War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Aylmer and Louise Maud Book 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ernst Patinama Amsterdam, the Netherlands War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Book 9, Chapter 1 Book 9, 1812 Chapter 1 From the close of the year 1811, intensified arming and concentrating of the forces of Western Europe began, and in 1812 these forces, millions of men, reckoning those transporting and feeding the army, moved from the west eastwards to the Russian frontier, toward which, since 1811, Russian forces had been similarly drawn. On the 12th of June, 1812, the forces of Western Europe crossed the Russian frontier, and war began, that is, an event took place opposed to human reason and to human nature. Millions of men perpetrated against one another such innumerable crimes, frauds, treacheries, thefts, forgeries, issues of false money, burglaries, incendiarisms, and murders, as in whole centuries are not recorded in the annals of all the law courts of the world, but which those who committed them did not at the time regard as being crimes. What produced this extraordinary occurrence? What were its causes? The historians tell us with naive assurance that its causes were the wrongs inflicted on the Duke of Oldenburg, the non-observance of the continental system, the ambition of Napoleon, the firmness of Alexander, the mistakes of the diplomatists, and so on. Consequently, it would only have been necessary for Metternich, whom Jantsev or Talleyrand, between a levy and an evening party, to have taken proper pains and written a more adroit note, or for Napoleon to have written to Alexander, My respected brother, I consent to restore the duchy to the Duke of Oldenburg, and there would have been no war. We can understand that the matter seemed like that to contemporaries. It naturally seemed to Napoleon that the war was caused by England's intrigues, as in fact he said on the island of St. Helena. It naturally seemed to members of the English Parliament that the cause of the war was Napoleon's ambition, to the Duke of Oldenburg that the cause of the war was the violence done to him, to businessmen that the cause of the war was the continental system which was ruining Europe, to the generals and old soldiers that the chief reason for the war was the necessity of giving them employment, to the legitimists of that day that it was the need of re-establishing les bons principes, and to the diplomatists of the time that it all resulted from the fact that the alliance between Russia and Austria in 1809 had not been sufficiently well concealed from Napoleon and from the awkward wording of memorandum number 178. It is natural that these and a countless and infinite quantity of other reasons, the number depending on the endless diversity of points of view, presented themselves to the men of that day. But to us, to posterity, who view the thing that happened in all its magnitude and perceive its plain and terrible meaning, these causes seem insufficient. To us it is incomprehensible that millions of Christian men killed and tortured each other either because Napoleon was ambitious or Alexander was firm, or because England's policy was astute or the Duke of Oldenburg wronged. We cannot grasp what connections such circumstances have with the actual fact of slaughter and violence? Why, because the Duke was wronged, thousands of men from the other side of Europe, 
killed and ruined the people of Smolensk and Moscow, and were killed by them. To us, their descendants, who are not historians, and are not carried away by the process of research, and can therefore regard the event with unclouded common sense, an incalculable number of courses present themselves. The deeper we delve in search of these courses, the more of them we find, and each separate course, or whole series of courses, appears to us equally valid in itself, and equally false by its insignificance, compared to the magnitude of the events, and by its impotence, apart from the cooperation of all the other coincident courses, to occasion the event. To us, the wish or objection of this or that French corporal to serve a second term appears as much a cause as Napoleon's refusal to withdraw his troops beyond the Vistula and to restore the Duchy of Oldenburg. For had he not wished to serve, and had a second, a third, and a thousandth corporal and private also refused, there would have been so many less men in Napoleon's army, and the war could not have occurred. Had Napoleon not taken offence at the demand that he should withdraw beyond the Vistula, and not ordered his troops to advance, there would have been no war. But had all his sergeants objected to serving a second term, then also there could have been no war. Nor could there have been a war had there been no English intrigues, and no Duke of Oldenburg, and had Alexander not felt insulted, and had there not been an autocratic government in Russia, or a revolution in France, and a subsequent dictatorship and empire, or all the things that produced the French Revolution, and so on. Without each of these causes, nothing could have happened. So all these causes, myriads of causes, coincided to bring it about. And so there was no one cause for that occurrence, but it had to occur because it had to. Millions of men, renouncing their human feelings and reason, had to go from west to east to slay their fellows, just as some centuries previously hordes of men had come from the east to the west, slaying their fellows. The actions of Napoleon and Alexander, on whose words the event seemed to hang, were as little voluntary as the actions of any soldier who was drawn into the campaign by lot or by conscription. This could not be otherwise, for in order that the will of Napoleon and Alexander, on whom the event seemed to depend, should be carried out, the concurrence of innumerable circumstances was needed without any one of which the event could not have taken place. It was necessary that millions of men, in whose hands lay the real power, the soldiers who fired or transported provisions and guns, should consent to carry out the will of these weak individuals, and should have been induced to do so by an infinite number of diverse and complex causes. We are forced to fall back on fatalism, as an explanation of irrational events, that is to say, events the reasonableness of which we do not understand. The more we try to explain such events in history reasonably, the more unreasonable and incomprehensible do they become to us. Each man lives for himself, using his freedom to attain his personal aims, and feels with his whole being that he can now do or abstain from doing this or that action, but as soon as he has done it, that action performed at a certain moment in time becomes irrevocable and belongs to history, in which it has not a free but a predestined significance. There are two sides to the life of every man, his individual life, which is the more free, the more abstract its interests, and his elemental hive life, in which he inevitably obeys laws laid down for him. Man lives consciously for himself, but is an unconscious instrument in the attainment of the historic, universal aims of humanity. A deed done is irrevocable, and its result, coinciding in time with the actions of millions of other men, assumes an historic significance. 
the higher a man stands on the social ladder the more people he is connected with and the more power he has over others the more evident is the predestination and inevitability of his every action the king's heart is in the hands of the lord a king is history's slave history that is the unconscious general hive life of mankind uses every moment of the life of kings as a tool for its own purposes though napoleon at the time in eighteen hundred and twelve was more convinced than ever that it depended on him verser ou ne pas verser le sang de ses peuples that is to shed or not to shed the blood of his peoples as alexander expressed it in the last letter he wrote him he had never been so much in the grip of inevitable laws which compelled him while thinking that he was acting on his own volition to perform for the hive life that is to say for history whatever had to be performed the people of the west moved eastwards to slay the fellow men and by the law of coincidence thousands of minute courses fitted in and coordinated to produce that movement and war reproaches for the non-observance of the continental system the duke of oldenburg's wrongs the movement of troops into prussia undertaken as it seemed to napoleon only for the purpose of securing an armed peace the french emperor's love and habit of war coinciding with his people's inclinations allurement by the grandeur of the preparations and the expenditure on those preparations and the need of obtaining advantages to compensate for that expenditure the intoxicating honours he received in dresden the diplomatic negotiations which in the opinion of contemporaries were carried on with a sincere desire to obtain peace but which only wounded the self-love of both sides and millions of other causes that adapted themselves to the event that was happening or coincided with it when an apple has ripened and falls why does it fall because of its attraction to the earth because its stalk withers because it is dried by the sun because it grows heavier because the wind shakes it or because the boy standing below wants to eat it nothing is the cause all this is only the coincidence of conditions in which all vital organic and elemental events occur and the botanist who finds that the apple falls because the cellular tissue decays and so forth is equally right with the child who stands under the tree and says the apple fell because he wanted to eat it and prayed for it equally right or wrong is he who says that napoleon went to moscow because he wanted to and perished because alexander desired his destruction and he who says that an undermined hill weighing a million tons fell because the last navvy struck it for the last time with his mattock in historic events the so-called great men are labels giving names to events and like labels they have but the smallest connection with the event itself every act of theirs which appears to them an act of their own will is in an historical sense involuntary and is related to the whole course of history and predestined from eternity end of chapter one recording by ernst patinama amsterdam the netherlands War and Peace Book Nine Chapter Two Read for Librivox dot org by Ernst Patinama Chapter Two On the twenty ninth of May Napoleon left Dresden, where he had spent three weeks surrounded by a court that included princes, dukes, kings, and even an emperor. Before leaving, napoleon showed favour to the emperor kings and princes who had deserved it reprimanded the kings and princes with whom he was dissatisfied 
presented pearls and diamonds of his own, that is, which he had taken from other kings, to the empress of Austria, and having, as his historian tells us, tenderly embraced the empress Marie-Louise, who regarded him as her husband, though he had left another wife in Paris, left her grieved by the parting which she seemed hardly able to bear. Though the diplomatists still firmly believed in the possibility of peace, and worked zealously to that end, and though the Emperor Napoleon himself wrote a letter to Alexander, calling him Monsieur Monfrère, and sincerely assured him that he did not want war, and would always love and honour him, yet he set off to join his army, and at every station gave fresh orders to accelerate the movement of his troops from west to east. He went in a travelling coach with six horses, surrounded by pages, aide de camp, and an escort, along the road to Posen, Thorn, Danzig, and Konigsberg. At each of these towns thousands of people met him with excitement and enthusiasm. The army was moving from west to east, and relays of six horses carried him in the same direction. On the 10th of June, old style, coming up with the army, he spent the night in apartments prepared for him on the estate of a Polish count in the Wilkowiski forest. Next day, overtaking the army, he went in a carriage to the Niemen, and, changing into a Polish uniform, he drove to the river bank in order to select a place for the crossing. Seeing on the other side some Cossacks, Le Cossack, and the wide spreading steppes in the midst of which lay the holy city of Moscow, Moscou, la ville sainte, the capital of a realm such as the Scythia into which Alexander the Great had marched, Napoleon, unexpectedly, and contrary alike to strategic and diplomatic considerations, ordered an advance and the next day his army began to cross the Niemen. Early in the morning of the 12th of June, he came out of his tent, which was pitched that day on the steep left bank of the Niemen, and looked through a spyglass at the streams of his troops pouring out of the Wilkowiski forest and flowing over the three bridges thrown across the river. The troops, knowing of the emperor's presence, were on the lookout for him, and when they caught sight of a figure in an overcoat and a cocked hat, standing apart from his suite in front of his tent on the hill, they threw up their caps and shouted, Vive l'Empereur! and one after another poured in a ceaseless stream out of the vast forest that had concealed them, and, separating, flowed on and on by the three bridges to the other side. Now we'll go into action. Oh, when he takes it in hand himself, things get hot. By heaven, there he is. Vive l'Empereur! So these are the steppes of Asia. It's a nasty country all the same. Au revoir, Bosch. I'll keep the best palace in Moscow for you. Au revoir. Good luck. Did you see the Emperor? Vive l'Empereur! Preur. If they make me governor of India, Gérard, I'll make you minister of Kashmir. That's settled. Vive l'Empereur! Hurrah! 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 The Cossacks, those rascals, see how they run! Vive l'Empereur! There he is! Do you see him? I've seen him twice, as I see you now. The little corporal. I saw him give the cross to one of the veterans. Vive l'Empereur! came the voices of men, old and young, of most diverse characters and social positions. On the faces of all was one common expression of joy at the commencement of the long-expected campaign, and of rapture and devotion to the man in the grey coat who was standing on the hill. On the 13th of June, a rather small, thoroughbred Arab horse was brought to Napoleon. He mounted it, and rode at a gallop to one of the bridges over the Niemen, deafened continually by incessant and rapturous acclamations, which he evidently endured only because it was impossible to forbid the soldiers to express their love of him by such shouting, but the shouting which accompanied him everywhere, 
disturbed him and distracted him from the military cares that had occupied him from the time he joined the army he rode across one of the swaying pontoon bridges to the farther side turned sharply to the left and galloped in the direction of kovno preceded by enraptured mounted chasseurs of the guard who breathless with delight galloped ahead to clear a path for him through the troops on reaching the broad river vilia he stopped near a regiment of polish uhlans stationed by the river vivat shouted the poles ecstatically breaking the ranks and pressing against one another to see him napoleon looked up and down the river dismounted and sat down on a log that lay on the bank at a mute sign from him a telescope was handed him which he rested on the back of a happy page who had run up to him and he gazed at the opposite bank then he became absorbed in a map laid out on the logs Without lifting his head, he said something, and two of his aides de camp galloped off to the Polish Uhlans. What? What, what did he, he say? say? was heard in the ranks of the Polish Uhlans when one of the aides de camp rode up to them. The order was to find a fort and to cross the river. The colonel of the Polish Uhlans, a handsome old man, flushed and, fumbling in his speech from excitement, asked the aide de camp whether he would be permitted to swim the river with his uhlans instead of seeking a fort in evident fear of refusal like a boy asking for permission to get on a horse he begged to be allowed to swim across the river before the emperor's eyes the aide de camp replied that probably the emperor would not be displeased at this excess of zeal as soon as the aide de camp had said this the old moustached officer with happy face and sparkling eyes raised his sabre shouted vivat and commanding the uhlans to follow him spurred his horse and galloped into the river he gave an angry thrust to his horse which had grown restive under him and plunged into the water heading for the deepest part where the current was swift hundreds of uhlans galloped in after him it was cold and uncanny in the rapid current in the middle of the stream and the uhlans caught hold of one another as they fell off their horses some of the horses were drowned and some of the men the others tried to swim on some in the saddle and some clinging to the horses manes they tried to make their way forward to the opposite bank and though there was a fort one-third of a mile away were proud that they were swimming and drowning in this river under the eyes of the man who sat on the log and was not even looking at what they were doing when the aide de camp having returned and choosing an opportune moment ventured to draw the emperor's attention to the devotion of the poles to his person the little man in the grey overcoat got up and having summoned berthier began pacing up and down the bank with him giving him instructions and occasionally glancing disapprovingly at the drowning uhlans who distracted his attention for him it was no new conviction that his presence in any part of the world from africa to the steppes of muscovy alike was enough to dumbfound people and impel them to insane self-oblivion he called for his horse and rode to his quarters some forty uhlans were drowned in the river though boats were sent to their assistance the majority struggled back to the bank from which they had started the colonel and some of his men got across and with difficulty clambered out on the further bank and as soon as they had got out in their soaked and streaming clothes they shouted vivat and looked ecstatically at the spot where napoleon had been but where he no longer was and at that moment considered themselves happy that evening between issuing one order that a forged russian paper money prepared for use in russia should be delivered as quickly as possible and another that a saxon should be shot on whom a letter containing information about the orders to the french army had been found napoleon also gave instructions that a polish colonel who had needlessly plunged into the river 
should be enrolled in the Légion d'honneur, of which Napoleon was himself the head. Quos vult perdere dementat. Those whom God wishes to destroy, he drives mad. End of chapter 2 Recording by Ernst Patinama Amsterdam, the Netherlands War and Peace, Book 9, Chapter 3 Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama Chapter 3 The Emperor of Russia had, meanwhile, been in Vilna for more than a month, reviewing troops and holding manoeuvres. Nothing was ready for the war that everyone expected, and to prepare for which the Emperor had come from Petersburg. There was no general plan of action. The vacillation between the various plans that were proposed had even increased after the emperor had been at headquarters for a month. Each of the three armies had its own commander-in-chief, but there was no supreme commander of all the forces, and the emperor did not assume that responsibility himself. The longer the emperor remained in Vilna, the less did everybody, tired of waiting, prepare for the war. All the efforts of those who surrounded the sovereign seemed directed merely to making him spend his time pleasantly and forget that war was impending. In June, after many balls and fates given by the Polish magnates, by the courtiers, and by the emperor himself, it occurred to one of the Polish aides de camp in attendance that a dinner and ball should be given for the emperor by his aide de camp. This idea was eagerly received. The emperor gave his consent. The aide of the camp collected money by a subscription. The lady, who was thought to be most pleasing to the emperor, was invited to act as hostess. Count Benningsen, being a landowner in the Vilna province, offered his country house for the fete, and the 13th of June was fixed for a ball, dinner, regatta, and fireworks at Zakrit, Count Benningsen's country seat. The very day that Napoleon issued the order to cross the Niemen, and his vanguard, driving off the Cossacks, crossed the Russian frontier, Alexander spent the evening at the entertainment given by his aide de camp at Benningsen's country house. It was a gay and brilliant fete. Connoisseurs of such matters declared that rarely had so many beautiful women been assembled in one place. Countess Bezukhova was present among other Russian ladies who had followed the sovereign from Petersburg to Vilna, and eclipsed the refined Polish ladies by her massive so-called Russian type of beauty. The emperor noticed her and honoured her with a dance. Boris Drubitskoy, having left his wife in Moscow and being for the present en garçon, as he phrased it, was also there, and, though not an aide de camp, had subscribed a large sum toward the expenses. Boris was now a rich man, who had risen to high honours, and no longer sought patronage, but stood on an equal footing with the highest of those of his own age. He was meeting Hélène in Vilna, after not having seen her for a long time, and did not recall the past. But as Hélène was enjoying the favours of a very important personage, and Boris had only recently married, they met as good friends of long standing. At midnight, dancing was still going on. Hélène, not having a suitable partner, herself offered to dance the mazurka with Boris. They were the third couple. Boris, coolly looking at Hélène's dazzling bare shoulders, which emerged from a dark, gold-embroidered gauze gown, talked to her of old acquaintances, and at the same time, unaware of it himself and unnoticed by others, never for an instant ceased to observe the emperor, who was in the same room. The emperor was not dancing. He stood in the doorway, stopping now one pair and now another with gracious words, which she alone knew how to utter. As the mazurka began, Boris saw that Adjutant General Balashov, one of those in closest attendance on the emperor, went up to him, and, contrary to court etiquette, stood near him while he was talking to a Polish lady. 
Having finished speaking to her, the emperor looked inquiringly at Balashov, and, evidently understanding that he only acted thus because there were important reasons for so doing, nodded slightly to the lady and turned to him. Hardly had Balashov begun to speak, before a look of amazement appeared on the emperor's face. He took Balashov by the arm and crossed the room with him, unconsciously clearing a path seven yards wide as the people on both sides made way for him. Boris noticed Arakcheyev's excited face when the sovereign went out with Balashov. Arakcheyev looked at the emperor from under his brow and, sniffing with his red nose, stepped forward from the crowd, as if expecting the emperor to address him. Boris understood that Arakcheyev envied Balashov and was displeased that evidently important news had reached the emperor otherwise than through himself. But the emperor and Balashov passed out into the illuminated garden without noticing Arakcheyev, who, holding his sword and glancing wrathfully around, followed some twenty paces behind them. All the time Boris was going through the figures of the mazurka, he was worried by the question of what news Balashov had brought and how he could find it out before others. In the figure in which he had to choose two ladies, he whispered to Hélène that he meant to choose Countess Potochka, who, he thought, had gone out onto the veranda, and glided over the parquet to the door opening into the garden, where, seeing Balashov and the Emperor returning to the veranda, he stood still. They were moving toward the door. Boris, fluttering as if he had not had time to withdraw, respectfully pressed close to the doorpost with bowed head. The emperor, with the agitation of one who has been personally affronted, was finishing with these words. To enter Russia without declaring war, I will not make peace as long as a single armed enemy remains in my country. It seemed to Boris that it gave the emperor pleasure to utter these words. He was satisfied with the form in which he had expressed his thoughts, but displeased that Boris had overheard it. Let no one know of it, the emperor added with a frown. Boris understood that this was meant for him, and, closing his eyes, slightly bowed his head. The emperor re-entered the ballroom and remained there about another half hour. Boris was thus the first to learn the news that the French army had crossed the Niemen, and, thanks to this, was able to show certain important personages that much that was concealed from others was usually known to him, and by this means he rose higher in their estimation. The unexpected news of the French having crossed the Niemen was particularly startling after a month of unfulfilled expectations and at a ball. On first receiving the news, under the influence of indignation and resentment, the emperor had found a phrase that pleased him, fully expressed his feelings, and has since become famous. On returning home at two o'clock that night, he sent for his secretary, Shiskov, and told him to write an order to the troops and a rescript to Field Marshal Prince Saltikov, in which he insisted on the words being inserted that he would not make peace so long as a single armed Frenchman remained on Russian soil. Next day, the following letter was sent to Napoleon. Monsieur mon frère, yesterday I learned that, despite the loyalty which I have kept my engagements with your majesty, your troops have crossed the Russian frontier, and I have this moment received from Petersburg a note in which Count Loriston informs me, as a reason for this aggression, that your majesty has considered yourself to be in a state of war with me from the time Prince Kuragin asked for his passports. The reasons on which the Duc de Bassano based his refusal to deliver them to him would never have led me to suppose that that could serve as a pretext for aggression. In fact, the ambassador, as he himself has declared, was never authorized to make that demand, and as soon as I was informed of it, I let him know how much I disapproved of it and ordered him to remain at his post. If your majesty does not intend to shed the blood of our peoples for such a misunderstanding, 
and consents to withdraw your troops from Russian territory, I will regard what has passed as not having occurred, and an understanding between us will be possible. In the contrary case, Your Majesty, I shall see myself forced to repel an attack that nothing on my part has provoked. It still depends on Your Majesty to preserve humanity from the calamity of another war. I am, etc. Signed, Alexander. End of chapter 3 Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands War and Peace, Book Nine, Chapter Four, read for LibriVox.org by Julie van Wallichem. At two in the morning of the fourteenth of June, the Emperor, having sent for Balashev and read him his letter to Napoleon, ordered him to take it and hand it personally to the French Emperor. When dispatching Balashev. The emperor repeated to him the words that he would not make peace so long as a single armed enemy remained on Russian soil and told him to transmit those words to Napoleon. Alexander did not insert them in his letter to Napoleon, because with his characteristic tact he felt it would be injudicious to use them at a moment when a last attempt at reconciliation was being made but he definitely instructed Balashev to repeat them personally to Napoleon. Having set off in the small hours of the fourteenth, accompanied by a burglar and two Cossacks, Balashev reached the French outposts at the village of Riconti, on the Russian side of the Niemen, by dawn. There he was stopped by French cavalry sentinels. A French non-commissioned officer of hussars, in crimson uniform, and a shaggy cap, shouted to the approaching Balashev to halt. Balashev did not do so at once, but continued to advance along the road at walking pace. The non-commissioned officer frowned, and, muttering words of abuse, advanced his horse's chest against Balashev, put his hand to his sabre, and shouted rudely at the Russian general, asking, Was he deaf, that he did not do as he was told? Balashev mentioned who he was. The non-commissioned officer began talking with his comrades about regimental matters without looking at the Russian general. After living at the seat of the highest authority and power, after conversing with the emperor less than three hours before, and in general being accustomed to the respect due to his rank in the service, Balashev found it very strange here on Russian soil to encounter this hostile and still more this disrespectful application of brute force to himself. The sun was only just appearing from behind the clouds. The air was fresh and dewy. A herd of cattle was being driven along the road from the village, and over the fields the larks rose trilling one after another, like bubbles rising in water. Balashev looked around him, awaiting the arrival of an officer from the village. The Russian Cossacks and Bugler and the French Hussars looked silently at one another from time to time. A French colonel of Hussars, who had evidently just left his bed, came riding from the village on a handsome sleek grey horse, accompanied by two Hussars. The officer, the soldiers, and their horses all looked smart and well kept. It was at that first period of a campaign, when troops are still in full trim, almost like that of peacetime manoeuvres, but with a shade of martial swagger in their clothes, and a touch of the gaiety and spirit of enterprise, which always accompanied the opening of a campaign. The French colonel with difficulty repressed a yawn, but was polite, and evidently understood Balashev's importance. He let him pass the soldiers, and behind the outposts, that his wish to be presented to the emperor, would most likely be satisfied immediately, as if the emperor's quarters were, he believed, not far off. They rode through the village of Riconti, past tethered French hussar horses, past sentinels and men who saluted their colonel and stared with curiosity at a Russian uniform, and came out at the other end of the village. 
The colonel said that the commander of the division was a mile and a quarter away, and would receive Balashev and conduct him to his destination. The sun had by now risen, and shone gaily on the bright verger. They had hardly ridden up a hill past a tavern, before they saw a group of horsemen coming towards them. In front of the group, on a black horse with trappings that glittered in the sun, rode a tall man with plumes in his hat and black hair, curling down to his shoulders. He wore a red mantle and stretched his long legs forward in French fashion. This man rode toward Balashev at a gallop, his plumes flowing and his gems and gold lace glittering in the bright June sunshine. Balashev was only two horses' length from the equestrian with the bracelets, plumes, necklaces, and gold embroidery, who was galloping toward him with his theatrically solemn countenance, when Gilner, the French colonel, whispered respectfully, "'The King of Naples.' It was, in fact, Murat, now called King of Naples. Though it was quite incomprehensible why he should be King of Naples, he was called so, and was himself convinced that he was so, and therefore assumed a more solemn and important air than formerly. He was so sure that he really was the King of Naples, that when, on the eve of his departure from that city, while walking through the street with his wife, some Italians called out to him, Viva il Re! Translator's note, Long live the King! End of note. He turned to his wife with a pensive smile and said, Poor fellows! They don't know that I am leaving them to-morrow. But though he firmly believed himself to be king of Naples, and pitied the grief felt by the subjects he was abandoning, latterly, after he had been ordered to return to military service, and especially since his last interview with Napoleon in Danzig, when his august brother-in-law had told him, I made you king that you should reign in my way, but not in yours, he had cheerfully taken up his familiar business, and, like a well-fed but not over-fed horse that feels himself in harness and grows skittish between the shafts, he dressed up in clothes as variegated and expensive as possible, and gaily and contentedly galloped along the roads of Poland, without himself knowing why or whither. On seeing the Russian general, he threw back his head, with its long hair curling to his shoulders, in a majestically royal manner, and looked inquiringly at the French colonel. The colonel respectfully informed his majesty of Balashev's mission, whose name he could not pronounce. "'De Balmakiv, said the king, overcoming by his assurance the difficulty that had presented itself to the colonel. "'Charmed to make your acquaintance, general,' he added with a gesture of kingly condescension. As soon as the king began to speak, loud and fast, his royal dignity instantly forsook him, and without noticing it, he passed into his natural tone of good-natured familiarity. He laid his hand on the withers of Balashev's horse, and said, "'Well, General, it all looks like war,' as if regretting a circumstance of which he was unable to judge. "'Your Majesty,' replied Balashev, "'my master, the Emperor, does not desire war, and as your Majesty sees,' said Balashev, using the words your majesty at every opportunity, with the affectation unavoidable in frequently addressing one to whom the title was still a novelty. Murat's face beamed with stupid satisfaction as he listened to Monsieur de Balmaguev. But, royaute oblige. Translator's note, royalty has its obligations. End of note. And he felt it incumbent on him, as a king and an ally, to confer on state affairs with Alexander's envoy. He dismounted, took Balashev's arm, and, moving a few steps away from his suite, which waited respectfully, began to pace up and down with him, trying to speak significantly. He referred to the fact that the Emperor Napoleon had resented the demand that he should withdraw his troops from Prussia, especially when that demand became generally known and the dignity of France was thereby offended. Balashev replied that there was nothing offensive in the demand, because— But Murat interrupted him. "'Then you don't consider the Emperor Alexander the aggressor?' he asked unexpectedly, with a kindly and foolish smile. 
Balashev told him why he considered Napoleon to be the originator of the war. "'Oh, my dear General,' Murat again interrupted him, "'with all my heart I wish the emperors may arrange the affair between them, and that the war begun by no wish of mine may finish as quickly as possible.' said he in the tone of a servant who wants to remain good friends with another despite a quarrel between their masters and he went on to inquire about the grand duke and the state of his health and to reminiscence of the gay and amusing times he had spent with him in naples then suddenly as if remembering his royal dignity murat solemnly drew himself up assumed the pose in which he had stood at his coronation and waving his right hand said I won't detain you longer, General. I wish success to your mission. And with his embroidered red mantle, his flowing feathers, and his glittering ornaments, he rejoined his Swede, who were respectfully waiting him. Balashev rode on, supposing from Murat's words that he would very soon be brought before Napoleon himself. But instead of that, at the next village, the sentinels of Davos infantry corps attained him as the pickets of the vanguard had done and an adjutant of the corps commander who was fetched conducted him into the village to marshal davout end of chapter four war and peace Book Nine, Chapter Five, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Seelaw. Devout was to Napoleon what Arakcheyev was to Alexander. Though not a coward like Arakcheyev, he was as precise, as cruel, and as unable to express his devotion to his monarch except by cruelty. In the organization of states, such men are necessary, as wolves are necessary in the organism of nature, and they always exist, always appear, and hold their own, however incongruous their presence and their proximity to the head of the government may be. This inevitability alone can explain how the cruel Arakcheyev, who tore out a grenadier's mustache with his own hands, whose weak nerves rendered him unable to face danger, and who was neither an educated man nor a courtier, was able to maintain his powerful position with Alexander, whose own character was chivalrous, noble, and gentle. Balashov found about seated on a barrel in the shed of a peasant's hut, writing. He was auditing accounts. Better quarters could have been found him, but Marshal Devout was one of those men who purposely put themselves in most depressing conditions to have a justification for being gloomy. For the same reason, they are always hard at work and in a hurry. How can I think of the bright side of life when, as you see, I am sitting on a barrel and working in a dirty shed, the expression of his face seemed to say. The chief pleasure and necessity of such men, when they encounter anyone who shows animation, is to flaunt their own dreary, persistent activity. Devout allowed himself that pleasure when Balashov was brought in. He became still more absorbed in his task when the Russian general entered, and, after glancing over his spectacles at Balashov's face, which was animated by the beauty of the morning and by his talk with Murat, he did not rise or even stir, but scowled still more and sneered malevolently. When he noticed in Balashov's face the disagreeable impression this reception produced, Devout raised his head and coldly asked what he wanted. Thinking he could have been received in such a manner only because Devout did not know that he was the adjutant general to the Emperor Alexander, and even his envoy to Napoleon, Balashov hastened to inform him of his rank and mission. Contrary to his expectation, Devout, after hearing him, became still surlier and ruder. "'Where is your dispatch?' he inquired. "'Give it to me. I will send it to the Emperor.' Balashov replied that he had been ordered to hand it personally to the Emperor." Your emperor's orders are obeyed in your army, but here, said Devout, you must do as you're told. And, as if to make the Russian general still more conscious of his dependence on brute force, Devout sent an adjutant to call the officer on duty. Balashov took out the packet containing the emperor's letter and laid it on the table, made of a door with its hinges still hanging on it and laid across two barrels. Devout took the packet and read the inscription. You're perfectly at liberty to treat me with respect or not protested Balashov, but permit me to observe that I have the honor to be the adjutant general to his majesty, and devout glanced at him silently and plainly derived pleasure from the signs of agitation and confusion which appeared on Balashov's face. You will be treated as is fitting, said he, 
putting the packet in his pocket, left the shed. A minute later, the marshal's adjutant, de Castres, came in and conducted Balashov to the quarters assigned him. That day, he dined with the marshal at the same board on the barrels. Next day, Devout rode out early. After asking Balashov to come to him, peremptorily requested him to remain there to move on with the baggage train should orders come for it to move, and to talk to no one except the Monsieur de Castres. After four days of solitude, ennui, and consciousness of his own impotence and insignificance, particularly acute by contrast with the sphere of power in which he had so lately moved, and after several marches with the marshal's baggage and the French army, which occupied the whole district, Balashov was brought to Vilna, now occupied by the French, through the very gate by which he had left it four days previously. Next day, the imperial gentleman-in-waiting, the Comte de Trenne, came to Balashov and informed him of the Emperor Napoleon's wish to honor him with an audience. Four days before, sentinels of the Preobrigensk regiment had stood in front of the house to which Balashov was conducted, and now two French grenadiers stood there in blue uniforms, unfastened in front and with shaggy caps on their heads, and an escort of hussars and uhlans, and a brilliant suite of aides-de-camp, pages, and generals, who were waiting for Napoleon to come out, were standing at the porch, round his saddle horse and his family Rustan. Napoleon received Balashov in the very house in Vilna, from which Alexander had dispatched him on his mission. End of chapter 5
judging by the calmly moderate and amicable tone in which the French emperor spoke, Balashov was firmly persuaded that he wished for peace and intended to enter into negotiations. When Napoleon, having finished speaking, looked inquiringly at the Russian envoy, Balashov began a speech he had prepared long before. Sire, the emperor, my master. But the sight of the emperor's eyes bent on him confused him. You are flurried. Compose yourself, Napoleon seemed to say, as with a scarcely perceptible smile he looked at Balashov's uniform and sword. Balashov recovered himself and began to speak. He said that the Emperor Alexander did not consider Kurakin's demand for his passports a sufficient cause for war, that Kurakin had acted on his own initiative and without his sovereign's assent, that the Emperor Alexander did not desire war and had no relations with England. Not yet, interposed Napoleon, and as if fearing to give vent to his feelings, he frowned and nodded slightly as a sign that Balashov might proceed. After saying all that he had been instructed to say, Balashov added that the Emperor Alexander wished for peace, but would not enter into negotiations except on condition that, here Balashov hesitated, he remembered the words the Emperor Alexander had not written in his letter, but had specially inserted in the rescript to Saltyakov and had told Balashov to repeat to Napoleon. Balashov remembered these words, so long as a single armed foe remains on Russian soil, but some complex feeling restrained him. He could not utter them, though he wished to do so. He grew confused and said, On condition that the French army retires beyond the Neman, Napoleon noticed Balashov's embarrassment when uttering these last words. His face twitched and the calf of his left leg began to quiver rhythmically. Without moving from where he stood, he began speaking in a louder tone and more hurriedly than before. During the speech that followed, Balashov, who more than once lowered his eyes, involuntarily noticed the quivering of Napoleon's left leg, which increased the more Napoleon raised his voice. "'I desire peace no less than the Emperor Alexander,' he began. "'Have I not for eighteen months been doing everything to obtain it? I have waited for eighteen months for explanations. But in order to begin negotiations, what is demanded of me?' he said." frowning and making an energetic gesture of inquiry with his small, white, plump hand. The withdrawal of your army beyond the Neman, sire, replied Balashov. The Neman, replied Napoleon. So now you want me to retire beyond the Neman. Only the Neman, repeated Napoleon, looking straight at Balashov. The latter bowed his head respectfully. Instead of the demand of four months earlier to withdraw from Pomerania, only a withdrawal beyond the Neman was now demanded. Napoleon turned quickly and began to pace the room. You say the demand now is that I am to withdraw beyond the Neiman before commencing negotiations. But in just the same way two months ago, the demand was that I should withdraw beyond the Vistula and Oder, and yet you are willing to negotiate. He went in silence from one corner of the room to the other, and again stopped in front of Balashov. Balashov noticed that his left leg was quivering faster than before and his face seemed petrified in its stern expression. This quivering of his left leg was a thing Napoleon was conscious of. The vibration of my left calf is a great sign with me, he remarked at a later date. Such demands as to retreat beyond the Vistula and Oder may be made to the Prince of Baden, but not to me, Napoleon almost screamed, quite to his own surprise. If you gave me Petersburg and Moscow, I could not accept such conditions. You say I have begun this war, but who first joined his army? The Emperor Alexander, not I. And you offer me negotiations when I have expended millions, when you are in alliance with England, and when your position is a bad one. You offer me negotiations. But what is the aim of your alliances with England? What has she given you? He continued hurriedly, evidently no longer trying to show the advantages of peace and discuss its possibility but only to prove his own rectitude and power and Alexander's errors and duplicity. The commencement of his speech had obviously been made with the intention of demonstrating the advantages of his position and showing that he was nevertheless willing to negotiate. But he had begun talking, and the more he talked, the less he could control his words. The whole purport of his remarks now was evidently to exalt himself and insult Alexander. 
just what he had least desired at the commencement of the interview. I hear you have made peace with Turkey. Balashov bowed his head affirmatively. Peace has been concluded, he began, but Napoleon did not let him speak. He evidently wanted to do all the talking himself and continued to talk with the sort of eloquence and unrestrained irritability to which spoiled people are so prone. Yes, I know you have made peace with the Turks without obtaining Moldavia and Wallachia. I would have given your sovereign those provinces as I gave him Finland. Yes, he went on. I promised and would have given the Emperor Alexander Moldavia and Wallachia. And now he won't have those splendid provinces. Yet he might have united them to his empire, and in a single reign would have extended Russia from the Gulf of Bothnia to the mouth of the Danube. Catherine the Great could not have done more, said Napoleon, growing more and more excited as he paced up and down the room, repeating to Balashov almost the very words he had used to Alexander himself at Tilsit. All that he would have owed to my friendship. Oh, what a splendid reign, he repeated several times, then paused, drew from his pocket a gold snuff box, lifted it to his nose, and greedily sniffed at it. What a splendid reign the Emperor Alexander's might have been. He looked compassionately at Belashov, and as soon as the latter tried to make some rejoinder, hastily interrupted him. What could he wish or look for that he would not have obtained through my friendship, demanded Napoleon, shrugging his shoulders in perplexity. But no, he has preferred to surround himself with my enemies, and with whom? With Steins, Armfelds, Benegains, Winston Gerodes, Stein, a traitor expelled from his own country, Armfelt, a rake and intriguer, Winston Gerod, a fugitive French subject, Benigzin, rather more of a soldier than the others, but all the same, an incompetent who was unable to do anything in 1807, and who should awaken terrible memories in the Emperor Alexander's mind. Granted that they were competent, they might be made use of, continued Napoleon. Hardly able to keep pace in words with the rush of thoughts that incessantly sprang up, proving how right and strong he was in his perception the two were one and the same. But they are not even that. They are neither fit for war nor peace. Barclay is said to be the most capable of them all, but I cannot say so, judging by his first movements. And what are they doing, all these courtiers? Fool proposes, Armfeld disputes, Benigzin considers, and Barclay, called on to act, does not know what to decide on, and time passes, bringing no result. Bagration alone is a military man. He's stupid, but he has experience, a quick eye and resolution. And what role is your young monarch playing in the monstrous crowd? They compromise him and throw on him the responsibility for all that happens. A sovereign should not be with the army unless he is a general, said Napoleon, evidently uttering these words as a direct challenge to the emperor. He knew how Alexander desired to be a military commander. The campaign began only a week ago, and you haven't even been able to defend Vilna. You are cut in two and have been driven out of the Polish provinces. Your army is grumbling. On the contrary, your majesty, said Belashov, hardly able to remember what had been said to him, and following these verbal fireworks with difficulty, the troops are burning with eagerness. I know everything. Napoleon interrupted him. I know everything. I know the number of your battalions as exactly as I know my own. You have not 200,000 men, and I have three times that number. I give you my word of honor, said Napoleon, forgetting that his word of honor could carry no weight. I give you my word of honor that I have 530,000 men this side of the Vistula. The Turks will be of no use to you. They are worth nothing, and have shown it by making peace with you. As for the Swedes, it's their fate to be governed by mad kings. Their king was insane, and they changed him for another, Bernadotte, who promptly went mad. For no Swede would ally himself with Russia unless he were mad. Napoleon grinned maliciously and again raised his snuff-box to his nose. Balashov knew how to reply to each of Napoleon's remarks, and would have done so. He continually made the gesture of a man wishing to say something, but Napoleon always interrupted him. To the alleged insanity of the Swedes, Balashov wished to reply that when Russia is on her side, Sweden is practically an island. But Napoleon gave an angry exclamation to drown his voice. Napoleon was in that state of irritability in which a man has to talk, talk, and talk. 
merely to convince himself that he's in the right. Balashov began to feel uncomfortable. As envoy, he feared to demean his dignity and felt the necessity of replying, but as a man, he shrank before the transport of groundless wrath that had evidently seized Napoleon. He knew that none of the words now uttered by Napoleon had any significance, and that Napoleon himself would be ashamed of them when he came to his senses. Balashov stood with downcast eyes, looking at the movements of Napoleon's stout legs, and trying to avoid meeting his eyes. But what do I care about your allies, said Napoleon. I have allies, the Poles. There are 80,000 of them, and they fight like lions, and there will be 200,000 of them. And probably still more perturbed by the fact he had uttered this obvious falsehood, and that Balashov still stood silently before him in the same attitude of submission to fate, Napoleon abruptly turned around, drew close to Balashov's face, and gesticulating rapidly and energetically with his white hands, almost shouted, Know that if you stir up Prussia against me, I'll wipe it off the map of Europe, he declared, his face pale and distorted by anger, and he struck one of his small hands energetically with the other. Yes, I will throw you back beyond the Dvina and beyond the Dnieper, and I will re-erect against you that barrier which it was criminal and blind of Europe to allow to be destroyed. Yes, that is what will happen to you. That is what you will have gained by alienating me. And he walked silently several times up and down the room, his fat shoulders twitching. He put his snuff box into his waistcoat pocket, took it out again, lifted it several times to his nose, and stopped in front of Balashov. He paused, looked ironically straight into Balashov's eyes, and said in a quiet voice, And yet, what a splendid reign your master might have had. Balashov, feeling it incumbent on him to reply, said that from the Russian side, things did not appear in so gloomy a light. Napoleon was silent, still looking derisively at him and evidently not listening to him. Balashov said that in Russia, the best results were expected from the war. Napoleon nodded condescendingly, as if to say, I know it's your duty to say that, but you don't believe it yourself. I have convinced you. When Balashov had ended, Napoleon again took out his snuff box, sniffed at it, and stamped his foot twice on the floor as a signal. The door opened. A gentleman-in-waiting, bending respectfully, handed the emperor his hat and gloves. Another brought him a pocket handkerchief. Napoleon, without giving them a glance, turned to Balashov. Assure the emperor Alexander from me, said he, taking his hat, that I am as devoted to him as before. I know him thoroughly and very highly esteem his lofty qualities. I will detain you no longer. General, you shall receive my letter to the emperor. And Napoleon went quickly to the door. Everyone in the reception room rushed forward and descended the staircase. End of chapter 6《War and Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Seven, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Seeloff. After all that Napoleon had said to him, those bursts of anger and the last dryly spoken words, "I will detain you no longer, General. You shall receive my letter." Balashov felt convinced that Napoleon would not wish to see him, and would even avoid another meeting with him, an insulted envoy, especially as he had witnessed his unseemly anger. But to his surprise, Balashov received through the rock an invitation to dine with the emperor that day. Messieurs Qualencourt and Berthier were present at that dinner. Napoleon met Balashov cheerfully and amiably. He not only showed no sign of constraint or self-reproach on account of his outburst that morning, but, on the contrary, tried to reassure Balashov. It was evident that he had long been convinced that it was impossible for him to make a mistake and that, in his perception, whatever he did was right not because it harmonized with any idea of right and wrong, but because he did it. The emperor was in very good spirits after his ride through Vilna, where crowds of people had rapturously greeted and followed him. From all the windows of the streets through which he rode, rugs, flags, and his monograms were displayed, and the Polish ladies welcoming him waved their handkerchiefs to him. At dinner, having placed Balashov beside him, Napoleon not only treated him amiably, but behaved as if Balashov were one of his own courtiers, one of those who sympathized with his plans and ought to rejoice at his success. In the course of conversation, he mentioned Moscow 
had questioned Balashov about the Russian capital, not merely as an interested traveler asks about a new city he intends to visit, but as if convinced that Balashov, as a Russian, must be flattered by his curiosity. How many inhabitants are there in Moscow? How many houses? Is it true that Moscow is called Holy Moscow? How many churches are there in Moscow? he asked. And receiving the reply that there were more than 200 churches, he remarked, Why such a quantity of churches? The Russians are very devout, replied Balashov. But a large number of monasteries and churches is always a sign of the backwardness of a people, said Napoleon, turning to Qualincourt for appreciation of this remark. Balashov respectfully ventured to disagree with the French emperor. Every country has its own character, said he. But nowhere in Europe is there anything like that, said Napoleon. I beg your majesty's pardon, returned Balashov. Besides, Russia, there is Spain, where there are also many churches and monasteries. This reply of Balashov, which hinted at the recent defeats of the French in Spain, was much appreciated when he related it at Alexander's court, but it was not much appreciated at Napoleon's dinner, where it passed unnoticed. The uninterested and perplexed faces of the marshal showed that they were puzzled as to what Balashov's tone suggested. If there is a point we don't see it, or it is not at all witty, their expression seemed to say, so little was his rejoinder appreciated that Napoleon did not notice it at all and naively asked Balashov through what towns the direct road from there to Moscow passed. Balashov, who was on the alert all through the dinner, replied that just as all roads lead to Rome, so all roads lead to Moscow. There were many roads, and among them the road through Poltava, which Charles XII chose. Balashov involuntarily flushed with pleasure at the aptitude of this reply, but hardly had he uttered the word Poltava before Qualincourt began speaking of the badness of the road from Petersburg to Moscow and of his Petersburg reminiscences. After dinner they went to drink coffee in Napoleon's study, which four days previously had been that of the Emperor Alexander. Napoleon sat down, toying with his Sevres coffee cup, and motioned Balashov to a chair beside him. Napoleon was in that well-known after-dinner mood which, more than any reason cause, makes a man contented with himself and disposed to consider everyone his friend. It seemed to him that he was surrounded by men who adored him, and he felt convinced that, after his dinner, Balashov too was his friend and worshipper. Napoleon turned to him with a pleasant, though slightly ironic, smile. They tell me this is the room the Emperor Alexander occupied. Strange, isn't it, General? he said, evidently not doubting that this remark would be agreeable to his hearer, since it went to prove his, Napoleon's, superiority to Alexander. Balashov made no reply, and bowed his head in silence. Yes, four days ago, in this room, Witzengerod and Stein were deliberating, continued Napoleon, with the same derisive and self-confident smile. What I can't understand, he went on, is that the Emperor Alexander has surrounded himself with my personal enemies. That I do not understand. Has he not thought that I may the same? And he turned inquiringly to Balashov, and evidently this thought turned him back on to the track of this morning's anger, which was still fresh in him. And let him know that I will do so, said Napoleon, rising and pushing his cup away with his hand. I'll drive all his Württemberg, Baden, and Weimar relations out of Germany. Yes, I'll drive them out. Let him prepare an asylum for them in Russia. Balashov bowed his head with an air, indicating that he would like to make his bow and leave and only listened because he could not help hearing what was said to him. Napoleon did not notice this expression. He treated Balashov not as an envoy from his enemy, but as a man now fully devoted to him, and who must rejoice at his former master's humiliation. And why has the Emperor Alexander taken command of the armies? What's the good of that? War is my profession, but his business is to reign and not to command armies. Why has he taken on himself such a responsibility? Again Napoleon brought out his snuff-box, paced several times up and down the room in silence, and then suddenly and unexpectedly went up to Balashov and with a slight smile, as confidently, quickly, and simply as if he were doing something not merely important but pleasing to Balashov, he raised his hand to the forty-year-old Russian general's face, and taking him by the ear, pulled it gently, smiling with his lips only. To have one's ear by the emperor was considered the greatest honor and a mark of favor at the French court. Well, adorer and courtier of the Emperor Alexander, 
Why don't you say anything, said he, as if it was ridiculous in his presence to be the adorer and courtier of any one but himself, Napoleon. Are the horses ready for the general, he added, with a slight inclination of his head in reply to Balashov's bow. Let it have mine. He is a long way to go. The letter taken by Balashov was the last Napoleon sent to Alexander. Every detail of the interview was communicated to the Russian monarch, and the war began. End of chapter 7《War and Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Eight, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Seeloff. After his interview with Pierre in Moscow, Prince Andrew went to Petersburg on business, as he told his family, but really to meet Anatoly Kuryagin, whom he felt it necessary to encounter. On reaching Petersburg, he inquired for Kuryagin, but the latter had already left the city. Pierre had warned his brother-in-law that Prince Andrew was on his track. Anatoly Kuryagin promptly obtained an appointment from the Minister of War and went to join the army in Moldavia. While in Petersburg, Prince Andrew met Kutuzov, his former commander, who was always well disposed toward him, and Kutuzov suggested that he should accompany him to the army in Moldavia, to which the old general had been appointed commander-in-chief. So Prince Andrew, having received an appointment on the headquarters staff, left for Turkey. Prince Andrew did not think it proper to write and challenge Kudyagin. He thought that if he challenged him without some fresh cause, it might compromise the young countess, Rostova, and so he wanted to meet Kuryagin personally in order to find a fresh pretext for a duel. But he again failed to meet Kuryagin in Turkey, for soon after Prince Andrew arrived, the latter returned to Russia. In a new country, amid new conditions, Prince Andrew found life easier to bear. After his betrothed had broken faith with him, which he felt the more acutely the more he tried to conceal its effects, the surroundings in which he had been happy became trying to him, and the freedom and independence he had once prized so highly were still more so. Not only could he no longer think the thoughts that had first come to him as he lay gazing at the sky on the field of Austerlitz, and had later enlarged upon with Pierre, and which had filled his solitude at Bokhacharova, and then in Switzerland and Rome, but he even dreaded to recall them and the bright, boundless horizons they had revealed. He was now concerned only with the nearest practical matters unrelated to his past interests, and he seized on these the more eagerly the more those past interests closed to him. It was as if that lofty, infinite canopy of heaven that had once towered above him had suddenly turned into a low, solid vault, that weighed him down, in which all was clear, but nothing eternal or mysterious. Of the activities that presented themselves to him, army service was the simplest and most familiar. As a general on duty on Kutuzov's staff, he applied himself to business with zeal and perseverance, and surprised Kutuzov by his willingness and accuracy in work. Not having found Kuryagin in Turkey, Prince Andrew did not think it necessary to rush back to Russia after him. But, all the same, he knew that however long it might be before he met Kuryagin, despite his contempt for him, and despite all the proofs he deduced to convince himself that it was not worth stooping to a conflict with him, he knew that when he did meet him, he would not be able to resist calling him out, any more than a ravenous man can help snatching at food, and the consciousness that the insult was not yet avenged, that his rancor was still unspent weighed on his heart, and poisoned the artificial tranquillity which he managed to obtain in Turkey by means of restless, plodding, and rather vainglorious and ambitious activity. In the year 1812, when the news of the war with Napoleon reached Bucharest, where Kutuzov had been living for two months, passing his days and nights with a Wallachian woman, Prince Andrew asked Kutuzov to transfer him to the Western Army. Kutuzov, who was already weary of Bolkonsky's activity, which seemed to reproach his own idleness, very readily let him go and gave him a mission to Barclay de Tali. Before joining the Western Army, which was then in May, encamped at Drisa, Prince Andrew visited Bald Hills, which was directly on his way, being only two miles off the Smolensk high road. During the last three years, there had been so many changes in his life. He had thought, felt, and seen so much, having traveled both in the East and the West, that on reaching Bald Hills it struck him as strange and unexpected to find the way of life there unchanged, and still the same in every detail. He entered through the gates with their stone pillars, 
and drove up the avenue leading to the house as if he were entering an enchanted sleeping castle. The same old stateliness, the same cleanliness, the same stillness reigned there, and inside there was the same furniture, the same walls, sounds, and smell, and the same timid faces, only somewhat older. Princess Mary was still the same timid, plain maiden, getting on in years, uselessly and joylessly passing the best years of her life in fear and constant suffering. Mademoiselle Bourienne was the same coquettish, self-satisfied girl, enjoying every moment of her existence and full of joyous hopes for the future. She had merely become more self-confident, Prince Andrew thought. De Salles, the tutor he had brought from Switzerland, was wearing a coat of Russian cut and talking broken Russian to the servants but was still the same narrowly intelligent, conscientious, and pedantic preceptor. The old prince had changed in appearance only by the loss of a tooth, which left a noticeable gap on one side of his mouth. In character he was the same as ever, only showing still more irritability and skepticism as to what was happening in the world. Little Nicholas alone had changed. He had grown, become rosier, had curly, dark hair, and, when merry and laughing, quite unconsciously lifted the upper lip of his pretty little mouth, just as little princesses used to do. He alone did not obey the law of immutability in the enchanted sleeping castle. But though externally all remained as of old, the inner relations of all these people had changed since Prince Andrew had seen them last. The household was divided into two alien and hostile camps, who changed their habits for his sake and only met because he was there. To the one camp belonged the old prince, Mademoiselle Bourienne, and the architect. To the other princess, Mary, the Salles, little Nicholas, and all the old nurses and maids. During his stay at Bald Hills, all the family dined together, but they were ill at ease, and Prince Andrew felt that he was a visitor for whose sake an exception was being made, and that his presence made them all feel awkward. Involuntarily feeling this at dinner on the first day, he was taciturn and the old prince, noticing this also, became morosely dumb, and retired to his apartments directly after dinner. In the evening, when Prince Andrew went to him, and, trying to rouse him, began to tell him of the Count Kamienski's campaign, the old prince began unexpectedly to talk about Princess Mary, blaming her for her superstitions and her dislike of Mademoiselle Bourienne, who, he said, was the only person really attached to him. The old prince said that if he was ill, it was only because of Princess Mary, that she purposely worried and irritated him, and that by indulgence and silly talk she was spoiling the little Prince Nicholas. The old prince knew very well that he tormented his daughter and that her life was very hard, but he also knew that he could not help tormenting her and that she deserved it. Why does Prince Andrew, who sees this, say nothing to me about his sister? Does he think me a scoundrel or an old fool who, without any reason, keeps his own daughter at a distance? and attaches this French woman to himself. He doesn't understand, so I must explain it, and he must hear me out, thought the old prince. And he began explaining why he could not put up with his daughter's unreasonable character. If you ask me, said Prince Andrew, without looking up, he was censuring his father for the first time in his life, I did not wish to speak about it. But as you ask me, I will give you my frank opinion. If there is any misunderstanding and discord between you and Mary, I can't blame her for it at all. I know how she loves and respects you, since you ask me, continued Prince Andrew, becoming irritable, as he was always liable to do of late. I can only say that if there are any misunderstandings, they are caused by that worthless woman who is not fit to be my sister's companion. The old man first stared fixedly at his son, and an unnatural smile disclosed the fresh gap between his teeth to which Prince Andrew could not get accustomed. What companion, my dear boy, eh? You've already been talking it over, eh? Father, I did not want to judge, said Prince Andrew, in a hard and bitter tone. But you challenged me, and I have said, and always shall say, that Mary is not to blame. But those to blame, the one to blame, is that Frenchwoman. Ah, he has passed judgment. Past judgment, said the old man in a low voice, and, as it seemed to Prince Andrew, with some embarrassment. But then he suddenly jumped up and cried, Be off! Be off! And let not a trace of you remain here. Prince Andrew wished to leave at once, but Princess Mary persuaded him to stay another day. That day he did not see his father, who did not leave his room and admitted no one but Mademoiselle Bourienne and Tichon, 
but asked several times whether his son had gone. Next day, before leaving, Prince Andrew went to his son's rooms. The boy, curly-headed like his mother and glowing with health, sat on his knee, and Prince Andrew began telling him the story of Bluebeard, but fell into a reverie without finishing the story. He thought not of this pretty child, his son, whom he held on his knee, but of himself. He sought in himself either remorse for having angered his father, or regret at leaving home for the first time in his life on bad terms with him, and was horrified to find neither. What meant still more to him was that he sought and did not find in himself the former tenderness for his son, which he had hoped to reawaken by caressing the boy and taking him on his knee. Well, go on, said his son. Prince Andrew, without replying, put him down from his knee and went out of the room. As soon as Prince Andrew had given up his daily occupations, and especially on returning to the old conditions of life amid which he had been happy, weariness of life overcame him with its former intensity, and he hastened to escape from these memories and to find some work as soon as possible. So you've decided to go, Andrew? asked his sister. Thank God that I can, replied Prince Andrew. I am very sorry you can't. Why do you say that? replied Princess Mary. Why do you say that when you are going to this terrible war and he's so old? Mademoiselle Bourienne says he has been asking about you. As soon as she began to speak of that, her lips trembled and her tears began to fall. Prince Andrew turned away and began pacing the room. Ah, my God, my God. When one thinks who and what, what trash can cause people misery, he said with a malignity that alarmed Princess Mary. She understood that when speaking of trash, she referred not only to Mademoiselle Bourienne, the cause of her misery, but also to the man who had ruined his own happiness. Andrew, one thing I beg, I entreat of you, she said touching his elbow and looking at him with eyes that shone through her tears. I understand you, she looked down. Don't imagine that sorrow is the work of men. Men are his tools. She looked a little above Prince Andrew's head with a confident, accustomed look with which one looks at the place where a familiar portrait hangs. Sorrow is sent by him, not by men. Men are his instruments. They are not to blame. If you think someone has wronged you, forget it and forgive. We have no right to punish, and then you will know the happiness of forgiving. If I were a woman, I would do so, Mary. That is a woman's virtue. But a man should not and cannot forgive and forget, he replied. And though till that moment he had not been thinking of Kuryagin, all his unexpended anger suddenly swelled up in his heart. If Mary is already persuading me forgive, it means that I ought to long ago have punished him, he thought and giving her no further reply, he began thinking of the glad, vindictive moment when he would meet Kuryagin, who he knew was now in the army. Princess Mary begged him to stay one day more, saying that she knew how unhappy her father would be if Andrew left without being reconciled to him. But Prince Andrew replied that he would probably soon be back again from the army, and would certainly write to his father, but that the longer he stayed now, the more embittered their differences would become. Goodbye, Andrew. Remember that misfortunes come from God, and men are never to blame, were the last words he heard from his sister when he took leave of her. Then it must be so, thought Prince Andrew, as he drove out of the avenue from the house at Bald Hills. She, poor innocent creature, is left to be victimized by an old man who has outlived his wits. The old man feels he is guilty, but cannot change himself. My boy is growing up and rejoices in life, in which, like everybody else, he will deceive or be deceived and I am off to the army. Why? I myself don't know. I want to meet that man whom I despise, so as to give him a chance to kill and laugh at me. These conditions of life had been the same before, but then they were all connected, while now they had all tumbled to pieces. Only senseless things, lacking coherence, presented themselves one after another to Prince Andrew's mind. End of chapter 8《War and Peace》Book 9, Chapter 9, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Seeloff. Prince Andrew reached the general headquarters of the army at the end of June. The first army, with which was the emperor, occupied the fortified camp at Drissa. The second army was retreating, trying to effect a junction with the first one from which it was said to be cut off by large French forces. 
Everyone was dissatisfied with the general course of affairs in the Russian army, but no one anticipated any danger of invasion of the Russian provinces. And no one thought the war would extend farther than the western, the Polish provinces. Prince Andrew found Barclay de Tolly, to whom he had been assigned on the bank of the Drissa. As there was not a single town or large village in the vicinity of the camp, the immense number of generals and courtiers accompanying the army were living in the best houses of the villages on both sides of the river, over a radius of six miles. Barclay de Tolly was quartered nearly three miles from the emperor. He received Bolkonsky stiffly and coldly and told him in his foreign accent that he would mention him to the emperor for a decision as to his employment, but asked him meanwhile to remain on his staff. Anatoly Kuryagin, whom Prince Andrew had hoped to find with the army, was not there. He had gone to Petersburg, but Prince Andrew was glad to hear this. His mind was occupied by the interests of the center that was conducting a gigantic war and he was glad to be free for a while from the distraction caused by the thought of Kuryagin. During the first four days, while no duties were required of him, Prince Andrew rode round the whole fortified camp, and by the aid of his own knowledge, and by talks with experts, tried to form a definite opinion about it. But the question whether the camp was advantageous or disadvantageous remained for him undecided. Already from his military experience, and what he had seen in the Austrian campaign, he had come to the conclusion that in war the most deeply considered plans have no significance, and that all depends on the way unexpected movements of the enemy that cannot be foreseen are met, and on how and by whom the whole matter is handled. To clear up this last point for himself, Prince Andrew, utilizing his position and acquaintances, tried to fathom the character of the control of the army and of the men and parties engaged in it, and he deduced for himself the following of the state of affairs. While the emperor had still been at Vilna, the forces had been divided into three armies, first the army under Barclay de Tully, secondly the army under Bagration, and thirdly the one commanded by Tormasov. The emperor was with the first army, but not as a commander-in-chief, in the orders issued it was stated not that the emperor would take command but only that he would be with the army the emperor moreover had with him not a commander-in-chief's staff but the imperial headquarters staff in attendance on him was the head of the imperial staff quartermaster general prince volkonsky as well as generals imperial aides-de-camp diplomatic officials and a large number of foreigners but not the army staff Besides these, there were in attendance on the emperor without any definite appointments, Arakcheyev, the ex-minister of war, Count Benigsen, the senior general in rank, the Grand Duke Tsarevich Konstantin Pavlovich, Count Rumyantsev, the chancellor, Stein, a former Prussian minister, Armfeld, a Swedish general, Fuhl, the chief author of the plan of the campaign, Pellucci, and an adjutant general, and Sardinian emigre, Wolzigen, and many others. Though these men had no military appointment in the army, their positions gave them influence, and often a corps commander, or even the commander-in-chief, did not know in what capacity he was questioned by Benixen, the Grand Duke Arekcheyev, or Prince Volkonsky, or was given this or that advice, and did not know whether a certain order received in the form of advice emanated from the man who gave it, or from the emperor, and whether it had to be executed or not. But this was only the external condition. The essential significance of the presence of the emperor and all of these people, from a courtier's point of view, and in an emperor's vicinity all became courtiers, was clear to everyone. It was this. The emperor did not assume the title of commander-in-chief, but disposed of all the armies, the men around him, were his assistants. Arakcheyev was a faithful custodian to enforce order and acted as the sovereign's bodyguard. Benigsen was a landlord in the Vilna province who appeared to be doing the honors of the district, but was in reality a good general, useful as an advisor and ready at hand to replace Barclay. The Grand Duke was there because it suited him to be. The ex-minister Stein was there because his advice was useful 
and the Emperor Alexander held him in high esteem personally. Armfelt virulently hated Napoleon and was a general full of self-confidence, a quality that always influenced Alexander. Bellucci was there because he was bold and decided in speech. The adjutants general were there because they always accompanied the emperor. And lastly and chiefly, Fuel was there because he had drawn up the plan of campaign against Napoleon and, having induced Alexander to believe in the efficacy of that plan, was directing the whole business of the war. With Fuel was Wolzigen, who expressed Fuel's thoughts in a more comprehensible way than Fuel himself, who was a harsh, bookish theorist, self-confident to the point of despising everyone else, was able to do. Besides these Russians and foreigners who propounded new and unexpected ideas every day, especially the foreigners, who did so with a boldness characteristic of people employed in a country not their own, there were many secondary personages accompanying the army because their principles were there. Among the opinions and voices in this immense, restless, brilliant, and proud sphere, Prince Andrew noticed the following sharply defined subdivisions of and parties. The first party consisted of fuel and his adherents, military theorists who believed in a science of war with immutable laws, laws of oblique movements, outflankings, and so forth. Fuel and his adherents demanded a retirement into the depths of the country in accordance with precise laws defined by a pseudo-theory of war, and they saw only barbarism, ignorance, or evil intention in every deviation from that theory. To this party belonged the foreign nobles, Wolzigen, Winston Gerard, and others, chiefly Germans. The second party was directly opposed to the first, one extreme, as always happens, was met by representatives of the other. The members of this party were those who had demanded an advance from Vilna into Poland and freedom from all prearranged plans. Besides being advocates of bold action, this section also represented nationalism, which made them still more one-sided in the dispute. They were Russians, Bagration, Yermolov, who was beginning to come to the front, and others. At that time, a famous joke of Yermolov's was being circulated, that, as a great favor, he had petitioned the emperor to make him a German. The men of that party, remembering Suvorov, said that what one had to do was not to reason, or stick pins into maps, but to fight, beat the enemy, keep him out of Russia, and not let the army get discouraged. To the third party, in which the emperor had most confidence, belonged the courtiers who tried to arrange compromises between the other two. The members of this party, chiefly civilians and to whom Arakcheyev belonged, thought and said what men who have no convictions but wish to seem to have some generally say. They said that undoubtedly war, particularly against such a genius as Bonaparte, they called him Bonaparte now, needs most deeply devised plans and profound scientific knowledge, and in that respect, fuel was a genius. But at the same time, it had to be acknowledged that the theorists are often one-sided, and therefore one should not trust them absolutely, but should also listen to what fuel's opponents and practical men of experience in warfare had to say, and then choose a middle course. They insisted on the retention of the camp at Drisa, according to Fuel's plan, but on changing the movements of the other armies, though by this course neither one aim nor the other could be obtained. Yet it seemed best to the adherents of this third party. Of a fourth opinion, the most conspicuous representative was the Tsarevich, who could not forget his disillusionment at Austerlitz where he had ridden out at the head of the guards, in his cask and cavalry uniform, as to a review, expecting to crush the French gallantly, but unexpectedly finding himself in the front line, had narrowly escaped amidst the general confusion. The men of this party had both the quality and the defect of frankness in their opinions. They feared Napoleon, recognized his strength and their own weakness, and frankly said so. They said... Nothing but sorrow, shame, and ruin will come of all this. We have abandoned Vilna. 
and Vitevsk and shall abandon Drisa. The only reasonable thing left to do is to conclude peace as soon as possible, before we are turned out of Petersburg. This view was very general in the upper army circles, and found support also in Petersburg and from the Chancellor, Rumiantsev, who, for other reasons of state, was in favor of peace. The fifth party consisted of those who were adherents of Barclay de Tully, not so much as a man, but as a minister of war and commander-in-chief. Be he what he may, he always began like that, he is an honest, practical man, and we have nobody better. Give him real power, for war cannot be conducted successfully without unity of command, and he will show what he can do, as he did in Finland. If our army is well organized and strong, and has withdrawn to Drisa, without suffering any defeats, we owe this entirely to Barclay. If Barclay is now to be superseded by Benixen, all will be lost, for Benixen showed his incapacity already in 1807. The sixth party, the Benixenites, said, on the contrary, that at any rate there was no one more active and experienced than Benixen. And twist about as you may, you will have to come to Benixen eventually. Let the others make mistakes now, said they, arguing that our retirement to Drisa was a most shameful reverse and an unbroken series of blunders. The more mistakes that are made, the better. It will at any rate be understood all the sooner that things cannot go on like this. What is wanted is not some Barclay or other, but a man like Benixen, who made his mark in 1807, and to whom Napoleon himself did justice a man whose authority would be willingly recognized, and Benixen is the only such man. The seventh party consisted of the sort of people who are always to be found, especially around young sovereigns, and of whom there were particularly many round Alexander, generals and imperial aides de camp passionately devoted to the emperor, not merely as a monarch but as a man, adoring him sincerely and disinterestedly, as Rostov had done in 1805, and who saw in him not only all the virtues, but all human capabilities as well. These men, though enchanted with the sovereign for refusing the command of the army, yet blamed him for such excessive modesty, and only desired and insisted that their adored sovereign should abandon his diffidence and openly announce that he would place himself at the head of the army, gather round him a commander-in-chief staff, and consulting experienced theoreticians and practical men were necessary, would himself lead the troops, whose spirits would thereby be raised to the highest pitch. The eighth and largest group, which in its enormous numbers was to the others as ninety-nine to one, consisted of men who desired neither peace nor war, neither an advance nor a defensive camp at the Drisa or anywhere else. Neither Barclay nor the Emperor nor Pfuel nor Benixen, but only the one most essential thing, as much advantage and pleasure for themselves as possible. In the troubled waters of conflicting and intersecting intrigues that eddied about the emperor's headquarters, it was possible to succeed in many ways unthinkable at other times. A man who simply wished to retain his lucrative post would today agree with fuel, tomorrow with his opponent, and the day after, merely to avoid responsibility or to please the emperor, would declare that he had no opinion at all on the matter. Another who wished to gain some advantage would attract the emperor's attention by loudly advocating the very thing the emperor had hinted at the day before, and would dispute and shout at the council, beating his breast and challenging those who did not agree with him to duels, thereby proving that he was prepared to sacrifice himself for the common good. A third, in the absence of his opponents, between two councils, would simply solicit a special gratuity for his faithful services well knowing that at the moment people would be too busy to refuse him. A fourth, while seemingly overwhelmed with work, would often come accidentally under the emperor's eye. A fifth, to achieve his long-cherished aim of dining with the emperor, would stubbornly insist on the correctness or falsity of some newly emerging opinion, and for this object would produce arguments more or less forcible and correct. All the men of this party were fishing for rubles, decorations, and promotions, and in this pursuit watched only the weathercock of imperial favor. And directly they noticed it turning in any direction, 
this whole drone population of the army began blowing hard that way. So it was all the harder for the emperor to turn it elsewhere. Amidst the uncertainties of the position, with the menace of serious danger giving a peculiarly threatening character to everything, amid this vortex of intrigue, egotism, conflict of views and feelings, and the diversity of race among these people, this eighth and largest party of those preoccupied with personal interests imparted great confusion and obscurity to the common task. Whatever question arose, a swarm of these drones, without having finished their buzzing on a previous theme, flew over to the new one, and by their hum drowned and obscured the voices of those who were disputing honestly. From among all these parties, just at the time Prince Andrew reached the army, another, a ninth party, was being formed, and was beginning to raise its voice. This was the party of the elders, reasonable men, experienced and capable in state affairs, who, without sharing any of those conflicting opinions, were able to take a detached view of what was going on at the staff at headquarters, and to consider means of escape from this muddle, indecision, intricacy, and weakness. The men of this party said and thought that what was wrong resulted chiefly from the emperor's presence in the army with his military court and from the consequent presence there of an indefinite conditional and unsteady fluctuation of relations which is in place at court but harmful in an army that a sovereign should reign but not command the army and that the only way out of the position would be for the emperor and his court to leave the army that the mere presence of the emperor paralyzed the action of 50,000 men required to secure his personal safety, and that the worst commander-in-chief, if independent, would be better than the very best one trammeled by the presence and authority of the monarch. Just at the time Prince Andrew was living unoccupied at Drisa, Shishkov, the Secretary of State, and one of the chief representatives of this party, wrote a letter to the emperor, which Arakcheyev and Balashov agreed to sign. In this letter, availing himself of permission given him by the emperor to discuss the general course of affairs, he respectfully suggested, on the plea that it was necessary for the sovereign to arouse a warlike spirit in the people of the capital, that the emperor should leave the army. That arousing of the people by their sovereign, and his call to them to defend their country, the very incitement which was the chief cause of Russia's triumph, insofar as it was produced by the Tsar's personal presence in Moscow, was suggested to the emperor and accepted by him as a pretext for quitting the army. End of chapter 9《War and Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Ten, read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama. Chapter Ten. This letter had not yet been presented to the Emperor, when Barclay, one day at dinner, informed Bolkonsky that the sovereign wished to see him personally, to question him about Turkey, and that Prince Andrew was to present himself at Benningsen's quarters at six that evening. News was received at the Emperor's quarters that very day of a fresh movement by Napoleon which might endanger the army, news subsequently found to be false, and that morning Colonel Michaud had ridden round the Drissa fortifications with the Emperor, and had pointed out to him that this fortified camp, constructed by Pfuel, until then considered a chef d'oeuvre of tactical science which would ensure Napoleon's destruction was an absurdity, threatening the destruction of the Russian army. Prince Andrew arrived at Benningsen's quarters, a country gentleman's house of moderate size, situated on the very banks of the river. Neither Benningsen nor the emperor was there, but Chernyshov, the emperor's aide-de-camp, received Bolkonsky and informed him that the emperor, accompanied by General Benningsen and Marquis Paolucci, had gone a second time that day 
to inspect the fortifications of the Drissa camp, of the suitability of which serious doubts were beginning to be felt. Chernyshev was sitting at a window in the first room, with a French novel in his hand. This room had probably been a music room. There was still an organ in it, on which some rugs were piled, and in one corner stood the folding bedstead of Benningson's adjutant. This adjutant was also there, and sat dozing on the rolled-up bedding, evidently exhausted by work or by feasting. Two doors led from the room, one straight on into what had been the drawing-room, and another on the right to the study. Through the first door came the sound of voices, conversing in German, and occasionally in French. In that drawing-room were gathered, by the Emperor's wish, not a military council, the Emperor preferred indefiniteness, but certain persons whose opinions he wished to know, in view of the impending difficulties. It was not a council of war, but, as it were, a council to elucidate certain questions for the Emperor personally. To this semi-council had been invited the Swedish General Armfeldt, Adjutant General Wohlzogen, Winzingerode, whom Napoleon had referred to as a renegade French subject, Michaud, Toll, Count Stein, who was not a military man at all, and Pfuel himself, who, as Prince Andrew had heard, was the mainspring of the whole affair. Prince Andrew had an opportunity of getting a good look at him, for Pfuel arrived soon after himself, and, in passing through to the drawing-room, stopped a minute to speak to Chernyshov. At first sight, Pfuel, in his ill-made uniform of a Russian general, which fitted him badly like a fancy costume, seemed familiar to Prince Andrew, though he saw him now for the first time. There was about him something of Weyrother, Mack, and Schmidt, and many other German theorists, generals, whom Prince Andrew had seen in 1805, but he was more typical than any of them. Prince Andrew had never yet seen a German theorist in whom all the characteristics of those others were united to such an extent. Fuel was short and very thin, but broad boat, of coarse, robust build, broad in the hips, and with prominent shoulder blades. His face was much wrinkled, and his eyes deep set. His hair had evidently been hastily brushed smooth in front of the temples, but stuck up behind in quaint little tufts. He entered the room, looking restlessly and angrily around, as if afraid of everything in that large apartment. Awkwardly holding up his sword, he addressed Chernyshov and asked in German where the Emperor was. One could see that he wished to pass through the rooms as quickly as possible, finish with the bows and greetings, and sit down to business in front of a map where he would feel at home. He nodded hurriedly in reply to Chernyshov, and smiled ironically on hearing that the sovereign was inspecting the fortifications that he, Fuel, had planned in accord with his theory. He muttered something to himself abruptly and in a bass voice, as self-assured Germans do. It might have been, stupid fellow, or the whole affair will be ruined, or something absurd will come of it. Prince Andrew did not catch what he said, and would have passed on, but Chernyshov introduced him to Pfuel, remarking that Prince Andrew was just back from Turkey, where the war had terminated so fortunately. Pfuel barely glanced, not so much at Prince Andrew as past him, and said with a laugh, "'That must have been a fine tactical war.' and laughing contemptuously, went on into the room from which the sound of voices was heard. Fuel, always inclined to be irritably sarcastic, was particularly disturbed that day, evidently by the fact that he had dared to inspect and criticize his camp in his absence. From this short interview with Fuel, Prince Andrew, thanks to his Austerlitz experiences, was able to form a clear conception of the man. Fuel was one of those hopelessly and immutably self-confident men, self-confident to the point of martyrdom, as only Germans are, because only Germans are self-confident 
on the basis of an abstract notion, science that is, the supposed knowledge of absolute truth. A Frenchman is self-assured because he regards himself personally, both in mind and body, as irresistibly attractive to men and women. An Englishman is self-assured as being a citizen of the best organized state in the world, and therefore, as an Englishman always knows what he should do, and knows that all he does as an Englishman is undoubtedly correct. An Italian is self-assured because he is excitable and easily forgets himself and other people. A Russian is self-assured just because he knows nothing, does not want to know anything, since he does not believe that anything can be known. The German's self-assurance is worst of all, stronger and more repulsive than any other, because he imagines that he knows the truth, science, which he himself has invented, but which is for him the absolute truth. Fuel was evidently of that sort. He had a science, the theory of oblique movements deduced by him from the history of Frederick the Great's wars, and all he came across in the history of more recent warfare seemed to him absurd and barbarous, monstrous collisions in which so many blunders were committed by both sides that these wars could not be called wars, they did not accord with the theory, and therefore could not serve as material for science. In 1806, Fuel had been one of those responsible for the plan of campaign that ended in Jena and Auerstadt, but he did not see the least proof of the fallibility of his theory in the disasters of that war. On the contrary, the deviations made from his theory were, in his opinion, the sole cause of the whole disaster, and with characteristically gleeful sarcasm he would remark, There! I said the whole affair would go to the devil. Fuel was one of those theoreticians who so love their theory that they lose sight of the theory's object, its practical application. His love of theory made him hate everything practical, and he would not listen to it. He was even pleased by failures, for failures resulting from deviations in practice from the theory only proved to him the accuracy of his theory. He said a few words to Prince Andrew and Chernyshov about the present war, with the air of a man who knows beforehand that all will go wrong, and who is not displeased that it should be so. The unbrushed tufts of hair sticking up behind, and the hastily brushed hair on his temples, expressed this most eloquently. He passed into the next room, and the deep, querulous sounds of his voice were at once heard from there. End of chapter 10 Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands War and Peace, Book 9, Chapter 11 Read for LibriVox.org by Shilifa Monaghan. Prince Andrew's eyes were still following Fuel out of the room when Count Bennigsen entered hurriedly, and nodding to Bolgonsky but not pausing, went into the study, giving instructions to his adjutant as he went. The Emperor was following him, and Bennigsen had hastened on to make some preparations and to be ready to receive the sovereign. Chernyshov and Prince Andrew went out into the porch, where the Emperor, who looked fatigued, was dismounting. Marcus Palucci was talking to him with particular warmth, and the Emperor, with his head bent to the left, was listening with a dissatisfied air. The Emperor moved forward, evidently wishing to end the conversation, but the flushed and excited Italian, oblivious of decorum, followed him and continued to speak. "'And as for the man who advised forming this camp, the Drisser camp,' said Paolucci, as the Emperor mounted the steps, and noticing Prince Andrew, scanned his unfamiliar face. "'As to that person, sire,' continued Paolucci, desperately, apparently unable to restrain himself, "'the man who advised the Drisser camp, I see no alternative but the lunatic asylum or the gallows.' 
without heeding the end of the Italian's remarks, and, as though not hearing them, the emperor, recognizing Bolgonsky, addressed him graciously. "'I am very glad to see you. Go in there, where they are meeting, and wait for me.' The emperor went into the study. He was followed by Prince Peter Mikhailovich Volkonsky and Baron Stein, and the door closed behind them. Prince Andrew, taking advantage of the Emperor's permission, accompanied Paolici, whom he had known in Turkey, into the drawing-room where the council was assembled. Prince Peter Mikhailovich Volkonsky occupied the position, as it were, of chief of the Emperor's staff. He came out of the study into the drawing-room with some maps which he spread on the table, and put questions on which he wished to hear the opinion of the gentlemen present. What had happened was that news which afterwards proved to be false had been received during the night of a movement by the French to outflank the Drissa camp. The first to speak was General Armfield, who, to meet the difficulty that presented itself, unexpectedly proposed a perfectly new position away from the Petersburg and Moscow roads. The reason for this was inexplicable unless he wished to show that he, too, could have an opinion. But he urged that at this point the army should unite and there await the enemy. It was plain that Armfeld had thought out that plan long ago, and now expounded it not so much to answer the questions put, which, in fact, his plan did not answer, as to avail himself of the opportunity to air it. It was one of the millions of proposal, one as good as another, that could be made as long as it was quite unknown what character the war would take. Some disputed his arguments, others defended them. Young Count Toll objected to the Swedish general's views more warmly than anyone else, and in the course of the dispute drew from his side pocket a well-filled notebook which he asked permission to read to them. In these voluminous notes Toll suggested another scheme, totally different from Armfeld's obvious plan of campaign. In answer to Toll, Paolici suggested an advance and an attack, which, he urged, could alone extricate us from the present uncertainty and from the trap, as he called the Drissa camp, in which we were situated. During all these discussions, Fuel and his interpreter, Volzogen, his bridge in court relations, were silent. Fuel only snorted contemptuously and turned away, to show that he would never demean himself by replying to such nonsense as he was now hearing. So when Prince Volkonsky, who was in the chair, called on him to give his opinion, he merely said, "'Why ask me? General Armfels has proposed a splendid position with an exposed rear. Why not this Italian gentleman's attack, very fine, or a retreat, also good? Why ask me?' said he. "'Why, you yourself know everything better than I do.' But when Volkonsky said, with a frown, that it was in the Emperor's name that he asked his opinion, Fuel rose, and, suddenly growing animated, began to speak. "'Everything has been spoiled, everything muddled, everybody thought they knew better than I did, and now you come to me. How meant matters? There is nothing to mend. The principles laid down by me must be strictly adhered to.' said he, drumming on the table with his bony fingers. "'What is a difficulty? A nonsense! Childishness!' He went up to the map, and, speaking rapidly, began proving that no eventuality could alter the efficiency of the dresser camp, that everything had been foreseen, and that if the enemy were really going to outflank it, the enemy would inevitably be destroyed. Paolucci, who did not know German, began questioning him in French. Volzogen came to the assistance of his chief, who spoke French badly, and began translating for him, hardly able to keep pace with Fuel, who was rapidly demonstrating that not only all that had happened, but all that could happen, had been foreseen in a scheme, and that if there were now any difficulties, the whole fault lay in the fact that his plan had not been precisely executed. He kept laughing sarcastically, he demonstrated, and at last contemptuously ceased to demonstrate, like a mathematician who ceases to prove in various ways the accuracy of a problem that has already been proved. Volzogen took his place and continued to explain his views in French, every now and then turning to Fuel and saying, "'Is it not so, Your Excellency?' 
but fuel like a man heated in a fight who strikes those on his own side shouted angrily at his own supporter voltorgen well of course what more is it there to explain paolucci and michaud both attacked voltorgen simultaneously in french armfeld addressed fuel in german toll explained to volkonsky in russian prince andrew listened and observed in silence of all these men, Prince Andrew sympathized most with fuel, angry, determined, and absurdly self-confident as he was. Of all those present, evidently he alone was not seeking anything for himself, nursed no hatred against anyone, and only desired that a plan, formed on a theory arrived at by years of toil, should be carried out. He was ridiculous and unpleasantly sarcastic, but yet— he inspired involuntary respect by his boundless devotion to an idea. Besides this, three marks of all except few had one common trait that had not been noticeable at the Council of War in 1805. There was now a panic fear of Napoleon's genius, which, though concealed, was noticeable in every rejoinder. Everything was assumed to be possible for Napoleon— they expected him from every side, and invoked his terrible name to shatter each other's proposals. Fuel alone seemed to consider Napoleon a barbarian, like everyone else who opposes a theory. But besides this feeling of respect, Fuel evoked pity in Prince Andrew, from the tone in which the courtiers addressed him, and the way Paolucci had allowed himself to speak of him to the emperor— but above all, from a certain desperation of Fuel's own expressions, it was clear that the others knew, and Fuel himself felt, that his fall was at hand. And despite his self-confidence and grumpy German sarcasm, he was pitiable, with his hair smoothly brushed on the temples and sticking up in tufts behind. So he concealed the factor in a show of irritation and contempt, he was evidently in despair that the sole remaining chance of verifying his theory by a huge experiment, and proving its soundness to the whole world, was slipping away from him. The discussions continued a long time, and the longer they lasted, the more heated became the dispute, culminating in shouts and personalities, and the less was it possible to arrive at any general conclusion from all that had been said. Prince Andrew, listening to this polyglot talk, and to these surmises, plans, refutations, and shouts, felt nothing but amazement at what they were saying. A thought, that had long since and often occurred to him during his military activities, the idea that there is not and cannot be any science of war, and that therefore there can be no such thing as a military genius, now appeared to him an obvious truth. What theory and science is possible about a matter, the conditions and circumstances of which are unknown and cannot be defined, especially when the strength of the acting forces cannot be ascertained? No one was or is able to foresee in what condition our or the enemy's armies will be in a day's time, and no one can gauge the force of this or that detachment. Sometimes, when there is not a coward at the front to shout, we are cut off and start running, but a brave and jolly lad who shouts, Hurrah! A detachment of five thousand is worth thirty thousand, as at Schongraben, while at times fifty thousand run from eight thousand, as at Austerlitz. What science can there be in a matter in which, as in all practical matters, nothing can be defined and everything depends on innumerable conditions, the significance of which is determined at a particular moment which arrives no one knows when. Armfel says our army is cut in half, and Paolucci says we have got the French army between two fires. Michaud says that the worthlessness of the dresser camp lies in having the river behind it, and Phil says that is what constitutes its strength. Toll proposes one plan, Armfeld another, and they are all good and all bad, and the advantages of any suggestions can be seen only at the moment of trial. And why do they all speak of a military genius? Is a man a genius who can order bread to be brought up at the right time, and say who is to go to the right and who to the left? It is only because military men are invested with pomp and power, and crowds of sycophants flatter power, attributing to it qualities of genius it does not possess. 
the best generals I have known were, on the contrary, stupid or absent-minded men. Bagration was the best, Napoleon himself admitted that, and of Bonaparte himself, I remember his limited, self-satisfied face on the field of Austerlitz. Not only does a good army commander not need any special qualities, on the contrary, he needs the absence of the highest and best human attributes, love, poetry, tenderness, and philosophic inquiring doubt. He should be limited, firmly convinced that what he is doing is very important, otherwise he will not have sufficient patience, and only then will he be a brave leader. God forbid that he should be human, should love or pity, or think of what is just and unjust. It is understandable that the theory of their genius was invented for them long ago, because they have power. The success of a military action depends not on them, but on the man in the ranks who shouts, We are lost, or who shouts, Hurrah! And only in the ranks can one serve with assurance of being useful. So thought Prince Andrew, as he listened to the talking, and he roused himself only when Paolucci called him, and everyone was leaving. At a review next day, the Emperor asked Prince Andrew where he would like to serve, and Prince Andrew lost his standing in court circles forever, by not asking to remain attached to the sovereign's person, but for permission to serve in the army. End of chapter 11 this recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book Nine, Chapter Twelve, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. Before the beginning of the campaign, Rostov had received a letter from his parents in which they told him briefly of Natasha's illness and the breaking off of her engagement to Prince Andrew, which they explained by Natasha's having rejected him, and again asked Nicholas to retire from the army and return home. On receiving this letter, Nicholas did not even make any attempt to get leave of absence or to retire from the army, but wrote to his parents that he was sorry Natasha was ill and her engagement broken off, and that he would do all he could to meet their wishes. To Sonia, he wrote separately. Adored friend of my soul, he wrote, nothing but honour could keep me from returning to the country. But now, at the commencement of the campaign, I should feel dishonoured not only in my comrades' eyes, but in my own, if I preferred my own happiness to my love and duty to the fatherland. But this shall be our last separation. Believe me, directly the war is over, if I am still alive and still loved by you, I will throw up everything and fly to you, to press you for ever to my ardent breast. It was, in fact, only the commencement of the campaign that prevented Rostov from returning home as he had promised, and marrying Sonia. The autumn in Otradno with the hunting, and the winter with the Christmas holidays and Sonia's love, had opened out to him a vista of tranquil rural joys and peace, such as he had never known before, and which now allured him. A splendid wife, children, a good pack of hounds, a dozen leashes of smart borzois, agriculture, neighbours, service by election, thought he. But now... The campaign was beginning, and he had to remain with his regiment. And since it had to be so, Nicholas Rostov, as was natural to him, felt contented with the life he led in the regiment, and was able to find pleasure in that life. On his return from his furlough, Nicholas, having been joyfully welcomed by his comrades, was sent to obtain remounts, and brought back from the Ukraine excellent horses, which pleased him and earned him commendation from his commanders. During his absence he had been promoted captain, and when the regiment was put on war footing with an increase in numbers, he was again allotted his old squadron. The campaign began. The regiment was moved into Poland on double pay, new officers arrived, new men and horses, and above all, everybody was infected with a merrily excited mood that goes with the commencement of a war and Rostov, 
conscious of his advantageous position in the regiment, devoted himself entirely to the pleasures and interests of military service, though he knew that sooner or later he would have to relinquish them. The troops retired from Vilna for various complicated reasons of state, political and strategic. Each step of the retreat was accompanied by a complicated interplay of interests, arguments and passions at headquarters. For the Pavlograd Hussars, however, the whole of this retreat during the finest period of summer and with sufficient supplies was a very simple and agreeable business. It was only at headquarters that there was depression, uneasiness, and intriguing. In the body of the army, they did not ask themselves where they were going or why. If they regretted having to retreat, it was only because they had to leave billets they had grown accustomed to, or some pretty young Polish lady. If the thought that things looked bad chanced to enter anyone's head, he tried to be cheerful, as befits a good soldier, and not to think of the general trend of affairs, but only of the task nearest to hand. First they camped gaily before Vilna, making acquaintance with the Polish landowners, preparing for reviews, and being reviewed by the emperor and other high commanders. Then came an order to retreat to Svensiani, and destroy any provisions they could not carry away with them. Svensiani was remembered by the hussars only as the Drunken Camp, a name the whole army gave to their encampment there, and because many complaints were made against the troops, who, taking advantage of the order to collect provisions, took also horses, carriages, and carpets from the Polish proprietors. Rostov remembered Svensiani because on the first day of their arrival at that small town he changed his sergeant-major, and was unable to manage all the drunken men of the squadron who, unknown to him, had appropriated five barrels of old beer. From Svensiani they retired further and further to Drissa, and thence again beyond Drissa, drawing near to the frontier of Russia proper. On the 13th of July, the Pavlograds took part in a serious action for the first time. On the 12th of July, on the eve of that action, there was a heavy storm of rain and hail. In general, the summer of 1812 was remarkable for its storms. The two Pavlograd squadrons were bivouacking on a field of rye, which was already in air but had been completely trodden down by cattle and horses. The rain was descending in torrents, and Rostov, with a young officer named Ilyin, his protégé, was sitting in a hastily constructed shelter. An officer of their regiment, with long moustaches extending on his cheeks, who after riding to the staff had been overtaken by the rain, entered Rostov's shelter. "'I have come from the staff, Count. Have you heard of Ryevsky's exploit?' And the officer gave them details of the Sultanov battle, which he had heard at the staff. Rostov, smoking his pipe and turning his head about as the water trickled down his neck, listened inattentively, with an occasional glance at Ilyin, who was pressing close to him. This officer, a lad of sixteen who had recently joined the regiment, was now in the same relation to Nicholas that Nicholas had been to Denisov seven years before. Ilyin tried to imitate Rostov in everything, and adored him as a girl might have done. Strijinsky, the officer with the long moustache, spoke grandiloquently of the Sultanov Dam being a Russian Thermopylae, and of how a deed worthy of antiquity had been performed by General Raevsky. He recounted how Raevsky had led his two sons onto the dam under terrific fire, and had charged with them beside him. Rostov heard the story, and not only said nothing to encourage Strijinsky's enthusiasm, but on the contrary looked like a man ashamed of what he was hearing, though with no intention of contradicting it. Since the campaigns of Austerlitz and of 1807, Rostov knew by experience that men always lie when describing military exploits, as he himself had done when recounting them. Besides that, he had experience enough to know that nothing happens in war at all as we can imagine or relate it and so he did not like Strijinsky's tale, nor did he like Strijinsky himself, who, with his moustaches extending over his cheeks, bent low over the face of his hearer, as was his habit, and crowded Rostov in the narrow shanty. 
Mostov looked at him in silence. In the first place, there must have been such a confusion and crowding on the dam that was being attacked, that if Raevsky did lead his sons there, it could have had no effect except perhaps on some dozen men nearest to him, thought he. The rest could not have seen how or with whom Raevsky came on to the dam, and even those who did see it would not have been much stimulated by it. For what had they to do with Ryevsky's tender paternal feelings when their own skins were in danger? And besides, the fate of the fatherland did not depend on whether they took the Sultanov dam or not, as we are told was the case at Thermopylae. So why should he have made such a sacrifice? And why expose his own children in the battle? I would not have taken my brother Petya there, or even Ilyin, who is a stranger to me, but a nice lad but would have tried to put them somewhere under cover, Nicholas continued to think, as he listened to Stradzinski. But he did not express his thoughts, for in such matters, too, he had gained experience. He knew that this tale redounded to the glory of our arms, and so one had to pretend not to doubt it, and he acted accordingly. "'I can't stand this any more,' said Ilyin, noticing that Rostov did not relish Stradzinski's conversation. "'My stockings and shirt, and the water is running on my seat. "'I'll go and look for shelter. "'The rain seems less heavy.' "'Ilyin went out, and Stradzinski rode away. Five minutes later, Ilyin, splashing through the mud, "'came running back to the shanty. "'Hurrah! Rostov, come quick! I found it! "'About two hundred yards away, there's a tavern where ours have already gathered. "'We can at least get dry there, and Mary Hendrikovna's there.' Mary Hendrikovna was the wife of the regimental doctor, a pretty young German woman he had married in Poland. The doctor, whether from lack of means or because he did not like to part from his young wife in the early days of their marriage, took her about with him wherever the Hussar regiment went, and his jealousy had become a standing joke among the Hussar officers. Rostov threw his cloak over his shoulders, shouted to Lavrushka to follow with the things, and now slipping in the mud, now splashing right through it, set off with Ilyin in the lessening rain, and the darkness that was occasionally rent by distant lightning. Rostov, where are you? Here, what lightning? They called to one another. End of chapter 12《War and Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Thirteen, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. In the tavern before which stood the doctor's covered cart, there were already some five officers. Mary Hendrikovna, a plump little blonde German in a dressing jacket and nightcap, was sitting on a broad bench in the front corner. Her husband, the doctor, lay asleep behind her. Rostov and Ilyin, on entering the room, were welcomed with merry shouts and laughter. "'Dear me, how jolly we are!' said Rostov, laughing. "'And why do you stand there gaping? What swells they are! Why are the water streams from them? Don't make our drawing-room so wet! Don't mess Mary Hendrikovna's dress!' cried other voices. Rostov and Ilyin hastened to find a corner where they could change into dry clothes, without offending Mary Hendrikovna's modesty. They were going into a tiny recess behind a partition to change, but found it completely filled by three officers, who sat playing cards by the light of a solitary candle on an empty box, and these officers would on no account yield their position. Mary Hendrikovna obliged them with the loan of a petticoat to be used as a curtain, and behind that screen Rostov and Ilyin, helped by Lavrushka, who had brought their kits, changed their wet things for dry ones. A fire was made up in the dilapidated brick stove. A board was found, fixed on two saddles and covered with a horse cloth. A small samovar was produced, and a celeret and half a bottle of rum. And having asked Mary Hendrikovna to preside, they all crowded round her. One offered her a clean handkerchief to wipe her charming hands. Another spread a jacket under her little feet to keep them from the damp. Another hung his coat over the window to keep out the draught and yet another waved the flies off her husband's face, lest he should wake up. "'Leave him alone,' said Mary Hendrikovna, smiling timidly and happily. 
He is sleeping well as it is, after a sleepless night. Oh, no, Mary Hendrikovna, replied the officer. One must look after the doctor. Perhaps he'll take pity on me some day, when it comes to cutting off a leg or an arm for me. There were only three tumblers. The water was so muddy that one could not make out whether the tea was strong or weak, and the samovar held only six tumblers of water. But this made it all the pleasanter to take turns in order of seniority to receive one's tumbler from Mary Hendrikovna's plump little hands with their short and not over clean nails. All the officers appeared to be and really were in love with her that evening. Even those playing cards behind the partition soon left their game and came over to the samovar, yielding to the general mood of courting Mary Hendrikovna. She, seeing herself surrounded by such brilliant and polite young men, beamed with satisfaction, try as she might to hide it, and perturbed as she evidently was each time her husband moved in his sleep behind her. There was only one spoon. Sugar was more plentiful than anything else, but it took too long to dissolve. So it was decided that Mary Hendrikovna should stir the sugar for every one in turn. Rostov received his tumbler, and adding some rum to it, asked Mary Hendrikovna to stir it. "'But you take it without sugar,' she said, smiling all the time, as if everything she said and everything the others said was very amusing and had a double meaning. "'It is not the sugar I want, but only that your little hand should stir my tea.' Mary Hendrikovna assented, and began looking for the spoon, which someone, meanwhile, had pounced on. "'Use your finger, Mary Hendrikovna. It will be still nicer,' said Rostov. "'Too hot,' she replied, blushing with pleasure. Ilyin put a few drops of rum into the bucket of water and brought it to Mary Hendrikovna, asking her to stir it with her finger. "'This is my cup,' said he. "'Only dip your finger in it, and I'll drink it all up.' When they had emptied the samovar, Rostov took a pack of cards and proposed that they should play kings with Mary Hendrikovna. They drew lots to settle who should make up her set. At Rostov's suggestion, it was agreed that whoever became king should have the right to kiss Mary Hendrikovna's hand, and that the booby should go to refill and reheat the samovar for the doctor when the latter awoke. Well, but supposing Mary Hendrikovna is king, asked Ilyin. As it is, she is queen, and her word is law. They had hardly begun to play before the doctor's dishevelled head suddenly appeared from behind Mary Hendrikovna. He had been awake some time, listening to what was being said, and evidently found nothing entertaining or amusing in what was going on. His face was sad and depressed. Without greeting the officers, he scratched himself, and asked to be allowed to pass as they were blocking the way. As soon as he had left the room, all the officers burst into loud laughter, and Mary Hendrikovna blushed, till her eyes filled with tears, and thereby became still more attractive to them. Returning from the yard, the doctor told his wife, who had ceased to smile so happily, and looked at him in alarm, awaiting her sentence, that the rain had ceased, and they must go to sleep in their covered cart, or everything in it would be stolen. But I'll send an orderly, two of them, said Rostov. What an idea, doctor. I'll stand guard on it myself, said Ilyin. No, gentlemen, you have had your sleep, but I have not slept for two nights, replied the doctor, and he sat down morosely beside his wife, waiting for the game to end. Seeing his gloomy face as he frowned at his wife, the officers grew still merrier, and some of them could not refrain from laughter, for which they hurriedly sought plausible pretexts. When he had gone, taking his wife with him, and had settled down with her in their covered cart, the officers lay down in the tavern, covering themselves with their wet cloaks, but they did not sleep for a long time. Now they exchanged remarks, recalling the doctor's uneasiness and his wife's delight, now they ran out into the porch and reported what was taking place in the covered trap. Several times Rostov, covering his head, tried to go to sleep, but some remark would arouse him, and conversation would be resumed, to the accompaniment of unreasoning, merry, childlike laughter. End of chapter 13
War and Peace, Book Nine, Chapter Fourteen, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. It was nearly three o'clock, but no one was yet asleep when the quartermaster appeared with an order to move on to the little town of Ostrovna. Still laughing and talking, the officers began hurriedly getting ready, and again boiled some muddy water in the samovar. But Rostov went off to his squadron without waiting for tea. Day was breaking, the rain had ceased, and the clouds were dispersing. It felt damp and cold, especially in clothes that were still moist. As they left the tavern in the twilight of the dawn, Rostov and Ilyin both glanced under the wet and glistening leather hood of the doctor's cart, from under the apron of which his feet were sticking out, and in the middle of which his wife's nightcap was visible, and her sleepy breathing audible. "'She really is a dear little thing,' said Rostov to Ilyin, who was following him. "'A charming woman,' said Ilyin, with all the gravity of a boy of sixteen. Half an hour later, the squadron was lined up on the road. The command was heard to mount, and the soldiers crossed themselves and mounted. Rostov, riding in front, gave the order, "'Forward!' and the hussars, with clanking sabres and subdued talk, their horses' hoofs splashing in the mud, defiled in fours, and moved along the broad road planted with birch trees on each side, following the infantry and a battery that had gone on in front. Tattered, blue-purple clouds, reddening in the east, were scudding before the wind. It was growing lighter and lighter. That curly grass which always grows by country roadsides became clearly visible, still wet with the night's rain. The drooping branches of the birches, also wet, swayed in the wind and flung down bright drops of water to one side. The soldiers' faces were more and more clearly visible. Rostov, always closely followed by Ilyin, rode along the side of the road between two rows of birch trees. When campaigning, Rostov allowed himself the indulgence of riding not a regimental, but a Cossack horse. A judge of horses and a sportsman, he had lately procured himself a large, fine, mettlesome Donetsk horse, dun-coloured with light mane and tail, and when he rode it no one could out-gallop him. To ride this horse was a pleasure to him, and he thought of the horse, of the morning, of the doctor's wife, but not once of the impending danger. Formerly, when going into action, Rostov had felt afraid. Now he had not the least feeling of fear. He was fearless, not because he had grown used to being under fire, one cannot grow used to danger, but because he had learned how to manage his thoughts when in danger. He had grown accustomed, when going into action, to think about anything but what would seem most likely to interest him the impending danger. During the first period of his service, hard as he tried, and much as he reproached himself with cowardice, he had not been able to do this, but with time it had come of itself. Now he rode beside Ilyin under the birch trees, occasionally plucking leaves from a branch that met his hand, sometimes touching his horse's side with his foot, or without turning round, handing a pipe he had finished to an hussar riding behind him, with as calm and careless an air as though he were merely out for a ride. He glanced with pity at the excited face of Ilyin, who talked much and in great agitation. He knew from experience the tormenting expectation of terror and death the cornet was suffering, and knew that only time could help him. As soon as the sun appeared in a clear strip of sky beneath the clouds, the wind fell, as if it dared not spoil the beauty of the summer morning after the storm. Drops still continued to fall, but vertically now, and all was still. The whole sun appeared on the horizon and disappeared behind a long, narrow cloud that hung above it. A few minutes later it reappeared brighter still from behind the top of the cloud, tearing its edge. Everything grew bright and glittered, and with that light, and as if in reply to it, came the sound of guns ahead of them. Before Rostov had had time to consider and determine the distance of that firing, 
Count Osterman Tolstoy's adjutant, came galloping from Vitebsk with orders to advance at a trot along the road. The squadron overtook and passed the infantry and the battery, which had also quickened their pace, rode down a hill, and passing through an empty and deserted village again ascended. The horses began to lather, and the men to flush. Halt! Dress your ranks! The order of the regimental commander was heard ahead. Forward by the left! Walk! March! came the order from in front, and the hussars, passing along the line of troops on the left flank of our position, halted behind our uhlans, who were in the front line. To the right stood our infantry in a dense column. They were the reserve. Higher up the hill, on the very horizon, our guns were visible through the wonderfully clear air, brightly illuminated by slanting morning sunbeams. In front, beyond a hollow dale, could be seen the enemy's columns and guns. Our advanced line, already in action, could be heard briskly exchanging shots with the enemy in the dale. At these sounds, long unheard, Rostov's spirits rose as at the strains of the merriest music. Trap, tat, tat, tap crack the shots, now together, now several quickly, one after another. Again all was silent, and then again it sounded as if someone were walking on detonators and exploding them. The hussars remained in the same place for about an hour. A cannonade began. Count Osterman, with his suite, rode up behind the squadron, halted, spoke to the commander of the regiment, and rode up the hill to the guns. After Ostman had gone, a command rang out to the Uhlans. Form column! Prepare to charge! The infantry in front of them parted into platoons to allow the cavalry to pass. The Uhlans started, the streamers on their spears fluttering, and trotted downhill towards the French cavalry, which was seen below to the left. As soon as the Uhlans descended the hill, the hussars were ordered up the hill to support the battery. As they took the places vacated by the Uhlans, bullets came from the front, whining and whistling, but fell spent without taking effect. These sounds, which he had not heard for so long, had an even more pleasurable and exhilarating effect on Rostov than the previous sounds of firing. Drawing himself up, he viewed the field of battle opening out before him from the hill, and with his whole soul followed the movement of the Uhlans. They swooped down close to the French dragoons. Something confused happened there amid the smoke, and five minutes later our Uhlans were galloping back, not to the place they had occupied, but more to the left, and among the orange-coloured Uhlans on chestnut horses and behind them in a large group, blue French dragoons on grey horses could be seen. End of chapter 14「War and Peace」Book 9 Chapter 15 Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman Rostov, with his keen sportsman's eye, was one of the first to catch sight of these blue French dragoons pursuing our Uhlans. Nearer and nearer in disorderly crowds came the Uhlans and the French dragoons pursuing them. He could already see how these men, who looked so small at the foot of the hill, jostled and overtook one another, waving their arms and their sabres in the air. Rostov gazed at what was happening before him, as at a hunt. He felt instinctively that if the hussars struck at the French dragoons now, the latter could not withstand them. But if a charge was to be made, it must be done now, that very moment, or it would be too late. He looked round. A captain, standing beside him, was gazing like himself, with eyes fixed on the cavalry below them. Andrew Sevastyanitch, said Rostov, you know we could crush them. A fine thing too, replied the captain, and really, Rostov, without waiting to hear him out, touched his horse, galloped to the front of the squadron, and before he had time to finish giving the word of command, the whole squadron, sharing his feeling, was following him. Rostov himself did not know how or why he did it. He acted as he did when hunting, without reflecting or considering. He saw the dragoons near, and that they were galloping in disorder. He knew they could not withstand an attack, knew there was only that moment, and that if he let it slip, it would not return. The bullets were whining and whistling so stimulatingly around him, and his horse was so eager to go, that he could not restrain himself. He touched his horse, gave the word of command, and immediately 
hearing behind him the tramp of the horses of his deployed squadron, rode at full trot downhill towards the dragoons. Hardly had they reached the bottom of the hill before their pace instinctively changed to a gallop, which grew faster and faster as they drew nearer to our Rolands and the French dragoons who galloped after them. The dragoons were now close at hand. On seeing our hussars, the foremost began to turn, while those behind began to halt. With the same feeling with which he had galloped across the path of a wolf, Rostov gave rein to his donet's horse and galloped to intersect the path of the dragoons' disordered lines. One Ulan stopped, another who was on foot flung himself to the ground to avoid being knocked over, and a riderless horse fell in among the hussars. Nearly all the French dragoons were galloping back. Rostov, picking out one on a grey horse, dashed after him. On the way he came upon a bush, his gallant horse cleared it, and almost before he had righted himself in his saddle, he saw that he would immediately overtake the enemy he had selected. That Frenchman, by his uniform an officer, was going at a gallop, crouching on his grey horse, and urging it on with his sabre. In another moment Rostov's horse dashed its breast against the hindquarters of the officer's horse, almost knocking it over and at the same instant Rostov, without knowing why, raised his sabre and struck the Frenchman with it. The instant he had done this, all Rostov's animation vanished. The officer fell, not so much from the blow, which had but slightly cut his arm above the elbow, as from the shock to his horse, and from fright. Rostov reined in his horse, and his eyes sought his foe to see whom he had vanquished. The French dragoon officer was hopping with one foot on the ground, the other being caught in the stirrup. His eyes, screwed up with fear, as if he every moment expected another blow, gazed up at Rostov with shrinking terror. His pale and mud-stained face, fair and young, with a dimple in the chin and light blue eyes, was not an enemy's face at all suited to a battlefield, but a most ordinary, home-like face. Before Rostov had decided what to do with him, the officer cried, I surrender! He hurriedly, but vainly tried to get his foot out of the stirrup, and did not remove his frightened blue eyes from Rostov's face. Some hussars who galloped up disengaged his foot and helped him into the saddle. On all sides the hussars were busy with the dragoons. One was wounded, but though his face was bleeding, he would not give up his horse. Another was perched up behind an hussar, with his arms round him. A third was being helped by an hussar to mount his horse. In front the French infantry were firing as they ran. The hussars galloped hastily back with their prisoners. Rostov galloped back with the rest, aware of an unpleasant feeling of depression in his heart, something vague and confused, which he could not at all account for, had come over him with the capture of that officer, and the blow he had dealt him. Count Osterman Tolstoy met the returning hussars, sent for Rostov, thanked him, and said he would report his gallant deed to the Emperor, and would recommend him for a St. George's Cross. When sent for by Count Ostermann, Rostov, remembering that he had charged without orders, felt sure his commander was sending for him to punish him for breach of discipline. Ostermann's flattering words and promise of a reward should therefore have struck him all the more pleasantly. But he still felt that same vaguely disagreeable feeling of moral nausea. "'But what on earth is worrying me?' he asked himself as he rode back from the general. "'Ilian? No. He's safe. Have I disgraced myself in any way? No. That's not it.' Something else, resembling remorse, tormented him. "'Yes. Oh, yes. That French officer with the dimple. And I remember how my arm paused when I raised it.' Rostov saw the prisoners being led away, and galloped after them to have a look at his Frenchman with the dimple on his chin. He was sitting in his foreign uniform, on an hussar pack-horse, 
and looked anxiously about him. The sword cut on his arm could scarcely be called a wound. He glanced at Rostov with a feigned smile and waved his hand in greeting. Rostov still had the same indefinite feeling as of shame. All that day and the next, his friends and comrades noticed that Rostov, without being dull or angry, was silent, thoughtful, and preoccupied. He drank reluctantly, tried to remain alone, and kept turning something over in his mind. Rostov was always thinking about that brilliant exploit of his, which to his amazement had gained him the St. George's Cross, and even given him a reputation for bravery. And there was something he could not at all understand. So others are even more afraid than I am, he thought. So that's all there is in what is called heroism. And did I do it for my country's sake? And how was he to blame, with his dimple and blue eyes? And how frightened he was! He thought I should kill him. Why should I kill him? My hand trembled. And they have given me a St. George's Cross. I can't make it out at all. But while Nicholas was considering these questions, and still could reach no clear solution of what puzzled him so, the wheel of fortune in the service, as often happens, turned in his favour. After the affair at Dostrovna, he was brought into notice, received command of an hussar battalion, and when a brave officer was needed, he was chosen. End of chapter 15《Warrant Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Sixteen, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. On receiving news of Natasha's illness, the Countess, though not quite well yet and still weak, went to Moscow with Petya and the rest of the household, and the whole family moved from Maria Dmitrievna's house to their own and settled down in town. Natasha's illness was so serious that. Fortunately for her and for her parents, the consideration of all that had caused the illness, her conduct, and the breaking off of her engagement, receded into the background. She was so ill that it was impossible for them to consider in how far she was to blame for what had happened. She could not eat or sleep, grew visibly thinner, coughed, and as the doctors made them feel, was in danger. They could not think of anything but how to help her. Doctors came to see her singly and in consultation, talked much in French, German, and Latin, blamed one another, and prescribed a great variety of medicines for all the diseases known to them. But the simple idea never occurred to any of them that they could not know the disease Natasha was suffering from as no disease suffered by a live man can be known, for every living person has his own peculiarities, and always has his own peculiar, personal, novel, complicated disease, unknown to medicine. Not a disease of the lungs, liver, skin, heart, nerves, and so on mentioned in medical books, but a disease consisting of one of the innumerable combinations of the maladies of those organs. This simple thought could not occur to the doctors, as it cannot occur to a wizard that he is unable to work charms, because the business of their lives was to cure, and they received money for it, and had spent the best years of their lives on that business. But above all, that thought was kept out of their minds by the fact that they saw they were really useful, as in fact they were to the whole Rostov family. Their usefulness did not depend on making the patient swallow substances, for the most part harmful, 
the harm was scarcely perceptible, as they were given in small doses, but they were useful, necessary, and indispensable, because they satisfied a mental need of the invalid, and of those who loved her. And that is why there are, and always will be, pseudo-healers, wise women, homeopaths, and allopaths. They satisfied that eternal human need for hope of relief, for sympathy, and that something should be done, which is felt by those who are suffering. They satisfied the need seen in its most elementary form in a child, when it wants to have a place rubbed that has been hurt. A child knocks itself and runs at once to the arms of its mother or nurse to have the aching spot rubbed or kissed, and it feels better when this is done. The child cannot believe that the strongest and wisest of its people have no remedy for its pain, and the hope of relief and the expression of its mother's sympathy while she rubs the bump comforts it. The doctors were of use to Natasha, because they kissed and rubbed her bump, assuring her that it would soon pass if only the coachman went to the chemist's in the Arbat, and got a powder and some pills in a pretty box for a rouble and seventy kopecks, and if she took those powders in boiled water at intervals of precisely two hours, neither more nor less. What would Sonia and the Count and Countess have done? How would they have looked if nothing had been done? If there had not been those pills to give by the clock, the warm drinks, the chicken cutlets, and all the other details of life ordered by the doctors, the carrying out of which supplied an occupation and consolation to the family circle. How would the Count have borne his dearly loved daughter's illness, had he not known that it was costing him a thousand roubles, and that he would not grudge thousands more to benefit her? Or had he not known that if her illness continued, he would not grudge yet other thousands, and would take her abroad for consultations there? And had he not been able to explain the details of how Metivier and Fella had not understood the symptoms, but Freeze had, and Mudrov had diagnosed them even better? What would the Countess have done, had she not been able sometimes to scold the invalid for not strictly obeying the doctor's orders? You'll never get well like that, she would say, forgetting her grief in her vexation. If you won't obey the doctor and take your medicine at the right time, you mustn't trifle with it, you know, or it may turn to pneumonia, she would go on, deriving much comfort from the utterance of that foreign word, incomprehensible to others, as well as to herself. What would Sonia have done, without the glad consciousness that she had not undressed during the first three nights, in order to be ready to carry out all the doctor's injunctions with precision, and that she still kept awake at night so as not to miss the proper time when the slightly harmful pills in the little gilt box had to be administered. Even to Natasha herself, it was pleasant to see that so many sacrifices were being made for her sake and to know that she had to take medicine at certain hours, though she declared that no medicine would cure her, and that it was all nonsense. And it was even pleasant to be able to show, by disregarding the orders, that she did not believe in medical treatment and did not value her life. The doctor came every day, felt her pulse, looked at her tongue, and regardless of her grief-stricken face, joked with her. But when he had gone into another room, to which the countess hurriedly followed him, he assumed a grave air, and thoughtfully shaking his head, said that though there was danger, he had hopes of the effect of this last medicine, and one must wait and see, that the malady was chiefly mental, but... And the countess, trying to conceal the action from herself and from him, 
slipped a gold coin into his hand, and always returned to the patient with a more tranquil mind. The symptoms of Natasha's illness were that she ate little, slept little, coughed, and was always low-spirited. The doctors said that she could not get on without medical treatment, so they kept her in the stifling atmosphere of the town, and the Rostovs did not move to the country that summer of 1812. In spite of the many pills she swallowed, and the drops and powders out of the little bottles and boxes, of which Madame Schoss, who was fond of such things, made a large collection, and in spite of being deprived of the country life to which she was accustomed, youth prevailed. Natasha's grief began to be overlaid by the impressions of daily life. It ceased to press so painfully on her heart. It gradually faded into the past, and she began to recover physically. End of chapter 16《War and Peace》Book 9, Chapter 17 Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman Natasha was calmer, but no happier. She not merely avoided all external forms of pleasure, balls, promenades, concerts and theatres, but she never laughed without a sound of tears in her laughter. She could not sing. As soon as she began to laugh, or tried to sing by herself, tears choked her, tears of remorse, tears at the recollection of those pure times which could never return. Tears of vexation that she should so uselessly have ruined her young life, which might have been so happy. Laughter and singing, in particular, seemed to her like a blasphemy in face of her sorrow. Without any need of self-restraint, no wish to coquette ever entered her head. She said and felt at that time that no man was more to her than Nastasia Ivanovna, the buffoon, Something stood sentinel within her, and forbade her every joy. Besides, she had lost all the old interests of her carefree, girlish life that had been so full of hope. The previous autumn, the hunting, uncle, and the Christmas holidays spent with Nicholas at a Tredno were what she recalled oftenest, and most painfully. What would she not have given to bring back even a single day of that time? But it was gone forever. Her presentiment at the time had not deceived her, that that state of freedom and readiness for any enjoyment would not return again. Yet it was necessary to live on. It comforted her to reflect that she was not better, as she had formerly imagined, but worse much worse, than anybody else in the world. But this was not enough. She knew that, and asked herself, what next? But there was nothing to come. There was no joy in life. Yet life was passing. Natasha apparently tried not to be a burden or a hindrance to anyone, but wanted nothing for herself. She kept away from everyone in the house, and only felt at ease with her brother Petya. She liked to be with him better than with the others, and when alone with him she sometimes laughed. She hardly ever left the house, and of those who came to see them, was only glad to see one person, Pierre. It would have been impossible to treat her with more delicacy, greater care, and at the same time more seriously than did Count Besukov. Natasha unconsciously felt this delicacy, and so found great pleasure in his society. But she was not even grateful to him for it. Nothing good on Pierre's part seemed to her to be an effort. It seemed so natural for him to be kind to everyone, that there was no merit in his kindness. Sometimes Natasha noticed embarrassment and awkwardness on his part in her presence, 
especially when he wanted to do something to please her, or feared that something they spoke of would awaken memories distressing to her. She noticed this and attributed it to his general kindness and shyness, which she imagined must be the same towards everyone as it was to her. After those involuntary words, that if he were free, he would have asked on his knees for her hand and her love, uttered at a moment when she was so strongly agitated, Pierre never spoke to Natasha of his feelings, and it seemed plain to her that those words, which had then so comforted her, were spoken as all sorts of meaningless words are spoken to comfort a crying child. It was not because Pierre was a married man, but because Natasha very strongly felt with him that moral barrier, the absence of which she had experienced with Koryagin, that it never entered her head that the relations between him and herself could lead to love on her part, still less on his, or even to the kind of tender, self-conscious, romantic friendship between a man and a woman of which she had known several instances. Before the end of the fast of St. Peter, Agrafena Ivanovna Belova, a country neighbour of the Rostovs, came to Moscow to pay her devotions at the shrines of the Moscow saints. She suggested that Natasha should fast and prepare for Holy Communion, and Natasha gladly welcomed the idea. Despite the doctor's orders that she should not go out early in the morning, Natasha insisted on fasting and preparing for the sacrament, not as they generally prepared for it in the Rostov family by attending three services in their own house, but as Agrafena Ivanovna did, by going to church every day for a week and not once missing vespers, matins or mass. The countess was pleased with Natasha's zeal. After the poor results of the medical treatment, in the depths of her heart, she hoped that prayer might help her daughter more than medicines, and, though not without fear, and concealing it from the doctor, she agreed to Natasha's wish, and entrusted her to Belova. Agrafena Ivanovna used to come to wake Natasha at three in the morning, but generally found her already awake. She was afraid of being late for matins. Hastily washing and meekly putting on her shabbiest dress and an old mantilla, Natasha, shivering in the fresh air, went out into the deserted streets lit by the clear light of dawn. By Agrafena Ivanovna's advice, Natasha prepared herself, not in their own parish, but at a church where, according to the devout Agrafena Ivanovna, the priest was a man of very severe and lofty life. There were never many people in the church. Natasha always stood beside Belova in the customary place before an icon of the Blessed Virgin, let into the screen before the choir on the left side, and a feeling, new to her, of humility before something great and incomprehensible, seized her when at that unusual morning hour, gazing at the dark face of the Virgin, illuminated by the candles burning before it, and by the morning light falling from the window, she listened to the words of the service, which she tried to follow with understanding. When she understood them, her personal feeling became interwoven in the prayers with shades of its own. When she did not understand, it was sweeter still to think that the wish to understand everything is pride, that it is impossible to understand all, that it is only necessary to believe and to commit oneself to God, whom she felt guiding her soul at those moments. She crossed herself, bowed low, and when she did not understand, in horror at her own vileness, simply asked God to forgive her everything, everything, and to have mercy upon her. The prayers to which she surrendered herself most of all were those of repentance, on her way home at an early hour, when she met no one but bricklayers going to work, or men sweeping the street, and everybody within the houses was still asleep, Natasha experienced a feeling new to her, a sense 
of the possibility of correcting her faults, the possibility of a new, clean life, and of happiness. During the whole week she spent in this way, that feeling grew every day, and the happiness of taking communion, or communing, as Agrafina Ivanovna, joyously playing with the word, called it, seemed to Natasha so great that she felt she should never live till that blessed Sunday. But the happy day came, and on that memorable Sunday, when dressed in white muslin, she returned home after communion. For the first time for many months she felt calm, and not oppressed by the thought of the life that lay before her. The doctor who came to see her that day ordered her to continue the powders he had prescribed a fortnight previously. "'She must certainly go on taking them, morning and evening,' said he, evidently sincerely satisfied with his success. "'Only, please be particular about it.' "'Be quite easy,' he continued playfully, as he adroitly took the gold coin in his palm. "'She will soon be singing and frolicking about.' The last medicine has done her a very great deal of good. She has freshened up very much. The Countess, with a cheerful expression on her face, looked down at her nails and spat a little for luck as she returned to the drawing room. End of chapter 17《War and Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Eighteen, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. At the beginning of July, more and more disquieting reports about the war began to spread in Moscow. People spoke of an appeal by the emperor to the people, and of his coming himself from the army to Moscow. And as up to the eleventh of July, no manifesto or appeal had been received exaggerated reports became current about them, and about the position of Russia. It was said that the emperor was leaving the army, because it was in danger. It was said that Smolensk had surrendered, that Napoleon had an army of a million, and only a miracle could save Russia. On the 11th of July, which was Saturday, the manifesto was received, but was not yet in print, and Pierre, who was at the Rostovs, promised to come to dinner next day, Sunday, and bring a copy of the manifesto and appeal, which he would obtain from Count Rostopchin. That Sunday the Rostovs went to Mass at the Rosimovsky's private chapel as usual. It was a hot July day. Even at ten o'clock, when the Rostovs got out of their carriage at the chapel, the sultry air, the shouts of hawkers, the light and gay summer clothes of the crowd, the dusty leaves of the trees on the boulevard, the sounds of the band, and the white trousers of a battalion marching to parade, the rattling of wheels on the cobblestones, and the brilliant, hot sunshine, were all full of that summer languor, that content and discontent with the present, which is most strongly felt on a bright hot day in town. All the Moscow notabilities, all the Rostov's acquaintances, were at the Rosimovsky's chapel, for as if expecting something to happen, many wealthy families who usually left town for their country estates had not gone away that summer. As Natasha, at her mother's side, passed through the crowd behind a liveried footman who cleared the way for them, she heard a young man speaking about her in too loud a whisper, "'That's Rostova, the one who... "'She's much thinner, but all the same she's pretty.' She heard or thought she heard, the names of Koryagin and Bolkonsky. But she was always imagining that. It always seemed to her that everyone who looked at her was thinking only of what had happened to her. With a sinking heart, wretched as she always was now when she found herself in a crowd, Natasha, in her lilac silk dress trimmed with black lace, walked, as women can walk, with the more repose and stateliness, the greater the pain and shame in her soul. She knew for certain that she was pretty, but this no longer gave her satisfaction as it used to. 
On the contrary, it had tormented her more than anything else of late, and particularly so on this bright, hot, summer day in town. It's Sunday again, another week past, she thought, recalling that she had been here the Sunday before, and always the same life that is no life, and the same surroundings in which it used to be so easy to live. I'm pretty, I'm young, and I know that now I am good. I used to be bad, but now I know I am good, she thought, but yet my best years are slipping by and are no good to any one. She stood by her mother's side and exchanged nods with acquaintances near her. From habit she scrutinised the ladies' dresses, condemned the bearing of a lady standing close by, who was not crossing herself properly, but in a cramped manner. And again she thought with vexation that she was herself being judged, and was judging others. And suddenly, at the sound of the service, she felt horrified at her own vileness, horrified that the former purity of her soul was again lost to her. A comely, fresh-looking old man was conducting the service with that mild solemnity which has so elevating and soothing an effect on the souls of the worshippers. The gates of the sanctuary screen were closed, the curtain was slowly drawn, and from behind it a soft, mysterious voice pronounced some words. Tears the cause of which she herself did not understand, made Natasha's breast heave, and a joyous but oppressive feeling agitated her. Teach me what I should do, how to live my life, how I may grow good for ever, for ever, she pleaded. The deacon came out onto the raised space before the altar screen, and holding his thumb extended, drew his long hair from under his dalmatic and making the sign of the cross on his breast, began in a loud and solemn voice to recite the words of the prayer, In peace, let us pray unto the Lord. As one community, without distinction of class, without enmity, united by brotherly love, let us pray, thought Natasha, for the peace that is from above and for the salvation of our souls, for the world of angels and all the spirits who dwell above us, prayed Natasha. When they prayed for the warriors, she thought of her brother and Denisov. When they prayed for all travelling by land and sea, she remembered Prince Andrew, prayed for him, and asked God to forgive her all the wrong she had done him. When they prayed for those who love us, she prayed for the members of her own family, her father and mother and Sonia, realising for the first time how wrongly she had acted towards them, and feeling all the strength of her love for them. When they prayed for those who hate us, she tried to think of her enemies and people who hated her in order to pray for them. She included among her enemies the creditors and all who had business dealings with her father, and always at the thought of enemies and those who hated her, she remembered Anatole, who had done her so much harm. And though he did not hate her, she gladly prayed for him as for an enemy. Only at prayer did she feel able to think clearly and calmly of Prince Andrew and Anatole, as men for whom her feelings were as nothing compared with her awe and devotion to God. When they prayed for the imperial family and the synod, she bowed very low and made the sign of the cross, saying to herself that even if she did not understand, still she could not doubt and at any rate loved the governing synod and prayed for it. When he had finished the litany, the deacon crossed the stole over his breast and said, Let us commit ourselves and our whole lives to Christ the Lord. Commit ourselves to God, Natasha inwardly repeated. Lord God, I submit myself to thy will, she thought. 
I want nothing, wish for nothing. Teach me what to do and how to use my will. Take me, take me, prayed Natasha with impatient emotion in her heart not crossing herself, but letting her slender arms hang down, as if expecting some invisible power at any moment to take her and deliver her from herself, from her regrets, desires, remorse, hopes, and sins. The countess looked round several times at her daughter's softened face and shining eyes, and prayed God to help her. Unexpectedly, in the middle of the service, and not in the usual order Natasha knew so well, the deacon brought out a small stool, the one he knelt on when praying on Trinity Sunday, and placed it before the doors of the sanctuary screen. The priest came out, with his purple velvet beretta on his head, adjusted his hair, and knelt down with an effort. Everybody followed his example, and looked at one another in surprise. Then came the prayer just received from the Synod, a prayer for the deliverance of Russia from hostile invasion. Lord God of might, God of our salvation, began the priest in that voice, clear, not grand eloquent, but mild, in which only the Slav clergy read, and which acts so irresistibly on a Russian heart. Lord God of might, God of our salvation, look this day in mercy and blessing on thy humble people, and graciously hear us, spare us, and have mercy upon us. This for confounding thy land, desiring to lay waste the whole world, rises against us. These lawless men are gathered together to overthrow thy kingdom, to destroy thy dear Jerusalem thy beloved Russia, to defile thy temples, to overthrow thine altars, and to desecrate our holy shrines. How long, O Lord, how long shall the wicked triumph, how long shall they wield unlawful power? Lord God, hear us when we pray to thee. Strengthen with thy might our most gracious sovereign Lord, the Emperor Alexander Pavlovich, be mindful of his uprightness and meekness. Reward him according to his righteousness, and let it preserve us, thy chosen Israel. Bless his counsels, his undertakings, and his work. Strengthen his kingdom by thine almighty hand, and give him victory over his enemy. Even as thou gavest Moses the victory over Amalek, Gideon over Midian, and David over Goliath. Preserve his army, put a bow of brass in the hands of those who have armed themselves in thy name, and gird their loins with strength for the fight. Take up the spear and shield, and arise to help us. Confound and put to shame those who have desired evil against us, May they be before the faces of thy faithful warriors as dust before the wind. And may thy mighty angel confound them and put them to flight. May they be ensnared when they know it not. And may the plots they have laid in secret be turned against them. Let them fall before thy servants' feet and be laid low by our hosts. Lord, Thou art able to save both great and small. Thou art God, and man cannot prevail against thee. God of our fathers, remember thy bounteous mercy and loving kindness, which are from of old. Turn not thy face from us, but be gracious to our unworthiness, and in thy great goodness and thy many mercies, Regard not our transgressions and iniquities. Create in us a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within us. Strengthen us all in thy faith. Fortify our hope. Inspire us with true love, one for another. Arm us with unity of spirit 
in the righteous defence of the heritage thou gavest to us and to our fathers, and let not the sceptre of the wicked be exalted against the destiny of those thou hast sanctified. O Lord our God, in whom we believe and in whom we put our trust, let us not be confounded in our hope of thy mercy, and give us a token of thy blessing, that those who hate us and our orthodox faith may see it, and be put to shame and perish, and may all the nations know that thou art the Lord, and we are thy people. Show thy mercy upon us this day, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Make the hearts of thy servants to rejoice in thy mercy. Smite down our enemies, and destroy them swiftly beneath the feet of thy faithful servants. For thou art the defence, the succour, and the victory of them that put their trust in thee. And to thee be all glory, to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, now and for ever, world without end. Amen. In Natasha's receptive condition of soul, this prayer affected her strongly. She listened to every word about the victory of Moses over Amalek, of Gideon over Midian, and of David over Goliath, and about the destruction of thy Jerusalem. And she prayed to God with the tenderness and emotion with which her heart was overflowing, but without fully understanding what she was asking of God in that prayer. She shared with all her heart in the prayer for the spirit of righteousness, for the strengthening of the heart by faith and hope, and its animation by love. But she could not pray that her enemies might be trampled underfoot, when but a few minutes before she had been wishing she had more of them that she might pray for them. But neither could she doubt the righteousness of the prayer that was being read on bended knees. She felt in her heart a devout and tremulous awe at the thought of the punishment that overtakes men for their sins, and especially of her own sins. And she prayed to God to forgive them all, and her too, and to give them all, and her too, peace and happiness and it seemed to her that God heard her prayer. End of chapter 18《War and Peace》Book 9, Chapter 19 Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman From the day when Pierre after leaving the Rostovs with Natasha's grateful look fresh in his mind, had gazed at the comet that seemed to be fixed in the sky, and felt that something new was appearing on his own horizon. From that day the problem of the vanity and uselessness of all earthly things that had incessantly tormented him no longer presented itself. That terrible question, why, wherefore, which had come to him amid every occupation, was now replaced, not by another question, or by a reply to the former question, but by her image. When he listened to, or himself took part in, trivial conversations, when he read or heard of human baseness or folly, he was not horrified as formerly, and did not ask himself why men struggled so about these things, when all is so transient and incomprehensible. But he remembered her as he had last seen her, and all his doubts vanished. Not because she had answered the questions that had haunted him, but because his conception of her transferred him instantly to another, a brighter realm of spiritual activity in which no one could be justified or guilty, a realm of beauty and love which it was worth living for. Whatever worldly baseness presented itself to him, he said to himself, Well, supposing N.N. has swindled the country and the Tsar, and the country and the Tsar confer honours upon him, 
What does that matter? She smiled at me yesterday, and asked me to come again, and I love her, and no one will ever know it. And his soul felt calm and peaceful. Pierre still went into society, drank as much, and led the same idle and dissipated life, because besides the hours he spent at the Rostovs, there were other hours he had to spend somehow, and the habits and acquaintances he had made in Moscow formed a current that bore him along irresistibly. But latterly, when more and more disquieting reports came from the seat of war, and Natasha's health began to improve, and she no longer aroused in him the former feeling of careful pity, an ever-increasing restlessness, which he could not explain, took possession of him. He felt that the condition he was in could not continue long, that a catastrophe was coming which would change his whole life, and he impatiently sought everywhere for signs of that approaching catastrophe. One of his brother Masons had revealed to Pierre the following prophecy concerning Napoleon, drawn from the revelation of St. John. In chapter 13, verse 18 of the Apocalypse, it is said, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. And in the fifth verse of the same chapter, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. The French alphabet, written out with the same numerical values as the Hebrew, in which the first nine letters denote units, and the others tens, will have the following significance. A1, B2, C3, D4, E5, F6, G7, H8, I9, K10, L20, M30, N40, O50, P60, Q70, R80, S90, T100, U110, V120, W one hundred and thirty, X one hundred and forty, Y one hundred and fifty, Z one hundred and sixty. Writing the words L'Empereur Napoleon in numbers, it appears that the sum of them is six hundred and sixty six, and that Napoleon was therefore the beast foretold in the Apocalypse. Moreover, by applying the same system to the words Calendar forty two, which was the term allowed to the beast that spoke great things and blasphemies, the same number, 666, was obtained, from which it followed that the limit fixed for Napoleon's power had come in the year 1812, when the French emperor was 42. This prophecy pleased Pierre very much, and he often asked himself, what would put an end to the power of the beast, that is, of Napoleon, and tried by the same system of using letters as numbers and adding them up to find an answer to the question that engrossed him. He wrote the words L'Empereur Alexandre, La Nation Rousse, and added up their numbers, but the sums were either more or less than 666. Once, when making such calculations, he wrote down his own name in French, Comte Pierre Bezuhov, but the sum of the numbers did not come right. Then he changed the spelling, substituting a Z for the S, and adding de and the article le, still without obtaining the desired result. Then it occurred to him that if the answer to the question were contained in his name, his nationality would also be given in the answer. So he wrote, Le Russe Bezuhov, and adding up the numbers, got 671. This was only five too much, and five was represented by E, the very letter alighted from the article le, before the word emperor. By omitting the E, though incorrectly, Pierre got the answer he sought, L apostrophe Russe Bezuhov 
made 666. This discovery excited him. How, or by what means, he was connected with the great event foretold in the apocalypse, he did not know, but he did not doubt that connection for a moment. His love for Natasha, Antichrist, Napoleon, the invasion, the comet, 666, L'Empereur Napoleon, and L. Rusbezuhov, all this had to mature and culminate, to lift him out of that spellbound, petty sphere of Moscow habits in which he felt himself held captive, and lead him to a great achievement and great happiness. On the eve of the Sunday when the special prayer was read, Pierre had promised the Rostovs to bring them, from Count Rostopchin, whom he knew well, both the appeal to the people and the latest news from the army. In the morning, when he went to call at Rostopchin's, he met there a courier, fresh from the army, an acquaintance of his own, who often danced at Moscow balls. "'Do please, for heaven's sake, relieve me of something,' said the courier. "'I have a sackful of letters to parents.' Among these letters was one from Nicholas Rostov to his father. Pierre took that letter, and Rostopchin also gave him the Emperor's appeal to Moscow, which had just been printed, the last army orders, and his own most recent bulletin. Glancing through the army orders, Pierre found in one of them, in the lists of killed, wounded, and rewarded, the name of Nicholas Rostov, awarded a St. George's Cross of the fourth class for courage shown in the Ostrovna affair, and in the same order the name of Prince Andrew Bolkonsky, appointed to the command of a regiment of chasseurs. Though he did not want to remind the Rostovs of Bolkonsky, Pierre could not refrain from making them happy by the news of their sons having received a decoration. So he sent that printed army order, and Nicholas's letter to the Rostovs, keeping the appeal, the bulletin, and the other orders, to take with him when he went to dinner. His conversation with Count Rostopchin, and the latter's tone of anxious hurry, the meeting with the courier who talked casually of how badly things were going in the army, the rumours of the discovery of spies in Moscow, and of a leaflet in circulation stating that Napoleon promised to be in both the Russian capitals by the autumn, and the talk of the emperors being expected to arrive next day, all aroused with fresh force that feeling of agitation and expectation in Pierre, which he had been conscious of ever since the appearance of the comet, and especially since the beginning of the war. He had long been thinking of entering the army, and would have done so had he not been hindered, first by his membership of the Society of Freemasons, to which he was bound by oath, and which preached perpetual peace and the abolition of war, and secondly, by the fact that when he saw the great mass of Moscovites who had donned uniform, and were talking patriotism, he somehow felt ashamed to take the step. But the chief reason for not carrying out his intention to enter the army lay in the vague idea that he was L. Rusbezuhov, who had the number of the beast, 666, that his part in the great affair of setting a limit to the power of the beast that spoke great and blasphemous things had been predestined from eternity, and that therefore he ought not to undertake anything, but wait for what was bound to come to pass. End of chapter 19《War and Peace》Book Nine, Chapter Twenty, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. A few intimate friends were dining with the Rostovs that day, as usual on Sundays. Pierre came early so as to find them alone. He had grown so stout this year that he would have been abnormal had he not been so tall, so broad of limb, and so strong that he carried his bulk with evident ease. He went up the stairs puffing and muttering something. His coachman did not even ask whether he was to wait. He knew that when his master was at the Rostovs, he stayed till midnight. 
the Rostov's footman rushed eagerly forward to help him off with his cloak and take his hat and stick. Pierre, from club habit, always left both hat and stick in the ante-room. The first person he saw in the house was Natasha. Even before he saw her, while taking off his cloak, he heard her. She was practising far exercises in the music-room. He knew that she had not sung since her illness, and so the sound of her voice surprised and delighted him. He opened the door softly and saw her, in the lilac dress she had worn at church, walking about the room singing. She had her back to him when he opened the door, but when, turning quickly, she saw his broad, surprised face, she blushed and came rapidly up to him. "'I want to try to sing again,' she said, adding, as if by way of excuse, "'it is at least something to do. That's capital. How glad I am you've come. I am so happy to-day,' she said with the old animation Pierre had not seen in her for a long time. "'You know Nicholas has received a St. George's Cross. I am so proud of him.' "'Oh, yes, I sent that announcement. But I don't want to interrupt you.' he added, and was about to go to the drawing-room. Natasha stopped him. "'Count, is it wrong of me to sing?' she said, blushing, and fixing her eyes inquiringly on him. "'No! Why should it be?' "'On the contrary. But why do you ask me?' "'I don't know myself,' Natasha answered quickly. "'But I should not like to do anything you disapproved of. I believe in you completely. You don't know how important you are to me, how much you've done for me.' She spoke rapidly, and did not notice how Pierre flushed at her words. "'I saw in that same army order that he, Bolkonsky,' she whispered the name hastily, "'is in Russia, and in the army again. What do you think?' She was speaking hurriedly, evidently afraid her strength might fail her. "'Will he ever forgive me? Will he not always have a bitter feeling towards me? What do you think? What do you think?' "'I think,' Pierre replied, "'that he has nothing to forgive. If I were in his place—' By association of ideas, Pierre was at once carried back to the day when, trying to comfort her, he had said that if he were not himself, but the best man in the world, and free, he would ask on his knees for her hand, and the same feeling of pity, tenderness, and love took possession of him, and the same words rose to his lips. But she did not give him time to say them, "'Yes, you, you!' she said, uttering the word you rapturously. That's a different thing. I know no one kinder, more generous, or better than you. Nobody could be. Had you not been there then, and now too, I don't know what would have become of me, because... Tears suddenly rose in her eyes. She turned away, lifted her music before her eyes, began singing again, and again began walking up and down the room. Just then Petya came running in from the drawing-room. Petya was now a handsome rosy lad of fifteen, with full red lips, and resembled Natasha. He was preparing to enter the university, but he and his friend Obolensky had lately, in secret, agreed to join the hussars. Petya had come rushing out to talk to his namesake about this affair. He had asked Pierre to find out whether he would be accepted in the hussars. Pierre walked up and down the drawing-room, not listening to what Petya was saying. Petya pulled him by the arm to attract his attention. "'Well, what about my plan? Peter Kirillich, for heaven's sake, you are my only hope,' said Petya. "'Oh, yes, your plan. Uh, to join the hussars, I'll mention it. I'll bring it all up to-day.' "'Well, mon cher, have you got the manifesto?' asked the old count. "'The countess has been to mass at the Rosimovskys and heard the new prayer. She says it's very fine.' "'Yes, I've got it,' said Pierre. "'The emperor is to be here to-morrow. "'There's to be an extraordinary meeting of the nobility, "'and they are talking of a levy of ten men per thousand. "'Oh, yes, let me congratulate you. "'Yes, yes, thank God. "'Well, and what news from the army?' "'We are again retreating. "'They say we're already near Smolensk,' replied Pierre. "'Oh, Lord! Oh, Lord!' exclaimed the count. "'Where is the manifesto? "'The emperor's appeal? Oh, yes!' Pierre began feeling in his pockets for the papers, but could not find them. Still slapping his pockets, he kissed the hand of the countess who entered the room, and glanced uneasily around, evidently expecting Natasha, who had left off singing, 
but had not yet come into the drawing-room. "'On my word, I don't know what I've done with it,' he said. "'There he is, always losing everything,' remarked the Countess. Natasha entered with a softened and agitated expression of face, and sat down looking silently at Pierre. As soon as she entered, Pierre's features, which had been gloomy, suddenly lighted up, and while still searching for the papers, he glanced at her several times. "'No, really, I'll drive home. I must have left them there. I'll certainly—but you'll be late for dinner. Oh, and my coachman has gone.' But Sonia, who had gone to look for the papers in the anteroom, had found them in Pierre's hat, where he had carefully tucked them under the lining. Pierre was about to begin reading. "'No, after dinner.' said the old count, evidently expecting much enjoyment from that reading. At dinner, at which champagne was drunk to the health of the new chevalier of St. George, Shinshin told them the town news, of the illness of the old Georgian princess, of Metivier's disappearance from Moscow, and of how some German fellow had been brought to Rostopchin and accused of being a French spire. So Count Rostopchin had told the story, and how Rostopchin let him go, and assured the people that he was not a spire at all, but only an old German ruin. "'People are being arrested,' said the Count. "'I have told the Countess she should not speak French so much. It's not the time for it now. "'And have you heard?' Shinshin asked. "'Prince Galitsin has engaged a master to teach him Russian. It is becoming dangerous to speak French in the streets.' And how about you, Count Peter Kirilich? If they call up the militia, you too will have to mount a horse, remarked the old count, addressing Pierre. Pierre had been silent and preoccupied all through dinner, seeming not to grasp what was said. He looked at the count. Oh, yes, the war, he said. No, what sort of a warrior should I make? And yet everything is so strange, so strange. I can't make it out. I don't know. I am very far from having military tastes. But in these times, no one can answer for himself. After dinner, the Count settled himself comfortably in an easy chair, and with a serious face, asked Sonia, who was considered an excellent reader, to read the appeal. To Moscow, our ancient capital. The enemy has entered the borders of Russia with immense forces. He comes to despoil our beloved country, Sonia read painstakingly, in her high-pitched voice. The Count listened with closed eyes, heaving abrupt sighs at certain passages. Natasha sat erect, gazing with a searching look now at her father, and now at Pierre. Pierre felt her eyes on him, and tried not to look round. The Countess shook her head disapprovingly and angrily at every solemn expression in the manifesto. In all these words she saw only that the danger threatening her son would not soon be over. Shinshin, with a sarcastic smile on his lips, was evidently preparing to make fun of anything that gave him the opportunity. Sonia's reading, any remark of the Count's, or even the manifesto itself, should no better pretext present itself. After reading about the dangers that threatened Russia, the hopes the emperor placed on Moscow, and especially on its illustrious nobility, Sonia, with a quiver in her voice, due chiefly to the attention that was being paid to her, read the last words, We ourselves will not delay to appear among our people in that capital, and in other parts of our realm for consultation, and for the direction of all ourselves, both those now barring the enemy's path, and those freshly formed to defeat him wherever he may appear. May the ruin he hopes to bring upon us recoil on his own head, and may Europe, delivered from bondage, glorify the name of Russia. Yes, that's it, cried the Count, opening his moist eyes and sniffing repeatedly, as if a strong vinaigrette had been held to his nose. And he added, Let the Emperor but say the word, and we'll sacrifice everything, and begrudge nothing. Before Shinshin had time to utter the joke he was ready to make on the Count's patriotism, Natasha jumped up from her place and ran to her father. "'What a darling our papa is!' she cried, kissing him, and she again looked at Pierre, with the unconscious coquetry that had returned to her with her better spirits. "'There! Here's a patriot for you!' said Shinshin. "'Not a patriot at all, but simply,' Natasha replied in an injured tone. "'Everything seems funny to you, but this isn't at all a joke.' "'A joke, indeed,' put in the Count. 
Let him but say the word, and we'll all go. We're not Germans. But did you notice it says, For consultation, said Pierre. Never mind what it's for. At this moment Petya, to whom nobody was paying any attention, came up to his father with a very flushed face, and said in his breaking voice that was now deep and now shrill, "'Well, Papa, I tell you definitely, and Mamma too, it's as you please, but I say definitely, that you must let me enter the army, because I can't, that is all.' The Countess, in dismay, looked up to heaven, clasped her hands, and turned angrily to her husband. "'That comes of your talking,' said she. But the Count had already recovered from his excitement. "'Come, come,' said he. "'Here's a fine warrior. No, nonsense. You must study.' "'It's not nonsense, Papa. Fedya Obolensky is younger than I, and he's going too. Besides, all the same, I can't study now when—' Petya stopped short, flushed till he perspired, but still got out the words, "'When our fatherland is in danger.' "'That'll do, that'll do. Nonsense.' "'But you said yourself that we would sacrifice everything.' "'Petya, be quiet, I tell you.' cried the Count, with a glance at his wife, who had turned pale and was staring fixedly at her son. "'And I tell you, Peter Kirillich here will also tell you.' "'Nonsense, I tell you. Your mother's milk has hardly dried on your lips, and you want to go into the army. There, there, I tell you.' And the Count moved to go out of the room, taking the papers, probably to re-read them in his study before having a nap. "'Well, Peter Kirillich, let's go and have a smoke,' he said. Pierre was agitated and undecided. Natasha's unwontedly brilliant eyes, continually glancing at him with a more than cordial look, had reduced him to this condition. No, I think I'll go home. Home? Why, you meant to spend the evening with us. You don't often come nowadays as it is. And this girl of mine, said the Count good-naturedly, pointing to Natasha, only brightens up when you're here. Yes, I had forgotten. I really must go home. Business, said Pierre hurriedly. Well then, au revoir, said the Count, and went out of the room. Why are you going? Why are you upset? asked Natasha, and she looked challengingly into Pierre's eyes. Because I love you, was what he wanted to say. But he did not say it, and only blushed till the tears came, and lowered his eyes. Because it is better for me to come less often. Because... No, simply, I have business. Why? No, tell me. Natasha began resolutely, and suddenly stopped. They looked at each other with dismayed and embarrassed faces. He tried to smile, but could not. His smile expressed suffering, and he silently kissed her hand and went out. Pierre made up his mind not to go to the Rostovs any more. End of chapter 20 War and Peace, Book 9, Chapter 21 Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman After the definite refusal he had received, Petya went to his room, and there locked himself in and wept bitterly. When he came in to tea, silent, morose, and with tear-stained face, everybody pretended not to notice anything. Next day the Emperor arrived in Moscow, and several of the Rostovs' domestic serfs begged permission to go to have a look at him. That morning Petya was a long time dressing and arranging his hair and collar to look like a grown-up man. He frowned before his looking-glass, gesticulated, shrugged his shoulders, and finally, without saying a word to anyone, took his cap and left the house by the back door, trying to avoid notice. Petya had decided to go straight to where the Emperor was, and to explain frankly to some gentleman in waiting, imagine the Emperor to be always surrounded by gentlemen in waiting, that he, Count Rostov, in spite of his youth, wished to serve his country, that youth could be no hindrance to loyalty, and that he was ready to... While dressing, Petya had prepared many fine things he meant to say to the gentleman-in-waiting. It was on the very fact of being so young 
that Petia accounted for success in reaching the emperor. He even thought how surprised everyone would be at his youthfulness. And yet in the arrangement of his collar and hair, and by his sedate deliberate walk, he wished to appear a grown-up man. But the further he went, and the more his attention was diverted by the ever-increasing crowds moving towards the Kremlin, the less he remembered to walk with the sedateness and deliberation of a man. As he approached the Kremlin, he even began to avoid being crushed, and resolutely stuck out his elbows in a menacing way. But within the Trinity Gateway, he was so pressed to the wall by people who probably were unaware of the patriotic intentions with which he had come, that in spite of all his determination, he had to give in, and stop while carriages passed in, rumbling beneath the archway. Beside Petya stood a peasant woman, a footman, two tradesmen, and a discharged soldier. After standing some time in the gateway, Petya tried to move forward in front of the others without waiting for all the carriages to pass, and he began resolutely working his way with his elbows. But the woman just in front of him, who was the first against whom he directed his efforts, angrily shouted at him, "'What are you shoving for, young Lord Ling? Don't you see we're all standing still? Then why push?' "'Anybody can shove,' said the footman, and also began working his elbows, to such effect that he pushed Petya into a very filthy corner of the gateway. Petya wiped his perspiring face with his hands, and pulled up the damp collar which he had arranged so well at home to seem like a man's. He felt that he no longer looked presentable, and feared that if he presented himself to the gentleman in waiting in that plight, he would not be admitted to the emperor. But it was impossible to smarten oneself up, or move to another place, because of the crowd. One of the generals who drove past was an acquaintance of the Rostovs, and Petya thought of asking his help, but came to the conclusion that that would not be a manly thing to do. When the carriages had all passed in, the crowd, carrying Petya with it, streamed forward into the Kremlin Square, which was already full of people. There were people not only in the square, but everywhere, on the slopes and on the roofs. As soon as Petya found himself in the square, he clearly heard the sound of the bells and the joyous voices of the crowd that filled the whole Kremlin. For a while, the crowd was less dense, but suddenly all heads were bared, and everyone rushed forward in one direction. Petya was being pressed so that he could scarcely breathe, and everybody shouted, Hurrah! 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 Petya stood on tiptoe, and pushed and pinched, but could see nothing except the people about him. All the faces bore the same expression of excitement and enthusiasm. A tradesman's wife standing beside Petya sobbed, and the tears ran down her cheeks. Father, angel, dear one, she kept repeating, wiping away her tears with her fingers. Hurrah! was heard on all sides. For a moment the crowd stood still, but then it made another rush forward. Quite beside himself, Petya, clenching his teeth and rolling his eyes ferociously, pushed forward, elbowing his way, and shouting, Hurrah! as if he were prepared that instant to kill himself and everyone else but on both sides of him other people with similarly ferocious faces pushed forward, and everybody shouted, Hurrah! So this is what the emperor is, thought Petya. No, I can't petition him myself. That would be too bold. But in spite of this, he continued to struggle desperately forward, and from between the backs of those in front he caught glimpses of an open space with a strip of red cloth spread out on it. But just then, the crowd swayed back. The police in front were pushing back those who had pressed too close to the procession. The emperor was passing from the palace to the Cathedral of the Assumption. And Petya unexpectedly received such a blow on his side and ribs, and was squeezed so hard, that suddenly everything grew dim before his eyes, and he lost consciousness. When he came to himself, a man of clerical appearance, with a tuft of grey hair at the back of his head, and wearing a shabby blue cassock, probably a church clerk and chanter, was holding him under the arm with one hand, while warding off the pressure of the crowd with the other, 
"'You've crushed the young gentleman,' said the clerk. "'What are you up to? Gently! They've crushed him! Crushed him!' The emperor entered the Cathedral of the Assumption. The crowd spread out again, more evenly, and the clerk led Petya, pale and breathless, to the Tsar cannon. Several people were sorry for Petya, and suddenly a crowd turned towards him and crushed round him. Those who stood nearest attended to him, unbuttoned his coat, seated him on the raised platform of the cannon, and reproached those others, whoever they might be, who had crushed him. One might easily get killed that way. What do they mean by it? Killing people? Poor dear, he's as white as a sheet, various voices were heard saying. Petya soon came to himself. The colour returned to his face. The pain had passed, and at the cost of that temporary unpleasantness, he had obtained a place by the cannon, from where he hoped to see the emperor, who would be returning that way. Petya no longer thought of presenting his petition. If he could only see the emperor, he would be happy. While the service was proceeding in the Cathedral of the Assumption, it was a combined service of prayer on the occasion of the emperor's arrival, and of thanksgiving for the conclusion of peace with the Turks. The crowd outside spread out, and hawkers appeared, selling kvars, gingerbread, and poppy seed sweets, of which Petya was particularly fond, and ordinary conversation could again be heard. A tradesman's wife was showing a rent in her shawl, and telling how much the shawl had cost, Another was saying that all silk goods had now got dear. The clerk who had rescued Petya was talking to a functionary about the priests who were officiating that day with the bishop. The clerk several times used the word plenary of the service, a word Petya did not understand. Two young citizens were joking with some serf girls who were cracking nuts. All these conversations especially the joking with the girls, was such as might have had a particular charm for Petya at his age. But they did not interest him now. He sat on his elevation, the pedestal of the cannon, still agitated as before by the thought of the emperor and by his love for him. The feeling of pain and fear he had experienced when he was being crushed, together with that of rapture, still further intensified his sense of the importance of the occasion. Suddenly the sound of a firing of cannon was heard from the embankment to celebrate the signing of peace with the Turks, and the crowd rushed impetuously towards the embankment to watch the firing. Petya too would have run there, but the clerk who had taken the young gentleman under his protection stopped him. The firing was still proceeding when officers, Generals and gentlemen in waiting came running out of the cathedral, and after them others in a more leisurely manner. Caps were again raised, and those who had run to look at the cannon ran back again. At last, four men in uniforms and sashes emerged from the cathedral doors. Hurrah! Hurrah! shouted the crowd again. Which is he? Which? asked Petya in a tearful voice of those around him. But no one answered him. Everybody was too excited, and Petya, fixing on one of those four men, whom he could not clearly see for the tears of joy that filled his eyes, concentrated all his enthusiasm on him, though it happened not to be the emperor, frantically shouted, Hurrah! and resolved that tomorrow, come what might, he would join the army. The crowd ran after the emperor, followed him to the palace, and began to disperse. It was already late, and Petya had not eaten anything, and was drenched with perspiration. Yet he did not go home, but stood with that diminishing, but still considerable, crowd before the palace while the emperor dined. Looking in at the palace windows, expecting he knew not what, and envying alike the notables he saw arriving at the entrance to dine with the emperor, and the court footmen who served at table, glimpses of whom could be seen through the windows. While the emperor was dining, Valuev, looking out of the window, said, The people are still hoping to see your majesty again. The dinner was nearly over, and the emperor, munching a biscuit, rose and went out on to the balcony. 
the people, with Petya among them, rushed towards the balcony. Angel, dear one, hurrah, father, cried the crowd, and Petya with it, and again the women and men of weaker mould, Petya among them, wept with joy. A largish piece of the biscuit the emperor was holding in his hand, broke off, fell on the balcony parapet, and then to the ground. A coachman in a jerkin, who stood nearest, sprang forward and snatched it up. Several people in the crowd rushed at the coachman. Seeing this, the emperor had a plateful of biscuits brought him, and began throwing them down from the balcony. Petya's eyes grew bloodshot, and still more excited by the danger of being crushed, he rushed at the biscuits. He did not know why, but he had to have a biscuit from the Tsar's hand, and he felt that he must not give way. He sprang forward and upset an old woman who was catching at a biscuit. The old woman did not consider herself defeated, though she was lying on the ground. She grabbed at some biscuits, but her hand did not reach them. Petya pushed her hand away with his knee, seized a biscuit, and as if fearing to be too late, again shouted, Hurrah! with a voice already hoarse. The emperor went in, and after that the greater part of the crowd began to disperse. There! I said if only we waited, and so it was, was being joyfully said by various people. Happy as Petya was, he felt sad at having to go home, knowing that all the enjoyment of that day was over. He did not go straight home from the Kremlin, but called on his friend Obolensky, who was fifteen and was also entering the regiment. On returning home, Petya announced resolutely and firmly that if he was not allowed to enter the service, he would run away. And next day, Count Ilya Rostov, though he had not yet quite yielded, went to inquire how he could arrange for Petya to serve, where there would be least danger. End of chapter 21「War and Peace」Book 9 Chapter 22 Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Batinama Two days later, on the 15th of July, an immense number of carriages were standing outside the Sloboda Palace. The great halls were full. In the first were the nobility and gentry in their uniforms. In the second, bearded merchants in full-skirted coats of blue cloth and wearing medals. In the nobleman's hall there was an incessant movement and buzz of voices. The chief magnates sat on high-backed chairs at a large table under the portrait of the emperor, but most of the gentry were strolling about the room. All these nobles, whom Pierre met every day at the club or in their own houses, were in uniform. Some in that of Catherine's day, others in that of Emperor Paul, others again in the new uniforms of Alexander's time, or the ordinary uniform of the nobility, and the general characteristic of being in uniform imparted something strange and fantastic to these diverse and familiar personalities, both old and young. The old men, dim-eyed, toothless, bald, sallow and bloated, or gaunt and wrinkled, were especially striking. For the most part they sat quietly in their places and were silent, or, if they walked about and talked, attached themselves to someone younger. On all these faces, as on the faces of the crowd Petya had seen in the square, there was a striking contradiction, the general expectation of a solemn event, and at the same time the everyday interests in a Boston card party, Peter the cook, Zinaida Dmitrievna's health, and so on. Pierre was there too, buttoned up since early morning in a nobleman's uniform that had become too tight for him. He was agitated. This extraordinary gathering, not only of nobles, but also of the merchant class, les états généraux, stage general, evoked in him a whole series of ideas he had long laid aside, but which were deeply graven in his soul. Thoughts of the contrat social, 
and the French Revolution. The words that had struck him in the Emperor's appeal, that the sovereign was coming to the capital for consultation with his people, strengthened this idea. And imagining that in this direction something important, which he had long awaited, was drawing near, he strode about, watching and listening to conversations, but nowhere finding any confirmation of the ideas that occupied him. The Emperor's manifesto was read, evoking enthusiasm, and then all moved about discussing it. Besides the ordinary topics of conversation, Pierre heard questions of where the marshals of the nobility were to stand when the Emperor entered, when a ball should be given in the Emperor's honour, whether they should group themselves by districts or by whole provinces, and so on. But as soon as the war was touched on, or what the nobility had been convened for, the talk became undecided and indefinite. Then all preferred listening to speaking. A middle-aged man, handsome and virile, in the uniform of a retired naval officer, was speaking in one of the rooms, and a small crowd was pressing round him. Pierre went up to the circle that had formed round the speaker, and listened. Count Ilya Rostov, in a military uniform of Catherine's time, was sauntering with a pleasant smile among the crowd, with all of whom he was acquainted. He too approached that group, and listened with a kindly smile and nods of approval, as he always did, to what the speaker was saying. The retired naval man was speaking very boldly, as was evident from the expression on the faces of the listeners, and from the fact that some people, he knew as the weakest and quietest of men, walked away disapprovingly, or expressed disagreement with him. Pierre pushed his way into the middle of the group, listened, and convinced himself that the man was indeed a liberal, but of views quite different from his own. The naval officer spoke in a particularly sonorous, musical, and aristocratic baritone voice, pleasantly swallowing his R's and generally slurring his consonants, the voice of a man calling out to his servant, Here, bring me my pipe. It was indicative of dissipation and the exercise of authority. What if the Smolensk people have offered to raise militia for the emperor? Are we to take Smolensk as our pattern? If the noble aristocracy of the province of Moscow thinks fit, it can show its loyalty to our sovereign, the emperor, in other ways. Have we forgotten the raising of the militia in the year seven? All that did was to enrich the priests' sons and thieves and robbers. Count Ilya Rostov smiled blandly and nodded approval. And was our militia of any use to the empire? Not at all. It only ruined our farming. Better have another conscription, or our men will return neither soldiers nor peasants, and will get only depravity from them. The nobility don't grudge their lives. Every one of us will go and bring in more recruits, and the sovereign... That was the way he referred to the emperor. Need only say the word, and we'll all die for him. Added the orator with animation. Count Rostov's mouth watered with pleasure, and he nudged Pierre, but Pierre wanted to speak himself. He pushed forward, feeling stirred, but not yet sure what stirred him or what he would say. Scarcely had he opened his mouth, when one of the senators, a man without a tooth in his head, with his shrewd though angry expression, standing near the first speaker, interrupted him. Evidently accustomed to managing debates and to maintaining an argument, he began in low but distinct tones. "'I imagine, sir,' said he, mumbling with his toothless mouth, "'that we have been summoned here not to discuss whether it's best for the Empire, at the present moment, to adopt conscription or to call out the militia.' We have been summoned to reply to the appeal with which our sovereign, the Emperor, has honoured us. But to judge what is best, conscription or the militia, we can leave to the supreme authority. Pierre suddenly saw an outlet for his excitement. 
he hardened his heart against the senator who was introducing this set and narrow attitude into the deliberations of the nobility pierre stepped forward and interrupted him he himself did not yet know what he would say but he began to speak eagerly occasionally lapsing into french or expressing himself in bookish russian excuse me your excellency he began he was well acquainted with the senator but thought it necessary on this occasion to address him formally though i don't agree with the gentleman he hesitated he wished to say mon très honorable préopinant my very honourable opponent with the gentleman whom i have not the honour of knowing i suppose that the nobility have been summoned not merely to express their sympathy and enthusiasm but also to consider the means by which we can assist our fatherland i imagine he went on warming to his subject that the emperor himself would not be satisfied to find in us merely owners of serfs whom we are willing to devote to his service and cher à canon food for cannon we are ready to make of ourselves and not to obtain from us any c c counsel many persons withdrew from the circle noticing the senator's sarcastic smile and the freedom of pierre's remarks only count rostov was pleased with them as he had been pleased with those of the naval officer the senator and in general with whatever speech he had last heard i think that before discussing these questions pierre continued we should ask the emperor most respectfully ask his majesty to let us know the number of our troops and the position in which our army and our forces now are and then but scarcely had pierre uttered these words before he was attacked from three sides the most vigorous attack came from an old acquaintance a boston player who had always been well disposed toward him stepan stepanovich adraksin adraksin was in uniform and whether as a result of the uniform or from some other cause pierre saw before him quite a different man with a sudden expression of malevolence on his aged face adraksin shouted at pierre in the first place i tell you we have no right to question the emperor about that and secondly if the russian nobility had that right the emperor could not answer such a question the troops are moved according to the enemy's movements and the number of men increases and decreases another voice that of a nobleman of medium height and about forty years of age whom pierre had formerly met at the gypsies and knew as a bad card player and who also transformed by his uniform came up to pierre interrupted adraxin yes and this is not a time for discussing he continued but for acting there is war in russia the enemy is advancing to destroy russia to desecrate the tombs of our fathers to carry off our wives and children the nobleman smote his breast we will all arise every one of us will go for our father the tsar he shouted rolling his bloodshot eyes several approving voices were heard in the crowd we are russians and will not grudge our blood in defense of our faith the throne and the fatherland we must cease raving if we are sons of our fatherland we will show europe how russia rises to the defense of russia pierre wished to reply but could not get in a word he felt that his words apart from what meaning they conveyed were less audible than the sound of his opponent's voice count rostov at the back of the crowd was expressing approval several persons briskly turning a shoulder to the orator at the end of a phrase said that's right quite right just so pierre wished to say that he was ready to sacrifice his money his serfs or himself only one ought to know the state of affairs in order to be able to improve it but he was unable to speak many voices shouted and talked at the same time so that count rostov had not time to signify his approval of them all and the group increased dispersed reformed and then moved with a hum of talk into the largest hall and to the big table not only was pierre's attempt to speak unsuccessful but he was rudely interrupted pushed aside and people turned away from him as from a common enemy this happened not because they were displeased by the substance of his speech which had even been forgotten after the many subsequent speeches 
but to animate it the crowd needed a tangible object to love and a tangible object to hate pierre became the latter many other orators spoke after the excited nobleman and all in the same tone many spoke eloquently and with originality glinka the editor of the russian messenger who was recognized cries of author author were heard in the crowd said that hell must be repulsed by hell and that he had seen a child smiling at lightning flashes and thunderclaps but we will not be that child yes yes a thunderclaps was repeated approvingly in the back rows of the crowd the crowd drew up to the large table at which sat grey-haired or bald seventy-year-old magnates uniformed and besashed almost all of whom pierre had seen in their own homes with their buffoons or playing boston at the clubs with an incessant hum of voices the crowd advanced to the table pressed by the throng against the high backs of the chairs the auditors spoke one after another and sometimes two together those standing behind noticed what the speaker omitted to say and hastened to supply it others in that heat and crush racked their brains to find some thought and hastened to utter it the old magnates whom pierre knew sat and turned to look first at one and then at another and their faces for the most part only expressed the fact that they found it very hot pierre however felt excited and a general desire to show that they were ready to go to all lengths which found expression in the tones and looks more than in the substance of the speeches infected him too he did not renounce his opinions but felt himself in some way to blame and wished to justify himself i only said that it would be more to the purpose to make sacrifices when we know what is needed said he trying to be heard above the other voices one of the old men nearest to him looked round but his attention was immediately diverted by an exclamation at the other side of the table yes moscow will be surrendered she will be our expiation shouted one man he is the enemy of mankind cried another allow me to speak gentlemen you are crushing me end of chapter 22 recording by ernst patinama Amsterdam, the Netherlands. War and Peace, Book Nine, Chapter Twenty Three, read for LibriVox.org by Julie van Wallachem. At that moment, Count Rossopchin, with his protruding chin and alert eyes, wearing the uniform of a general with a sash over his shoulder, entered the room, stepping briskly to the front of the crowd of gentry. "'Our sovereign, the emperor, will be here in a moment,' said Rostopchin. "'I'm straight from the palace. Seeing the position we are in, I think there is little need for discussion. The emperor has designed to summon us and the merchants. Millions will pour forth from there.' He pointed to the merchant's hall, but our business is to supply men and not spare ourselves. That is the least we can do. A conference took place confined to the magnate sitting at the table. The whole consultation passed more than quietly. After all the preceding noise, the sound of their old voices saying one after another, I agree, or for variety, I too am of that opinion, and so on, had even a mournful effect. The secretary was told to write down the resolution of the Moscow nobility and gentry, that they would furnish ten men fully equipped out of every thousand serfs, as the Smolensk gentry had done. Their chairs made a scraping noise as the gentlemen who had conferred rose with apparent relief, and began walking up and down, arm in arm, to stretch their legs and converse in couples. The emperor! The emperor! A sudden cry resounded through the halls, and the whole throng hurried to the entrance. The emperor entered the hall through a broad patch between two lines of nobles. Every face expressed respectful, awestruck curiosity. Pierre stood rather far off, and could not hear all that the emperor said. From what he did hear, he understood that the emperor spoke of the danger 
threatening the empire and of the hopes he placed on the Moscow nobility. He was answered by a voice which informed him of the resolution just arrived at. Gentlemen, said the emperor with quivering voice. There was a rustling among the crowd, and it again subsided, so that Pierre distinctly heard the pleasantly human voice of the emperor saying with emotion, I never doubted the devotion of the Russian nobles, but to-day it has surpassed my expectations. I thank you in the name of the fatherland. Gentlemen, let us act. Time is most precious. The emperor ceased speaking. The crowd began pressing round him, and rapturous exclamations were heard from all sides. Yes, most precious, a royal word, said Count Rostov with a sob. He stood at the back, and though he had heard hardly anything, understood everything in his own way. From the hall of the nobility, the emperor went to that of the merchant. There he remained about ten minutes. Pierre was among those who saw him come out from the merchant's hall, with tears of emotion in his eyes. As became known later, he had scarcely begun to address the merchants before tears gushed from his eyes, and he concluded in a trembling voice. When Pierre saw the emperor, he was coming out accompanied by two merchants, one of whom Pierre knew, a fat Otkupchik. The other was the mayor, a man with a thin, sallow face and narrow beard. Both were weeping. Tears filled the thin man's eyes, and the fat Otkupchik sobbed outright like a child and kept repeating, "'Our lives and property, take them, your majesty!' Pierre's one feeling at the moment was a desire to show that he was ready to go all lengths, and was prepared to sacrifice everything. He now felt ashamed of his speech with its constitutional tendency, and sought an opportunity of effacing it. Having heard that Count Mamanov was furnishing a regiment, Bezukhov at once informed Rostopchin that he would give a thousand men and their maintenance. Old Rostov could not tell his wife of what had passed without tears, and at once consented to Petya's request, and went himself to enter his name. Next day the emperor left Moscow. The assembled nobles all took off their uniforms and settled down again in their homes and clubs, and not without some groans gave orders to their stewards about the enrolment, feeling amazed at themselves at what they had done. End of chapter 23 End of War and Peace, Book 9, by Leo Tolstoy this recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Geneva. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Book 10, 1812, Chapter 1 Napoleon began war with Russia because he could not resist going to Dresden, could not help having his head turned by the homage he received, could not help donning a Polish uniform and yielding to the stimulating influence of a June morning, and could not refrain from bursts of anger in the presence of Kurakin and then of Balashev. Alexander refused negotiations because he felt himself to be personally insulted. Barclay de Tolly tried to command the army in the best way, because he wished to fulfill his duty and earn fame as a great commander. Rostov charged the French because he could not restrain his wish for a gallop across a level field, and in the same way the innumerable people who took part in the war acted in accord with their personal characteristics, habits, circumstances, and aims. They were moved by fear or vanity, rejoiced, or were indignant, reasoned, imagining that they knew what they were doing, and did it of their own free will, but they all were involuntary tours of history, carrying on a work concealed from them, but comprehensible to us, such as the inevitable fate of men of action, and the higher they stand in the social hierarchy, the less are they free. The actors of 1812 have long since left the stage. Their personal interests have vanished, leaving no trace, and nothing remains of their time but its historic results. Providence compelled all these men, striving to attain personal aims, 
to further the accomplishment of a stupendous result no one of them at all expected neither napoleon nor alexander nor still less any of those who did the actual fighting the cause of the destruction of the french army in eighteen twelve is clear to us now no one will deny that that cause was on the one hand its advance into the heart of russia late in the season without any preparation for a winter campaign and on the other the character given to the war by the burning of russian towns and the hatred of the foe this aroused among the russian people but no one at the time foresaw what now seems so evident that this was the only way an army of eight hundred thousand men the best in the world and led by the best general could be destroyed in conflict with a raw army of half its numerical strength and led by inexperienced commanders as the russian army was not only did no one see this but on the russian side every effort was made to hinder the only thing that could save russia while on the french side despite napoleon's experience and so-called military genius every effort was directed to pushing on to moscow at the end of the summer that is to doing the very thing that was bound to lead to destruction in historical works on the year eighteen twelve french writers were very fond of saying that napoleon feared the danger of extending his line that he sought a battle and that his marshals advised him to stop at smolensk and of making similar statements to show that the danger of campaign was even then understood russian authors are still fond of telling us that from the commencement of the campaign a system or plan was adopted to lure napoleon into the depths of russia in this plain some of them attribute to four others to a certain frenchman others to tall and others again to alexander himself pointing to notes projects and letters which contains hints of such a line of action but all these hints at what happened both from the french side and the russian are advanced only because they fit in with the event had that event not occurred these hints would have been forgotten as we have forgotten the thousands and millions of hints and expectations to the country which were current then but have now been forgotten because the event falsified them there are always so many conjectures as to the issue of any event that however it may end there will always be people to say i said then that it would be so quite forgetting that amid their innumerable conjectures many were to quite the contrary effect conjectures as to napoleon's awareness of the danger of extending his line and on the russian side as to luring the enemy into the depths of russia are evidently of that kind and only by much straining can historians attribute such conceptions to napoleon and his marshals or such plans to the russian commanders all the facts are in flat contradiction to such conjectures during the whole period of the war not only was there no wish on the russian side to draw the french into the heart of the country but from their first entry into russia everything was done to stop them and not only was napoleon not afraid to extend his line but he welcomed every step forward as a triumph and did not seek battle as eagerly as in former campaigns but very lazily at the very beginning of the war our armies were divided and our sole aim was to unite them so uniting the armies was no advantage if we meant to retire and lure the enemy into the depths of the country our emperor joined the army to encourage it to defend every inch of russian soil and not to retreat the enormous Jessa camp was formed on first plan and there was no intention of retiring further the emperor reproached the commanders-in-chief for every step they retired he could not bear the idea of letting the enemy even reach smolensk still less could he contemplate the burning of moscow and when our armies did unite he was displeased that smolensk was abandoned and burned without a general engagement having been fought and its wars so thought the emperor and the russian commanders and people were still more provoked at the thought that our forces were retreating into the depths of the country napoleon having cut our armies apart advanced far into the country and missed several chances of forcing an engagement in august he was at smolensk and thought only of how to advance farther so as we now see that advance was evidently ruinous to him the facts clearly show that napoleon did not foresee the danger of the advance on moscow nor did alexander and the russian commanders then think of luring napoleon on but quite the contrary 
the luring of napoleon into the depths of the country was not the result of any play for no one believed it to be possible it resulted from a most complex interplay of intrigues aims and wishes among those who took part in the war and had no perception whatever of the inevitable or of the one way of saving russia everything came about fortuitously the armies were divided at the commencement of the campaign we tried to unite them with the evident intention of giving battle and checking the enemy's advance and by this effort to unite them while avoiding battle with a much stronger enemy and necessarily withdrawing the armies at an acute angle we lead the french on to smolensk but we withdraw at an acute angle not only because the french advanced between our two armies the angle became still more acute and we withdrew with father because barclay de tolly was an unpopular foreigner disliked by bagration who would come his command and bagration being command of the second army tried to postpone joining up and coming under barclay's command as long as he could bagration was slow in effecting the junction though that was the chief aim of all at headquarters because as he alleged he exposed his army to danger on this march and it was best for him to attire more to the left and more to the south worrying the enemy from flank and rear and securing for the ukraine recruits for his army and it looks as if he planned this in order not to come under the command of the detested foreigner barclay whose rank was inferior to his own the emperor was with the army to encourage it but his presence and ignorance of what steps to take and the enormous number of advisers and plans destroyed the first army's energy and it retired the intention was to make a stand at the dresser camp but paulucci aiming at becoming commander-in-chief unexpectedly employed his energy to influence alexander and the first whole plan was abandoned and the command entrusted to barclay but as barclay did not inspire confidence his power was limited the armies were divided there was no unity of command and barclay was unpopular but from this confusion division and the unpopularity of the foreign commander-in-chief there resulted on the one hand indecision and the avoidance of a battle which we could not have refrained from had the armies been united and had someone else instead of barclay being in command and on the other an ever-increasing indignation against the foreigners and an increase in patriotic zeal at last the emperor left the army and as the most convenient and indeed the only pretext for his departure it was decided that it was necessary for him to inspire the people in the capitals and arouse the nation in general to a patriotic war and by this visit of the emperor to moscow the strength of the russian army was troubled he left in order not to obstruct the commander-in-chief's undivided control of the army and hoping that more decisive action would then be taken but the command of the armies became still more confused and enfeebled by nixon the Zarevich, and a swarm of adjutants general remained with the army to keep the commander-in-chief under observation and arouse his energy and barclay feeling less free than ever under the observation of all these eyes of the emperor became still more cautious of undertaking any decisive action and avoided giving battle barclay stood for caution the Zarevich hinted at treachery and demanded a general engagement lubomirsky bronitsky vlosky and the others of that group stirred up so much trouble that barclay under pretext of sending papers to the emperor dispatched this polish adjutant general to petersburg and plunged into an open struggle with Benixen and Zarevich. At Smolensk, the armies at last reunited, much as Bagration disliked it. Bagration drove up in a carriage to the house occupied by Barclay. Barclay donned his sash and came out to meet and report to his senior officer Bagration. Despite his seniority in rank Bagration, in this contest of magnanimity, took his orders from Barclay, but, having submitted, agreed with him less than ever by the emperor's orders bagration reported direct to him he wrote to arakchev the emperor's confidant it must be as my sovereign pleases but i cannot work with the minister meaning barclay for god's sake send me somewhere else if only in command of a regiment i cannot stand it here headquarters are so full of germans that a russian cannot exist and there is no sense in anything 
I thought I was really serving my sovereign and the fatherland, but it turns out that I am serving Barclay. I confess I do not want to. The swarm of Bronitskis and Winsingerodas and their likes there further embittered the relations between the commanders in chief, and even less unity resulted. Preparations were made to fight the French before Smolensk. A general was sent to survey the position. This general, hating Barclay, wrote to visit a friend of his own, a corps commander, and, having spent a day with him, returned to Barclay and condemned, as unsuitable from every point of view, the battleground he had not seen. While disputes and intrigues were going on about the future field of battle, and while we were looking for the French, having lost touch with them, the French stumbled upon Nevorovsky's division and reached the walls of Smolensk. It was necessary to fight an unexpected battle at Smolensk to save our lines of communication. The battle was fought, and thousands were killed on both sides. Smolensk was abandoned contrary to the wishes of the emperor and of the whole people. But Smolensk was burned by its own inhabitants, who had been misled by their governor. And this ruined the inhabitants, setting an example to other Russians, went to Moscow, thinking only of their own losses, but kindling hatred of the foe. Napoleon advanced farther and we retired, thus arriving at the very result which caused his destruction. End of chapter 1 Recorded on October 4th, 2008 by Geneva War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Alma and Louis Mao Book 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andy Yu War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Book 10 Chapter 2 The day after his son had left, Prince Nicholas sent for Princess Mary to come to his study. Well, are you satisfied now? said he. You've made me quarrel with my son. Satisfied, aren't you? That is all you wanted. Satisfied? It hurts me, it hurts. I'm old and weak, and this is what you wanted. Well then, gloat over it, gloat over it. After that, Princess Mary did not see her father for a whole week. He was ill and did not leave his study. Princess Mary noticed to her surprise that during this illness, the old prince not only excluded her from his room, but did not admit Mademoiselle Bourienne either. Tikhon alone attended him. At the end of the week, the prince reappeared and resumed his former way of life, devoting himself with special activity to building operations and the arrangements of the gardens, and completely breaking off his relationships with Mademoiselle Bourienne. His looks and cold tone to his daughter seemed to say, there, you see, you plotted against me. You lied to Prince Andrew about my relations with that French woman and made me quarrel with him. But, you see, I need neither her nor you. Princess Mary spent half of every day with little Nicholas, watching his lessons, teaching him Russian and music herself, and talking to the Salas, the rest of the day she spent over her books with her old nurse or with God's folk who sometimes came by the back door to see her. Of the war, Princess Mary thought as women do think about wars. She feared for her brother, who was in it, was horrified by and amazed at the strange cruelty that impels men to kill one another. But 
she did not understand the significance of this war, which seemed to her like all previous wars. She did not realize the significance of this war, though Desalus, with whom she constantly conversed, was passionately interested in its progress and tried to explain his own conception of it to her. And though the gospel who came to see her reported in their own way the rumors current among the people of an invasion by Antichrist, and though Julie, now Princess Jobuskaya, who had resumed correspondence with her, wrote patriotic letters from Moscow. I write to you in Russian, my good friend, wrote Julie in her Frenchified Russian, because I have a detestation for all the French, and the same for the language which I cannot support to hear spoken. We in Moscow are elated by enthusiasm for our adored emperor. My poor husband is enduring pains and hunger in Jewish taverns, but the news which I have inspires me yet more. You heard probably of the heroic exploit of Ryeski embracing his two sons and saying, I will perish with them, but we will not be shaken. And truly, though the enemy was twice stronger than we, we were unshakable. We pass the time as we can, but in war as in war. The princess Aline and Sophie sit whole days with me, and we, unhappy widows of life men, made beautiful conversations over our chappy. Only you, my friend, are missing, and so on. The chief reason Princess Mary did not realize the full significance of this war was that the old prince never spoke of it, did not recognize it, and laughed at the salad when he mentioned it at dinner. The prince's tone was so calm and confident that Princess Mary unhesitantly believed him. All that July, the old prince was exceedingly active and even animated. He planned another garden and began a new building for the domestic serfs. The only thing that made Princess Mary anxious about him was that he slept very little and, instead of sleeping in his study as usual, changed his sleeping place every day. One day, he would order his camp bed to be set up in the grass gallery. Another day, he remained in the couch or on the lounge chair in the drawing room and dozed there without undressing, while instead of Mademoiselle Borian, a serf boy read to him. Then again, he would spend a night in the dining room. On August 1st, a second letter was received from Prince Andrew. In his first letter, which came soon after he had left home, Prince Andrew had dutifully asked his father's forgiveness for what he had allowed himself to say and begged to be resorted to his favor. To this letter, the old prince had replied affectionately, and from that time had kept the French woman at a distance. Prince Andrew's second letter, written near Bidets after the French had occupied the town, gave a brief account of the whole campaign, enclosed for them a plan he had drawn and forecast as to the further progress of the war. In this letter, Prince Andrew pointed out to his father the danger of staying at Bowed Hills, so near the theater of war and on the army's direct line of march, and advised him to move to Moscow. 
At dinner that day, on Dessalles mentioning that the French were said to have already entered Vitesse, the old prince remembered his son's letter. There was a letter from Prince Andrew today, he said to Princess Mary. Haven't you read it? No, father, she replied in a frightened voice. She could not have read the letter as she did not even know it had arrived. He writes about this war, said the prince, with the ironic smile that had become habitual to him in speaking of the present war. That must be very interesting, said the Salas. Prince Andrew is in position to know. Oh, very interesting, said Mademoiselle Borian. Go and get it for me, said the old prince to Mademoiselle Borian. You know, under the paperweight on the little table. Mademoiselle Borian jumped up eagerly. No, don't, he exclaimed with a frown. You go. Michael Ivanovich. Michael Ivanovich rose and went to the study, but as soon as he had left the room, the old prince, looking uneasily round, threw down his napkin and went himself. They can't do anything. Always make some muddle, he muttered. While he was away, Princess Mary, de Salas, Mademoiselle Borian, and even little Nicholas exchanged looks in silence. The old prince returned with quick steps, accompanied by Michael Ivanovich, bringing the letter and a plan. These he put down beside him, not letting anyone read them at dinner. On moving to the drawing room, he handed the letter to Princess Mary and, spreading out before him the plan of the new building, and fixing his eyes upon it, told her to read the letter aloud. When she had done so, Princess Mary looked inquiringly at her father. He was examining the plan, evidently engrossed in his own ideas. What do you think of it, Prince? De Salas ventured to ask. Uh, uh, said the prince, as if unpleasantly awakened and not taking eyes from the plan of the building. Very possibly the theatre wall will move so near to us that... <laughs> the theatre wall, said the prince. I have said and still say that the theatre wall is Poland, and the enemy will never get beyond the Niemen. The Salas looked in amazement at the prince, who was talking of the Niemen when the enemy was already at the Dipa. But Princess Mary, forgetting the geographical position of the Niemen, thought that what her father was saying was correct. When the snow melts, they'll sink in the Polish swarms. Only they could fail to see it, the prince continued evidently thinking of the campaign of 1807, which seemed to him so recent. Benison should have advanced into Prussia sooner. Then things would have taken a different turn. But Prince de Salis began timidly. The letter mentions Vitebsk. Ah, the letter, yes, replied the prince peevishly. Yes, yes, his face suddenly took on a morose expression. He paused. Yes, he writes that the French were beaten at, at, uh, what river is it? De Salas dropped his eyes. The prince says nothing about that, he remarked gently. Doesn't he? But... I didn't invent it myself. No one spoke for a long time. Yes, yes. Well, Michael Ivanovich, he suddenly went on, raising his head and pointing to the plan of the building. Tell me how you mean to alter it. 
Michael Ivanovich went up to the plan, and the prince, after speaking to him about the building, looked angrily at Princess Mary and the Salas, and went to his own room. Princess Mary saw the Salas' embarrassment and astonished look fixed on her father, noticed his silence, and was struck by the fact that her father had forgotten his son's letter on the drawing room table. But she was not only afraid to speak of it and asked the Salas the reason of his confusion and silence, but was afraid even to think about it. In the evening, Michael Ivanovich, sent by the prince, came to Princess Mary for Prince Andrew's letter, which had been forgotten in the drawing-room. She gave it to him, and, unpleasant as it was to her to do so, ventured to ask him what her father was doing. "'Always busy,' replied Michael Ivanovich, with a respectfully ironic smile, which caused Princess Mary to turn pale. He's worrying very much about the new building. He has been reading a little, but now, Michael Ivanovich went on, lowering his voice, now he's at his desk, busy with his will, I expect. Open bracket. One of the prince's favorite occupations of late had been the preparation of some papers he meant to leave at his death and which he called his will, close brackets. An apatich is being sent to Smolensk, asked Princess Mary. Oh, yes, he has been wanting to start for some time. End of chapter 2 War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Andy Yu, Mississauga, Canada War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Three, read for LibriVox.org by David Anton. When Michael Ivanovitch returned to the study with the letter, the old prince, with spectacles on and a shade over his eyes, was sitting at his open bureau with screened candles, holding a paper in his outstretched hand, and in a somewhat dramatic attitude was reading his manuscript, his remarks, as he termed it, which was to be transmitted to the emperor after his death. When Michael Ivanovich went in, there were tears in the prince's eyes, evoked by the memory of the time when the paper he was now reading had been written. He took the letter from Michael Ivanovich's hand, put it in his pocket, folded up his papers, and called in Alpatish, who had long been waiting. The prince had a list of things to be bought in Smolensk, and walking up and down the room past Alpatish, who stood by the door, he gave his instructions. First note paper. Do you hear? Eight choirs. Like this sample, gilt-edged. It must be exactly like the sample. Varnish? Sealing wax? As in Michael Ivanovich's list. He paced up and down for a while and glanced at his notes. Then hand to the governor in person a letter about the deed. Next, bolts for the doors of the new building were wanted, and had to be of a special shape the prince had himself designed, and a leather case had to be ordered to keep the will in. The instructions to Alpatish took over two hours, and still the prince did not let him go. He sat down, sank into thought, closed his eyes, and dozed off. Alpatish made a slight movement. Well, go, go. If anything more is wanted, I'll send after you. Alpatish went out. The prince again went to his bureau, glanced into it, fingered his papers, closed the bureau again, and sat down at the table to write to the governor. It was already late when he rose after sealing the letter. He wished to sleep, but he knew he would not be able to, 
and that most depressing thoughts came to him in bed. So he called Tikon and went through the rooms with him to show him where to set up the bed for that night. He went about looking at every corner. Every place seemed unsatisfactory, but worst of all was his customary couch in the study. That couch was dreadful to him, probably because of the oppressive thoughts he had had while lying there. It was unsatisfactory everywhere, but the corner behind the piano in the sitting room was better than the other places. He had never slept there yet. With the help of a footman, Tikon brought in the bedstead and began putting it up. "'That's not right! That's not right!' cried the prince, and himself pushed it a few inches from the corner, and then closer in again. "'Well, at last I've finished. Now I'll rest,' thought the prince, and let Tikon undress him. Frowning with vexation at the effort necessary to divest himself of his coat and trousers, the prince undressed, sat down heavily on the bed, and appeared to be meditating as he looked contemptuously at his withered yellow legs. He was not meditating, but only deferring the moment of making the effort to lift those legs up and turn over on the bed. Ugh, oh, how hard it is! Oh, that this toil might end and you would release me, thought he. Pressing his lips together, he made that effort for the twenty thousandth time, and lay down. But hardly had he done so before he felt the bed rocking backwards and forwards beneath him, as if it were breathing heavily and jolting. This happened to him almost every night. He opened his eyes as they were closing. "'No peace, damn them!' he muttered, angry he knew not with whom. Ah, yes, there was something else important, very important, that I was keeping till I should be in bed. The bolts? No, I told him about them. No, it was something. Something in the drawing room. Princess Mary talked some nonsense. DeSalle's that fool said something. Something in my pocket? I can't remember. Tikon! What did we talk about at dinner? About Prince Michael. Be quiet, quiet. The prince slapped his hand on the table. Yes, I know. Prince Andrew's letter. Princess Mary read it. De Salle said something about Vitebsk. Now I'll read it. He had the letter taken from his pocket, and the table, on which stood a glass of lemonade and a spiral wax candle, moved close to the bed, and putting on his spectacles, he began reading. Only now, in the stillness of the night, reading it by faint light under the green shade, did he grasp its meaning for a moment. The French at Vitebsk! In four days' march, they may be at Smolyansk! Perhaps are already there. Tikhon! Tikhon jumped up. No, no, I don't want anything! he shouted. He put the letter under the candlestick and closed his eyes and there rose before him the Danube, at bright noonday, Reeds, the Russian camp, and himself a young general without a wrinkle on his ruddy face, rigorous and alert, entering Potemkin's gaily-colored tent, and a burning sense of jealousy of the favorite agitated him now as strongly as it had done then. He recalled all the words spoken at that first meeting with Potemkin, and he saw before him a plump, rather sallow-faced, short, stout woman, the Empress Mother, with her smile and her words at her first gracious reception of him, and then that same face on the catafalque, and the encounter he had with Zubov over her coffin about his right to kiss her hand. Oh, quicker, quicker, to get back to that time and have done with all the present. Quicker, quicker and that they should leave me in peace. End of chapter 3《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Ilma and Louise Mao Book 10 this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Yu. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Book 10, Chapter 4. Bout Hills, Prince Nicholas Bokonsky's estate lay forty miles east from Swalensk and two miles from the main road to Moscow. The same evening that the prince gave his instructions to Arpadich, the Salas, having asked to see Princess Mary, told her that as the prince was not very well and was taking no steps to secure his safety, though from prince andrew's letter it was evident that to remain at about hill might be dangerous he respectfully advised her to send a letter by alpatich to the provincial governor at smolensk asking him to let her know the state of affairs and the extent of the danger to which bald hills was exposed de Salis wrote this letter to the governor for Princess Mary. She signed it, and it was given to a party with instructions to hand it to the governor and to come back as quickly as possible if there was danger. Having received all his orders, a party wearing a white beaver hat, a present from the prince, and carrying a stick as the prince did, went out accompanied by his family three well-fed rooms stood ready harnessed to a small conveyance with a leather hood the larger bell was muffled and the little bells on the harness stuffed with paper the prince allowed no one at bowed hills to drive with ringing bells but on a long journey alpatich liked to have them his satellites the senior clerk a counting-house clerk a scullery maid a cook two old women a little page-boy the coachman and various domestic serfs were seeing him off his daughter placed chintz covered down cushions for him to sit on and behind his back his old sister-in-law popped in a small bundle and one of the coachmen helped him into the vehicle there there women's fuss women women said alpatich putting and squeaking rapidly just as the prince did and he climbed into the trap after giving the clerk orders about the work to be done alpatich not trying to imitate the prince now lifted the hat from his bald head and crossed himself three times if there's anything come back yakov alpatich for christ's sake think of us cried his wife referring to the rumours of war and the enemy women women women's fuss muttered alpatich himself and started on his journey looking round at the fields of yellow rye and the still green thickly growing oats and at other quite back fields just being ploughed a second time as he went along he looked with pressure at the year's splendid crop of corn scrutinized the strips of rye field which here and there were already being reaped made his calculations as to the sowing and the harvest and asked himself whether he had not gotten any of the prince's orders having baited the horses twice on the way he arrived at the town towards evening on the fourth of august a party kept meeting and overtaking baggage trains and troops on the road as he approached smolensk he heard the sounds of distant firing but these did not impress him what struck him most was the sight of a splendid field of oats in which a camp had been pitched and which was being mown down by the soldiers evidently for fodder this fact impressed alpatich but in thinking about his own business he soon forgot it all the interests of his life for more than thirty years had been bounded by the will of the prince and he never went beyond that limit everything not connected with the execution of the prince's orders did not interest and did not even exist for alpatich on reaching smolensk on the evening of the fourth of august he put up in the gachina suburb across the nitpa 
at the inn kept by Ferapontov, where he had been in the habit of putting up for the last thirty years some thirty years ago Peradontov, by Arpadich's advice had bought a wood from the prince had begun to trade and now had a house an inn and a corn dealer's shop in that province he was a stout dark red-faced peasant in the forties with thick lips broad knobable nose similar knobs over his black frowning brows and around the belly wearing a waistcoat over his cotton shirt Peratontov was standing before his shop, which opened onto the street. On seeing Apatich, he went up to him. You're welcome, Yako Apatich. Folks are leaving the town, but you have come to it, said he. Why are they leaving the town? asked Apatich. That's what I say. Folks are foolish, always afraid of the French. Women's fuss, women's fuss, said Apatich. Just what I think, Yakov Apatich. What I say is, orders have been given not to let them in, so that must be right, and the peasants are asking three rubles for carting isn't Christian. Yako Apatich heard without hearing. He asked for a semova and for hay for his horses, and when he had had his tea, he went to bed. All night long, troops were moving past the inn. Next morning, Alpatich donned a jacket he wore only in town and went out on business. It was a sunny morning, and by eight o'clock it was already hot. A good day for harvesting, thought Alpatich. From beyond the town, firing had been heard since early morning. At eight o'clock, the booming of cannon was added to the sound of musketry. Many people were hurrying through the streets and there were many soldiers, but caps were still driving about, tradesmen stood at the shops, and service was being held in the churches as usual. Alpatich went to the shops, to government offices, to the post office, and to the governors. In the offices and shops, and the post office, everyone was talking about the army and about the enemy who was already attacking the town. Everybody was asking what should be done, and all were trying to calm one another. In front of the governor's house, a partage found a large number of people, Crossacks and a travelling carriage of the governor's. At the porch, he met two of the landed gentry, one of whom he knew. This man, an ex-captain of police, was saying angrily, It's no joke, you know, it's all very well if you're single one man though undone is but one as the proverb says but with fifteen in your family and all the property they've brought us to utter ruin what sort of governors are they to do that they ought to be hanged the brigands oh come that's enough said the other what do i care let him hear we're not dogs said the ex-captain of police and looking around he noticed a partage Oh, Yakov Abatich, what have you come for? To see the governor by his excellency's order, answered Abatich, lifting his head and proudly thrusting his hand into the bosom of his coat, as he always did when he mentioned the prince. He has ordered me to inquire into the position of affairs, he added. Yes, go and find out, shouted the angry gentleman. They've brought things to such a pass that there are no carts or anything. There it is again, you hear, said he, pointing in the direction whence came the sounds of firing. They've brought us all to ruin, the brigands, he repeated, and descended the porch steps. Our partage swayed his head and went upstairs. In the waiting room were tradesmen, women, and officials, looking silently at one another. The door of the governor's room opened, and they all rose and moved forward. An official ran out, said some words to a merchant, called a stout official with a cross hanging on his neck to follow him, and vanished again, evidently wishing to avoid the inquiring looks and questions addressed to him. A partage moved forward, and next time the official came out, addressed him, one hand placed in the breast of his buttoned coat, and handed him two letters. To his honor, Baron Ash, from General-in-Chief Prince Bukonsky, 
he announced with such solemnity and significance that the official turned to him and took the letters a few minutes later the governor received alpatage and hurriedly said to him inform the prince and princess that i knew nothing i acted on the highest instructions here and he handed a paper to alpatage still as the prince is unwell my advice is that they should go to moscow i am just starting myself inform them but the governor did not finish dusty perspiring officer ran into the room and began to say something in french the governor's face expressed terror go he said nodding his head to alpatage and began questioning the officer eager frightened helpless glances were turned on alpatage when he came out of the governor's room involuntarily listening now to the firing would had drawn nearer and was increasing in strength alpatage hurried to his inn the paper handed him by the governor said this i assure you that the town of solence is not in the slightest danger as yet and it is unlikely that it will be threatened with any i from the one side and prince bragachian from the other are marching to unite our forces before smolensk which junction will be effected on the twenty second instant and both armies with their united forces will defend our compatriots of the province and entrusted to your care till our efforts shall have beaten back the enemies of our fatherland or till the last warrior in our valiant ranks has perished from this you will see that you have a perfect right to reassure the inhabitants of smolensk for those defended by two such brave armies may feel assured on victory in brackets instructions from barclay de tolly to baron ash the civil governor of smolensk eighteen twelve people were anxiously roaming about the streets carts piled high with household utensils chairs and cupboards kept emerging from the gates of the yards and moving along the streets loaded carts stood at the house next to ferapontov's and women were wailing and lamenting as they said good-bye a small watchdog ran round barking in front of the harnessed horses alpatich entered the inn-yard at a quicker pace than usual and went straight to the shed where his horses and trap were the coachman was asleep he woke him up told him to harness and went into the passage from the host's room came the sounds of a child crying the despairing sobs of a woman and the hoarse angry shouting of ferapontov the cook began running hither and thither in the passage like a frightened hen just as alpatich entered he stunned her to death killed the mistress beat her dragged her about so what for asked alpatich she kept begging to go away she's a woman take me away says she don't let me perish with my little children folks she says are all gone so why she says don't we go and he began beating and pulling her about so at these words alpatich nodded as if in approval and not wishing to hear more went to the door of the room opposite the innkeeper's where he had left his purchases you brute you murderer screamed thin pale woman who with a baby in her arms and her kerchief torn from her head burst through the door at that moment and down the steps into the yard ferapotov came out after her but on seeing a partridge adjusted his waistcoat smoothed his hair yawned and followed a partridge into the opposite room going already said he partridge without answering or looking at his host sorted his packages and asked how much he owed well reckoned up well have you been to the governor's asked ferapontov what has been decided alpatich replied that the governor had not told him anything definite with our business how can we get away said ferapontov we'd have to pay seven roubles a cartload to dorogobosh 
and I tell them they are not Christians to ask it. Selimwenov now did a good stroke last Thursday, sold flour to the army at nine rubles a sack. Will you have some tea? he asked. While the horses were being harnessed, Apatich and Verpontov over the tea talked of the price of corn, the crops, and the good weather for harvesting. Well, it seems to be getting quieter, remarked Verpontov, finishing his third cup of tea and getting up. Ours must have got the best of it. The orders were not to let them in, so we are in force, it seems. They say the other day Matthew Ivanich Platov drove them into the river manor and drowned some 18,000 in one day. Alpatich collected his parcels, handed them to the coachman who had come in and settled up with the innkeeper. The noise of wheels, hoofs, and bells was heard from the gateway as the little trap passed out. It was by now late in the afternoon. Half the street was in shadow, the other half brightly lit by the sun. Alpatich looked out of the window and went to the door. Suddenly, the strange sound of a far-off whistling and thud was heard, followed by a boom of cannon, branding into a dull roar that set the windows rattling. He went out into the street. Two men were running past towards the bridge. From different sides came whistling sounds and the thud of cannon balls and bursting shells falling on the town. But these sounds were hardly heard in comparison with the noise of the firing outside the town and attracted little attention from the inhabitants. The town was being bombarded by a hundred and thirty guns which Napoleon had ordered up after four o'clock. The people did not at once realize the meaning of this bombardment. At first, the noise of the falling bombs and shells only aroused curiosity. Ferapontov's wife, who till then had not ceased wailing under the shed, became quiet and, with the baby in her arms, went to the gate, listening to the sounds and looking in silence at the people. The cook and a shop assistant came to the gate. With lively curiosity, everyone tried to get a glimpse of the projectiles as they flew over the heads. Several people came round the corner, talking eagerly. What force, remarked one, knocked the roof and ceiling all to splinters. Routed up the earth, like a pig, said another. That's grand, it bucks one up, laughed the first. Lucky you jumped aside or it would have wiped you out. Others joined those men and stopped and told how cannon balls had fallen on a house close to them. Meanwhile, still more projectiles, now with the swift sinister whistle of a cannon ball, now with the agreeable intermittent whistle of a shell, flew over people's heads incessantly, but not one fell close by. They all flew over. A partage was getting in his trap. The innkeeper stood at the gate. What are you staring at? shouted to the cook, who, in her red skirt, with sleeves rolled up, swinging her bare elbows, had stepped to the corner to listen to what was being said. What marvels! she exclaimed, but hearing her master's voice, she turned back, pulling down her tucked up skirt. Once more, something whistled, but this time quite close, swooping downwards like a little bird. A frame flashed in the middle of the street. Something exploded, and the street was shrouded in smoke. Scoundrel, what are you doing? shouted the innkeeper, rushing to the cook. At that moment, the pitiful wailing of women was heard from different sides. The frightened baby began to cry, and people crowded silently with pale faces round the cook. The loudest sound in that crowd was her wailing. Oh, dear souls, dear kind souls, don't let me die, my good souls. Five minutes later, no one remained in the street. The cook, with a thigh broken by a shell splinter, had been carried into the kitchen. 
Alpatich, his coachman, Frapontov's wife, and children, and the house porter were all sitting in the cellar, listening. The roar of guns, the whistling of projectiles, and the piteous moaning of the cook, which rose above the other sounds, did not cease for a moment. The mistress rocked and hushed her baby, and when anyone came into the cellar, asked in a pathetic whisper what had become of her husband who had remained in the street. A short man who entered told her her husband had gone with others to the cathedral, whence they were fetching the wonder-working icon of Smolensk. Toward dusk the cannonade began to subside. A partage left the cellar and stopped in the doorway. The evening sky that had been so clear was clouded with smoke, though which high up the sickle of the new moon shone strangely. Now that the terrible din of the guns had ceased, a hush seems to reign over the town, broken only by the rustle of footsteps, the moaning, the distant cries, and the crackle of fires, which seemed widespread everywhere. The cook's moans had now subsided. On two sides, black curling clouds of smoke rose and spread from the fires. Through the streets, soldiers in various uniforms walked or ran confusedly in different directions, like ants from a ruined anthill. Several of them ran into Ferepontov's yard before Alpatich's eye. Alpatich went out to the gate. A retreating regiment, thronging and hurrying, blocked the street. Noticing him, an officer said, The town is being abandoned. Get away, get away. And then, turning to the soldiers, sh shouted, I'll teach you to run into the yards. Alpatich went back to the house, called the coachman, and told him to set off. For the part of the whole household came out too, following Alpatich and the coachman. The women, who had been silent till then, suddenly began to wail as they looked at the fires, the smoke, and even the frames of which could be seen in the falling twilight. And, as if in reply to the same kind of lamentation was heard from other parts of the street. Inside the shed, Alpatich and the coachman arranged the tangled reins and traces of their horses with trembling hands. As Alpatich was driving out to the gate, he saw some ten soldiers in Ferepontov's open shop, talking loudly and filling their bags and knapsacks with flour and sunflower seeds. Just then, Ferapontov turned and entered his shop. On seeing the soldiers, he was about to shout at them, but suddenly stopped and, clutching at his hair, burst into sobs and laughter. Lose everything, lads! Don't let those devils get it, he cried, taking some bags of flour himself and throwing them into the street. Some of the soldiers were frightened and ran away. Others went on filling their bags. On seeing Alpatich, Ferpontov turned to him. Russia is done for, he cried. Alpatich, I'll set the place on fire myself. We're done for, and Ferpontov ran into the yard. Soldiers were passing in a constant stream along the street, blocking it completely, so that Alpatich could not pass out, and had to wait. Ferepontov's wife and children were also sitting in a cart, waiting till it was possible to drive out. Night had come. There were stars in the sky, and the new moon shone out behind the smoke that screened it. On the sloping descent to the Nipper, Alpatich's cart and that of the innkeeper's wife, which were slowly moving amid the rows of soldiers and of other vehicles, had to stop. In a side street near the crossroads where the vehicles had stopped, a house and some shops were on fire. This fire was already burning itself out. 
the flames now died down and were lost in the black smoke now suddenly flared up again brightly lighting up distinctness the faces of the people crowding at the crossroads black figures flirted about before the fire and through the incessant cracking of the frames talking and shouting could be heard seeing that his trap would not be able to move on for some time arpatych got down and turned into the side street to look at the fire soldiers were continually rushing backwards and forwards near it and he saw two of them and a man in a fleece coat dragging burning beams into another yard across the street while others carried bundles of hay Arpatych went up to a large crowd standing before a high barn which was blazing briskly. The walls were all on fire and the black wall had fallen in. The wooden roof was collapsing and the rafters were alight. The crowd was evidently watching for the roof to fall in and Arpatych watched for it too. Alpatish, a familiar voice suddenly hailed the old man. Mercy on us, your excellency, answered Alpatish, immediately recognizing the voice of his young prince. Prince Andrew, in his riding cloak mounted on a black horse, was looking at Alpatish from the back of the crowd. Why are you here? he asked. Your, your excellency, stammered Alpatish and broke into sob are we really lost master why are you here prince andrew repeated at that moment the frames flared up and showed his young master's pale worn face arpatich told how he had been sent there and how difficult it was to get away are we really quite lost your excellency he asked again prince andrew without replying took out a notebook and raising his knee began writing in a pencil on a page he tore out he wrote to his sister smolensk is being abandoned bald hill will be occupied by the enemy within a week set off immediately for moscow let me know at once when you will start sent by special messenger to uswash having written this and given the paper to arpatich he told him how to arrange for departure of the prince the princess his son and the boy's tutor and how and where to let him know immediately before he had had time to finish giving these instructions a chief of staff followed by a suite galloped up to him you are a colonel shouted the chief of staff with a german accent in a voice familiar to prince andrew houses are set on fire in your presence and you stand by what does this mean you will answer for it shouted berg who was now assistant to the chief of staff of the commander of the left flank of the infantry of the first army place as berg said very agreeable and well on evidence prince andrew looked at him and without replying went on speaking to alpatich so tell them that i shall await a reply till the tenth and if by the tenth i don't receive news that they have all got away i shall have to throw up everything and come myself to bald hills prince said berg recognizing prince andrew i only spoke because i have to obey orders because i always do obey exactly you must please excuse me he went on apologetically something cracked in the flames the fire died down for a moment and wreaths of black smoke rolled from under the roof there was another terrible crash and something huge collapsed oh ro ro yelled the crowd echoing the collapsing roof of the barn the burning grain in which diffused a cake-like aroma all round the frames flared up again lighting the animated delighted exhausted faces of the spectators the man in the fleece 
coat, raised his arms and shouted, "It's fine, lass! Now it's raging! It's fine!" That's the owner himself," cried several voices. "Well then," continued Prince Andrew to Alpatich, "report to them as I have told you." And not replying a word to Berg, who was now mute beside him. He touched his horse and rode down the side street. End of chapter four. War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Andy Yu, Mississauga, Canada. War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Five, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. From Smolensk, the troops continued to retreat, followed by the enemy. On the tenth of August, the regiment Prince Andrew commanded was marching along the high road past the avenue leading to Bald Hills. Heat and drought had continued for more than three weeks. Each day, fleecy clouds floated across the sky and occasionally veiled the sun but toward evening the sky cleared again and the sun set in reddish-brown mist. Heavy night dews alone refreshed the earth. The unreaped corn was scorched and shed its grain. The marshes dried up. The cattle lowed from hunger, finding no food on the sun-parched meadows. Only at night and in the forests, while the dew lasted, was there any freshness. But on the road, the high road along which the troops marched, there was no such freshness, even at night, or when the road passed through the forest. The dew was imperceptible on the sandy dust, churned up more than six inches deep. As soon as day dawned, the march began. The artillery and baggage wagons moved noiselessly through the deep dust that rose to the very hubs of the wheels, and the infantry sank ankle-deep in that soft, choking, hot dust that never cooled, even at night. Some of this dust was needed by the feet and wheels, while the rest rose and hung like a cloud over the troops, settling in eyes, ears, hair and nostrils, and worst of all, in the lungs of the men and beasts as they moved along that road. The higher the sun rose, the higher rose that cloud of dust, and through the screen of its hot fine particles one could look with naked eye at the sun, which showed like a huge crimson ball in the unclouded sky. There was no wind, and the men choked in that motionless atmosphere. They marched with handkerchiefs tied over their noses and mouths. When they passed through a village, they all rushed to the wells and fought for the water and drank it down to the mud. Prince Andrew was in command of a regiment, and the management of that regiment, the welfare of the men and the necessity of receiving and giving orders, engrossed him. The burning of Smolensk and its abandonment made an epoch in his life. A novel feeling of anger against the foe made him forget his own sorrow. He was entirely devoted to the affairs of his regiment, and was considerate and kind to his men and officers. In the regiment they called him Our Prince, were proud of him and loved him. But he was kind and gentle only to those of his regiment, to Timochin and the like, people quite new to him, belonging to a different world, and who could not know and understand his past. As soon as he came across a former acquaintance or anyone from the staff, he bristled up immediately and grew spiteful, ironical, and contemptuous. Everything that reminded him of his past was repugnant to him, and so in his relations with that former circle he confined himself trying to do his duty and not to be unfair. In truth, everything presented itself in a dark and gloomy light to Prince Andrew, especially after the abandonment of Smolensk on the 6th of August. He considered that it could and should have been defended, and after his sick father had had to flee to Moscow, abandoning to pillage his dearly beloved bald hills which he had built and peopled. But despite this, thanks to his regiment, Prince Andrew had something to think about entirely apart from general questions. Two days previously he had received news that his father, son, and sister had left for Moscow, and though there was nothing for him to do at bald hills, Prince Andrew, with a characteristic desire to foment his own grief, decided that he must ride there. He ordered his horse to be saddled, and, leaving his regiment on the march, rode to his father's estate, where he had been born and spent his childhood. Riding past the pond, where there used always to be dozens of women, 
chattering as they rinsed their linen or beat it with wooden beetles, Prince Andrew noticed that there was not a soul about, and that the little washing wharf, torn from its place and half submerged, was floating on its side in the middle of the pond. He rode to the keeper's lodge. No one at the stone entrance gates of the drive, and the door stood open. Grass had already begun to grow on the garden paths, and horses and calves were straying in the English park. Prince Andrew rode up to the hothouse. Some of the glass panes were broken, and of the trees and tubs some were overturned, and others dried up. He called for Taras, the gardener, but no one replied. Having gone round the corner of the hothouse to the ornamental garden, he saw that the carved garden fence was broken, and branches of the plum trees had been torn off with the fruit. An old peasant, whom Prince Andrew in his childhood had often seen at the gate, was sitting on a green garden seat, plaiting a bast shoe. He was deaf, and did not hear Prince Andrew ride up. He was sitting on the seat the old prince used to like to sit on, and beside him strips of bast were hanging on the broken and withered branch of a magnolia. Prince Andrew rode up to the house. Several limes in the old garden had been cut down, and a piebald mare and her foal were wandering in front of the house among the rose bushes. The shutters were all closed, except at one window, which was open. A little serf boy, seeing Prince Andrew, ran into the house. Alpetich, having sent his family away, was alone at Bald Hills, and was sitting indoors, reading the lives of the saints. On hearing that Prince Andrew had come, he went out with his spectacles on his nose, buttoning his coat, and, hastily stepping up, without a word, began weeping and kissing Prince Andrew's knee. Then, vexed at his own weakness, he turned away and began to report on the position of affairs. Everything precious and valuable had been removed to Bakhuchahava. Seventy quarters of grain had also been carted away. The hay and the spring corn, of which Alpatich said there had been a remarkable crop that year, had been commandeered by the troops and mown down while still green. The peasants were ruined. Some of them, too, had gone to Bakhuchahava. Only a few remained. Without waiting to hear him out, Prince Andrew asked, "'When did my father and sister leave?' meaning, when did they leave for Moscow? Alpatich, understanding the question to refer to their departure for Bakuhava, replied that they had left on the 7th, and again went into details concerning the estate management, asking for instructions. "'Am I to let the troops have the oats, and to take a receipt for them? We have still six hundred quarters left,' he inquired. "'What am I to say to him?' thought Prince Andrew, looking down on the old man's bald head, shining in the sun, and seeing by the expression on his face that the old man himself understood how untimely such questions were, and only asked them to allay his grief. "'Yes, let them have it,' replied Prince Andrew. "'If you noticed some disorder in the garden,' said Alpatich, "'it was impossible to prevent it. Three regiments have been here and spent the night, dragoons mostly. I took down the name and rank of their commanding officer, to hand in a complaint about it. "'Well, and what are you going to do?' "'Will you stay here if the enemy occupies the place?' asked Prince Andrew. Alpatich turned his face to Prince Andrew, looked at him, and suddenly, with a solemn gesture, raised his arm. "'He is my refuge! His will be done!' he exclaimed. A group of bareheaded peasants was approaching across the meadow toward the prince. "'Well, good-bye,' said Prince Andrew, bending over to Alpatich. "'You must go away, too. Take away what you can, and tell the serfs to go to the Ryazan estate.' or to the one near Moscow. Alpatich clung to Prince Andrew's leg and burst into sobs. Gently disengaging himself, the prince spurred his horse and rode down the avenue at a gallop. The old man was still sitting in the ornamental garden, like a fly impassive on the face of a loved one who is dead, tapping the bast on which he was making the bast shoe, and two little girls, running out from the hothouse, carrying in their skirts plums they had plucked from the trees there, came upon Prince Andrew. On seeing the young master, the elder one, frightened, clutched her younger companion by the hand and hid with her behind a birch tree, not stopping to pick up some green plums they had dropped. Prince Andrew turned away with startled haste, unwilling to let them see that they had been observed. He was sorry for the pretty, frightened little girl, was afraid of looking at her, and yet felt an irresistible desire to do so. A new sensation of comfort and relief came over him when, seeing these girls, he realized the existence of other human interests entirely aloof from his own, and just as legitimate as those that occupied him. Evidently, these girls passionately desired one thing, 
to carry away and eat those green plums without being caught, and Prince Andrew shared their wish for the success of their enterprise. He could not resist looking at them once more. Believing their danger passed, they sprang from their ambush, and, chirruping something in their shrill little voices and holding up their skirts, their bare little sunburned feet scampered merrily and quickly across the meadow grass. Prince Andrew was somewhat refreshed by having ridden off the dusty high road along which the troops were moving, but not far from Bald Hills he again came out on the road and overtook his regiment at its halting place by the dam of a small pond. It was past one o'clock. The sun, a red ball through the dust, burned and scorched his back intolerably through his black coat. The dust always hung motionless above the buzz of talk that came from the resting troops. There was no wind. As he crossed the dam, Prince Andrew smelt the ooze and freshness of the pond. He longed to get into that water, however dirty it might be, and he glanced round at the pool from whence came sounds of shrieks and laughter. The small, muddy, green pond had risen visibly more than a foot, flooding the dam, because it was full of the naked white bodies of soldiers, with brick-red hands, necks and faces, who were splashing about in it. All this naked white human flesh, laughing and shrieking, floundered about in that dirty pool like carp stuffed into a watering-can, and the suggestion of merriment in that floundering mass rendered it specially pathetic. One fair-haired young soldier of the third company, whom Prince Andrew knew, and who had a strap round the calf of one leg, crossed himself, stepped back to get a good run, and plunged into the water. Another, a dark, non-commissioned officer, who was always shaggy, stood up to his waist in the water, joyfully wriggling his muscular figure, and snorted with satisfaction as he poured the water over his head with hands blackened to the wrists. There were sounds of men slapping one another, yelling and puffing. Everywhere on the bank, on the dam, and in the pond, there was healthy, white, muscular flesh. The officer, Timokin, with his red little nose, standing on the dam, wiping himself with a towel, felt confused at seeing the prince, but made up his mind to address him nevertheless. "'It's very nice, Your Excellency. Wouldn't you like to?' said he. "'It's dirty,' replied Prince Andrew, making a grimace. "'We'll clear it out for you in a minute,' said Timokin, and, still undressed, ran off to clear the men out of the pond. "'The prince wants to bathe.' "'What prince? Ours?' said many voices, and the men were in such haste to clear out that the prince could hardly stop them. He decided that he would rather wash himself with water in the barn. Flesh, bodies, cannon fodder, he thought, and he looked at his own naked body and shuddered, not from cold, but from a sense of disgust and horror he did not himself understand, aroused by the sight of that immense number of bodies splashing about in the dirty pond. On the 7th of August, Prince Bagration rode as follows from his quarters at Mikhailovna on the Smolensk road. Dear Count Alexis Andreevich, he was writing to Arachiev, but knew that his letter would be read by the Emperor, and therefore weighed every word in it to the best of his ability. I expect the minister, Barclay de Tailly, has already reported the abandonment of Smolensk to the enemy. It is pitiable and sad and the whole army is in despair that this most important place has been wantonly abandoned. I, for my part, begged him personally, most urgently, and finally wrote him, but nothing would induce him to consent. I swear to you, on my honour, that Napoleon was in such a fix as never before, and might have lost half his army, but could not have taken Smolensk. Our troops fought, and are fighting, as never before." With fifteen thousand men I held the enemy at bay for thirty-five hours and beat him, but he would not hold out even for fourteen hours. It is disgraceful, a stain on our army, and as for him, he ought, it seems to me, not to live. If he reports that our losses were great, it is not true. Perhaps about four thousand, not more, and not even that. But even were they ten thousand, that's war. But the enemy has lost masses." what would it have cost him to hold out for another two days? They would have had to retire of their own accord, for they had no water for men or horses. He gave me his word he would not retreat, but suddenly sent instructions that he was retiring that night. We cannot fight in this way, or we may soon bring the enemy to Moscow. There is a rumour that you are thinking of peace. God forbid that you should make peace, after all our sacrifices and such insane retreats. 
you would set all Russia against you, and every one of us would feel ashamed to wear the uniform. If it has come to this, we must fight as long as Russia can, and as long as there are men able to stand. One man ought to be in command, and not two. Your minister may perhaps be good as a minister, but as a general he is not merely bad, but execrable. Yet to him is entrusted the fate of our whole country. I am really frantic with vexation. Forgive my writing boldly. It is clear that the man who advocates the conclusion of a peace, and that the minister should command the army, does not love our sovereign, and desires the ruin of us all. So I write you frankly, call out the militia, for the minister is leading these visitors after him to Moscow in a most masterly way. The whole army feels great suspicion of the imperial aide-de-camp, Wolzogen. He is said to be more Napoleon's man than ours, and he is always advising the minister. I am not merely civil to him, but obey him like a corporal, though I am his senior. This is painful, but, loving my benefactor and sovereign, I submit. Only I am sorry for the emperor that he entrusts our fine army to such as he. Consider that on our retreat we have lost by fatigue and left in the hospital more than fifteen thousand men, and had we attacked this would not have happened. Tell me, for God's sake, what will Russia, our mother Russia, say to our being so frightened, and why are we abandoning our good and gallant fatherland to such rabble, and implanting feelings of hatred and shame in all our subjects? What are we scared at? and of whom are we afraid? I am not to blame that the minister is vacillating, a coward, dense, dilatory, and has all bad qualities. The whole army bewails it, and calls down curses upon him. End of chapter 5《War and Peace》Book Ten, Chapter Six, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. Among the innumerable categories applicable to the phenomena of human life, one may discriminate between those in which substance prevails and those in which form prevails. To the latter, as distinguished from village, country, provincial, or even Moscow life, we may allot Petersburg life and especially the life of its salons. That life of the salons is unchanging. Since the year 1805 we had made peace and had again quarreled with Bonaparte, and had made constitutions and unmade them again, but the salons of Anna Pavlovna Helene remained just as they had been, the one seven years and the other five years before. At Anna Pavlovna's they talked with perplexity of Bonaparte's successes just as before, and saw in them and in the subservience shown to him by the European sovereigns a malicious conspiracy, the sole object of which was to cause unpleasantness and anxiety to the court circle of which Anna Pavlovna was the representative. And in Helene's salon, which Rumyantsev himself honored with his visits, regarding Helene as a remarkably intelligent woman, they talked with the same ecstasy in 1812 as in 1808 of the great nation and the great man and regretted our rupture with France, a rupture which, according to them, ought to be promptly terminated by peace. Of late, since the Emperor's return from the army, there had been some excitement in these conflicting salon circles, and some demonstrations of hostility to one another, but each camp retained its own tendency. In Anna Pavlovna's circle only those Frenchmen were admitted who were deep-rooted legitimists, and patriotic views were expressed to the effect that one ought not to go to the French theatre and that to maintain the French troop was costing the government as much as a whole army corps. The progress of the war was eagerly followed, and only the reports most flattering to our army were circulated. In the French circle of Helene and Rumyantsev, the reports of the cruelty of the enemy and of the war were contradicted, and all Napoleon's attempts at conciliation were discussed. In that circle, they discountenanced those who advised hurried preparations for a removal to Kazan of the court and the girls' educational establishments under the patronage of the Dowager Empress. In Helene's circle, the war in general was regarded as a series of formal demonstrations which would very soon end in peace, and the view prevailed expressed by Bilibin, who now in Petersburg was quite at home in Helene's house, 
which every clever man was obliged to visit, that not by gunpowder, but by those who invented it would matters be settled. In that circle, the Moscow enthusiasm, news of which had reached Petersburg simultaneously with the Emperor's return, was ridiculed sarcastically and very cleverly, though with much caution. Anna Pavlovna's circle, on the contrary, was enraptured by this enthusiasm and spoke of it as Plutarch speaks of the deeds of the ancients. Prince Vasily, who still occupied his former important posts, formed a connecting link between these two circles. He visited his good friend Anna Pavlovna, as well as his daughter's diplomatic salon, and often in his constant comings and goings between the two camps became confused and said at Helene's what he should have said at Anna Pavlovna's, and vice versa. Soon after the emperor's return, Prince Vasily, in a conversation about the war at Anna Pavlovna's, severely condemned Barclay de Tolly, but was undecided as to who ought to be appointed commander-in-chief. One of the visitors, usually spoken of as a man of great merit, having described how he had that day seen Kutuzov, the newly chosen chief of the Petersburg militia, presiding over the enrollment of recruits at the treasury, cautiously ventured to suggest that Kutuzov would be the man to satisfy all requirements. Anna Pavlovna remarked with a melancholy smile that Kutuzov had done nothing but cause the emperor annoyance. I have talked and talked at the assembly of the nobility, Prince Vasily interrupted, but they did not listen to me. I told them his election as chief of the militia would not please the emperor. They did not listen to me. It's all this mania for opposition, he went on. And who for? It is all because we want to ape the foolish enthusiasm of the Muscovites, Prince Vasily continued, forgetting for a moment that though at Helene's one had to ridicule the Moscow enthusiasm, at Anna Pavlovna's one had to be ecstatic about it. But he retrieved his mistake at once. Now is it suitable that Count Kutuzov, the oldest general in Russia, should preside at that tribunal? He will get nothing for his pains. How could they make a man commander-in-chief who cannot mount a horse, who drops asleep at council, and has the very worst morals? A good reputation he made for himself at Bucharest. I don't speak of his capacity as a general, but at a time like this, how they appoint a decrepit, blind old man, positively blind, a fine idea to have a blind general. He can't see anything. To play blind man's bluff, he can't see at all. No one replied to his remarks. This was quite correct on the 24th of July, but on the 29th of July, Kutuzov received the title of prince. This might indicate a wish to get rid of him, and therefore Prince Vasily's opinion continued to be correct, though he was not now in any hurry to express it. But on the 8th of August, a committee, consisting of Field Marshal Saltikov, Arakchev, Vyazmitinov, Lopuchkin, and Kochuvi, met to consider the progress of the war. This committee came to the conclusion that our failures were due to a want of unity in the command, and though the members of the committee were aware of the emperor's dislike of Kutuzov, after a short deliberation they agreed to advise his appointment as commander-in-chief. That same day Kutuzov was appointed commander-in-chief with full powers over the armies and over the whole region occupied by them. On the 9th of August, Prince Vasily at Anna Pavlovna's again met the man of great merit. The latter was very attentive to Anna Pavlovna because he wanted to be appointed director of one of the educational establishments for young ladies. Prince Vasily entered the room with the air of a happy conqueror who has attained the object of his desires. Well, have you heard the great news? Prince Kutuzov is field marshal. All dissensions are at an end. I am so glad, so delighted. At last we have a man. And he, glancing sternly and significantly round at everyone in the drawing room. The man of great merit, despite his desire to obtain the post of director, could not refrain from reminding Prince Vasily of his former opinion. Though this was impolite to Prince Vasily in Anna Pavlovna's drawing room, and also to Anna Pavlovna herself, who had received the news with delight, he could not resist the temptation. But, Prince, they say he is blind, said he, reminding Prince Vasily of his own words. Eh? Nonsense! He sees well enough, said Prince Vasily rapidly, in a deep voice and with a slight cough the voice and cough with which he was wont to dispose of all difficulties. He sees well enough, he added. And what I am so pleased about, he went on, is that our sovereign has given him full powers over all the armies in the whole region, powers no commander-in-chief ever had before. He's a second autocrat, he concluded with a victorious smile. God grant it, God grant it, said Anna Pavlovna, the man of great merit, 
who was still a novice in court circles, wishing to flatter Anna Pavlovna by defending her former position on the question, observed, It is said that the emperor was reluctant to give Kutuzov those powers. They say he blushed like a girl to whom Jaconde is read, when he said to Kutuzov, Your emperor and the fatherland award you this honor. Perhaps the heart took no part in that speech, said Anna Pavlovna. Oh, no, no, warmly rejoined Prince Vasily, who would not now yield Kutuzov to anyone. In his opinion, Kutuzov was not only admirable himself, but was adored by everybody. No, that's impossible, said he, for our sovereign appreciated him so highly before. God grant only that Prince Kutuzov assumes real power and does not allow anyone to put a spoke in his wheel, observed Anna Pavlovna. Understanding at once to whom she alluded, Prince Vasily said in a whisper, I know for a fact that Kutuzov made it an absolute condition that the Tsvarovich should not be with the army. Do you know what he said to the emperor? And Prince Vasily repeated the words supposed to have been spoken by Kutuzov to the emperor. I can neither punish him if he does wrong, nor reward him if he does right. Oh, a very wise man is Prince Kutuzov. I have known him a long time. They even say, remarked the man of great merit, who did not yet possess courtly tact, that His Excellency made it an express condition that the sovereign himself should not be with the army. As soon as he said that, both Prince Vasily and Anna Pavlovna turned away from him and glanced sadly at one another with a sigh at his naivete. End of chapter 6 Read by David F-O-U-R-T-E-A-T-O-O -O dot blogspot dot com War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 7, read for LibriVox.org, by Eva Harnick. While this was taking place in Petersburg, the French had already passed Smolensk and were drawing nearer and nearer to Moscow. Napoleon's historian Thiers, like other of his historians, trying to justify his hero, says, that he was drawn to the walls of Moscow against his will. He is as right as other historians who look for the explanation of historic events in the will of one man. He is as right as the Russian historians who maintain that Napoleon was drawn to Moscow by the skill of the Russian commanders. Here, Besides the law of retrospection, which regards all the past as a preparation for events that subsequently occur, the law of reciprocity comes in confusing the whole matter. A good chess player, having lost a game, is sincerely convinced that his loss resulted from a mistake he made and looks for that mistake in the opening, but forgets that at each stage of the game there were similar mistakes and that none of his moves were perfect. He only notices the mistake to which he pays attention because his opponent took advantage of it. How much more complex than this is the game of war, which occurs under certain limits of time and where it is not one will that manipulates the lifeless objects but everything results from innumerable conflicts of various wills. After Smolensk, Napoleon sought a battle beyond Dorogbuz at Vyazma and then at Tsarevo Zaimice, but it happened that owing to a conjunction of innumerable circumstances, the Russians could not give battle till they reached Borodino, 70 miles from Moscow. From Vyazma, Napoleon ordered a direct advance on Moscow. Moscow, la capitale asiatique de ce grand empire, la ville sacrée des peuples d'Alexandre, Moscow, avec ses innumerable églises en forme de pagode chinoise. Asterisk, Moscow, 
the Asiatic capital of this great empire, the sacred city of Alexander's people, Moscow, with its innumerable churches shaped like Chinese pagodas. This Moscow gave Napoleon's imagination no rest. On the march from Vyazma to Cherevo Zainice, he rode his light bay bobtailed ambler, accompanied by his guards, his bodyguard, his pages, and aide de camp. Berthier, his chief of staff, dropped behind to question a Russian prisoner captured by the cavalry. Followed by Le Lone, de de Ville, an interpreter, he overtook Napoleon at a gallop and reined in his horse with an amused expression. Well, asked Napoleon, one of Platov's Cossacks says that Platov's court is joining up with the main army and that Kutuzov has been appointed commander-in-chief. He is a very shrewd and garrulous fellow. Napoleon smiled and told them to give the Cossack a horse and bring the man to him. He wished to talk to him himself. Several adjutants galloped off, and an hour later, Labrushka, the serf Denisov had handed over to Rostov, rode up to Napoleon in an orderly jacket and on a French cavalry saddle with a merry and tipsy face. Napoleon told him to ride by his side and began questioning him. You are a Cossack. Yes, a Cossack, Your Honor. The Cossack, not knowing in what company he was, for Napoleon's plain appearance had nothing about it that would reveal to an Oriental mind the presence of a monarch, talked with extreme familiarity of the incidents of the war, says Thiers, narrating this episode. In reality, Labrushka, having got drunk the day before and left his master dinnerless, had been whipped and sent to the village in quest of chickens, where he engaged in looting till the French took him prisoner. Lavrushka was one of those coarse, barefaced lackeys who have seen all sorts of things, consider it necessary to do everything in a mean and cunning way, are ready to render any sort of service to their master, and are keen at guessing their master's baser impulses especially those prompted by vanity and pettiness. Finding himself in the company of Napoleon, whose identity he had easily and surely recognized, Lavrushka was not in the least abashed, but merely did his utmost to gain his new master's favor. He knew very well that this was Napoleon, but Napoleon's presence could no more intimidate him than Rostov's or a sergeant major's with the rods would have done, for he had nothing that either the sergeant major or Napoleon could deprive him of. So he rattled on, telling all the gossip he had heard among the orderlies, much of it true. But when Napoleon asked him, whether the Russians thought they would beat Bonaparte or not, Larushka screwed up his eyes and considered. In this question he saw subtle cunning, as men of his type see cunning in everything, so he frowned and did not answer immediately. It is like this, he said thoughtfully. If there is a battle soon, yours will win. That's right. But if three days pass, then after that, well, then that same battle will not soon be over. Lelon de Ideville smilingly interpreted this speech to Napoleon thus. If a battle takes place within the next three days, the French will win, but if later, God knows what will happen. Napoleon did not smile, though he was evidently in high good humor, and he ordered these words to be repeated. Lavrushka noticed this, and to entertain him further, pretending not to know who Napoleon was, added, We know that you have Bonaparte, 
and that he has beaten everybody in the world. But we are a different matter. Without knowing why or how this bit of boastful patriotism slipped out at the end. The interpreter translated these words without the last phrase and Bonaparte smiled. The young Cossack made his mighty interlocutor smile, says Pierre. After riding a few paces in silence, Napoleon turned to Berthier and said he wished to see how the news that he was talking to the emperor himself, to that very emperor who had written his immortally victorious name on the pyramids, would affect this enfant du don, asterisk, child of the dawn. The fact was accordingly conveyed to Lavrushka. Lavrushka, understanding that this was done to perplex him and that Napoleon expected him to be frightened, to gratify his new masters, promptly pretended to be astonished and awestruck, opened his eyes wide and assumed the expression he usually put on when taken to be whipped. As soon as Napoleon's interpreter had spoken, says Thiers, the Cossack, seized by amazement, did not utter another word, but rode on, his eyes fixed on the conqueror, whose fame had reached him across the steppes of the East. All his loquacity was suddenly arrested and replaced by a naive and silent feeling of admiration. Napoleon, after making the Cossack a present, had him set free, like a bird restored to its native fields. Napoleon rode on, dreaming of the Moscow that so appealed to his imagination, and the bird restored to its native fields galloped to our outposts, inventing on the way all that had not taken place, but that he meant to relate to his comrades. What had really taken place, he did not wish to relate, because it seemed to him not worth telling. He found the Cossacks, inquired for the regiment operating with blood of detachment, and by evening found his master Nicholas Rostov quartered at Yankovo. Rostov was just mounting to go for a ride around the neighboring villages with Ilyin. He let Labrushka have another horse and took him along with him. End of chapter 7 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 8 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick Princess Mary was not in Moscow and out of danger as Prince Andrew supposed. After the return of Alpatich from Smolensk, the old prince suddenly seemed to awake as from a dream. He ordered the militiamen to be called up from the villages and armed, and wrote a letter to the commander-in-chief informing him that he had resolved to remain at Bald Hills to the last extremity and to defend it, leaving to the commander-in-chief's discretion to take measures or not for the defense of Bald Hills, where one of Russia's oldest generals would be captured or killed, and he announced to his household that he would remain at Ball's Hills. But while himself remaining, he gave instructions for the departure of the princess and the Sals with the little prince to Bogucharovo and thence to Moscow. Princess Mary, alarmed by her father's feverish and sleepless activity, after his previous apathy, could not bring herself to leave him alone, and, for the first time in her life, 
ventured to disobey him. She refused to go away, and her father's fury broke over her in a terrible storm. He repeated every injustice he had ever inflicted on her. Trying to convict her, he told her she had worn him out, had caused his quarrel with his son, had harbored nasty suspicions of him, making it the object of her life to poison his existence, and he drove her from his study, telling her that if she did not go away, it was all the same to him. He declared that he did not wish to remember her existence and warned her not to dare to let him see her. The fact that he did not, as she had feared, order her to be carried away by force, but only told her not to let him see her, cheered Princess Mary. She knew it was a proof that in the depths of his soul he was glad she was remaining at home and had not gone away. The morning after little Nicholas had left, the old prince donned his full uniform and prepared to visit the commander-in-chief. His calash was already at the door. Princess Mary saw him walk out of the house in his uniform, wearing all his orders, and go down the garden to review his armed peasants and domestic serfs. She sat by the window, listening to his voice, which reached her from the garden. Suddenly several men came running up the avenue with frightened faces. Princess Mary ran out to the porch, down the flower-bordered path, and into the avenue. A large crowd of militiamen and domestics were moving toward her, and in their midst several men were supporting by the armpits and dragging along a little old man in a uniform and decorations. She ran up to him, and in the play of the sunlight that fell in small round spots through the shade of the Lime Tree Avenue, could not be sure what change there was in his face. All she could see was that his former stern and determined expression had altered to one of timidity and submission. On seeing his daughter, he moved his helpless lips and made a hoarse sound. It was impossible to make out what he wanted. He was lifted up, carried to his study, and laid on the very couch he had so feared of late. The doctor, who was fetched that same night, bled him and said that the prince had had a seizure paralyzing his right side. It was becoming more and more dangerous to remain at Bald Hills, and next day they moved the prince to Bogucharovo, the doctor accompanying him. By the time they reached Bogucharovo, Dessals and the little prince had already left for Moscow. For three weeks the old prince lay stricken by paralysis in the new house Prince Andrew had built at Bogucharovo, ever in the same state, getting neither better nor worse. He was unconscious and lay like a distorted corpse. He muttered unceasingly, his eyebrows and lips twitching, and it was impossible to tell whether he understood what was going on around him or not. One thing was certain, that he was suffering and wished to say something, but what it was no one could tell. It might be some caprice of a sick and half-crazy man, or it might relate to public affairs or possibly to family concerns. The doctor said this restlessness did not mean anything and was due to physical causes. But Princess Mary thought he wished to tell her something, and the fact that her presence always increased his restlessness confirmed her opinion. 
He was evidently suffering both physically and mentally. There was no hope of recovery. It was impossible for him to travel. It would not do to let him die on the road. Would it not be better if the end did come, the very end? Princess Mary sometimes thought. Night and day, hardly sleeping at all, she watched him and, terrible to say, often watched him, not with hope of finding signs of improvement, but wishing to find symptoms of the approach of the end. Strange as it was to her to acknowledge this feeling in herself, yet there it was. And what seemed still more terrible to her was that since her father's illness began, perhaps even sooner when she stayed with him expecting something to happen, all the personal desires and hopes that had been forgotten or sleeping within her had awakened. Thoughts that had not entered her mind for years, thoughts of a life free from the fear of her father and even the possibility of love and of family happiness floated continually in her imagination like temptations of the devil. Thrust them aside as she would, questions continually recurred to her as to how she would order her life now after that. These were temptations of the devil, and Princess Mary knew it. She knew that the sole weapon against him was prayer, and she tried to pray. She assumed an attitude of prayer, looked at the icons, repeated the words of a prayer, but she could not pray. She felt that a different world had now taken possession of her, the life of a world of strenuous and free activity, quite opposed to the spiritual world in which till now she had been confined and in which her greatest comfort had been prayer. She could not pray, could not weep, and worldly cares took possession of her. It was becoming dangerous to remain in Bogucharovo. News of the approach of the French came from all sides, and in one village, ten miles from Bogucharovo, a homestead had been looted by French marauders. The doctor insisted on the necessity of moving the prince. The provincial marshal of the nobility sent an official to Princess Mary to persuade her to get away as quickly as possible, and the head of the rural police, having come to Bogucharovo, urged the same thing, saying that the French were only some twenty-five miles away, that French proclamations were circulating in the villages, and that if the princess did not take her father away before the fifteenth, he could not answer for the consequences. The princess decided to leave on the fifteenth. The cares of preparation and giving orders, for which everyone came to her, occupied her all day. She spent the night of the fourteenth, as usual, without undressing, in the room next to the one where the prince lay. Several times, waking up, she heard his groans and muttering, the creak of his bed and the steps of Tikhon and the doctor when they turned him over. Several times she listened at the door, and it seemed to her that his mutterings were louder than usual and that they turned him over oftener. She could not sleep, and several times went to the door and listened, wishing to enter, but not deciding to do so. Though he did not speak, Princess Mary saw and knew how unpleasant every sign of anxiety on his account was to him. She had noticed with what dissatisfaction he turned from the look 
she sometimes involuntarily fixed on him. She knew that her going in during the night at an unusual hour would irritate him. But never had she felt so grieved for him or so much afraid of losing him. She recalled all her life with him, and in every word and act of his found an expression of his love of her. Occasionally, amid these memories, temptations of the devil would surge into her imagination, thoughts of how things would be after his death, and how her new liberated life would be ordered. But she drove these thoughts away with disgust. Toward morning he became quiet and she fell asleep. She woke late. That sincerity, which often comes with waking, showed her clearly what chiefly concerned her about her father's illness. On waking, she listened to what was going on behind the door, and hearing him groan, said to herself with a sigh that things were still the same. But what could have happened? What did I want? I want his death, she cried with a feeling of loathing for herself. She washed, dressed, said her prayers, and went out to the porch. In front of it stood carriages without horses, and things were being packed into the vehicles. It was a warm grey morning. Princess Mary stopped at the porch, still horrified by her spiritual baseness and trying to arrange her thoughts before going to her father. The doctor came downstairs and went out to her. He's a little better today, said he. I was looking for you. One can make out something of what he's saying. His head is clearer. Come in, he's asking for you. Princess Mary's heart beat so violently at this news that she grew pale and leaned against the wall to keep from falling. To see him, talk to him, feel his eyes on her, now that her whole soul was overflowing with those dreadful wicked temptations, was a torment of joy and terror. Come, said the doctor. Princess Mary entered her father's room and went up to his bed. He was lying on his back, propped up high, and his small bony hands with their knotted purple veins were lying on the quilt. His left eye gazed straight before him. His right eye was awry, and his brows and lips motionless. He seemed altogether so thin, small and pathetic. His face seemed to have shriveled or melted. His features had grown smaller. Princess Mary went up and kissed his hand. His left hand pressed her so that she understood that he had long been waiting for her to come. He twitched her hand and his brows and lips quivered angrily. She looked at him in dismay, trying to guess what he wanted of her. When she changed her position so that his left eye could see her face, he calmed down, not taking his eyes off her for some seconds. Then his lips and tongue moved, sounds came, and he began to speak, gazing timidly and imploringly at her, evidently afraid that she might not understand. Straining all her faculties, Princess Mary looked at him. The comic efforts with which he moved his tongue made her drop her eyes and with difficulty repress the sobs that rose to her throat. He said something, repeating the same words several times. She could not understand them but tried to guess what he was saying and inquiringly repeated the words he uttered. Mary, Ed, he repeated several times. 
It was quite impossible to understand these sounds. The doctor thought he had guessed them, and inquiringly repeated, Mary, are you afraid? The prince shook his head, again repeated the same sounds. My mind, my mind aches, questioned Princess Mary. He made a mumbling sound in confirmation of this, took her hand, and began pressing it to different parts of his breast, as if trying to find the right place for it. Always thoughts. About you. Thoughts. He then uttered much more clearly than he had done before, now that he was sure of being understood. Princess Mary pressed her head against his hand, trying to hide her sobs and tears. He moved his hand over her hair. I have been calling you all night, he brought out. If only I had known, she said through her tears. I was afraid to come in. He pressed her hand. Weren't you asleep? No, I did not sleep said Princess Mary, shaking her head. Unconsciously imitating her father, she now tried to express herself as he did, as much as possible by signs, and her tongue, too, seemed to move with difficulty. Dear one, dearest, Princess Mary could not quite make out what he had said, but from his look, it was clear that he had uttered a tender, caressing word, such as he had never used to her before. Why didn't you come in? And I was wishing for his death, thought Princess Mary. He was silent a while. Thank you, daughter dear, for all, for all, forgive. Thank you. Forgive, thank you. And tears began to flow from his eyes. Call Andrew, he said suddenly, and a childish, timid expression of doubt showed itself on his face as he spoke. He himself seemed aware that his demand was meaningless. So at least it seemed to Princess Mary. I have a letter from him, she replied. He glanced at her with timid surprise. Where is he? He is with the army father at Smolensk. He closed his eyes and remained silent a long time. Then, as if in answer to his doubts and to confirm the fact that now he understood and remembered everything, he nodded his head and reopened his eyes. Yes, he said softly and distinctly, Russia has perished. They have destroyed her. And he began to sob, and again tears flowed from his eyes. Princess Mary could no longer restrain herself and wept while she gazed at his face. Again he closed his eyes. His sobs ceased, he pointed to his eyes, and Tikhon, understanding him, wiped away the tears. Then he again opened his eyes and said something none of them could understand for a long time, till at last Tikhon understood and repeated it. Princess Mary had sought the meaning of his words in the mood in which he had just been speaking. She sought he was speaking of Russia, or Prince Andrew, of herself, of his grandson, or of his own death, and so she could not guess his words. Put on your white dress, I like it, was what he said. Having understood this, Princess Mary sobbed still louder, and the doctor, taking her arm, led her out to the veranda, soothing her and trying to persuade her to prepare for her journey. 
When she had left the room, the prince again began speaking about his son, about the war, and about the emperor, angrily twitching his brows and raising his hoarse voice, and then he had a second and final stroke. Princess Mary stayed on the veranda. The day had cleared, it was hot and sunny. She could understand nothing, think of nothing, and feel nothing, except passionate love for her father, love such as she thought she had never felt till that moment. She ran out sobbing into the garden and as far as the pond, along the avenue of young lime trees Prince Andrew had planted. Yes, I, I, I wished for his death. Yes, I wanted it to end quicker. I wished to be at peace. And what will become of me? What use will peace be when he is no longer here? Princess Mary murmured, pacing the garden with hurried steps and pressing her hands to her bosom, which heaved with convulsive sobs. When she had completed the tour of the garden, which brought her again to the house, she saw Mademoiselle Burien, who had remained at Bogucharovo and did not wish to leave it, coming toward her with a stranger. This was the marshal of the nobility of the district, who had come personally to point out to the princess the necessity for her prompt departure. Princess Mary listened without understanding him. She led him to the house, offered him lunch, and sat down with him. Then, excusing herself, she went to the door of the old prince's room. The doctor came out with an agitated face and said she could not enter. Go away, princess! Go away! Go away! She returned to the garden and sat down on the grass at the foot of the slope by the pond, where no one could see her. She did not know how long she had been there when she was aroused by the sound of a woman's footsteps running along the path. She rose and saw Dunyasha, her maid, who was evidently looking for her, and who stopped suddenly as if in alarm on seeing her mistress. Please come, princess, the prince, said Dunyasha in a breaking voice. Immediately, I am coming, I am coming, replied the princess hurriedly, not giving Dunyasha time to finish what she was saying and trying to avoid seeing the girl. She ran toward the house. Princess, it is God's will. You must be prepared for everything said the marshal, meeting her at the house door. Let me alone. It is not true, she cried angrily to him. The doctor tried to stop her. She pushed him aside and ran to her father's door. Why are these people with frightened faces stopping me? I don't want any of them. And what are they doing here, she thought. She opened the door, and the bright daylight in that previously darkened room startled her. In the room were her nurse and other women. They all drew back from the bed, making way for her. He was still, lying on the bed as before, but the stern expression of his quiet face made Princess Mary stop short on the threshold. No, he's not dead. It is impossible, she told herself and approached him, and repressing the terror that seized her, she pressed her lips to his cheek. But she stepped back immediately. All the force of the tenderness she had been feeling for him vanished instantly and was replaced by a feeling of horror at what lay there before her. No, he is no more. He is not, but here, where he was, is something unfamiliar and hostile, some dreadful, terrifying and repellent mystery. And hiding her face in her hands, 
Princess Mary sank into the arms of the doctor who held her up. In the presence of Tikhon and the doctor, the women washed what had been the prince, tied his head up with a handkerchief that the mouth should not stiffen while open, and with another handkerchief tied together the legs that were already spreading apart. Then they dressed him in uniform with his decorations and placed his shriveled little body on a table. Heaven only knows who arranged all this and when, but it all got done as if of its own accord. Toward night candles were burning round his coffin, a pall was spread over it, the floor was strewn with sprays of juniper, a printed band was tucked in under his shriveled head, and in a corner of the room sat a chanter reading the psalms. Just as horses shy and snort and gather about a dead horse, so the inmates of the house and strangers crowded into the drawing-room round the coffin. The marshal, the village elder, peasant women, and all with fixed and frightened eyes crossing themselves, bowed and kissed the old prince's cold and stiffened hand. End of chapter 8 Recording by Eva Harnick, Ponte Vedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 9, read for LibriVox.org. Until Prince Andrew settled in Bogotarovo, its owners had always been absentees, and its peasants were of quite a different character from those of Bald Hills. They differed from them in speech, dress, and disposition. They were called step peasants. The old prince used to approve of them for their endurance at work when they came to Bald Hills, to help with the harvest or to dig ponds and ditches, but he disliked them for their boorishness. Prince Andrew's last day at Bogotrovo, when he introduced hospitals and schools and reduced the quit-rent the peasants had to pay, had not softened their disposition, but had, on the contrary, strengthened in them the traits of character the old prince called boorishness. Various obscure rumors were always current among them. At one time, a rumor that they would all be enrolled as Cossacks. At another, of a new religion to which they were all to be converted. Then of some proclamation of the Tsars, and of an oath to the Tsar Paul in 1797, in connection with which it was rumored that freedom had been granted them, but the landowners had stopped it. Then of Peter Fedorovich's return to the throne in seven years' time, when everything would be made free and so simple that there would be no restrictions. Rumors of the war with Bonaparte and his invasion were connected in their minds with the same sort of vague notions of Antichrist, the end of the world, and pure freedom. In the vicinity of Bogotarovo were large villages belonging to the crown or to owners whose serfs paid quit rent and could work where they pleased. There were very few resident landlords in the neighborhood, and also very few domestic or literate serfs, and in the lives of the peasantry of those parts the mysterious undercurrents in the life of the Russian people, the causes and meaning of which are so baffling to contemporaries, were more clearly and strongly noticeable than among others. One instance, which had occurred some twenty years before, was a movement among the peasants to emigrate to some unknown warm rivers. Hundreds of peasants, among them the Bogotarovo folk, suddenly began selling their cattle and moving in whole families toward the southeast. As birds migrate to somewhere beyond the sea, so these men, with their wives and children, streamed to the southeast, to parts where none of them had ever been. They set off in caravans, bought their freedom one by one, or ran away, and drove or walked toward the warm rivers. Many of them were punished, some sent to Siberia, many died of cold and hunger on the road, many returned of their own accord, and the movement died down of itself, just as it had sprung up, without apparent reason. 
But such undercurrents still existed among the people, and gathered new forces ready to manifest themselves just as strangely, unexpectedly, and at the same time simply, naturally, and forcibly. Now, in 1812, to anyone living in close touch with these people, it was apparent that these undercurrents were acting strongly and nearing an eruption. Alpatich, who had reached Bogotarovo shortly before the old prince's death, noticed an agitation among the peasants, and that contrary to what was happening in the Bald Hills district, where over a radius of forty miles all the peasants were moving away and leaving their villages to be devastated by the Cossacks, the peasants in the steppe region round Bogotarovo were, it was rumored, in touch with the French, received leaflets from them that passed from hand to hand, and did not migrate. He learned from domestic serfs loyal to him that the peasant Carp, who possessed great influence in the village commune and had recently been away driving a government transport, had returned with news that the Cossacks were destroying deserted villages, but that the French did not harm them. Alpatich also knew that on the previous day another peasant had even brought from the village of Vizlikovo, which was occupied by the French, a proclamation by a French general that no harm would be done to the inhabitants, and if they remained, they would be paid for anything taken from them. As proof of this, the peasant had brought from Vizlikovo a hundred roubles in notes. He did not know that they were false, paid to him in advance for hay. More important still, Alpatich learned that on the morning of the very day he gave the village elder orders to collect carts to move the princess's luggage from Bogotrovo, there had been a village meeting, at which had been decided not to move but to wait. Yet there was no time to waste. On the 15th, the day of the old prince's death, the marshal had insisted on Princess Mary's leaving at once, as it was becoming dangerous. He had told her that after the 16th, he could not be responsible for what might happen. On the evening of the day the old prince died, the marshal went away, promising to return next day for the funeral. But this he was unable to do, for he received tidings that the French had unexpectedly advanced, and had barely time to remove his own family and valuables from his estate. For some thirty years Bogotarovo had been managed by the village elder, Dron, whom the old prince called by the diminutive Dronushka. Dron was one of those physically and mentally vigorous peasants who grow big beards as soon as they are of age and go on unchanged till they are sixty or seventy, without a gray hair or the loss of a tooth, as straight and strong at sixty as at thirty. Soon after the migration to the warm rivers in which he had taken part like the rest, Dron was made village elder and overseer of Bogotarovo, and had since filled that post irreproachably for twenty-three years. The peasants feared him more than they did their master. The masters, both the old prince and the young, and the steward, respected him, and jestingly called him the minister. During the whole time of his service, Dron had never been drunk or ill, never after sleepless nights or the hardest tasks had he shown the least fatigue, and though he could not read, he had never forgotten a single money account or the number of quarters of flour in any of the endless cartloads he sold for the prince, nor a single shock of the whole corn crop on any single acre of the Bogotrovo fields. Alpatich, arriving from the devastated Bald Hills estate, sent for his drawn on the day of the prince's funeral, and told him to have twelve horses got ready for the princess's carriages and eighteen carts for the things to be removed from Bogotrovo. Though the peasants paid quit-rent, Alpatich thought no difficulty would be made about complying with this order, for there were two hundred and thirty households at work in Bogotrovo, and the peasants were well-to-do. But, on hearing the order, Dron lowered his eyes and remained silent. Alpatich named certain peasants he knew from whom he told him to take the carts. Dron replied that the horses of these peasants were away carting. Alpatich named others, but they too, according to Dron, had no horses available. Some horses were carting for the government, others were too weak, and others had died for want of fodder. It seemed that no horses could be had, even for the carriages, much less for the carting. Alpatich looked intently at Dron, and frowned. 
Just as Dron was a model village elder, so Alpatich had not managed the princess's estates for twenty years in vain. He, a model steward, possessing in the highest degree the faculty of divining the needs and instincts of those he dealt with, having glanced at Dron, he at once understood that his answers did not express his personal views, but the general mood of the Bogotrovo commune, by which the elder had already been carried away, but he also knew that Drone, who had acquired property and was hated by the commune, must be hesitating between the two camps, the masters and the serfs. He noticed this hesitation in Drone's look, and therefore frowned, and moved closer up to him. "'Now just listen, Dronushka," said he. "'Don't talk nonsense to me. His Excellency Prince Andrew himself gave me orders to move all the people away and not leave them with the enemy, and there is an order from the Tsar about it too. Anyone who stays is a traitor to the Tsar. Do you hear?' "'I hear,' Dron answered, without lifting his eyes. Alpatish was not satisfied with this reply. "'Eh, Dron, it will turn out badly,' he said, shaking his head. "'The power is in your hands.' Drone rejoined sadly. "'Eh, John, drop it,' Alpatich repeated, withdrawing his hand from his bosom and solemnly pointing to the floor at Drone's feet. "'I can see through you and three yards into the ground under you,' he continued, gazing at the floor in front of Drone. Drone was disconcerted, glanced furtively at Alpatich, and then again lowered his eyes. "'You drop this nonsense, and tell the people to get ready to leave their homes, "'and to go to Moscow, and to get carts ready for tomorrow morning for the princess's things. "'And don't go to any meeting yourself, do you hear?' "'Dron suddenly fell on his knees. "'Yakov Alpatich, discharge me! Take the keys from me and discharge me, for Christ's sake!' "'Stop that!' cried Alpatich sternly. "'I see through you and three yards under you,' he repeated." knowing that his skill in bee-keeping his knowledge of the right time to sow the oats and the fact that he had been able to retain the old prince's favor for twenty years had long since gained him the reputation of being a wizard and that the power of seeing three yards under a man is considered an attribute of wizards drone got up and was about to say something but alpatich interrupted him what is it you have got into your heads eh what are you thinking of eh "'What am I to do with the people?' said Drone. "'They're quite beside themselves. I have already told them. "'Told them, I dare say,' said Alpatich. "'Are they drinking?' he asked abruptly. "'Quite beside themselves, Yakov Alpatich. They fetched another barrel.' "'Well, then, listen. I'll go to the police officer, and you tell them so, "'and that they must stop this, and the carts must be got ready. "'I understand.' "'Alpatich did not insist further.' He had managed people for a long time, and knew that the chief way to make them obey is to show no suspicion that they can possibly disobey. Having wrung a submissive, I understand, from Dron, Alpatich contented himself with that, though he not only doubted, but felt almost certain that without the help of the troops, the carts would not be forthcoming. And so it was, for when evening came, no carts had been provided. In the village, outside the drink-shop, another meeting was being held, which decided that the horses should be driven out into the woods, and the cart should not be provided. Without saying anything of this to the princess, Alpatish had his own belongings taken out of the carts which had arrived from Bald Hills, and had those horses got ready for the princess's carriages. Meanwhile, he went himself to the police authorities. End of chapter 9 Recording by Marcy Fraser in Custer, South Dakota. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 10 Read for DeepliVox.org by Eva Harnick After her father's funeral, Princess Mary shut herself up in her room and did not admit anyone. A maid came to the door to say that Alpatish was asking for orders about their departure. This was before his talk was drawn. Princess Mary raised herself on the sofa on which she had been lying 
and replied through the closed door that she did not mean to go away and begged to be left in peace. The windows of the room in which she was lying looked westward. She lay on the sofa with her face to the wall, fingering the buttons of the leather cushion and seeing nothing but that cushion and her confused thoughts were centered on one subject, the irrevocability of death and her own spiritual baseness, which she had not suspected, but which had shown itself during her father's illness. She wished to pray, but did not dare to, dared not in her present state of mind address herself to God. She lay for a long time in that position. The sun had reached the other side of the house, and its slanting rays shone into the open window, lighting up the room and part of the Morocco cushion at which Princess Mary was looking. The flow of her thoughts suddenly stopped. Unconsciously, she sat up, smoothed her hair, got up and went to the window, involuntarily inhaling the freshness of the clear but windy evening. Yes, you can well enjoy the evening now. He is gone and no one will hinder you, she said to herself, and sinking into a chair, she let her head fall on the window sill. Someone spoke her name in a soft and tender voice from the garden and kissed her head. She looked up. It was Mademoiselle Bourienne in a black dress and weepers. She softly approached Princess Mary, sighed, kissed her, and immediately began to cry. The princess looked up at her. All their former disharmony and her own jealousy recurred to her mind. But she remembered, too, how he had changed of late toward Mademoiselle Bourienne, and could not bear to see her, thereby showing how unjust were the reproaches Princess Mary had mentally addressed to her. Besides, is it for me, for me who desired his death to condemn anyone, she thought? Princess Mary vividly pictured to herself the position of Mademoiselle Bourienne, whom she had of late kept at a distance, but who yet was dependent on her and living in her house. She felt sorry for her, and held out her hand with a glance of gentle inquiry. Mademoiselle Bourienne at once began crying again, and kissed that hand, speaking of the princess's sorrow, and making herself a partner in it. She said her only consolation was the fact that the princess allowed her to share her sorrow, that all the old misunderstandings should sink into nothing but this great grief, that she felt herself blameless in regard to everyone, and that he, from above, saw her affection and gratitude. The princess heard her, not heeding her words, but occasionally looking up at her and listening to the sound of her voice. Your position is doubly terrible, dear princess, said Mademoiselle Bourienne after a pause. I understand that you could not and cannot think of yourself, but with my love for you I must do so. Has Alpatish been to you? Has he spoken to you of going away? she asked. Princess Mary did not answer. She did not understand who was to go or where to. Is it possible to plan or think of anything now? Is it not all the same? She thought and did not reply. You know, chère Marie, said Mademoiselle Bourienne, that we are in danger, are surrounded by the French. It would be dangerous to move now. If we go... We are almost sure to be taken prisoners, and God knows. 
Princess Mary looked at her companion without understanding what she was talking about. Oh, if anyone knew how little anything matters to me now, she said. Of course, I would on no account wish to go away from him. Alpatish did say something about going. Speak to him. I can do nothing, nothing, and don't want to. I have spoken to him. He hopes we should be in time to get away tomorrow, but I think it would now be better to stay here, said Mademoiselle Bourienne, because you will agree, Cher Marie, to fall into the hands of soldiers or of riotous peasants would be terrible. Mademoiselle Bourienne took from her reticule a proclamation, not printed on ordinary Russian paper, of General Rameau's telling people not to leave their homes and that the French authorities would afford them proper protection. She handed this to the princess. I think it would be best to appeal to that general, she continued, and, and I'm sure that all due respect would be shown you. Princess Mary read the paper and her face began to quiver with stifled sobs. From whom did you get this? she asked. They probably recognize that I'm French by my name, replied Mademoiselle Burienne, blushing. Princess Mary, with the paper in her hand, rose from the window and with a pale face went out of the room and into what had been Prince Andrew's study. Dunyasha! Send Alpatish or Dronushka or somebody to me, she said, and tell Mademoiselle Burian not to come to me, she added, hearing Mademoiselle Burian's voice. We must go at once, at once, she said, appalled at the thought of being left in the hands of the French. If Prince Andrew heard that I was in the power of the French, that I, the daughter of Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky, asked General Rameau for protection and accepted his favor. This idea horrified her, made her shudder, blush, and feel such a rush of anger and pride as she had never experienced before. All that was distressing, and especially all that was humiliating, in her position rose vividly to her mind. They, the French, would settle in this house. Monsieur le Général Rameau would occupy Prince Andrew's study and amuse himself by looking through and reading his letters and papers. Mademoiselle Burian would do the honors of Bogucharovo for him. I should be given a small room as a favor, the soldiers would violate my father's newly dug grave to steal his crosses and stars. They would tell me of their victories over the Russians and would pretend to sympathize with my sorrow. Thought Princess Mary, not thinking her own thoughts, but feeling bound to think like her father and her brother. For herself, she did not care where she remained or what happened to her but she felt herself the representative of her dead father and of Prince Andrew. Involuntarily, she sought their thoughts and felt their feelings. What they would have said and what they would have done, she felt bound to say and do. She went into Prince Andrew's study, trying to enter completely into his ideas and considered her position. The demands of life, which had seemed to her annihilated by her father's death, all at once rose before her with a new, previously unknown force and took possession of her. Agitated and flushed, she paced the room, sending now for Michael Ivanovich and now for Tikhon or Dron. Dunyasha, the nurse, and the other maids could not say in how far Mademoiselle Burian's statement was correct. Apatich was not at home, 
he had gone to the police. Neither could the architect, Mikhail Ivanovich, who on being sent for, came in with sleepy eyes, tell Princess Mary anything. With just the same smile of agreement, with which for fifteen years he had been accustomed to answer the old prince without expressing views of his own, he now replied to Princess Mary so that nothing definite could be got from his answers. The old valet Tikhon, with sunken, emaciated face that bore the stamp of inconsolable grief, replied, Yes, princess. To all Princess Mary's questions, and hardly refrained from sobbing as he looked at her. At length, Drone, the village elder, entered the room, and with a deep bow to Princess Mary came to halt by the doorpost. Princess Mary walked up and down the room and stopped in front of him. Dronyushka, she said, regarding as a sure friend this Dronyushka, who always used to bring a special kind of gingerbread, from his visit to the fair at Vyazma every year and smilingly offer it to her. Dronyushka, now since our misfortune, she began but could not go on. We are all in God's hands, said he with a sigh. They were silent for a while. Dronyushka, Alpatich has gone off somewhere and I have no one to turn to. Is it true, as they tell me, that I can't even go away? Why shouldn't you go away, Your Excellency? You can't go, said Dron. I was told it would be dangerous because of the enemy. Dear friend, I can do nothing. I understand nothing. I have nobody. I want to go away tonight or early tomorrow morning. Dron paused. He looked askance at Princess Mary and said, There are no horses. I told Yakov Alpatich so. Why are there none? asked the princess. It is all God's scourge, said Dron. What horses we had? have been taken for the army or have died. This is such a year. It is not a case of feeding horses. We may die of hunger ourselves. As it is, some go three days without eating. We have nothing. We have been ruined. Princess Mary listened attentively to what he told her. The peasants are ruined, they have no bread, she asked. They are dying of hunger, said Dron. It is not a case of carting. But why didn't you tell me, Dronyushka? Isn't it possible to help them? I will do all I can. To Princess Mary it was strange that now, at a moment when such sorrow was filling her soul, there could be rich people and poor, and the rich could refrain from helping the poor. She had heard vaguely that there was such a thing as landlord's corn, which was sometimes given to the peasants. She also knew that neither her father nor her brother would refuse to help the peasants in need. She only feared to make some mistake in speaking about the distribution of the grain she wished to give. She was glad such cares presented themselves, enabling her, without scruple, to forget her own grief. She began asking Dron about the peasant's needs and what there was in Bogucharovo that belonged to the landlord. But we have grain belonging to my brother, she said. The landlord's grain is all safe, replied Dron proudly. Our prince did not order it to be sold. Give it to the peasants. Let them have all they need. I give you leave in my brother's name, said she. 
Drawn made no answer, but sighed deeply. Give them that corn, if there's enough of it. Distribute it all. I give this order in my brother's name, and tell them that what is ours is theirs. We do not grudge them anything. Tell them so. Drone looked intently at the princess while she was speaking. Discharge me, little mother, for God's sake. Order the keys to be taken from me, said he. I have served twenty-three years and have done no wrong. Discharge me, for God's sake. Princess Mary did not understand what he wanted of her or why he was asking to be discharged. She replied that she had never doubted his devotion and that she was ready to do anything for him and for the peasants. End of chapter 10 Recording by Eva Harnick, Ponte Vedra, Florida War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Eleven, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. An hour later, Dunyasha came to tell the princess that Drone had come, and all the peasants had assembled at the barn by the princess's order and wished to have a word with their mistress. But I never told them to come," said Princess Mary. "I only told Drone to let them have the grain." Only, for God's sake, Princess dear, have them sent away, and don't go out to them. It's all a trick, said Dunyasha. And when Yakov Alpatyitch returns, let us get away, and please don't... What is a trick? said Princess Mary in surprise. I know it is. Only listen to me, for God's sake. Ask nurse, too. They say they don't agree to leave Bogucharovo as you ordered. You're making some mistake. I never ordered them to go away, said Princess Mary. Kaldranushka. Drone came and confirmed Dunyasha's words. The peasants had come by the princess's order. But I never sent for them, declared the princess. You must have given my message wrong. I only said that you were to give them the grain. Drone only sighed in reply. If you order it, they will go away, said he. No, no, I'll go out to them, said Princess Mary, and in spite of the nurses and Dunyasha's protests, she went out into the porch. Drone, Dunyasha, the nurse, and Mikhail Ivanovich following her. They probably think I'm offering them the grain to bribe them to remain here while I myself go away, leaving them to the mercy of the French, thought Princess Mary. I will offer them monthly rations and housing at our Moscow estate. I am sure Andrew would do even more in my place, she thought as she went out into the twilight toward the crowd standing on the pasture by the barn. The men crowded closer together, stirred, and rapidly took off their hats. Princess Mary lowered her eyes and, tripping over her skirt, came close up to them. So many different eyes, old and young, were fixed on her, and there were so many different faces that she could not distinguish any of them, and feeling that she must speak to them all at once, did not know how to do it. But again the sense that she represented her father and her brother gave her courage, and she boldly began her speech. I am very glad you have come, she said without raising her eyes, and feeling her heart beating quickly and violently. Dronushka tells me that the war has ruined you. That is our common misfortune, and I shall grudge nothing to help you. I am myself going away because it is dangerous here. The enemy is near, because I am giving you everything, my friends, and I beg you to take everything, all our grain, so that you may not suffer want. And if you have been told that I am giving you the grain to keep you here, that is not true. On the contrary, I ask you to go with all your belongings to our estate near Moscow, and I promise you I will see to it that there you shall want for nothing. You shall be given food and lodging. The princess stopped. Sighs were the only sound heard in the crowd. I am not doing this on my own account, she continued. I do it in the name of my dead father, who was a good master to you and of my brother and his son. Again she paused. No one broke the silence. 
Ours is a common misfortune, and we will share it together. All that is mine is yours, she concluded, scanning the faces before her. All eyes were gazing at her with one and the same expression. She could not fathom whether it was curiosity, devotion, gratitude, or apprehension and distrust, but the expression on all the faces was identical. We are all very thankful for your bounty, but it won't do for us to take the landlord's grain, said a voice at the back of the crowd. But why not? asked the princess. No one replied, and Princess Mary, looking round at the crowd, found that every eye she met now was immediately dropped. But why don't you want to take it? she asked again. No one answered. The silence began to oppress the princess. She tried to catch someone's eye. Why don't you speak? she inquired of a very old man who stood just in front of her leaning on a stick. If you think something more is wanted, tell me. I will do anything, said she, catching his eye. But as if this angered him, he bent his head quite low and muttered, Why should we agree? We don't want the grain. Why should we give up everything? We don't agree. Don't agree. We are sorry for you, but we're not willing. Go away yourself, alone came from various sides of the crowd. And again all the faces in the crowd bore an identical expression, though now it was certainly not an expression of curiosity or gratitude, but of angry resolve. "'But you can't have understood me,' said Princess Mary with a sad smile. "'Why don't you want to go? I promised to house and feed you, while here the enemy would ruin you.' But her voice was drowned by the voices of the crowd. "'We're not willing. Let them ruin us.' We won't take your grain. We don't agree. Again, Princess Mary tried to catch someone's eye, but not a single eye in the crowd was turned to her. Evidently, they were all trying to avoid her look. She felt strange and awkward. Oh, yes, an artful tale. Follow her into slavery. Pull down your houses and go into bondage. I dare say. I'll give you grain indeed, she says, voices in the crowd were heard saying. With drooping head, Princess Mary left the crowd and went back to the house. Having repeated her order to Drone to have horses ready for her departure next morning, she went to her room and remained alone with her own thoughts. End of chapter 11 Read by David Rehm, Sacramento, California, F-O-U-R-T-E-A-T-O-O dot blogspot dot com War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 12, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. For a long time that night, Princess Mary sat by the open window of her room, hearing the sounds of the peasants' voices that reached her from the village, but it was not of them she was thinking. She felt that she could not understand them, however much she might think about them. She thought only of one thing, her sorrow which, after the break caused by cares for the present, seemed already to belong to the past. Now she could remember it and weep or pray. After sunset the wind had dropped. The night was calm and fresh. Toward midnight the voices began to subside, a cock crowed. The full moon began to show from behind the lime trees. A fresh white dewy mist began to rise, and stillness reigned over the village and the house. Pictures of the near past her father's illness and last moments rose one after another to her memory with mournful pleasure she now lingered over these images repelling with horror only the last one the picture of his death which she felt she could not contemplate even in the imagination at this still and mystic hour of night and these pictures presented themselves to her so clearly and in such detail that they seemed now present now past and now future she vividly recalled the moment when he had his first stroke and was being dragged along by his armpits through the garden at Bald Hills, muttering something with his helpless tongue, twitching his gray eyebrows and looking uneasily and timidly at her. Even then he wanted to tell me what he told me the day he died, she thought. He had always thought what he said then, and she recalled in all its detail the night at Bald Hills before he had the last stroke, when with a foreboding of disaster she had remained at home against his will. She had not slept and had stolen downstairs on tiptoe, going to the door of the conservatory where he slept that night, had listened at the door, 
In a suffering and weary voice, he was saying something to Tikhon, speaking of the Crimea and its warm nights and of the Empress. Evidently, he had wanted to talk. And why didn't he call me? Why didn't he let me be there instead of Tikhon? Princess Mary had thought and thought again now. Now he will never tell anyone what he had in his soul. Never will that moment return for him or for me when he might have said all he longed to say, and not Tikhon, but I, might have heard and understood him. Why didn't I enter the room, she thought. Perhaps he would then have said to me what he said the day he died. While talking to Tikhon, he asked about me twice. He wanted to see me, and I was standing close by, outside the door. It was sad and painful for him to talk to Tikhon, who did not understand him. I remember how he began speaking to him about Lisa as if she were alive. He had forgotten she was dead, and Tikhon reminded him that she was no more. And he shouted, Fool! He was greatly depressed. From behind the door I heard how he lay down on his bed groaning and loudly exclaimed, My God! Why didn't I go in then? What could he have done to me? What could I have lost? And perhaps he would then have been comforted and would have said that word to me. And Princess Mary uttered aloud the caressing word he had said to her on the day of his death. Dearest, she repeated, and began sobbing with tears that relieved her soul. She now saw his face before her, and not the face she had known ever since she could remember and had always seen at a distance, but the timid, feeble face she had seen for the first time quite closely with all its wrinkles and details when she stooped nearer to his mouth to catch what he said. Dearest, she repeated again. What was he thinking when he uttered that word? What is he thinking now? This question suddenly presented itself to her, and in answer she saw him before her with the expression that was on his face as he lay in his coffin with his chin bound up with a white handkerchief. And the horror that had seized her when she touched him and convinced herself that that was not he, but something mysterious and horrible seized her again. She tried to think of something else and to pray, but could do neither. With wide open eyes she gazed at the moonlight and the shadows, expecting every moment to see his dead face, and she felt that silence brooding over the house and within it held her fast. Tunyasha, she whispered. Tunyasha, she screamed wildly, and tearing herself out of the silence she ran to the servants' quarters, to meet her old nurse and the maidservants who came running toward her. End of chapter 12. Recording by David Rehm, Sacramento, California. F-O-U-R-T-E-A-T-O-O dot blogspot dot com. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 13, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. On the 17th of August, Rostov and Ilyin, accompanied by Lavrushka, who had just returned from captivity, and by an hussar orderly, left their quarters at Yankovo, ten miles from Bogucharovo, and went for a ride. To try a new horse Ilyin had bought, and to find out whether there was any hay to be had in the villages. For the last three days Bogucharovo had lain between the two hostile armies, so that it was as easy for the Russian rearguard to get to as it was for the French vanguard, so Rostov, as a careful squadron commander, wished to take such provisions as remained at Bogucharovo before the French could get them. Rostov and Yelian were in the merriest of moods. On the way to Bogucharovo, a princely estate with a dwelling-house and farm, where they hoped to find many domestic serfs and pretty girls, they questioned Lavrushka about Napoleon and laughed at his stories and raced one another to try Ilyin's horse. Rostov had no idea that the village he was entering was the property of that very Bolkonsky who had been engaged to his sister. Rostov and Ilyin gave rein to their horses for a last race along the incline before reaching Bogucharovo, and Rostov, outstripping Ilyin, was the first to gallop into the village street. You're first, cried Ilyin, flushed. Yes, always first, both on the grassland and here, answered Rostov, stroking his heated donut's horse. 
"'And I'd have won on my Frenchy, Your Excellency,' said Lavrushka from behind, alluding to his shabby cart-horse. "'Only I didn't wish to mortify you.' They rode at a footpace to the barn, where a large crowd of peasants was standing. Some of the men bared their heads. Others stared at the new arrivals without doffing their caps. Two tall, old peasants with wrinkled faces and scanty beards emerged from the tavern, smiling, staggering, and singing some incoherent song, and approached the officers. "'Fine fellows,' said Rostov, laughing. "'Is there any hay here? And how like one another?' said Ilyin. "'He boost merry comp sang one of the peasants with a blissful smile. One of the men came out of the crowd and went up to Rostov. "'Who do you belong to?' he asked. "'The French,' replied Ilyin jestingly. "'And here is Napoleon himself,' as he pointed to Lavrushka. "'Then you are Russians?' the peasant asked again. "'And is there a large force of you here?' said another, a short man, coming up. "'Very large,' answered Rostov. "'But why have you collected here?' he added. "'Is it a holiday?' "'The old men have met to talk over the business of the commune,' replied the peasant, moving away. At that moment, on the road, leading from the big house, two women and a man in a white hat were seen coming towards the officers. "'The one in pink is mine, so keep off,' said Ilyin, on seeing Dunyasha running resolutely towards him. "'She'll be yours,' said Lavrushka to Ilyin, winking. "'And what do you want, my pretty?' said Ilyin, with a smile. "'The princess ordered me to ask your regiment and your name. This is Count Rostov, squadron commander, and I am your humble servant. Company, roared the tipsy peasant with a beatific smile as he looked at Ilyin, talking to the girl. Following Dunyasha, Alpatyach advanced to Rostov, having bared his head while still at a distance. May I make bold to trouble your honor, said he respectfully, but with a shade of contempt for the youthfulness of this officer and with a hand thrust into his bosom. My mistress, daughter of General-in-Chief Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky, who died in the 15th of this month, finding herself in difficulties owing to the boorishness of these people, he pointed to the peasants, asks you to come up to the house. Won't you please ride on a little farther, said Alpatyich, with a melancholy smile, as it is not convenient in the presence of he pointed to the two peasants who kept as close to him as horse flies to a horse. Ah, Alpatyich, ah, Yakov Alpatyich, grand, forgive us for Christ's sake, eh? said the peasants, smiling joyfully at him. Rostov looked at the tipsy peasants and smiled. Or perhaps they amuse your honor, remarked Alpatyich, with a staid air, as he pointed at the old men with his free hand. "'No, there's not much to be amused at here,' said Rostov, and rode on a little way. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'I make bold to inform your honor that these rough peasants here don't wish to let the mistress leave the estate, and threaten to unharness her horses, so that though everything has been packed since morning, her excellency cannot get away.' "'Impossible!' exclaimed Rostov. "'I have the honor to report to you the actual truth,' said Elpatyich. Rostov dismounted, gave his horse to the orderly, and followed Opatyech to the house, questioning him as to the state of affairs. It appeared that the princess's offer of corn to the peasants the previous day, and her talk with Drone, and at the meeting, had actually had so bad an effect that Drone had finally given up the keys and joined the peasants, and had not appeared when Alpatyech sent for him and that in the morning when the princess gave orders to harness for her journey, the peasants had come in a large crowd to the barn and sent word that they would not let her leave the village, that there was an order not to move, and that they would unharness the horses. Alpatyech had gone out to admonish them, but was told it was chiefly Carp who did the talking, Drone not showing himself in the crowd, that they could not let the princess go, that there was an order to the contrary, but that if she stayed, they would serve her as before and obey her in everything. At the moment when Rostov and Ilyin were galloping along the road, Princess Mary, despite the dissuasions of Alpatyech, her nurse, 
and the maids had given orders to harness and intended to start, but when the cavalrymen were espied, they were taken for Frenchmen, the coachman ran away, and the women in the house began to wail. Father, benefactor, God has sent you, exclaimed deeply moved voices as Rostov passed through the ante-room. Princess Mary was sitting, helpless and bewildered, in the large sitting-room when Rostov was shown in. She could not grasp who he was and why he had come, or what was happening to her. When she saw his Russian face, and by his walk and the first words he uttered recognized him as a man of her own class, she glanced at him with her deep, radiant look and began speaking in a voice that faltered and trembled with emotion. This meeting immediately struck Rostov as a romantic event. A helpless girl, overwhelmed with grief, left to the mercy of coarse rioting peasants, and what a strange fate sent me here! What gentleness and nobility there is in her features and expression, thought he as he looked at her and listened to her timid story. When she began to tell him that all this had happened the day after her father's funeral, her voice trembled. She turned away, and then, as if fearing he might take her words as meant to move him to pity, looked at him with an apprehensive glance of inquiry. There were tears in Rostov's eyes. Princess Mary noticed this, and glanced gratefully at him, with that radiant look which caused the plainness of her face to be forgotten. "'I cannot express, Princess, how glad I am that I happened to ride here, and able to show you my readiness to serve you,' said Rostov, rising. "'Go when you please, and I give you my word of honor that no one shall dare to cause you annoyance, if only you will allow me to act as your escort.' and bowing respectfully, as if to a lady of royal blood, he moved towards the door. Rostov's deferential tone seemed to indicate that though he would consider himself happy to be acquainted with her, he did not wish to take advantage of her misfortunes to intrude upon her. Princess Mary understood this and appreciated his delicacy. "'I am very, very grateful to you,' she said in French, "'but I hope it was all a misunderstanding,' and that no one is to blame for it. She suddenly began to cry. Excuse me, she said. Rostov, knitting his brows, left the room with another low bow. End of chapter 13 Recording by David Rehm, Sacramento, California F-O-U-R-T-E-A-T-O-O dot blogspot dot com October 30th, 2008
Some of the peasants said that these new arrivals were Russians and might take it amiss that the mistress was being detained. Vron was of this opinion, but as soon as he expressed it, Karp and others attacked their ex-elder. How many years have you been fattening on the commune? Karp shouted at him. That's all one to you. You'll dig up your pot of money and take it away with you. What does it matter to you whether our homes are ruined or not? We've been told to keep order, and that no one is to leave their homes or take away a single grain, and that's all about it, cried another. It was your son's turn to be conscripted, but no fear. You begrudged your lump of a son. A little old man suddenly began attacking the roan. And so they took away my vanka to be shaved for a soldier. But we all have to die. To be sure, we all have to die. I am not against the commune, said Throne. That's it, not against it. You've filled your belly. The two tall peasants had their say. As soon as Rostov, followed by Ilyan, Lavrushka, and Alpatyich came up to the crowd, Karp, thrusting his fingers into his belt and smiling a little, walked to the front. Drone, on the contrary, retired to the rear, and the crowd drew closer together. Who's your elder here, eh? shouted the Rostov, coming up to the crowd with quick steps. The elder? What do you want with him? asked Karp. But before the words were well out of his mouth, his cap flew off, and a fierce blow jerked his head to one side. Caps off, traitors, shouted Rostov in a wrathful voice. Where's the elder? he cried furiously. The elder? He wants the elder. Dron Zakaryich, you! Meek and flustered voices here and there were heard calling, and the caps began to come off their heads. We don't riot. We're following the orders, declared Karp, and at that moment several voices began speaking together. It's as the old men have decided. There's too many of you giving orders. Arguing? Mutiny. Brigands. Traitors! cried Rostov, unmeaningly in a voice not his own, gripping Karp by the collar. Bind him! Bind him! he shouted, though there was no one to bind him but Lavrushka and Alpatyich. Lavrushka, however, ran up to Karp and seized him by the arms from behind. Shall I call up our men from behind the hill? he called out. Alpatyich turned to the peasants and ordered two of them by name to come and bind Karp. The men obediently came out of the crowd and began taking off their belts. Where's the elder? demanded the Rostov in a loud voice. With a pale and frowning face, Drone stepped out of the crowd. Are you the elder? Bind him, Lavrushka, shouted Rostov, as if that order too could not possibly meet with any opposition. And in fact, two more peasants began binding Drone, who took off his own belt and handed it to them as if to aid them. And you all listen to me, said the Rostov to the peasants. Be off to your houses at once, and don't let one of your voices be heard. Why, we've not done any harm. We did it just out of foolishness. It's all nonsense. I said then that it was not in order. Voices were heard bickering with one another. There, what did I say, said Alpatyich, coming into his own again. It's wrong, lads. All our stupidity, Yakov Alpatyich, came the answers and the crowd began at once to disperse through the village. The two bound men were led off to the master's house. The two drunken peasants followed them. Aye, when I look at you, said one of them to Karp, how can one talk to the masters like that? What were you thinking of, you fool, added the other. A real fool. Two hours later the carts were standing in the courtyard of the Bogocharovo house. The peasants were briskly carrying out the proprietor's goods and packing them on the carts and Drone, liberated at Princess Mary's wish from the cupboard where he had been confined, was standing in the yard directing the men. "'Don't put it in so carelessly,' said one of the peasants, a man with a round, smiling face, taking a casket from a housemaid. "'You know it has cost money. How could you chuck it in like that, or shove it under the cord where it'll get rubbed? I don't like that way of doing things. Let it all be done properly, according to rule. Look here. Put it under the best matting and cover it with hay. That's the way. Hey, books, books, said another peasant, bringing out Prince Andrew's library cupboards. Don't catch up against it. It's heavy, lads. Solid books. Yes, they worked all day and didn't play, remarked the tall, round-faced peasant gravely, pointing with a significant wink at the dictionaries that were on the top. Unwilling to obtrude himself on the princess, Rostov did not go back to the house but remained in the village awaiting her departure. When her carriage drove out of the house, he mounted and accompanied her eight miles from Bogocharvo to where the road was occupied by her troops. At the inn at Yankovo, he respectfully took leave of her, for the first time permitting himself to kiss her hand. "'How can you speak so?' he blushingly replied to Princess Murray's expressions of gratitude for her deliverance, as she termed what had occurred. 
Any police officer would have done as much. If we had only peasants to fight, we should not have let the enemy come so far, said he with a sense of shame and wishing to change the subject. I am only happy to have had the opportunity of making your acquaintance. Goodbye, Princess. I wish you happiness and consolation, and hope to meet you again in happier circumstances. If you don't want to make me blush, please don't thank me. But the princess, if she did not again thank him in words, thanked him with the whole expression of her face, radiant with gratitude and tenderness. She could not believe that there was nothing to thank him for. On the contrary, it seemed to her certain that had he not been there, she would have perished at the hands of the mutineers and of the French, and that he had exposed himself to terrible and obvious danger to save her, and even more certain was it that he was a man of lofty and noble soul, able to understand her position and her sorrow. His kind, honest eyes, with the tears rising in them when she herself had begun to cry, as she spoke of her loss, did not leave her memory. When she had taken leave of him and remained alone, she suddenly felt her eyes filling with tears, and then not for the first time the strange question presented itself to her. Did she love him? On the rest of the way to Moscow, though the princess's position was not a cheerful one, Dunyasha, who went with her in the carriage, more than once noticed that her mistress leaned out of the window and smiled at something with an expression of mingled joy and sorrow. Well, supposing I do love him, thought Princess Mary. Ashamed as she was of acknowledging to herself that she had fallen in love with a man who would perhaps never love her, she comforted herself with the thought that no one would ever know it, and that she would not be to blame if, without ever speaking of it to anyone, she continued to the end of her life to love the man with whom she had fallen in love for the first and last time in her life. Sometimes, when she recalled his looks, his sympathy, and his words, happiness did not appear impossible to her. It was at those moments that Dunyasha noticed her smiling as she looked out of the carriage window. Was it not fate that brought him to Bogucharovo, and at that very moment, thought Princess Mary, and that caused his sister to refuse my brother? And in all this, Princess Mary saw the hand of Providence. The impression the princess made on Rostov was a very agreeable one. To remember her gave him pleasure, and when his comrades, hearing of his adventure in Bogucharovo, rallied him on having gone to look for hay and having picked up one of the wealthiest heiresses in Russia, he grew angry. It made him angry just because the idea of marrying the gentle Princess Mary, who was attractive to him and had an enormous fortune, had against his will more than once entered his head. For himself personally, Nicholas could not wish for a better wife. By marrying her, he would make the countess his mother happy, would be able to put his father's affairs in order, and would even, he felt it, ensure Princess Mary's happiness. But Sonia, and his plighted word, that was why Rostov grew angry when he was rallied about Princess Bulkanskaya. End of chapter 14. Recording by David Rehm, Sacramento, California. November 5th, 2008. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Alma and Louise Maud Book 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andy Yu War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Book 10 Chapter 15 on receiving command of the armies, Kutuzov remembered Prince Andrew and sent an order for him to report at headquarters. Prince Andrew arrived at Tsarevo Shemischi on the very day and at the very hour that Kutuzov was reviewing the troops for the first time. He stopped in the village at the priest's house in front of which stood the commander-in-chief's carriage and he sat down on the bench at the gate awaiting his serene highness, as everyone now called Kurtisov. From the field beyond the village came now sounds of regimental music, and now the roar of many voices shouting hurrah to the new commander-in-chief. Two orderlies, a courier and a major-domo, stood nearby, some ten paces from Prince Andrew availing themselves of Kutuzov's absence and of the weather. 
a short swarthy lieutenant colonel of hussars with thick moustache and whiskers rode up to the gate and glancing at prince andrew inquired whether his serene highness was putting up there and whether he would soon be back prince andrew replied that he was not on his serene highness staff but was himself a new arrival the lieutenant colonel turned to a smart orderly who with the peculiar contempt with which a commander-in-chief's orderly speaks to others replied what his serene highness i expect he'll be here soon what do you want the lieutenant colonel of hussars smiled beneath his moustache at the orderly's tone dismounted and gave his horse to a dispatch runner and approached Bukonsky with a slight bow. Bukonsky made room for him on the bench, and the lieutenant colonel sat down beside him. You are also waiting for the commander in chief, said he. They say he receives everyone. Thank God. It's awful with those sausage eaters. Ermanov had reason to ask to be a German. Now perhaps Russians will get a look in, and it was devil only knows that what was happening we kept wet-witting and wet-witting did you take part in the campaign he asked i had the pressure replied prince andrew not only of taking part in the retreat but of losing in that retreat all i held dear not to mention this estate and the home of my birth my father who died of grief i belong to the province of smolensk ah you are prince bukonsky very glad to make your acquaintance i am lieutenant colonel denisov better known as vaska said denisov pressing prince andrew's hand and looking into his face with a particularly kindly attention yes i heard said he sympathetically and after a short pause added yes it is scythian warfare it's all very well, only not for those who get in the neck. So you are Prince Andrew Bukonsky. He swayed his head. Very pleased, Prince, to make your acquaintance, he repeated again, smiling sadly, and he again pressed Prince Andrew's hand. Prince Andrew knew Denisov from what Natasha had told him of her first suitor. This memory carried him sadly and sweetly back to those painful feelings of which he had not thought lately but was still found place in his soul of late he had received so many new and very serious impressions such as the retreat from smolensk his visit to bald hills and the recent news of his father's death and had experienced so many emotions that for a long time past those memories had not entered his mind and now that they did they did not act on him with nearly their former strength for denisov too the memories awakened by the name of bukonsky belonged to a distant romantic past when after supper and after natasha's singing he had proposed to a little girl of fifteen without realizing what he was doing he smiled at the recollection of that time and of his love for natasha and passed at once to what now interested him passionately and exclusively this was a plan of campaign he had devised while serving at the outpost during the retreat he had proposed that plan to Barclay de Tolly, and now wished to propose it to Kutuzov. The plan was based on the fact that the French line of operation was too extended, and it proposed that instead of concurrently with action on the front to bar the advance of the French, we should attack their line of communication. He began explaining his plan to Prince Andrew. They can hold all that line. It's impossible. I will undertake to break through. Give me five hundred men, and I will break the line. That's certain. There's only one way. Gluilla warfare. Denisov rose and began gesticulating as he explained his plan to Bokonsky. In the midst of his explanation, shouts were heard from the arm, growing more incoherent and more diffused ringing with music and songs and coming from the field where the review was held 
sounds of hoofs and shouts were nearing the village he's coming he's coming shouted a cossack standing at the gate bolkonsky and denisov moved to the gate at which a knot of soldiers in brackets a guard of honour was standing and they saw Gertusov coming down the street mounted on a rather small sorrel horse a huge suite of generals rode behind him barclay was riding almost beside him and a cloud of officers ran after and around them shouting hurrah his adjuncts galloped into the yard before him kutuzov was impatiently urging on his horse which ambled smoothly under his weight and he raised his hand to his white horse guard's cap with a red band and no peak nodding his head continually when he came up to the guard of honours a fine set of grenadiers mostly wearing decorations who were giving him the salute he looked at them silently and attentively for nearly a minute with the steady gaze of a commander and then turned to the cloud of generals and officers surrounding him suddenly his face assumed a subtle expression he shrugged his shoulders with an air of perplexity and with such fine fellows to retreat and retreat well good-bye general he added and rode into the yard past prince andrew and denisov hurrah 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 shouted those behind him since prince andrew had last seen him kutuzov had grown still more corpulent flaccid and fat but the breached eyeball the scar and the familiar weariness of his expression were still the same he was wearing the white horse guard's cap and a military overcoat with a whip hanging over his shoulder by a thin strap he sat heavily and swayed limply on his brisk little horse view 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 he whistled just loudly as he rode into the yard his face expressed the relief of relaxed strain felt by a man who means to rest after a ceremony he drew his left foot out of the stirrup and lurching with his whole body and puckering his face with the effort raised it with difficulty on to the saddle leaned on his knee groaned and slipped down into the arms of the cossacks and adjuncts who stood ready to assist him he pulled himself together looked around screwing up his eyes glanced at prince andrew and evidently not recognizing him moved with his wattering gait to the porch phew 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 he whistled and again he glanced at prince andrew as often occurs with old men it was only after some seconds that the impression produced by prince andrew's face linked itself up with kutuzov's remembrance of his personality ah how do you do my dear prince how do you do my dear boy come along said he glancing wearily round and he stepped on to the porch which creaked with his weight he unbuttoned his coat and sat down on a bench in the porch and how's your father i received news of his death yesterday replied prince andrew abruptly kutuzov looked at him with eyes wide open with dismay and then took off his cap and clothed himself may the kingdom of heavens be his god's will be done to us all he sighed deeply his whole chest heaving and was silent for a while i loved him and respected him and sympathized with you with all my heart he embraced prince andrew pressing him to his fat breast and for some time did not let him go when he released him prince andrew saw that kutuzov's flappy lips were trembling and that tears were in his eyes he sighed and pressed on the bench with both hands to raise himself come come with me we'll have a talk said he but at that moment denisov no more intimidated by his superiors than by the enemy came with jingling spurs up the steps of the porch despite the angry whispers of the adjuncts who tried to stop him kutuzov his hand still pressed on the seat glanced at him glumly denisov having given his name announced that he had to communicate to his serene highness matter of great importance for their country's welfare 
Kutuzov looked weary at him and, lifting his hands with a gesture of annoyance, folded them across his stomach, repeating the words, For our country's welfare? Well, what is it? Speak! Denisov brushed like a girl, in brackets, it was strange to see the color rise in that shaggy, bibulous, time-worn face, and boldly began to expand his plan of cutting the enemy's lines of communication between Smolensk and Vasma. Denisov came from those parts and knew the country well. His plan seemed decidedly a good one, especially from the strength of conviction with which he spoke. Kutuzov looked down at his own legs, occasionally glancing at the door of the adjoining hut, as if expecting something unpleasant to emerge from it. And from that hut, while Denisov was speaking, a general with a portfolio under his arm really did appear. What? said Kutuzov, in the midst of Denisov's explanation. Are you ready so soon? Ready, your serene highness, replies the general. Kutuzov swayed his head as much as to say, How is the man to deal with it all? And again listened to Denisov. I give my word of honor as a Russian officer, said Denisov, that I can break Napoleon's line of communication. What relation are you to Intendant General Karol Andre with Denisov? asked Kutuzov, interrupting him. He is my uncle, your serene highness. Ah, we were friends, said Kutuzov cheerfully. All right, all right, friend. Stay here at the staff, and tomorrow we'll have a talk. With a nod to Denisov, he turned away and put out his hand to the papers Konovitsyn had brought him. Would not your serene highness like to come inside? said the general on duty in a discontented voice. The plans must be examined, and several papers have to be signed. An adjunct came out and announced that everything was in readiness within. But Kutuzov evidently did not wish to enter that room till he was disengaged. He made a grimace. No, tell them to bring a small table out here, my dear boy. I'll look at them here, said he. Don't go away, he added, turning to Prince Andrew, who remained in the porch and listened to the general's report. While this was being given, Prince Andrew heard the whispers of a woman's voice and the rustle of a silk dress behind the door. Several times, on glancing that way, he noticed behind the door a plump, rosy, handsome woman in a pink dress with a lilac silk kerchief on her head, holding a dish and evidently awaiting the entrance of the commander-in-chief. Kutuzov's adjunct whispered to Prince Andrew that this was the wife of the priest whose home it was, and that she intended to offer his serene highness bread and salt. Her husband has welcomed his serene highness with the cross at the church, and she intends to welcome him in the house. She's very pretty, added the adjunct with a smile. At those words, Kutuzov looked around. He was listening to the general's report, which consisted chiefly of a criticism of the position at Travifo Shemishchi, as he had listened to Denisov, and seven years previously had listened to the discussion at the Austrian Council of War. He evidently listened only because he had ears, which, though there was a piece of toe in one of them, could not help hearing, but it was evident that nothing the general could say would surprise or even interest him, that he knew all that would be said beforehand, and heard it all only because he had to, as one has to listen to the chanting of a service of player. All that Denisov had said was clever and to the point. What the general was saying was even more clever and to the point but it was evident that Kutuzov despised knowledge and cleverness and knew of something else that would decide the matter, something independent of cleverness and knowledge. Prince Andrew watched the commander-in-chief's face attentively, and the only expression he could see there was one of boredom. 
curiosity as to the meaning of the feminine whispering behind the door and a desire to observe propriety it was evident that Kutuzov despised cleverness and learning and even the patriotic feeling shown by Denisov, but despised them not because of his own intellect, feelings, or knowledge. He did not try to display any of these, but because of something else. He despised them because of his old age and experience of life. The only instruction Kutuzov gave of his own accord during that report referred to looting by the Russian troops. At the end of the report, the general put before him for signature a paper relating to the recovery of payment from army commanders for green oats mown down by the soldiers when landowners lodged petitions for compensation. After hearing the matter, Kutuzov smacked his lips together and shook his head. Into the stove, into the fire with it, I tell you once for all, my dear fellow, said he. Into the fire with all such things. Let them cut the cobs and burn wood to their heart's content. I don't order it or allow it, but I don't exact compensation either. One can't get on without it. When wood is chopped, the chips will fly he looked at the paper again oh this german precision he muttered shaking his head end of chapter fifteen war and peace book ten chapter fifteen read for liberwalk dot org by andy yu mississauga canada War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Sixteen, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. Well, that's all," said Kutuzov as he signed the last of the documents, and rising heavily and smoothing out the folds in his fat white neck, he moved towards the door with a more cheerful expression. The priest's wife, flushing rosy red, caught up the dish she had not managed to present at the right moment after all, though she had so long been preparing for it and with a low bow offered it to Kutuzov. He screwed up his eyes, smiled, lifted her chin with his hand, and said, Ah, what a beauty! Thank you, sweetheart. He took some gold pieces from his trouser pocket and put them on the dish for her. Well, my dear, and how are we getting on? he asked, moving to the door of the room assigned to him. The priest's wife smiled, and with dimples in her rosy cheeks followed him into the room. The adjutant came out to the porch and asked Prince Andrew to lunch with him. Half an hour later, Prince Andrew was again called to Kutuzov. He found him reclining in an armchair, still in the same unbuttoned overcoat. He had in his hand a French book, which he closed as Prince Andrew entered, marking the place with a knife. Prince Andrew saw by the cover that it was Le Chevalier du Seigneur by Madame du Genlis. Well, sit down, sit here. Let's have a talk, said Kutuzov. It's sad very sad. But remember, my dear fellow, that I'm a father to you, a second father. Prince Andrew told Kutuzov all he knew of his father's death, and what he had seen at Bald Hills when he passed through it. What, what they have brought us to, Kutuzov suddenly cried in an agitated voice, evidently picturing vividly to himself from Prince Andrew's story the condition Russia was in. But give me time, give me time he said with a grim look, evidently not wishing to continue this agitating conversation, and added, I sent for you to keep you with me. I thank your serene highness, but fear I am no longer fit for the staff, replied Prince Andrew with a smile which Kutuzov noticed. Kutuzov glanced inquiringly at him. But above all, added Prince Andrew, I have grown used to my regiment, am fond of the officers, and I fancy the men also like me. I should be sorry to leave the regiment. If I decline the honor of being with you, believe me, a shrewd, kindly, yet subtly derisive expression lit up Kutuzov's podgy face. He cut Balkonsky short. I am sorry, for I need you, but you're right, you're right. It's not here that men are needed. Advisers are always plentiful, but men are not. The regiments would not be what they are if the would-be advisers served there as you do. I remember you at Austerlitz. I remember... Yes, I remember you with the standard, said Kutuzov, and a flush of pleasure suffused Prince Andrew's face at this re recollection. 
Taking his hand and drawing him downwards, Kutuzov offered his cheek to be kissed, and again Prince Andrew noticed tears in the old man's eyes. Though Prince Andrew knew that Kutuzov's tears came easily, and that he was particularly tender to and considerate of him from a wish to show sympathy with his loss, yet this reminder of Austerlitz was both pleasant and flattering to him. Go your way, and God be with you. I know your path is the path of honor. He paused. I missed you at Bucharest, but I needed someone to send. And changing the subject, Kutuzov began to speak of the Turkish war and the peace that had been concluded. Yes, I have been much blamed, he said, both for that war and the peace, but everything came at the right time. Tout vient pour celui qui sait attendre. And there were as many advisers there as here, he went on, returning to the subject of advisers, which evidently occupied him. Ah, those advisers, said he. If we had listened to them all, we should not have made peace with Turkey, and should not have been through with that war. Everything in haste, but more haste, less speed. Kamensky would have been lost if he had not died. He stormed fortresses with thirty thousand men. It is not difficult to capture a fortress, but it is difficult to win a campaign. For that, not storming and attacking, but patience and time are wanted. Kamensky sent soldiers to Ruschik but I only employed these two things and took more fortresses than Kamensky and made the Turks eat horse flesh. He swayed his head. And the French shall too, believe me, he went on, growing warmer and beating his chest. I'll make them eat horse flesh. And tears again dimmed his eyes. But shan't we have to accept battle? remarked Prince Andrew. We shall if everybody wants it. It can't be helped. But believe me, my dear boy, there is nothing stronger than those two. Patience and time... They will do it all. But the advisers. Non tan pan de setare, voilà le mal. Some want a thing, others don't. What's one to do? he asked, evidently expecting an answer. Well, what do you want us to do? he repeated, and his eyes shone with a deep, shrewd look. I'll tell you what to do, he continued, as Prince Andrew still did not reply. I will tell you what to do, and what I do. Ton le doute, mon cher, he paused. Abstiens-toi. He articulated the French proverb deliberately. Well, good-bye, my dear fellow. Remember that with all my heart I share your sorrow, and that for you I am not a serene highness, nor a prince, not a commander-in-chief, but a father. If you want anything, come straight to me. Good-bye, my dear boy. Again he embraced and kissed Prince Andrew, but before the latter had left the room, Kutuzov gave a sigh of relief and went on with his unfinished novel. Le Chevalier de Sillon by Madame Jolie. Prince Andrew could not have explained how or why it was, but after that interview with Kutuzov he went back to his regiment reassured as to the general course of affairs and as to the man to whom it had been entrusted. The more he realized the absence of all personal motive in that old man, in whom there seemed to remain only the habit of passions, and in place of an intellect, grouping events and drawing conclusions, only the capacity calmly to contemplate the course of events, the more reassured he was that everything would be as it should. He will not bring in any plan of his own. He will not devise or undertake anything, thought Prince Andrew, but he will hear everything, remember everything, and put everything in its place. He will not hinder anything useful, nor allow anything harmful. He understands that there is something stronger and more important than his own will, the inevitable course of events, and he can see them and grasp their significance, and seeing that significance can refrain from meddling and renounce his personal wish directed to something else, and, above all, thought Prince Andrew, one believes in him because he's Russian, despite the novel by Jean Lee and the French proverbs, and because his voice shook when he said, what they have brought us to, and had a sob in it when he said he would make them eat horse flesh. On such feelings, more or less dimly shared by all, the unanimity and general approval were founded with which, despite court influences, the popular choice of Kutuzov as commander-in-chief was received. End of chapter 16. Recording by David Rehm, Sacramento, California. F-O-U-R-T-E-A-T-O-O dot blogspot dot com. Book 
10, Chapter 17 of War and Peace Read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm After the Emperor had left Moscow, life flowed on there in its usual course, and its course was so very usual that it was difficult to remember the recent days of patriotic elation and ardor, hard to believe that Russia was really in danger, and that the members of the English club were also sons of the fatherland, ready to sacrifice everything for it. The one thing that recalled the patriotic fervor everyone had displayed during the Emperor's stay was the call for contributions of men and money, a necessity that, as soon as the promises had been made, assumed a legal, official form and became unavoidable. With the enemy's approach to Moscow, the Moscovites, view of the situation did not grow more serious, but on the contrary became even more frivolous, as always happens with people who see a great danger approaching. At the approach of danger, there are always two voices that speak with equal power in the human soul. One very reasonably tells a man to consider the nature of the danger and the means of escaping it. The other, still more reasonably, says that it is too depressing and painful to think of the danger since it is not in a man's power to foresee everything and avert the general course of events, and it is therefore better to disregard what is painful till it comes and to think about what is pleasant. In solitude a man generally listens to the first voice, but in society to the second. So it was now with the inhabitants of Moscow. It was long since people had been as gay in Moscow as that year. Rostopchin's broadsheets headed by woodcuts of a drink shop, a potman, and a Moscow burger called Karpushka Chigirin, quote, who, having been a militiaman and having had rather too much at the pub, heard that Napoleon wished to come to Moscow, grew angry, abused the French in very bad language, came out of the drink shop, and under the sign of the eagle began to address the assembled people, end quote, were read and discussed together with the latest of Vasily Lvovich Pushkin's Butrem. In the corner room at the club, members gathered to read these broadsheets, and some liked the way Karpushka jeered at the French, saying, They will swell up with Russian cabbage, burst with our buckwheat porridge, and choke themselves with cabbage soup. They are all dwarfs, and one peasant woman will toss three of them with a hayfork. Others did not like that tone, and said it was stupid and vulgar. It was said that Rostopchin had expelled all Frenchmen, and even all foreigners, from Moscow, and that there had been some spies and agents of Napoleon among them, but this was told chiefly to introduce Rostopchin's witty remark on that occasion. The foreigners were deported to Nizhny by boat, and Rostopchin had said to them in French, Rentrez en vous-même, entrez dans la bac et ne fait pas une bac de charron. Translation note, think it over, get into the bark, and take care not to make it a bark of Karen. There was talk of all the government offices having been already removed from Moscow, and to this Shinshin's witticism was added, that for that alone Moscow ought to be grateful to Napoleon. It was said that Mamanov's regiment would cost him 800,000 rubles, and that Bazhukov had spent even more on his, but the best thing about Bazhukov's action was that he himself was going to don a uniform and ride at the head of his regiment without charging anything for the show. You don't spare anyone, said Julie Drubetskaya, as she collected and pressed together a bunch of raveled lint with her thin, be-ringed fingers. Julie was preparing to leave Moscow next day and was giving a farewell soiree. Bozhukov is ridicule, but he is so kind and good-natured. What pleasure is there to be so caustic? A forfeit, cried a young man in a militia uniform, whom Julie called Mon Chevalier, and who was going with her to Nizhny. In Julie's set, as in many other circles in Moscow, it had been agreed that they would speak nothing but Russian, and that those who made a slip and spoke French should pay fines to the Committee of Voluntary Contributions. Another forfeit for a gallicism, said a Russian writer who was present. What pleasure is there to be is not Russian. You spare no one, continued Julie to the young man, without heeding the author's remark. For Kostik I am guilty and will pay, and I am prepared to pay again for the pleasure of telling you the truth. For gallicisms, I won't be responsible, she remarked, turning to the author. I have neither the money nor the time, like Prince Galitsyn, to engage a master to teach me Russian. Ah, here he is, she added. Content. No, no, she said to the militia officer, you won't catch me. Speak of the sun and you see its rays, and she smiled amiably at Pierre. 
We were just talking of you, she said with the facility in lying natural to a society woman. We were saying that your regiment would be sure to be better than Momonoff's. Oh, don't talk to me of my regiment, replied Pierre, kissing his hostess's hand and taking a seat beside her. I am so sick of it. You will, of course, command it yourself, said Julie, directing a sly, sarcastic glance towards the militia officer. The latter in Pierre's presence had ceased to be caustic, and his face expressed perplexity as to what Julie's smile might mean. In spite of his absent-mindedness and good nature, Pierre's personality immediately checked any attempt to ridicule him to his face. No, said Pierre, with a laughing glance at his big, stout body. I should make too good a target for the French. Besides, I am afraid I should hardly be able to climb onto a horse. Among those whom Julie's guests happened to choose to gossip about were the Rostovs. I hear that their affairs are in a very bad way, said Julie. And he is so unreasonable, the count himself, I mean. The Razumovskys wanted to buy his house and his estate near Moscow, but it drags on and on. He asks too much. No, I think the sale will come off in a few days, said someone. Though it is madness to buy anything in Moscow now. Why? asked Julie. You don't think Moscow's in danger? Then why are you leaving? I? What a question. I am going because, well, because everyone is going, and besides... I'm not Joan of Arc, or an Amazon. Well, of course, of course. Let me have some more strips of linen. If he manages the business properly, he'll be able to pay off all his debts, said the militia officer, speaking of Rostov. A kindly old man, but not up to much. And why do they stay on so long in Moscow? They meant to leave for the country a long time ago. Natalia is quite well again now, isn't she? Julie asked Pierre with a knowing smile. They are waiting for their younger son, Pierre replied. He joined Oblinsky's Cossacks and went to Belia Tsurkov, where the regiment is being formed. But now they have had him transferred to my regiment and are expecting him every day. The Count wanted to leave long ago, but the Countess won't on any account leave Moscow till her son returns. I met them the day before yesterday at the Arkharovs. Natalia has recovered her looks and is brighter. She sang a song. How easily some people get over everything get over what inquired pierre looking displeased julie smiled you know count such knights as you are only found in madame de souza's novels what knights what do you mean demanded pierre blushing oh come my dear count c'est la fable de tomosco je vous admire ma parole de l'honneur it is the talk of all moscow my word i admire you forfeit forfeit cried the militia officer all right, one can't talk. How tiresome. What is the talk of all Moscow? Pierre asked angrily, rising to his feet. Come now, Count, you know. I don't know anything about it, said Pierre. I know you were friendly with Natalia, and so... But I was always more friendly with Vera, that dear Vera. No, madam, Pierre continued in a tone of displeasure. I have not taken on myself the role of Natalia Rostova's knight at all, and have not been their house for nearly a month. But I cannot understand the cruelty. Qui se excusa cousa? Who excuses himself, accuses himself, said Julie, smiling and waving the lint triumphantly, and to have the last word she promptly changed the subject. Do you know what I heard today? Poor Mary Bulkinskaya arrived in Moscow yesterday. Do you know that she has lost her father? Really? Where is she? I should very much like to see her, said Pierre. I spent the evening with her yesterday. She is going to their estate near Moscow either today or tomorrow morning with her nephew. Well, and how is she? asked Pierre. She is well but sad. But do you know who rescued her? It is quite a romance. Nicholas Rostov. She was surrounded, and they wanted to kill her and had wounded some of her people. He rushed in and saved her. Another romance, said the militia officer. Really, this general flight has been arranged to get all the old maids married off. Katish is one, and Princess Bulkinskaya another. Do you know, I really believe she is un petit peu amoureuse du jeune homme, a little bit in love with the young man. Forfeit, forfeit, forfeit. But how could one say that in Russian? End of Book 10, Chapter 17, read by David Rehm, Sacramento, California, January 19th, 2009.
War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 18, read for LibriVox.org, by David Rehm. When Pierre returned home, he was handed two of Rostopchin's broadsheets that had been brought that day. The first declared the report that Count Rostopchin had forbidden people to leave Moscow was false. On the contrary, he was glad that ladies and tradesmen's wives were leaving the city. There will be less panic and less gossip, ran the broadsheet but I will stake my life on it that they will not enter Moscow. These words showed Pierre clearly for the first time that the French would enter Moscow. The second broadsheet stated that our headquarters were at Vyazma, that Count Wittgenstein had defeated the French, but that as many of the inhabitants of Moscow wished to be armed, weapons were ready for them at the arsenal, sabers, pistols, and muskets, which could be had at a low price. The tone of the proclamation was not as jocose as in the former Chigurin talks. Pierre pondered over these broadsheets, evidently the terrible storm-cloud he had desired, with the whole strength of his soul, but which yet aroused involuntary horror, in him was drawing near. "'Shall I join the army and enter the service, or wait?' he asked himself for the hundredth time. He took a pack of cards that lay on the table, and began to lay them out for a game of patience. "'If this patience comes out, he said to himself, after shuffling the cards, holding them in his hand and lifting his head. If it comes out, it means... What does it mean? He had not decided what it should mean when he heard the voice of the eldest princess at the door asking whether she might come in. Then it will mean that I must go to the army, said Pierre to himself. Come in, come in, he added to the princess. Only the eldest princess, the one with the stony face and long waist, was still living in Pierre's house. The two younger ones had both married. "'Excuse my coming to you, cousin,' she said in a reproachful and agitated voice. "'You know some decision must be come to. What is going to happen? Everyone has left Moscow, and the people are rioting. How is it that we are staying on?' "'On the contrary, things seem satisfactory, Mocassine said Pierre, in the bantering tone he habitually adopted toward her, always feeling uncomfortable in the role of her benefactor. Satisfactory indeed, very satisfactory. Barbara Ivanova told me today how our troops are distinguishing themselves. It certainly does them credit, and the people too are quite mutinous. They no longer obey, even my maid has taken to being rude. At this rate they will soon begin beating us. One can't walk in the streets. But above all the French will be here any day now. So what are we waiting for? I ask just one thing of you, cousin, she went on. Arrange for me to be taken to Petersburg. Whatever I may be, I can't live under Bonaparte's rule. Oh, come, Moccasin. Where do you get your information from? On the contrary. I won't submit to your Napoleon. Others may, if they please. If you don't want to do this, but I will. I'll give the order at once. The princess was apparently vexed at not having anyone to be angry with. Muttering to herself, she sat down on a chair. "'But you have been misinformed,' said Pierre. "'Everything is quiet in the city, and there is not the slightest danger. "'See, I have just been reading,' he showed her the broadsheet. "'Count Rostopchin writes that he will stake his life on it that the enemy will never enter Moscow.' "'Oh, that count of yours,' said the princess malevolently. He's a hypocrite, a rascal, who has himself roused the people to riot. Didn't he write in those idiotic broadsheets that anyone, whoever it might be, should be dragged to the lock-up by his hair? How silly! And honor and glory to whoever captures him, he says. This is what his cajolery has brought us to. Barbara Ivanova told me the mob near killed her because she said something in French. Oh, but it's so. You're... You take everything so to heart, said Pierre, and began laying out his cards for patience. Although that patience did come out, Pierre did not join the army, but remained in deserted Moscow ever in the same state of agitation, irresolution, and alarm, yet at the same time joyfully expecting something terrible. Next day, toward evening, the princess set off, and Pierre's head steward came to inform him that the money needed for the equipment of his regiment could not be found without selling one of the estates. In general, the head steward made out to Pierre that his project of raising a regiment would ruin him. Pierre listened to him, scarcely able to repress a smile. "'Well, then, sell it,' said he. "'What's to be done? I can't draw back now.' 
the worse everything became, especially his own affairs, the better was Pierre pleased, and the more evident was it that the catastrophe he expected was approaching. Hardly anyone he knew was left in town. Julie had gone, and so had Princess Mary. Of his intimate friends, only the Rostovs remained, but he did not go to see them. To distract his thoughts, he drove that day to the village of Vorontsovo to see the great balloon Lepich was constructing to destroy the foe, and a trial balloon that was to go up next day. The balloon was not yet ready, but Pierre learned that it was being constructed by the Emperor's desire. The Emperor had written to Count Rostopchin as follows. As soon as Lepchip is ready, get together a crew of reliable and intelligent men for his car and send a courier to General Kutuzov to let him know. I have informed him of the matter. Please impress upon Lepich to be very careful where he descends for the first time that he may not make a mistake and fall into the enemy's hands. It is essential for him to combine his movements with those of the commander-in-chief. On his way home from Vorontsovo, as he was passing the Bolontnoya place, Pierre, seeing a large crowd round the Lobnoya place, stopped and got out of his trap. A French cook, accused of being a spy, was being flogged. The flogging was only just over, and the executioner was releasing from the flogging bench a stout man with red whiskers in blue stockings and a green jacket, who was moaning piteously. Another criminal, thin and pale, stood near. Judging by their faces, they were both Frenchmen. With a frightened and suffering look, resembling that on the thin Frenchman's face, Pierre pushed his way in through the crowd. What is it? Who is it? What is it for? he kept asking. But the attention of the crowd, officials, burghers, shopkeepers, peasants, and women in cloaks and in pelisses, was so eagerly centered on what was passing in Lobnoya place that no one answered him. The stout man rose, frowned, shrugged his shoulders, and evidently, trying to appear firm, began to pull on his jacket without looking about him. But suddenly his lips trembled, and he began to cry in the way full-blooded grown men cry, though angry with himself for doing so. In the crowd people began talking loudly to stifle their feelings of pity as it seemed to Pierre. He's cook to some prince. Eh, monsieur, Russian sauce seems to be sour to a Frenchman. Sets his teeth on edge, said a wrinkled clerk who was standing behind Pierre when the Frenchman began to cry. The clerk glanced round, evidently hoping that his joke would be appreciated. Some people began to laugh, others continued to watch in dismay the executioner who was undressing the other man. Pierre choked, his face puckered, and he turned hastily away, went back to his trap muttering something to himself as he went, and took his seat. As they drove along he shuddered and exclaimed several times so audibly that the coachman asked him, "'What is your pleasure?' "'Where are you going?' shouted Pierre to the man who was driving to Lubyanka Street. "'To the governor's, as you ordered,' answered the coachman. "'Fool! Idiot!' shouted Pierre, abusing his coachman, a thing he rarely did. "'Home, I told you, and drive faster, blockhead. "'I must get away this very day,' he murmured to himself. At the sight of the tortured Frenchman and the crowd surrounding the Lubnoya place, Pierre had so definitely made up his mind that he could no longer remain in Moscow and would leave for the army that very day that it seemed to him that either he had told the coachman this or that the man ought to have known it for himself. On reaching home Pierre gave orders to Eftsavfe, his head coachman, who knew everything, could do anything, and was known to all Moscow, that he would leave that night for the army at Moskayesk and that his saddle horses should be sent there. This could not all be arranged that day, so, on F. Tsafe's reputation, Pierre had to put off his departure till next day to allow time for the relay horses to be sent on in advance. On the 24th the weather cleared up after a spell of rain, and after dinner Pierre left Moscow. When changing horses that night in Perkushkovo, he learned that there had been a great battle that evening. This was the Battle of Shevardino. He was told that there in Perkushkovo the earth trembled from the firing, but nobody could answer his questions as to who had won. 
At dawn next day, Pierre was approaching Mosaisk. Every house in Mosaisk had soldiers quartered in it, and at the hostel where Pierre was met by his groom and coachman, there was no room to be had. It was full of officers. Everywhere in Mosaisk and beyond it, troops were stationed or on the march, Cossacks, foot and horse soldiers, wagons, caissons, and cannon were everywhere. Pierre pushed forward as fast as he could, and the farther he left Moscow behind, and the deeper he plunged into the sea of troops, the more was he overcome by restless agitation and a new and joyful feeling he had not experienced before. It was a feeling akin to what he had felt at the Sloboda Palace during the Emperor's visit, a sense of the necessity of undertaking something and sacrificing something. He now experienced a glad consciousness that everything that constitutes men's happiness, the comforts of life, wealth, even life itself, is rubbish it is pleasant to throw away, compared with something. With what? Pierre could not say, and he did not try to determine for whom and for what he felt such particular delight in sacrificing everything. He was not occupied with the question of what to sacrifice for. The fact of sacrificing in itself afforded him a new and joyous sensation. End of chapter 18. Recording by David Rehm in Sacramento, California, January 18, 2009. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 19, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. On the 24th of August, the Battle of the Chevardino Redoubt was fought. On the 25th, not a shot was fired by either side, and on the 26th, the Battle of Borodino itself took place. Why and how were the battles of Chevardino and Borodino given and accepted? Why was the Battle of Borodino fought? There was not the least sense in it for either the French or the Russians. Its immediate result for the Russians was, and was bound to be, that we were brought nearer to the destruction of Moscow, which we feared more than anything in the world. And for the French its immediate result was that they were brought nearer to the destruction of their whole army, which they feared more than anything in the world. What the result must be was quite obvious, and yet Napoleon offered and Kutuzov accepted that battle. If the commanders had been guided by reason, it would seem that it must have been obvious to Napoleon that by advancing thirteen hundred miles and giving battle with a probability of losing a quarter of his army, he was advancing to certain destruction, and it must have been equally clear to Kutuzov that by accepting battle and risking the loss of a quarter of his army, he would certainly lose Moscow. For Kutuzov this was mathematically clear, as it is that if, when playing drafts, I have one man less, and go on exchanging, I shall certainly lose, and therefore should not exchange. When my opponent has sixteen men, and I have fourteen, I am only one-eighth weaker than he. But when I have exchanged thirteen more men, he will be three times as strong as I am. Before the Battle of Borodino, our strength in proportion to the French was about as five to six, but after that battle it was little more than one to two. Previously we had a hundred thousand against a hundred and twenty thousand. Afterwards little more than fifty thousand against a hundred thousand. Yet the shrewd and experienced Kutuzov accepted the battle, while Napoleon, who was said to be a commander of genius, gave it losing a quarter of his army, and lengthening his lines of communication still more. If it is said that he expected to end the campaign by occupying Moscow, as he had ended a previous campaign by occupying Vienna, there is much evidence to the contrary. Napoleon's historians themselves tell us that from Smolensk onwards he wished to stop, knew the danger of his extended position, and knew that the occupation of Moscow would not be the end of the campaign, for he had seen at Smolensk the state in which Russian towns were left to him, and had not received a single reply to his repeated announcements of his wish to negotiate. 
In giving and accepting battle at Borodino, Kutuzov acted involuntarily and irrationally, but later on, to fit what had occurred, the historians provided cunningly devised evidence of the foresight and genius the generals who, of all the blind tools of history, were the most enslaved and involuntary. The ancients have left us model heroic poems in which the heroes furnish the whole interest of the story, and we are still unable to accustom ourselves to the fact that, for our epic histories of that kind, are meaningless. On the other question, how the Battle of Borodino and the preceding Battle of Shevardino were fought, there also exists a definite and well-known, but quite false conception. All the historians describe the affair as follows. The Russian army, they say, in its retreat from Smolensk, sought out for itself the best position for a general engagement, and found such a position at Borodino. The Russians, they say, fortified this position in advance on the left of the high road from Moscow to Smolensk, and almost at a right angle to it, from Borodino to Utitsa, at the very place where the battle was fought. In front of this position, they say, a fortified outpost was set up on the Shevardino Mound to observe the enemy. On the 24th, we are told, Napoleon attacked this advance post and took it, and on the 26th attacked the whole Russian army, which was in position on the field of Borodino. So the histories say, and it is all quite wrong, as anyone who cares to look into the matter can easily convince himself. The Russians did not seek out the best position, but, on the contrary, during the retreat passed many positions better than Borodino. They did not stop at any one of these positions because Kutuzov did not wish to occupy a position he had not himself chosen, because the popular demand for a battle had not yet expressed itself strongly enough, and because Milorodovich had not yet arrived with the militia, and for many other reasons. The fact is that other positions they had passed were stronger, and that the position at Borodino, the one where the battle was fought, far from being strong, was no more a position than any other spot one might find in the Russian Empire by sticking a pin into the map at hazard. Not only did the Russians not fortify the position on the field of Borodino, to the left of, and at a right angle to, the high road, that is, the position on which the battle took place, but never till the 25th of August, 1812, did they think that a battle might be fought there. This was shown first by the fact that there were no entrenchments there by the 25th, and that those begun on the 25th and 26th were not completed, and secondly, by the position of the Shevardino redoubt. That redoubt was quite senseless in front of the position where the battle was accepted. Why was it more strongly fortified than any other post? And why were all efforts exhausted and 6,000 men sacrificed to defend it till late at night on the 24th? A Cossack patrol would have sufficed to observe the enemy. Thirdly, as proof that the position on which the battle was fought had not been foreseen and that the Shevardino redoubt was not an advanced post of that position, we have the fact that up to the 25th Barclay de Tolle and Bagration were convinced that the Shevardino redoubt was the left flank of the position, and that Kutuzov himself in his report, written in hot haste after the battle, speaks of the Shevardino redoubt as the left flank of the position. It was much later, when reports on the Battle of Borodino were written at leisure, that the incorrect and extraordinary statement was invented probably to justify the mistakes of a commander-in-chief who had to be represented as infallible, that the Shevardino redoubt was an advanced post, whereas in reality it was simply a fortified point on the left flank, and that the Battle of Borodino was fought by us on an entrenched position previously selected, where, as it was fought on a quite unexpected spot which was almost entrenched. The case was evidently this. A position was selected along the river Kolocha, which crosses the high road not at a right angle but at an acute angle, so that the left flank was at Chevardino, the right flank near the village of Novoya, and the center at Borodino at the confluence of the rivers Kolocha and Voina. 
To anyone who looks at the field of Borodino without thinking of how the battle was actually fought, this position, protected by the river Colocha, presents itself as obvious for an army whose object was to prevent an enemy from advancing along the Smolensk road to Moscow. Napoleon, riding to Valuevo on the 24th, did not see, as the history books say he did, the position of the Russians from Utitsa to Borodino, he could not have seen that position, because it did not exist, nor did he see an advanced post of the Russian army. But while pursuing the Russian rearguard, he came upon the left flank of the Russian position, at the Shevardino redoubt, and, unexpectedly for the Russians, moved his army across the Kolocha. And the Russians, not having time to begin a general engagement, withdrew their left wing from the position they had intended to occupy, and took up a new position which had not been foreseen, and was not fortified. By crossing to the other side of the Kolocha to the left of the high road, Napoleon shifted the whole forthcoming battle from right to left, looking from the Russian side, and transferred it to the plain between Utitsa, Semenovsk, and Borodino, a plain no more advantageous as a position than any other plain in Russia, and there the whole battle of the 26th of August took place. Had Napoleon not ridden out on the evening of the 24th to the Kolocha, and had he not then ordered an immediate attack on the redoubt, but had begun the attack next morning, no one would have doubted that the Shevardino redoubt was the left flank of our, and the battle would have taken place where we expected it. In that case, we should probably have defended the Shevardino redoubt, our left flank, still more obstinately. We should have attacked Napoleon in the center or on the right, and the engagement would have taken place on the 25th, in the position we intended and had fortified. But as the attack on our left flank took place in the evening after the retreat of our rear guard, that is, immediately after the fight at Grydneva, and as the Russian commanders did not wish, or were not in time, to begin a general engagement then on the evening of the 24th, the first and chief action of the Battle of Borodino was already lost on the 24th, and obviously led to the loss of the one fought on the 26th. After the loss of the Shevardino Redoubt, we found ourselves on the morning of the 25th without a position for our left flank, and were forced to bend it back and hastily entrench it where it chanced to be. Not only was the Russian army on the 26th defended by weak, unfinished entrenchments, but the disadvantage of that position was increased by the fact that the Russian commanders, not having fully realized what had happened, namely the loss of our position on the left flank and the shifting of the whole field of the forthcoming battle from right to left, maintained their extended position from the village of Novoya to Utitsa, and consequently had to move their forces from right to left during the battle. So it happened that throughout the whole battle the Russians opposed the entire French army launched against our left flank with but half as many men. Ponyatsowski's action against the Utitsa and Yuvarov's on the right flank against the French were actions distinct from the main course of the battle. So the Battle of Borodino did not take place at all as, in an effort to conceal our commander's mistakes even at the cost of diminishing the glory due to the Russian army and people, it has been described. The Battle of Borodino was not fought on a chosen and entrenched position with forces only slightly weaker than those of the enemy, but, as a result of the loss of the Shevardino redoubt, the Russians fought the Battle of Borodino in an open and almost unentrenched position, with forces only half as numerous as the French, that is to say, under conditions in which it was not merely unthinkable to fight for ten hours and secure an indecisive result, but unthinkable to keep an army even from complete disintegration and flight. End of chapter 19 Recording by David Rehm in Sacramento, California, January 19th, 2009. War and Peace, Book 10, 
Chapter 20, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. On the morning of the 25th, Pierre was leaving Mozhaisk at the descent of the high steep hill, down which a winding road led out of the town past the cathedral on the right, where a service was being held and the bells were ringing. Pierre got out of his vehicle and proceeded on foot. Behind him, a cavalry regiment was coming down the hill, preceded by its singers. Coming up toward him was a train of carts carrying men who had been wounded in the engagement the day before. The peasant drivers, shouting and lashing their horses, kept crossing from side to side. The carts, in each of which three or four wounded soldiers were lying or sitting, jolted over the stones that had been thrown on the steep incline to make it something like a road. The wounded, bandaged with rags, with pale cheeks, compressed lips, and knitted brows, held on to the sides of the carts as they were jolted against one another. Almost all of them stared with naive, childlike curiosity at Pierre's white hat and green swallowtail coat. Pierre's coachman shouted angrily at the convoy of wounded to keep to one side of the road. The cavalry regiment, as it descended the hill with its singers, surrounded Pierre's carriage and blocked the road. Pierre stopped, being pressed against the side of the cutting in which the road ran. The sunshine from behind the hill did not penetrate into the cutting, and there it was cold and damp, but above Pierre's head was the bright August sunshine, and the bells sounded merrily. One of the carts with wounded stopped by the side of the road close to Pierre. The driver, in his best shoes, ran panting up to it, placed a stone under one of its tireless hind wheels, and began arranging the breech band on his little horse. One of the wounded, an old soldier with a bandaged arm who was following the cart on foot, caught hold of it with his sound hand and turned to look at Pierre. I say, fellow countrymen, will they set us down here or take us on to Moscow? he asked. Pierre was so deep in thought that he did not hear the question. He was looking now at the cavalry regiment that had met the convoy of wounded, now at the cart by which he was standing, in which two wounded men were sitting and one was lying. One of those sitting up in the cart had probably been wounded in the cheek. His whole head was wrapped in rags, and one cheek was swollen to the size of a baby's head. His nose and mouth were twisted to one side. The soldier was looking at the cathedral and crossing himself. Another, a young lad, a fair-haired recruit as white as though there was no blood in his thin face, looked at Pierre kindly with a fixed smile. The third lay prone so that his face was not visible. The cavalry singers were passing close by. Ah, lost, quite lost, is my head so king, living in a foreign land, they sang their soldiers' dance song. As if responding to them, but with a different sort of merriment, the metallic sound of the bells reverberated high above, and the hot rays of the sun bathed the top of the opposite slope with yet another sort of merriment. But beneath the slope, by the cart, with the wounded near the panting little nag where Pierre stood, it was damp, somber, and sad. The soldier with the swollen cheek looked angrily at the cavalry singers. "'Oh, the coxcombs!" he muttered reproachfully. "'It's not the soldiers only, but I've seen peasants today, too. The peasants! Even they have to go,' said the soldier behind the cart, addressing Pierre with a sad smile. "'No distinctions made nowadays.' They want the whole nation to fall on them. In a word, it's Moscow. They want to make an end of it. In spite of the obscurity of the soldier's words, Pierre understood what he wanted to say and nodded approval. The road was clear again. Pierre descended the hill and drove on. He kept looking to either side of the road for familiar faces, but only saw everywhere the unfamiliar faces of various military men of different branches of the service, who all looked with astonishment at his white hat and green tailcoat. Having gone nearly three miles, he at last met an acquaintance and eagerly addressed him. This was one of the head army doctors. He was driving toward Pierre, in a covered gig, sitting beside a young surgeon, and on recognizing Pierre, he told the Cossack who occupied the driver's seat to pull up. "'Count, Your Excellency, how come you to be here?' asked the doctor. "'Well, you know, I wanted to see. Yes, yes, there will be something to see.' Pierre got out and talked to the doctor, explaining his intention of taking part in a battle. 
the doctor advised him to apply direct to Kutuzov. Why should you be God knows where out of sight during the battle, he said, exchanging glances with his young companion. Anyhow, his serene highness knows you, and will receive you graciously. That's what you must do. The doctor seemed tired and in a hurry. You think so? Uh, I also wanted to ask you where our position is exactly, said Pierre. The position, repeated the doctor. Well, that's not my line. Drive past Tatarinova. A lot of digging is going on there. Go up the hillock and you'll see. Can one see from there? If you would. But the doctor interrupted him and moved toward his gig. I would go with you, but on my honor, I'm up to here. And he pointed to his throat. I'm galloping to the commander of the corps. How do matters stand? You know. Count, there will be a battle tomorrow. Out of an army of a hundred thousand, we must expect at least twenty thousand wounded, and we haven't stretchers or bunks or dressers or doctors enough for six thousand. We have ten thousand carts, but we need other things as well. We must manage as best we can. The strange thought, that of thousands of men, young and old, who had stared with merry surprise at his hat, perhaps the very men he had noticed, twenty thousand were inevitably doomed to wounds and death, amazed Pierre. They may die tomorrow. Why are they thinking of anything but death? And by some latent sequence of thought, the descent of the Mosias kill, the carts with the wounded, the ringing bells, the slanting rays of the sun, and the songs of the cavalrymen vividly recurred to his mind. The cavalry ride to battle and meet the wounded, and do not for a moment think of what awaits them, but pass by, winking at the wounded. Yet from among these men twenty thousand are doomed to die, and they wonder at my hat. Strange, thought Pierre, continuing his way to Tatarinova. In front of a landowner's house, to the left of the road, stood carriages, wagons, and crowds of orderlies and sentinels. The commander-in-chief was putting up there, but just when Pierre arrived, he was not in, and hardly any of the staff were there. They had gone to the church service. Pierre drove on toward Gorky. When he had ascended the hill and reached the little village street, he saw for the first time pleasant militiamen in their white shirts with crosses on their caps who, talking and laughing loudly, animated and perspiring, were at work on a huge knoll overgrown with grass to the right of the road. Some of them were digging, others were wheeling barrel loads of earth along planks, while others stood about doing nothing. Two officers were standing on the knoll, directing the men. On seeing these peasants, who were evidently still amused by the novelty of their position as soldiers, Pierre once more thought of the wounded men at Mosiasque and understood what the soldier had meant when he said, They want the whole nation to fall on them. The sight of these bearded peasants at work on the battlefield, with their queer clumsy boots and perspiring necks and their shirts opening from the left toward the middle, unfastened, exposing their sunburned collarbones, impressed Pierre more strongly with the solemnity and importance of the moment than anything he had yet seen or heard. End of chapter 20, recording by David Rehm in Sacramento, California, January 24th, 2009. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 21, read for LibriVox.org. Pierre stepped out of his carriage, and, passing the toiling militiamen, ascended the knoll from which, according to the doctor, the battlefield could be seen. It was about eleven o'clock. The sun shone somewhat to the left and behind him, and brightly lit up the enormous panorama which, rising like an amphitheatre, extended before him in the clear, rarefied atmosphere. From above, on the left, bisecting that amphitheatre, wound the Smolensk high road, passing through a village with a white church some five hundred paces in front of the knoll and below it. This was Borodino. Below the village the road crossed the river by a bridge, and, winding down and up, rose higher and higher to the village of Valuevo, visible about four miles away, where Napoleon was then stationed. Beyond Valuevo, the road disappeared into a yellowing forest on the horizon. Far in the distance in that birch and fir forest to the right of the road, the cross and belfry of the Kolocha Monastery gleamed in the sun. 
here and there, over the whole of that blue expanse, to right and left of the forest and the road, smoking campfires could be seen, and indefinite masses of troops, ours and the enemy's. The ground to the right, along the course of the Kolocha and Moskva rivers, was broken and hilly. Between the hollows the villages of Buzobova and Zakarino showed in the distance. On the left the ground was more level. There were fields of grain, and the smoking ruins of Semenovsk, which had been burned down, could be seen. All that Pierre saw was so indefinite that neither the left nor the right side of the field fully satisfied his expectations. Nowhere could he see the battlefield he had expected to find, but only fields, meadows, troops, woods, the smoke of campfires, villages, mounds, and streams, and try as he would, he could descry no military position in this place which teemed with life, nor could he even distinguish our troops from the enemy's. I must ask someone who knows, he thought and addressed an officer who was looking with curiosity at his huge unmilitary figure. "'May I ask you,' said Pierre, "'what village that is in front?' "'Berdino, isn't it?' said the officer, turning to his companion. "'Borodino,' the other corrected him. The officer, evidently glad of an opportunity for a talk, moved up to Pierre. "'Are those our men there?' Pierre inquired. "'Yes, and there, further on, are the French,' said the officer. "'There they are, there, you can see them.' "'Where, where?' asked Pierre. "'One can see them with the naked eye. Why, there!' The officer pointed with his hand to the smoke visible on the left behind the river, and the same stern and serious expression that Pierre had noticed on many of the faces he had met came into his face. "'Ah, those are the French. And over there?' Pierre pointed to a knoll on the left, near which some troops could be seen. "'Those are ours.' "'Ah, ours. And there?' Pierre pointed to another knoll in the distance with a big tree on it, near a village that lay in a hollow where also some campfires were smoking and something black was visible. "'That's his again,' said the officer. It was the Shevardino Redoubt. It was ours yesterday, but now it is his. "'Then how about our position?' "'Our position?' replied the officer with a smile of satisfaction. "'I can tell you quite clearly, because I constructed nearly all our entrenchments. There, you see?' "'There's our centre, at Barodino, just there,' and he pointed to the village in front of them with a white church. "'That's where one crosses the Kolocha. You see down there, where the rows of hay are lying in the hollow, there's the bridge. That's our centre. Our right flank is over there,' he pointed sharply to the right, far away in the broken ground. "'That's where the Moskva River is, and we have thrown up three redoubts there, very strong ones. The left flank—' Here the officer paused. Well, you see, that's difficult to explain. Yesterday our left flank was there, at Shevardino, you see, where the oak is. But now we have withdrawn our left wing. Now it is over there. Do you see that village and the smoke? That's Semenovsk. Yes, there, he pointed to Reevsky's knoll. But the battle will hardly be there. His having moved his troops there is only a ruse. He will probably pass around to the right of the Moskva. "'But wherever it may be, many a man will be missing tomorrow,' he remarked. "'An elderly sergeant, who had approached the officer while he was giving these explanations, "'had waited in silence for him to finish speaking, "'but at this point, evidently not liking the officer's remark, interrupted him. "'Gabians must be sent for,' said he sternly. "'The officer appeared abashed, for as though he understood that one might think of how many men would be missing tomorrow, but ought not to speak of it. Well, send number three company again, the officer replied hurriedly. And you? Are you one of the doctors? No, I've come on my own, answered Pierre, and he went down the hill again, passing the militiamen. Oh, those damned fellows, muttered the officer who followed him, holding his nose as he ran past the men at work. "'There they are! Bringing her! Coming! There they are! They'll be here in a minute!' Voices were suddenly heard saying, and officers, soldiers, and militiamen began running forward along the road. A church procession was coming up the hill from Borodino. First along the dusty road came the infantry in ranks, bareheaded and with arms reversed. From behind them came the sound of church singing. 
Soldiers and militiamen ran bareheaded past Pierre toward the procession. They are bringing her, our Patrectress, the Iberian Mother of God, someone cried. The Smolengst Mother of God, another corrected him. The militiamen, both those who had been in the village and those who had been at work on the battery, threw down their spades and ran to meet the church procession. Following the battalion that marched along the dusty road came priests in their vestments, one little old man in a hood with attendants and singers. Behind them, soldiers and officers bore a large, dark-faced icon with an embossed metal cover. This was the icon that had been brought from and had since accompanied the army. Behind, before, and on both sides, crowds of militia men with bared heads walked, ran, and bowed to the ground. At the summit of the hill they stopped with the icon. The men who had been holding it up by the linen bands attached to it were relieved by others. The chanters relit their censers, and service began. The hot rays of the sun beat down vertically in a fresh, soft wind, played with the hair of the bared heads and with the ribbons decorating the icon. The singing did not sound loud under the open sky. An immense crowd of bareheaded officers, soldiers, and militiamen surrounded the icon. Behind the priest and a chanter stood the notabilities on a spot reserved for them. A bald general with a St. George's cross on his neck stood just behind the priest's back, and without crossing himself, he was evidently a German, patiently awaited the end of the service, which he considered it necessary to hear to the end, probably to arouse the patriotism of the Russian people. Another general stood in a martial pose, crossing himself by shaking his hand in front of his chest while looking about him. Standing among the crowd of peasants, Pierre recognized several acquaintances among these notables, but did not look at them. His whole attention was absorbed in watching the serious expression on the faces of the crowd of soldiers and militiamen who were all gazing eagerly at the icon. As soon as the tired chanters who were singing the service for the twentieth time that day began lazily and mechanically to sing, Save from calamity thy servants, O mother of God, and the priest and deacon chimed in, For to thee under God we all flee, as to an inviolable bulwark and protection. There again kindled in all those faces the same expression of consciousness of the solemnity of the impending moment that Pierre had seen on the faces at the foot of the hill, a mosaic, and momentarily on many and many faces he had met that morning. And heads were bowed more frequently, and hair tossed back, and sighs, and the sound men made as they crossed themselves were heard. The crowd round the icon suddenly parted and pressed against Pierre. Someone, a very important personage, judging by the haste with which way was made for him, was approaching the icon. It was Kutuzov, who had been riding round the position and on his way back to Tatarnova, had stopped where the service was being held. Pierre recognized him at once by his peculiar figure, which distinguished him from everybody else. With a long overcoat on his exceedingly sout, round-shouldered body, with uncovered white head and puffy face, showing the white ball of the eye he had lost, Kutuzov walked with plunging, swaying gait into the crowd and stopped behind the priest. He crossed himself with an accustomed movement, bent till he touched the ground with his hand, and bowed his white head with a deep sigh. Behind Kutuzov was Benigzin and the suite. Despite the presence of the commander-in-chief, who attracted the attention of all the superior officers, the militiamen and soldiers continued their prayers without looking at him. When the service was over, Kutuzov stepped up to the icon, sank heavily to his knees, bowed to the ground, and for a long time tried vainly to rise, but could not do so on account of his weakness and weight. His white head twitched with the effort. At last he rose, kissed the icon as a child does with naively pointing, pouting lips, and again bowed till he touched the ground with his hand. The other generals followed his example, then the officers, and after them with excited faces, pressing on one another, crowding, panting, and pushing, scrambled the soldiers and militiamen. End of chapter 21, recording by Marcy Fraser, Custer, South Dakota. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 22 
Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick. Staggering amid the crush, Pierre looked about him. Count Peter Kirillovich, how did you get here? said a voice. Pierre looked round. Boris Drubetskoy, brushing his knees with his hand, he had probably sold them when he, too, had knelt before the icon, came up to him smiling. Boris was elegantly dressed with a slightly martial touch appropriate to a campaign. He wore a long coat and, like Kutuzov, had a whip slung across his shoulder. Meanwhile, Kutuzov had reached the village and seated himself in the shade of the nearest house on a bench which one Cossack had run to fetch and another had hastily covered with a rug. An immense and brilliant suite surrounded him. The icon was carried further, accompanied by the throng. Pierre stopped some thirty paces from Kutuzov talking to Boris. He explained his wish to be present at the battle and to see the position. This is what you must do, said Boris. I will do the honors of the camp to you. You'll see everything best from where Count Benningsen will be. I am in attendance on him, you know. I will mention it to him. But if you want to ride round the position, come along with us. We are just going to the left flank. Then, when we get back, do spend the night with me, and we'll arrange a game of cards. Of course you know Dmitri Sergeyevich. Those are his quarters, and he pointed to the third house in the village of Gorky. But I should like to see the right flank. They say it is very strong, said Pierre. I should like to start from the Moskva River and ride round the whole position. Well, you can do that later, but the chief thing is the left flank. Yes, yes, but where is Prince Bolkonsky's regiment? Can you point it out to me? Prince Andrews, we shall pass it, and I'll take you to him. What about the left flank? asked Pierre. To tell you the truth, between ourselves, God only knows what state our left flank is in, said Boris, confidentially lowering his voice. It is not at all what Count Benningsen intended. He meant to fortify that knoll quite differently, but... Boris shrugged his shoulders. His Serene Highness would not have it, or someone persuaded him. You see? But Boris did not finish, for at that moment Kaiserov, Kutuzov's adjutant, came up to Pierre. Ah, oh, Kaiserov, said Boris, addressing him with an unembarrassed smile. I was just trying to explain our position to the Count. It is amazing how His Serene Highness could so foresee the intentions of the French. You mean the left flank? asked Kaiserov. Yes, exactly. The left flank is now extremely strong. Though Kutuzov had dismissed all unnecessary men from the staff, Boris had contrived to remain at headquarters after the changes. He had established himself with Count Benningsen, who, like all on whom Boris had been in attendance, considered young Prince Drubetskoy an invaluable man. In the higher command there were two sharply defined parties, Kutuzov's party and that of Benningsen, the chief of staff. Boris belonged to the latter and no one else, while showing servile respect to Kutuzov, could so create an impression that the old fellow was not much good and that Benningsen managed everything. Now the decisive moment of battle had come, when Kutuzov would be destroyed and the power passed to Benningsen, 
or even if Kutuzov won the battle, it would be felt that everything was done by Benningsen. In any case, many great rewards would have to be given for tomorrow's action, and new men would come to the front. So Boris was full of nervous vivacity all day. After Kaiserov, others whom Pierre knew came up to him. And he had not time to reply to all the questions about Moscow that were showered upon him or to listen to all that was told him. The faces all expressed animation and apprehension. But it seemed to Pierre that the cause of the excitement shown in some of these faces lay chiefly in questions of personal success. His mind, however, was occupied by the different expression he saw on other faces, an expression that spoke not of personal matters, but of the universal questions of life and death. Kutuzov noticed Pierre's figure and the group gathered round him. Call him to me, said Kutuzov. An adjutant told Pierre of his Serene Highness's wish and Pierre went toward Kutuzov's bench. But a militiaman got there before him. It was Dolokhov. How did that fellow get here? asked Pierre. He is a creature that wriggles in anywhere, was the answer. He has been degraded, you know. Now he wants to bob up again. He has been proposing some scheme or other and has crawled into the enemy's picket line at night. He is a brave fellow. Pierre took off his hat and bowed respectfully to Kutuzov. I concluded that if I reported to your serene highness, you might send me away or say that you knew what I was reporting. But then I shouldn't lose anything, Dolokhov was saying. Yes, yes. But if I were right, I should be rendering a service to my fatherland for which I am ready to die. Yes, yes. And should your serene highness require a man who will not spare his skin, please think of me. Perhaps I may prove useful to your serene highness. Yes, yes, Kutuzov repeated, his laughing eye narrowing more and more as he looked at Pierre. Just then Boris, with his courtier-like adroitness, stepped up to Pierre's side near Kutuzov and in a most natural manner, without raising his voice, said to Pierre as though continuing an interrupted conversation. The militia have put on clean white shirts to be ready to die. What heroism, Count? Boris evidently said this to Pierre in order to be overheard by his Serene Highness. He knew Kutuzov's attention would be caught by those words. And so it was. What are you saying about the militia? he asked Boris. Preparing for tomorrow, your serene highness, for death, they have put on clean shirts. Ah, oh, a wonderful, a matchless people, said Kutuzov, and he closed his eyes and swayed his head. A matchless people, he repeated with a sigh. So you want to smell gunpowder, he said to Pierre. Yes, it is a pleasant smell. I have the honor to be one of your wife's adorers. Is she well? My quarters are at your service. And, as often happens with old people, Kutuzov began looking about absent-mindedly as if forgetting all he wanted to say or do. Then, Evidently remembering what he wanted, he beckoned to Andrew Kaiserov, his adjutant's brother. Those verses, those verses of Marines, how do they go, eh? Those he wrote about Gerakov, lectures for the corpse inditing. 
Recite them, recite them, said he, evidently preparing to laugh. Kaiserov recited. Kutuzov smilingly nodded his head to the rhythm of the verses. When Pierre had left Kutuzov, Dolokhov came up to him and took his hand. I am very glad to meet you here, Count, he said aloud, regardless of the presence of strangers and in a particularly resolute and solemn tone. On the eve of a day, when God alone knows who of us is fated to survive, I am glad of this opportunity to tell you that I regret the misunderstandings that occurred between us and should wish you not to have any ill feeling for me. I beg you to forgive me. Pierre looked at Dolokhov with a smile, not knowing what to say to him. With tears in his eyes, Dolokhov embraced Pierre and kissed him. Boris said a few words to his general, and Count Benningsen turned to Pierre and proposed that he should ride with him along the line. It will interest you, said he. Yes, very much, replied Pierre. Half an hour later, Kutuzov left for Tatarinova, and Benningsen and his suite, with Pierre among them, set out on their ride along the line. End of chapter 22 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 23, read for LibriVox.org. From Gorky, Bennigsen descended the high road to the bridge, which, when they had looked at it from the hill, the officer had pointed out as being the center of our position, and where rows of fragrant new-mown hay lay by the riverside. They rode across that bridge into the village of Borodino, and thence turned to the left, passing an enormous number of troops and guns, and came to a high knoll where militiamen were digging. This was the redoubt, as yet unnamed, which afterwards became known as the Raevsky Redoubt, or the Knoll Battery. But Pierre paid no special attention to it. He did not know that it would become more memorable to him than any other spot on the plain of Borodino. They then crossed the hollow to Semenovsk, where the soldiers were dragging away the last logs from the huts and barns. Then they rode downhill and uphill, across a rye field, trodden and beaten down as if by hail, following a track freshly made by the artillery over the furrows of the ploughed land, and reached some fleshes, a kind of entrenchment, which were still being dug. At the fleshes... Benigsen stopped, and began looking at the Shevardino redoubt opposite, which had been ours the day before, and where several horsemen could be descried. The officers said that either Napoleon or Murat was there, and they all gazed eagerly at this little group of horsemen. Pierre also looked at them, trying to guess which of the scarcely discernible figures was Napoleon. At last those mounted men rode away from the mound and disappeared. Benningsen spoke to a general who approached him, and began explaining the whole position of our troops. Pierre listened to him, straining each faculty to understand the essential points of the impending battle, but was mortified to feel that his mental capacity was inadequate for the task. He could make nothing of it. Benningsen stopped speaking, and, noticing that Pierre was listening, suddenly said to him, "'I don't think this interests you.' "'On the contrary, it's very interesting.' replied Pierre, not quite truthfully. From the flushes they rode still further to the left, along a road winding through a thick, low-growing birch wood. In the middle of the wood a brown hare with white feet sprang out, and scared by the tramp of the many horses, grew so confused that it leaped along the road in front of them for some time, arousing general attention and laughter, and only when several voices shouted at it did it dart to one side and disappear in the thicket. After going through the wood for about a mile and a half, they came out on a glade where troops of Tuchkov's corps were stationed to defend the left flank. Here, at the extreme left flank, Benningsen talked a great deal and with much heat, and as it seemed to Pierre, gave orders of great military importance. In front of Tuchkov's troops was some high ground not occupied by troops. Benningsen loudly criticized 
this mistake, saying that it was madness to leave a height which commanded the country around unoccupied and to place troops below it. Some of the generals expressed the same opinion. One in particular declared with martial heat that they were put there to be slaughtered. Bennigsen, on his own authority, ordered the troops to occupy the high ground. This disposition on the left flank increased Pierre's doubt of his own capacity to understand military matters. Listening to Bennigsen and the generals criticizing the position of the troops behind the hill, he quite understood them and shared their opinion, but for that very reason he could not understand how the man who put them there behind the hill could have made so gross and palpable a blunder. Pierre did not know that these troops were not as Bennigsen supposed, put there to defend the position, but were in a concealed position as an ambush, that they should not be seen and might be able to strike an approaching enemy unexpectedly. Bennigsen did not know this and moved the troops forward according to his own ideas without mentioning the matter to the commander-in-chief. End of chapter 23. Recording by Marcy Fraser, Custer, South Dakota. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 24, Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick On that bright evening of August 25, Prince Andrew lay leaning on his elbow in a broken-down shed in the village of Knyaskovo at the further end of his regiment's encampment. Through a gap in the broken wall he could see, beside the wooden fence, a row of thirty-year-old birches with their lower branches lopped off, a field on which shocks of oats were standing, and some bushes near which rose the smoke of campfires, the soldiers' kitchens. Narrow and burdensome and useless to anyone as his life now seemed to him, Prince Andrew, on the eve of battle, felt agitated and irritable, as he had done seven years before at Austerlitz. He had received and given the orders for next day's battle, and had nothing more to do. But his thoughts, the simplest, clearest, and therefore most terrible thoughts, would give him no peace. He knew that tomorrow's battle would be the most terrible of all he had taken part in, and, for the first time in his life, the possibility of death presented itself to him, not in relation to any worldly matter, or with reference to its effect on others, but simply in relation to himself, to his own soul, vividly, plainly, terribly, and almost as a certainty. And from the height of this perception, all that had previously tormented and preoccupied him suddenly became illumined by a cold white light without shadows, without perspective, without distinction of outline. All life appeared to him like magic lantern pictures at which he had long been gazing by artificial light through a glass. Now he suddenly saw those badly daubed pictures in clear daylight and without a glass. Yes, yes, there they are, those false images that agitated and raptured and tormented me, said he to himself passing in review the principal pictures of the magic lantern of life and regarding them now in the cold white daylight of his clear perception of death. There they are, those rudely painted figures that once seemed splendid and mysterious. Glory, the good of society, love of a woman, the fatherland itself, how important these pictures appeared to me, with what profound meaning they seemed to be filled. And it is all so simple. 
pale and crude in the cold white light of this morning, which I feel is dawning for me. The three great sorrows of his life held his attention in particular. His love for a woman, his father's death, and the French invasion which had overrun half Russia. Love, that little girl who seemed to me brimming over with mystic forces. Yes, indeed, I loved her. I made romantic plans of love and happiness with her. Oh, what a boy I was, he said aloud bitterly. Ah, oh, me! I believed in some ideal love which was to keep her faithful to me for the whole year of my absence. Like the gentle dove in the fable, she was to pine apart from me. But it was much simpler, really. It was all very simple and horrible. When my father built Bald Hills, he thought the place was his, his land, his heir, his peasants. But Napoleon came and swept him aside, unconscious of his existence, as he might brush a chip from his path, and his Bald Hills and his whole life fell to pieces. Princess Mary says it is a trial sent from above. What is the trial for when he is not here and will never return? He is not here. For whom, then, is the trial intended? The fatherland, the destruction of Moscow. And tomorrow I shall be killed, perhaps not even by a Frenchman, but by one of our own men, by a soldier discharging a musket, close to my ear, as one of them did yesterday. And the French will come and take me by head and heels and fling me into a hole that I may not stink under their noses. And new conditions of life will arise, which will seem quite ordinary to others and about which I shall know nothing. I shall not exist. He looked at the row of birches shining in the sunshine with their motionless green and yellow foliage and white bark. To die, to be killed tomorrow, that I should not exist, that all this should still be, but no me. And the birches with their light and shade, the curly clouds, the smoke of the campfires, and all that was around him changed and seemed terrible and menacing. A cold shiver ran down his spine. He rose quickly, went out of the shed, and began to walk about. After he had returned, voices were heard outside the shed. Who's that? he cried. The red-nosed Captain Timokin formerly Dolokhov's squadron commander, but now, from lack of officers, a battalion commander, shyly entered the shed, followed by an adjutant and the regimental paymaster. Prince Andrew rose hastily, listened to the business they had come about, gave them some further instruction, and was about to dismiss them when he heard a familiar lisping voice behind the shed. Devil take it, said the voice of a man stumbling over something. Prince Andrew looked out of the shed and saw Pierre, who had tripped over a pole on the ground and had nearly fallen coming his way. It was unpleasant to Prince Andrew to meet people of his own set in general, and Pierre specially, for he reminded him of all the painful moments of his last visit to Moscow. You? What a surprise, said he. What brings you here? This is unexpected. As he said this, his eyes and face expressed more than coldness. They expressed hostility, which Pierre noticed at once. 
He had approached the shed full of animation, but on seeing Prince Andrew's face, he felt constrained and ill at ease. I have come simply, you know, come. It interests me, said Pierre, who had so often that day senselessly repeated that word interesting. I wish to see the battle. Oh, yes, and what do the Masonic brothers say about war? How would they stop it? said Prince Andrew sarcastically. Well, and how is Moscow? And my people, have they reached Moscow at last? he asked seriously. Yes, they have. Julie Drubetskaya told me so. I went to see them, but missed them. They have gone to your estate near Moscow. End of chapter 24 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 25, Read for LibriVox.org, by Jeff. Chapter 25 The officers were about to take leave, but Prince Andrew, apparently reluctant to be left alone with his friend, asked them to stay and have tea. Seats were brought in, and so was the tea. The officers gazed with surprise at the pure's huge stout figure, and listened to his talk of Moscow and the position of our army round which he had ridden. Prince Andrew remained silent, and his expression was so forbidding that the peer addressed his remarks sharply to the good-natured battalion commander. So you understand the whole position of our troops? Prince Andrew interrupted him. Yes, that is. How do you mean, said the peer? Not being a military man, I can't say I have understood it fully, but I understand the general position. Well then, you know more than anyone else, be it who it may, said Prince Andrew. Oh, said Pierre, looking over his spectacles in perplexity at Prince Andrew. Well, and what to think of Kutuzov's appointment, he asked. I was very glad of his appointment, that's all I know, replied Prince Andrew. And tell me your opinion of Bakley de Tolly. In Moscow, they are saying heaven knows what about him. What do you think of him? Ask them, replied Prince Andrew, indicating the officers. Pierre looked at Timalkin with a condescendingly interrogative smile, with which everybody involuntarily addressed that officer. We see light again, since his serenity has been appointed. Your Excellency, said Timalkin timidly, and continually turning to glance at his colonel. Why so? asked the peer. Well, to mention only firewood and the father, let me inform you. Why, when we were retreating from Svenziani, we dare not touch a stick or a wisp of hay or anything. You see, we were going away, so he would get it out. Wasn't it so, your excellency? And again, Timalkin turned to the prince, but we daren't. In our regiment, two officers were court marshaled for that kind of thing. When his serenity took command, everything becomes straightforward. Now we see light. Then why was it forbidden? Timalkin looked about in confusion, now knowing what or how to answer such a question. Pierre put the same question to Prince Andrew. Why, so as now to lay waste the country we were abandoning to the enemy, said Prince Andrew with venomous irony. It is very sound. One can't permit the land to be pillaged and accustomed to the troops to marauding. At Smolensk, too, he judged correctly that the French might outflank us, as they had large forces. But he could now understand this, cried Prince Andrew in a shrill voice that seemed to escape him involuntarily. He could now understand that there, for the first time, we were fighting for Russian soil and that there was a spirit in the man such as I had never seen before, that we had held the French for two days, and that that success 
had increased our strength tenfold. He ordered us to retreat, and all our efforts and losses went for nothing. He had no thought of betraying us. He tried to do the best he could. He thought of everything, and that's why he is unsuitable. He is unsuitable now just because he plans out everything very thoroughly and accurately, as every German has to. How can I explain? Well, say your father has a German valet, and he is a splendid valet and satisfies your father's requirements better than you could. Then it's all right to let him serve. But if your father is mortally sick, you will send the valet away, attend to your father with your own unpracticed, awkward hands, and will suit him better than a skilled man who is stranger could. So it has been with Barclay. Well, Russian was well. A foreigner could serve her and be a splendid minister, but as soon as she is in danger, she needs one of her own kin. But in your club, they have been making him out a traitor. They slander him as a traitor, and the only result will be that afterwards, ashamed of their false accusations, they will make him out a hero or a genius instead of a traitor, and that will be still more unjust. He is an honest and a very punctilious German, and they say he is a skillful commander," rejoined Pierre. "I don't understand what is meant by a skillful commander," replied Prince Andrew ironically. "A skillful commander," replied Pierre. "Why, one who foresees all contingencies and foresees the adversary's intentions." But that's impossible," said Prince Andrew, as if it were a matter of settled long ago. Pierre looked at him in surprise. And yet they say that the war is like a game of chess," he remarked. "Yes," replied Prince Andrew. "But with this little difference, that in chess you may think over each move as long as you please, and there are no limit for time. And with this difference too." That a knight is always stronger than a pawn, and two pawns are always stronger than one. While in war, battalion is sometimes stronger than a division, and sometimes weaker than a company. The relative strength of bodies of troop can never be known to anyone. Believe me, he went on. If things depended on arrangements made by the staff, I could be there making arrangements. But instead of that, I have the honor to serve here in the regiment with this gentleman, and I consider that on us tomorrow's battle would depend not on those others. Success never depends, and never will depend, on position or equipment or even on numbers, and the least of all on position. But on what then? On the feeling that is in me and in him. He pointed to Timalkin. And in each soldier, Prince Andrew glanced at Timalkin, who looked at his commander in alarm and bewilderment. In contrast to his former reticent taciturnity, Prince Andrew now seemed excited. He could apparently not refrain from expressing the thoughts that had suddenly occurred to him. The battle is won by those who firmly resolve to win it. Why did we lose the battle at Austerlitz? The French losses were almost equal to ours, but very early we said to ourselves that we were losing the battle, and we did lose it. And we said so because we had nothing to fight for there. We wanted to get away from the battlefield as soon as we could. We've lost, so let us run, and we ran. And if we had now said that till the evening, heaven knows what might not have happened. But tomorrow we shan't say it. We talk about our position. The left flank weak and the right flank too extended. He went on. That's all nonsense. There's nothing of the kind. But、uh, what awaits us tomorrow? A hundred million most diverse chances, which will be decided on the instant by the fact that our men or theirs run or do not run, and that this man or that man is killed. But all that is being done at present is only play. The fact is that those men with whom you have ridden around the position not only do not help matters, but they hinder. They are only concerned with their own petty interests," said Pierre reproachfully. At that moment, Prince Andrew repeated, 
To them, it is only a moment affording opportunities to undermine a rival and obtain an extra cross or ribbon. For me, tomorrow means this: the Russian army of a hundred thousand and the French army of a hundred thousand have met to fight, and the thing is that these two hundred thousand men will fight, and the side that fights more fiercely and spares itself least will win. And if you like, I will tell you that whatever happens. And whatever models those at the top may make, we shall win tomorrow's battle. Tomorrow, happen what may, we shall win. Dear now, your excellency, that's the truth, the real truth," said Malkin. Who would spare himself now? The soldier in my battalion, believe me, wouldn't drink their vodka. It's now the day for that, they say. All were silent. The officers rose. Prince Andrew went out of the shed with them, giving final orders to the adjutants. After they had gone, Pierre approached Prince Andrew, and was about to start a conversation when they heard the clatter of three horses' hoofs on the road not far from the shed. And looking in that direction, Prince Andrew recognized Wozzenkin and Clausewitz, accompanied by a Cossack. The road closed by continuing to converse. And、Prince Andrew involuntarily heard these words: "The war must be extended widely. I cannot sufficiently command that view." Oh yes, the only aim is to weaken the enemy. So of course one cannot take into account the loss of private individuals. Oh no, agree the others. Extend widely," said Prince Andrew with an angry snout when they had ridden past. In that extent, were my father. Son and sister at bowed heels, thou shalt the same to him. That's what I was saying to you. Those German gentlemen won't win the battle tomorrow, but will only take out the mass they can, because they have nothing in their German heads but the theories not worth an empty eggshell, and they have it in their hearts. The one thing needed tomorrow that the wished Malkin has, they have yielded up all Europe to him. And have now come to teach us, fine teachers. And again, his voice grew shrill. So you think we shall win tomorrow's battle? Asked the peer. Yes, yes. Answered the prince Andrew absently. One thing I would do if I had the power. He began again. I would now take prisoners. Why take prisoners? It's chivalry. The French has destroyed my home. And are on their way to destroy Moscow. They have outraged and are outraging me every moment. They are my enemies. In my opinion, they are all criminals. And so thinks Timokhin and the whole army. They should be executed. Since they are my foes, they cannot be my friends. Whatever may have been said at Tilsit. Yes, yes," muttered Pierre, looking with shining eyes at Prince Andrew. I quite agree with you. The question that had perturbed Pierre on the Mozaska Hill and all that day now seemed to him quite clear and completely solved. He now understood the whole meaning and importance of this war and of the impending battle. All that he had seen that day, all the significant and the stern expression on the faces he had seen in passing, were lit up for him by a new light. He understood that the latent heat, as they say in physics, of patriotism, which was present in all these men he had seen, and this explained to him why they all prepared for death calmly and as it were lightheartedly, not taking prisoners. Prince Andrew continued that the by itself would quite change the whole war and make it less cruel, as it is we have played at war. That's what's vile. We play at magnanimity and all that stuff. Such magnanimity and sensibility are like the magnanimity and sensibility of a lady who faints when she sees a calf being killed. She is so kind-hearted that she can't look at the blood, but enjoys eating the calf served up with sauce. They talk to us of rules of war, of chivalry, of flags of truce, of mercy to the unfortunate, and so on. It's all rubbish. I saw chivalries and flags of truce in 1805. They humbugged us, and we humbugged them. 
the plunder of the people's houses, issue false paper money, and worst of all, they kill my children and my father, and then talk of rules of war and magnanimity to foes, take no prisoners, but kill and be killed. He who has come to this as I through the same sufferings, Prince Andrew, who had felt it was all the same to him, whether or not Moscow was taken as Marlins had been, was suddenly checked in his speech by an unexpected cramp in his throat. He paced up and down a few times in silence, but his eyes glittered feverishly, and his lips quivered as he began speaking. If there was none of this magnanimity in war, we should go to war only when it was worth while going to a certain death, as now. Then there would not be war, because Paul Ivanovich has offended Michael Ivanovich, and when there was a war like this one, it would be a war. And then the determination of the troops would be quite different. Then all these Westphalians and the Hessians, whom Napoleon is leading, would not follow him into Russia. And we should not go to fight in Austria and Prussia without knowing why. War is not a courtesy, but the most horrible thing in life. And we ought to understand that, and not play at a war. We ought to accept this terrible necessity sternly and seriously. It all lies in that. Get rid of falsehood and let war be war, not a game, as it is now. War is the favorite pastime of the idle and the frivolous. The military calling is the most highly honored. But what is war? What is needed for success in warfare? What are the habits of military? The aim of war is murder. The methods of war are spying, treachery, and their encouragement the ruin of a country's inhabitants, robbing them, or stealing to provision the army, and the frauds and the falsehood termed military craft. The habits of the military class are the absence of freedom, that is, discipline, idleness, ignorance, cruelty, debauchery, and drunkenness. And in spite of all this, it is the highest class, respected by everyone. All the kings, except the Chinese, wear military uniforms, and he who kills most people receives the highest rewards. They meet as we shall meet tomorrow, to murder one another. They kill and maim tens of thousands, and they have thanksgiving service for having killed so many people. They even exaggerate the number, and they announce a victory, supposing that the more people they have killed, the greater their achievement. How does God above look at them and hear them? exclaimed Prince Andrew in a shrill and a piercing voice. Ah, my friends, it has of late become hard for me to live. I see that I have begun to understand too much, and it doesn't do for men to taste of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Ah, well, it is now for long, he added. However, you are sleepy. And it's time for me to sleep. Go back to Gorky, said Prince Andrew suddenly. Oh no, Pierre replied, looking at Prince Andrew with frightened, compassionate eyes. Go, go, before a battle, one must have one sleep out, repeated Prince Andrew. He came quickly up to Pierre and embraced and kissed him. Goodbye, be off, he shouted, whether we meet again or not, and turning away hurriedly, he entered the shed. It was already dark, and Pierre could not make out whether the expression of Prince Andrew's face was angry or tender. For some time he stood in silence, whether he should follow him or go away. No, he does not want it, Pierre concluded, and I know that this is our last meeting. He sighed deeply and rode back to Gorky. On re-entering the shed, Prince Andrew lay down a rug, but he could not sleep. He closed his eyes. One picture succeeded another in his imagination. On one of them he dwelt long and joyfully. He vividly recalled an evening in Petersburg. Natasha, with animated and excited face, was telling him how she had gone to look for mushrooms the previous summer and had lost her way in the big forest. She incoherently described the depths of the forest, her feelings, 
and the talk with the beekeeper she met, and constantly interrupt her story to say, "No, I can't, and not telling it right. No, you don't understand." Though he encouraged her by saying that he did understand, and that he really had understand all she wanted to say, but Natasha was not satisfied with her own words. She felt that they did not convey the passionately poetic. Natasha was not satisfied with her own words. She felt that they did not convey the passionately poetic feeling she had experienced that day. The wish to convey, he was such a delightful old man, and it was so dark in the forest, and he had such kind. No one can describe it. She had said, flushed and excited. Prince Andrew smiled now, the same happy smile as then when he had looked into her eyes. I understood her, he thought. I not only understood her, but it was just the inner spiritual force, that sincerity, that the frankness of soul, that very soul of hers, which seemed to be fettered by her body. It was in that soul I loved in her, loved so strongly and happily. And suddenly he remembered how his love had ended. He did not need anything of that kind. He neither saw nor understood anything of the sort. He only saw in her pretty and fresh young girl, with whom he did not deign to unite his fate. And I, and he is still alive and gay. Prince Andrew jumped up as if someone had burned him, and again began pacing up and down in front of the shed. End of chapter twenty-five. War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Twenty Six, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. On August twenty-fifth, the eve of the Battle of Borodino, Monsieur de Bosset, prefect of the French Emperor's palace, arrived at Napoleon's quarters at Valoevo with Colonel Favier, the former from Paris and the latter from Madrid. Donning his court uniform, Monsieur de Bosset ordered a box he had brought for the Emperor to be carried before him and entered the first compartment of Napoleon's tent. Where he began opening the box while conversing with Napoleon's aide de camp, who surrounded him. Fabvier, not entering the tent, remained at the entrance talking to some generals of his acquaintance. The Emperor Napoleon had not yet left his bedroom and was finishing his toilet. Slightly snorting and grunting, he presented now his back and now his plump, hairy chest to the brush with which his valet was rubbing him down. Another valet, with his finger over the mouth of a bottle, was sprinkling eau de Cologne on the Emperor's pampered body with an expression which seemed to say that he alone knew where and how much eau de Cologne should be sprinkled. Napoleon's short hair was wet and matted on the forehead, but his face, though puffy and yellow, expressed physical satisfaction. "'Go on, harder, go on,' he muttered to the valet who was rubbing him, slightly twitching and grunting. An aide de camp who had entered the bedroom to report to the Emperor the number of prisoners taken in yesterday's action, was standing by the door after delivering his message, awaiting permission to withdraw. Napoleon, frowning, looked at him from under his brows. "'No prisoners,' said he, repeating the aide de words. "'They are forcing us to exterminate them. So much the worse for the Russian army. Go on, harder, harder,' he muttered, hunching his back and presenting his fat shoulders. "'All right,' Let Monsieur de Bosset enter, and Favier too, he said, nodding to the aide de camp. Yes, sire, and the aide de camp disappeared through the door of the tent. Two valets rapidly dressed his majesty, and wearing the blue uniform of the guards, he went with firm quick steps to the reception room. De Bosset's hands, meanwhile, were busily engaged arranging the present he had brought from the empress on two chairs directly in front of the entrance. But Napoleon had dressed and come out with such unexpected rapidity that he had not time to finish arranging the surprise. Napoleon noticed at once what they were about and guessed that they were not ready. He did not wish to deprive them of the pleasure of giving him a surprise, so he pretended not to see the Bosset and called Favier to him, listening silently and with a stern frown to what Favier told him of the heroism and devotion of his troops fighting at Salamanca, at the other end of Europe, with but one thought to be worthy of their emperor, and but one fear, to fail to please him. The result of that battle had been deplorable. 
Napoleon made ironic remarks during Favier's account, as if he had not expected that matters could go otherwise in his absence. "'I must make up for that in Moscow,' said Napoleon. "'I'll see you later,' he added, and summoned the Bousset, who by that time had prepared the surprise, having placed something on the chairs and covered it with a cloth. The Bousset bowed low, with that courtly French bow which only the old retainers the Bourbons knew how to make, and approached him, presenting an envelope. Napoleon turned to him gaily and pulled his ear. "'You have hurried here. I am very glad. Well, what is Paris saying?' he asked, suddenly changing his former stern expression for a most cordial tone. "'Sire, all Paris regrets your absence,' replied the Bousset, as was proper. But though Napoleon knew that de Bousset had to say something of this kind, and though in his lucid moments he knew it was untrue, he was pleased to hear it from him. Again he honoured him by touching his ear. "'I am very sorry to have made you travel so far,' said he. "'Sire, I expected nothing less than to find you at the gates of Moscow,' replied de Bousset. Napoleon smiled, and, lifting his head absent-mindedly, glanced to the right, an aide-de-camp approached with gliding steps and offered him a gold snuff-box, which he took. "'Yes, it has happened luckily for you,' he said, raising the open snuff-box to his nose. "'You are fond of travel, and in three days you will see Moscow. You surely did not expect to see that Asiatic capital. You will have a pleasant journey.' De Bosse bowed gratefully at this regard for his taste for travel, of which he had not till then been aware. "'Ha! What's this?' asked Napoleon noticing that all the courtiers were looking at something concealed under a cloth. With courtly adroitness, the Bousset half turned, and without turning his back to the emperor, retired two steps, twitching off the cloth at the same time, and said, "'A present to your majesty from the empress.' It was a portrait, painted in bright colours by Gerard, of the son born to Napoleon by the daughter of the emperor of Austria, the boy whom for some reason everyone called the king of Rome." A very pretty, curly-headed boy, with a look of the Christ in the Sistine Madonna, was depicted playing at stick and ball. The ball represented the terrestrial globe, and the stick in his other hand a sceptre. Though it was not clear what the artist meant to express by depicting the so-called King of Rome spiking the earth with a stick, the allegory apparently seemed to Napoleon, as it had done to all who had seen it in Paris, quite clear and very pleasing. "'The King of Rome,' he said, pointing to the portrait with a graceful gesture. Admirable! With the natural capacity of an Italian for changing the expression of his face at will, he drew nearer to the portrait and assumed a look of pensive tenderness. He felt that what he now said and did would be historical, and it seemed to him that it would now be best for him, whose grandeur enabled his son to play stick and ball with the terrestrial globe, to show, in contrast to that grandeur, the simplest paternal tenderness. His eyes grew dim, he moved forward, glanced round at the chair, which seemed to place itself under him, and sat down on it before the portrait. At a single gesture from him, every one went out on tiptoe, leaving the great man to himself and his emotion. Having sat still for a while, he touched, himself not knowing why, the thick spot of paint representing the highest light in the portrait, rose and recalled the Bosset and the officer on duty. He ordered the portrait to be carried outside his tent, that the old guard, stationed around it, might not be deprived of the pleasure of seeing the King of Rome, the son and heir of their adored monarch. And while he was doing M. de Bousset the honour of breakfasting with him, they heard, as Napoleon had anticipated, the rapturous cries of the officers and men of the old guard who had run up to see the portrait. "'Vive l'Empereur! Vive le Roi de Rome! Vive l'Empereur!' came those ecstatic cries. After breakfast, Napoleon, in de Bosset's presence, dictated his order of the day to the army. "'Short and energetic,' he remarked, when he had read over the proclamation which had dictated straight off without corrections. It ran, "'Soldiers, this is the battle you have so longed for. Victory depends on you. It is essential for us. It will give us all we need, comfortable quarters, and a speedy return to our country.' Behave as you did at Austerlitz, Friedland, Vitebsk, and Smolensk. Let our remotest posterity recall your achievements this day with pride. Let it be said of each of you, he was in the great battle before Moscow. Before Moscow, repeated Napoleon. And inviting Monsieur de Bousset, who was so fond of travel, 
to accompany him on his ride, he went out of the tent to where the horses stood saddled. "'Your Majesty is too kind,' replied the Bosse, to the invitation to accompany the Emperor. He wanted to sleep, did not know how to ride, and was afraid of doing so. But Napoleon nodded to the traveller, and the Bosse had to mount. When Napoleon came out of the tent, the shouting of the guards before his son's portrait grew still louder. Napoleon frowned. "'Take him away,' he said, pointing with a gracefully majestic gesture to the portrait. "'It is too soon for him to see a field of battle.' The Bosse closed his eyes, bowed his head, and sighed deeply, to indicate how profoundly he valued and comprehended the Emperor's words. End of chapter 26「War and Peace」by Leo Tolstoy Book 10, Chapter 27 Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama Chapter 27 On the 25th of August, so his historians tell us, Napoleon spent the whole day on horseback, inspecting the locality, considering plans submitted to him by his marshals, and personally giving commands to his generals. The original line of the Russian forces along the river Kalocha had been dislocated by the capture of the Shevardino redoubt on the 24th, and part of the line, the left flank, had been drawn back. That part of the line was not entrenched, and in front of it the ground was more open and level than elsewhere. It was evident to any one, military or not, that it was here the French should attack. It would seem that not much consideration was needed to reach this conclusion, nor any particular care or trouble on the part of the Emperor and his marshals, nor was there any need of that special and supreme quality called genius that people are so apt to ascribe to Napoleon. Yet the historians who describe the event later, and the men who then surrounded Napoleon and he himself, thought otherwise. Napoleon rode over the plain and surveyed the locality with a profound air and in silence, nodded with approval or shook his head dubiously, and, without communicating to the generals around him the profound cause of ideas which guided his decisions, merely gave them his final conclusions in the form of commands. Having listened to a suggestion from Davout, who was now called Prince Decmule, to turn the Russian left wing, Napoleon said it should not be done, without explaining why not. To a proposal made by General Campon, who was to attack the flèches, to lead his division through the woods, Napoleon agreed, though the so-called Duke of Elchingen, nay, ventured to remark that a movement through the woods was dangerous and might disorder the division. Having inspected the country opposite the Chevardino redoubt, Napoleon pondered a little in silence, and then indicated the spots where two batteries should be set up by the morrow to act against the Russian entrenchments, and the places where, in line with them, the field artillery should be placed. After giving these and other commands, he returned to his tent, and the dispositions for the battle were written down from his dictation. These dispositions, of which the French historians write with enthusiasm, and other historians with profound respect, were as follows. Adorn the two new batteries established during the night on the plain occupied by the Prince de Cmule, will open fire on the opposing batteries of the enemy. At the same time, the commander of the artillery of the First Corps, General Pernetti, with thirty cannon of Campon's division, and all the howitzers of Dessais and Friant's divisions will move forward, open fire, and overwhelm with shell fire the enemy's battery, against which will operate twenty-four guns of the artillery of the guards, thirty guns of Campon's division, and eight guns of Friant's and Dessais divisions. In all, 
sixty-two guns. The commander of the artillery of the Third Corps, General Fouché, will place the howitzers of the Third and Eighth Corps, sixteen in all, on the flanks of the battery, that is, to bombard the entrenchment on the left, which will have forty guns in all directed against it. General Sobier must be ready at the first order to advance with all the howitzers of the guards' artillery against either one or other of the entrenchments. During the cannonade, Prince Poniatowski is to advance through the wood on the village and turn the enemy's position. General Campon will move through the wood to seize the first fortification. After the advance has begun in this manner, orders will be given in accordance with the enemy's movements. The cannonade on the left flank will begin as soon as the guns of the right wing are heard. The sharpshooters of Morin's division and of the vice-king's division will open a heavy fire on seeing the attack commence on the right wing. The vice-king will occupy the village and cross by its three bridges, advancing to the same heights as Morin's and Gibra's divisions, which under his leadership will be directed against the redoubt and come into line with the rest of the forces. All this must be done in good order. Le tout se fera avec ordre et méthode, as far as possible, retaining troops in reserve. The Imperial Camp near Mojesk, September the 6th, 1812. These dispositions, which are very obscure and confused, if one allows oneself to regard the arrangements without religious awe of his genius, related to Napoleon's orders to deal with four points, four different orders. Not one of these was or could be carried out. In the disposition it is said first that the batteries placed on the spot chosen by Napoleon with the guns of Pernetti and Fouché, which were to come in line with them, 102 guns in all, were to open fire and shower shells on the Russian flèches and redoubts. This could not be done, as from the spot selected by Napoleon, the projectiles did not carry to the Russian works, and those 102 guns shot into the air until the nearest commander, contrary to Napoleon's instructions, moved them forward. The second order was that Poniatowski, moving to the village through the wood, should turn the Russian left flank. This could not be done, and was not done, because Poniatowski, advancing on the village through the wood, met Tuchkov there, barring his way, and could not and did not turn the Russian position. The third order was, General Campon will move through the wood to seize the first fortification. General Campon's division did not seize the first fortification, but was driven back, for, on emerging from the wood, it had to reform under grape-shot, of which Napoleon was unaware. The fourth order was, the vice-king will occupy the village, Borodino, and cross by its three bridges, advancing to the same heights as Morin's and Gibra's divisions, for whose movements no directions are given, which under his leadership will be directed against the redoubt and come into line with the rest of the forces. As far as one can make out, not so much from this unintelligible sentence as from the attempts the vice-king made to execute the orders given him, he was to advance from the left through Borodino to the redoubt, while the divisions of Marat and Girard were to advance simultaneously from the front. All this, like the other parts of the disposition, was not and could not be executed. After passing through Borodino, the vice-king was driven back to the Calocha and could get no farther, while the divisions of Morin and Girard did not take the redoubt but were driven back, and the redoubt was only taken at the end of the battle by the cavalry, a thing probably unforeseen and not heard of by Napoleon. So not one of the orders in the disposition was, or could be, executed, 
but in the disposition it is said that after the fight has commenced in this manner orders will be given in accordance with the enemy's movements and so it might be supposed that all necessary arrangements would be made by napoleon during the battle but this was not and could not be done for during the whole battle napoleon was so far away that as appeared later he could not know the course of the battle and not one of his orders during the fight could be executed end of chapter twenty seven recording by ernst patinama amsterdam the netherlands this recording is in the public domain War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Aylmer and Louise Maud Book 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by James Slater War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Book 10 Chapter 28 Many historians say that the French did not win the Battle of Borodino because Napoleon had a cold, and that if he had not had a cold, the orders he gave before and during the battle would have been still more full of genius, and Russia would have been lost, and the face of the world have been changed. To historians who believe that Russia was shaped by the will of one man, Peter the Great, and that France from a republic became an empire and French armies went to Russia at the will of one man, Napoleon, to say that Russia remained a power because Napoleon had a bad cold on the 24th of August may seem logical and convincing. If it had depended on Napoleon's will to fight or not to fight the Battle of Borodino, and if this or that other arrangement depended on his will, then evidently a cold affecting the manifestation of his will might have saved Russia, and consequently the valet who admitted to bring Napoleon his waterproof boots on the 24th would have been the savior of Russia. Along that line of thought, such a deduction is indubitable, as indubitable as the deduction Voltaire made in jest, without knowing what he was jesting at. When he saw that the massacre of St. Bartholomew was due to Charles IX's stomach being deranged. But to men who do not admit that Russia was formed by the will of one man, Peter I, or that the French Empire was formed and the war with Russia begun by the will of one man, Napoleon, that argument seems not merely untrue and irrational but contrary to all human reality. To the question of what causes historic events, another answer presents itself, namely, that the course of human events is predetermined from on high, depends on the coincidence of the wills of all who take part in the events, and what in Napoleon's influence on the course of these events is purely external and fictitious. Strange as at first glance it may seem to suppose that the massacre of St. Bartholomew was not due to Charles IX's will, Though he gave the order for it and thought it was done as a result of that order, and strange as it may seem to suppose that the slaughter of 80,000 men at Bordino was not due to Napoleon's will, though he ordered the commencement and conduct of the battle and thought it was done because he ordered it, strange as these suppositions appear, that human dignity, which tells me that each of us is, if not more, at least not less a man than the great Napoleon, demands the acceptance of that solution of the question and historic investigation abundantly confirms it. At the Battle of Borodino, Napoleon shot at no one and killed no one. That was all done by the soldiers, therefore it was not he who killed people. The French soldiers went to kill and be killed at the Battle of Borodino not because of Napoleon's orders, but by their own volition. The whole army, French, Italian, German, Polish, and Dutch, hungry, ragged, and weary of the campaign, felt at the sight of an army blocking their road to Moscow that the wine was drawn and must be drunk. Had Napoleon then forbidden them to fight the Russians, they would have killed him, and have proceeded to fight the Russians because it was inevitable. When they heard Napoleon's proclamation offering them, as compensation for mutilation and death, the words of posterity about their having been in the battle before Moscow, they cried, Vive l'Empereur, just as they had cried, Vive l'Empereur, at the sight of the portrait of the boy piercing the terrestrial globe with a toy stick and just as they would have cried vive l'empereur at any nonsense that might be told them. There was nothing left for them to do but cry vive l'empereur and go to fight, in order to get food and rest as conquerors in Moscow. So it was not because of Napoleon's commands that they killed their fellow men. 
and it was not Napoleon who directed the course of the battle, for none of his orders were executed, and during the battle he did not know what was going on before him. So the way in which these people killed one another was not decided by Napoleon's will, but occurred independently of him, in accord with the will of hundreds of thousands of people who took part in the common action. It only seemed to Napoleon that it all took place by his will. And so the question whether he had or had not a cold has no more historic interest than the cold of the least of the transport soldiers. Moreover, the assertions made by various writers that his cold was the cause of his dispositions not being as well planned as on former occasions, and of his orders during the battle not being as good as previously, is quite baseless, which again shows that Napoleon's cold on the 26th of August was unimportant. The dispositions cited above are not at all worse but are even better than previous dispositions by which he had won victories. His pseudo-orders during the battle were also no worse than formerly, but much the same as usual. These dispositions and orders only seem worse than previous ones because the Battle of Bordino was the first Napoleon did not win. The profoundest and most excellent dispositions and orders seem very bad, and every learned militarist criticizes them with looks of importance when they relate to a battle that has been lost and the very worst dispositions and orders seem very good, and serious people fill whole volumes to demonstrate their merits when they relate to a battle that has been won. The dispositions drawn up by Weyrother for the Battle of Austerlitz were a model perfection for that kind of composition, but still they were criticized, criticized for their very perfection, for their excessive minuteness. Napoleon at the Battle of Borodino fulfilled his office as representative of authority as well as, and even better than, at other battles. He did nothing harmful to the progress of the battle, he inclined to the most reasonable opinions, he made no confusion, did not contradict himself, did not get frightened or run away from the field of battle, but with his great tact and military experience, carried out his role of appearing to command, calmly and with dignity. End of chapter 28 Recorded by James Slater. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Twenty Nine, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. On returning from a second inspection of the lines, Napoleon remarked. The chessmen are set up. The game will begin tomorrow. Having ordered Punch and summoned de Bousset, he began to talk to him about Paris and about some changes he meant to make to the Emperor's household, surprising the prefect by his memory of minute details relating to the court. He showed an interest in trifles, joked about de Bousset's love of travel, and chatted carelessly, as a famous, self-confident surgeon who knows his job does when turning up his sleeves and putting on his apron while a patient is being strapped to the operating table. The matter is in my hands, and is clear and definite in my head. When the time comes to set to work, I shall do it as no one else could. But now I can jest, and the more I jest and the calmer I am, the more tranquil and confident you ought to be, and the more amazed at my genius. Having finished his second glass of punch, Napoleon went to rest before the serious business which, he considered, awaited him next day. He was so much interested in that task that he was unable to sleep, and in spite of his cold, which had grown worse from the dampness of the evening, he went into the large division of the tent at three o'clock in the morning, loudly blowing his nose. He asked whether the Russians had not withdrawn, and was told that the enemy's fires were still in the same places. He nodded approval. The adjutant in attendance came into the tent. "'Well, Rap, do you think we shall do good business today?' Napoleon asked him. "'Without doubt, sire,' replied Rap. Napoleon looked at him. "'Do you remember, sire, what you did me the honour to say at Smolensk?' continued Rap. "'The wine is drawn and must be drunk.' Napoleon frowned and sat silent for a long time, leaning his head on his hand. "'This poor army,' he suddenly remarked. "'It has diminished greatly since Smolensk.' Fortune is frankly a courtesan, Rap. I've always said so, and I'm beginning to experience it. But the guards, Rap, the guards are intact, he remarked interrogatively. Yes, sire, replied Rap. Napoleon took a lozenge, put it in his mouth, and glanced at his watch. He was not sleepy, and it was still not nearly morning. 
it was impossible to give further orders for the sake of killing time, for the orders had all been given and were now being executed. "'Have the biscuits and rice been served out to the regiments of the guards?' asked Napoleon sternly. "'Yes, sire. The rice, too?' Rapp replied that he had given the emperor's order about the rice, but Napoleon shook his head in dissatisfaction, as if not believing that his order had been executed. An attendant came in with punch. Napoleon ordered another glass to be brought for Rapp, and silently sipped his own. "'I have neither taste nor smell,' he remarked, sniffing at his glass. "'This cold is tiresome. They talk about medicine. What is the good of medicine when it can't cure a cold?' Carvizar gave me these lozenges, but they don't help at all. What can doctors cure? One can't cure anything. Our body is a machine for living. It is organized for that. It is its nature. Let life go on in it unhindered, and let it defend itself. It will do more than if you paralyze it by encumbering it with remedies. Our body is like a perfect watch that should go for a certain time. The watchmaker cannot open it. He can only adjust it by fumbling, and that blindfold... Yes, our body is just a machine for living, that is all. And, having entered on the path of definition of which he was fond, Napoleon suddenly and unexpectedly gave a new one. Do you know, Rapp, what military art is? he asked. It is the art of being stronger than the enemy at a given moment. That's all. Rapp made no reply. Tomorrow we shall have to deal with Kutuzov, said Napoleon. We shall see. Do you remember at Braunau he commanded an army for three weeks and did not once mount a horse to inspect his entrenchments? We shall see. He looked at his watch. It was still only four o'clock. He did not feel sleepy. The punch was finished, and there was still nothing to do. He rose, walked to and fro, put on a warm overcoat and a hat, and went out of the tent. The night was dark and damp. A scarcely perceptible moisture was descending from above. Nearby, the campfires were dimly burning among the French guards, and in the distance those of the Russian line shone through the smoke. The weather was calm, and the rustle and tramp of the French troops, already beginning to move to take up their positions, were clearly audible. Napoleon walked about in front of his tent, looked at the fires, and listened to these sounds, and as he was passing a tall guardsman in a shaggy cap, who was standing sentinel before his tent, and had drawn himself up like a black pillar at sight of the emperor, Napoleon stopped in front of him. "'What year did you enter the service?' he asked, with that affectation of military bluntness and geniality with which he always addressed the soldiers. The man answered the question. "'Ah, one of the old ones. Has your regiment had its rise?' "'It has, your majesty.' Napoleon nodded and walked away. At half-past five, Napoleon rode to the village of Chevardino. It was growing light, the sky was clearing, only a single cloud lay in the east. The abandoned campfires were burning themselves out in the faint morning light. On the right, a single deep report of a cannon resounded and died away in the prevailing silence. Some minutes passed. A second and a third report shook the air. Then a fourth and a fifth boomed solemnly nearby on the right. The first shots had not yet ceased to reverberate before others rang out, and yet more were heard, mingling with and overtaking one another. Napoleon, with his suite, rode up to the Chevardino Redoubt, where he dismounted. The game had begun. End of chapter 29「War and Peace」Book 10 Chapter 30 Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick On returning to Gorky, after having seen Prince Andrew, Pierre ordered his groom to get the horses ready and to call him early in the morning and then immediately fell asleep behind a partition in a corner Boris had given up to him. Before he was thoroughly awake next morning, Everybody had already left the hut. The panes were rattling in the little windows, and his groom was shaking him. "'Your Excellency! Your Excellency! Your Excellency!' He kept repeating pertinaciously while he shook Pierre by the shoulder, without looking at him, 
having apparently lost hope of getting him to wake up. What? Has it begun? Is it time? Pierre asked, waking up. Hear the firing, said the groom, a discharged soldier. All the gentlemen have gone out, and his serene highness himself rode past long ago. Pierre dressed hastily and ran out to the porch. Outside all was bright, fresh, dewy, and cheerful. The sun, just bursting forth from behind a cloud that had concealed it, was shining, with rays still half-broken by the clouds. Over the roofs of the street opposite, on the dew-besprinkled dust of the road, on the walls of the houses, on the windows, the fence, and on Pierre's horses standing before the hut. The roar of guns sounded more distinct outside. An adjutant accompanied by a Cossack passed by at a sharp trot. It is time, Count, it is time, cried the adjutant. Telling the groom to follow him with the horses, Pierre went down the street to the knoll from which he had looked at the field of the battle the day before. A crowd of military men was assembled there. Members of the staff could be heard conversing in French, and Kutuzov's grey head in a white cap with a red band was visible, his grey nape sunk between his shoulders. He was looking through a field glass down the high road before him. Mounting the steps to the knoll, Pierre looked at the scene before him, spellbound by beauty. It was the same panorama he had admired from that spot the day before, but now the whole place was full of troops and covered by smoke clouds from the guns, and the slanting rays of the bright sun rising slightly to the left behind Pierre, cast upon it through the clear morning air penetrating streaks of rosy, golden-tinted light and long dark shadows. The forest at the farthest extremity of the panorama seemed carved in some precious stone of a yellowish-green color. Its undulating outline was silhouetted against the horizon, and was pierced beyond Valuevo by the Smolensk high road crowded with troops. Nearer at hand glittered golden cornfields interspersed with copses. There were troops to be seen everywhere, in front and to the right and left. All this was vivid, majestic and unexpected. But what impressed Pierre most of all was the view of the battlefield itself, of Borodino, and the hollows on both sides of the Colocha. Above the Colocha, in Borodino, and on both sides of it, especially to the left, where the Voina flowing between its marshy banks falls into the Colocha, a mist had spread which seemed to melt, to dissolve, and to become translucent when the brilliant sun appeared and magically colored and outlined everything. The smoke of the guns mingled with this mist, and over the whole expanse and through that mist the rays of the morning sun were reflected, flashing back like lightning from the water, from the dew, and from the bayonets of the troops crowded together by the river banks and in Borodino. A white church could be seen through the mist. And here and there the roofs of huts in Borodino, as well as dense masses of soldiers, or green ammunition chests and ordnance. And all this moved, or seemed to move, as the smoke and mist spread out over the whole space. Just as in the mist-enveloped hollow near Borodino, so along the entire line outside and above it, and especially in the woods and fields to the left, in the valleys and on the summits of the high ground, clouds of powder smoke seemed continually to spring up out of nothing, now singly, 
now several at a time, some translucent, others dense, which, swelling, growing, rolling, and blending, extended over the whole expanse. These puffs of smoke, and strange to say, the sound of the firing produced the chief beauty of the spectacle. Puff, suddenly a round compact cloud of smoke, was seen merging from violet into grey and milky white, and boom, came the report a second later. Puff, puff, and two clouds arose pushing one another and blending together, and boom, boom, came the sounds confirming what the eye had seen. Pierre glanced round at the first cloud, which he had seen as a round compact ball, and in its place already were balloons of smoke floating to one side, and puff with a pause, puff, puff, three and then four more appeared, and then from each, with the same interval, boom, 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 came the fine, firm, precise sounds in reply. It seemed as if those smoke clouds sometimes ran and sometimes stood still, while woods, fields, and glittering bayonets ran past them. From the left, over fields and bushes, those large balls of smoke were continually appearing, followed by their solemn reports, while nearer still in the hollows and woods there burst from the muskets small cloudlets that had no time to become balls, but had their little echoes in just the same way. Truck, ta 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 came the frequent crackle of musketry, but it was irregular and feeble in comparison with the reports of the cannon. Pierre wished to be there with that smoke, those shining bayonets, that movement and those sounds. He turned to look at Kutuzov and his suit, to compare his impressions with those of others. They were all looking at the field of battle as he was, and, as it seemed to him, with the same feelings. All their faces were now shining with that latent warmth of feeling Pierre had noticed the day before and had fully understood after his talk with Prince Andrew. Go, my dear fellow, go, and Christ be with you. Kutuzov was saying to a general who stood beside him, not taking his eye from the battlefield. Having received this order, the general passed by Pierre on his way down the knoll. To the crossing, said the general coldly and sternly, in reply to one of the staff, who asked where he was going. I will go there too, I too, thought Pierre and followed the general. The general mounted a horse a Cossack had brought him. Pierre went to his groom who was holding his horses and, asking which was the quietest, clambered onto it, seized it by the mane and turning out his toes, pressed his heels against its sides, and, feeling that his spectacles were slipping off, but unable to let go of the mane and reins, he galloped after the general, causing the staff officers to smile as they watched him from the knoll. End of chapter 30 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Thirty One, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Having descended the hill, the general, after whom Pierre was galloping, turned sharply to the left, and Pierre, losing sight of him, galloped in among some ranks of infantry marching ahead of him. He tried to pass either in front of them or to the right or left, but there were soldiers everywhere, all with expression and busy with some unseen but evidently important task. They all gazed with the same dissatisfied and inquiring expression at this stout man in a white hat, who, for some unknown reason, threatened to trample them under his horse's hoofs. "'Why ride into the middle of the battalion?' one of them shouted at him. 
Another prodded his horse with the butt-end of a musket, and Pierre, bending over his saddle-bow and hardly able to control his shying horse, galloped ahead of the soldiers where there was a free space. There was a bridge ahead of him, where other soldiers stood firing. Pierre rode up to them. Without being aware of it, he had come to the bridge across the Colocha, between Gorky and Borodino, which the French, having occupied Borodino, were attacking in the first phase of the battle. Pierre saw that there was a bridge in front of him, and that soldiers were doing something on both sides of it, and in the meadow, among the rows of new-mown hay which he had taken no notice of amid the smoke of the campfires the day before. But despite the incessant firing going on there, he had no idea that this was the field of battle. He did not notice the sound of the bullets whistling from every side, or the projectiles that flew over him, did not see the enemy on the other side of the river, and for a long time did not notice the killed and wounded, though many fell near him. He looked about him with a smile which did not leave his face. "'Why is that fellow in front of the line?' shouted somebody at him again. "'To the left! Keep to the right!' the man shouted to him. Pierre went to the right, and unexpectedly encountered one of Ravsky's adjutants whom he knew. The adjutant looked angrily at him, evidently also intending to shout at him, but on recognizing him he nodded. "'How have you got here?' he said, and galloped on. Pierre, feeling out of place there, having nothing to do, and afraid of getting in someone's way again, galloped after the adjutant. "'What's happening here? May I come with you?' he asked. "'One moment, one moment,' replied the adjutant, and riding up to a stout colonel who was standing in the meadow, he gave him some message, and then addressed Pierre. "'Why have you come here, Count?' he asked with a smile. "'Still inquisitive?' "'Yes, yes,' assented Pierre but the adjutant turned his horse about and rode on. "'Here it's tolerable,' said he, "'but with Bagration on the left flank they're getting it frightfully hot.' "'Really?' said Pierre. "'Where's that?' "'Come along with me to our knoll. We can get a view from there, and in our battery it is still bearable,' said the adjutant. "'Will you come?' "'Yes, I'll come with you,' replied Pierre, looking round for his groom. It was only now that he noticed wounded men staggering along or being carried on stretchers. On that very meadow he had ridden over the day before, a soldier was lying athwart the rows of scented hay, with his head thrown awkwardly back and his shako off. "'Why haven't they carried him away?' Pierre was about to ask, but seeing the stern expression of the adjutant, who was also looking that way, he checked himself. Pierre did not find his groom, and rode along the hollow with the adjutant to Revsky's redoubt. His horse lagged behind the adjutant's and jolted him at every step. "'You don't seem to be used to riding, Count,' remarked the adjutant. "'No, it's not that, but her action seems so jerky,' said Pierre, in a puzzled tone. "'Why, she's wounded,' said the adjutant. "'In the off foreleg, above the knee. A bullet, no doubt. I congratulate you, Count, on your baptism of fire.' Having ridden in the smoke past the Sixth Corps, behind the artillery, which had been moved forward and was in action, deafening them with the noise of firing, they came to a small wood. There it was cool and quiet, with the scent of autumn. Pierre and the adjutant dismounted and walked up the hill on foot. "'Is the general here?' asked the adjutant, on reaching the knoll. "'He was here a minute ago, but has just gone that way,' someone told him, pointing to the right. The adjutant looked at Pierre as if puzzled what to do with him now. "'Don't trouble about me,' said Pierre. "'I'll go up on to the knoll, if I may.' "'Yes, do. You'll see everything from there, and it's less dangerous, and I'll come for you.' Pierre went to the battery, and the adjutant rode on. They did not meet again, and only much later did Pierre learn that he lost an arm that day. The knoll to which Pierre ascended was that famous one afterwards known to the Russians as the Knoll Battery, Orevsky's Redoubt, and to the French as La Grande Redoute, La Fatale Redoute, La Redoute du Centre, around which tens of thousands fell, and which the French regarded as the key to the whole position. This redoubt consisted of a knoll, on three sides of which trenches had been dug. Within the entrenchment stood ten guns that were being fired through openings in the earthwork. In line with the knoll on both sides stood other guns, which also fired incessantly. A little behind the guns stood infantry. When ascending that knoll, Pierre had no notion that this spot, on which small trenches had been dug, and from which a few guns were firing, was the most important point of the battle. On the contrary, just because he happened to be there, he thought it one of the least significant parts of the field. Having reached the knoll, 
Pierre sat down at one end of a trench surrounding the battery, and gazed at what was going on around him with an unconsciously happy smile. Occasionally he rose and walked about the battery still with that same smile, trying not to obstruct the soldiers who were loading, hauling the guns, and continually running past him with bags and charges. The guns of that battery were being fired continually one after another, with a deafening roar, enveloping the whole neighborhood in powder smoke. In contrast with the dread felt by the infantrymen placed in support, here in the battery, where a small number of men busy at their work were separated from the rest by a trench, everyone experienced a common, and as it were, family feeling, of animation. The intrusion of Pierre's non-military figure, in a white hat, made an unpleasant impression at first. The soldiers looked askance at him, with surprise and even alarm as they went past him. The senior artillery officer, a tall, long-legged, pock-marked man, moved over to Pierre as if to see the action of the farthest gun, and looked at him with curiosity. A young, round-faced officer, quite a boy still, and evidently only just out of the cadet college, who was zealously commanding the two guns entrusted to him, addressed Pierre sternly. "'Sir,' he said, "'permit me to ask you to stand aside. You must not be here.' The soldiers shook their heads disapprovingly as they looked at Pierre. But when they had convinced themselves that this man in the white hat was doing no harm— but either sat quietly on the slope of the trench with a shy smile, or, politely making way for the soldiers, paced up and down the battery under fire as calmly as if he were on a boulevard, their feeling of hostile distrust gradually began to change into a kindly and bantering sympathy, such as soldiers feel for their dogs, cocks, goats, and in general for the animals that live with the regiment. The men soon accepted Pierre into their family, adopted him, gave him a nickname, Our Gentleman, and made kindly fun of him among themselves. A shell tore up the earth two paces from Pierre, and he looked around with a smile as he brushed from his clothes some earth it had thrown up. "'And how is it you're not afraid, sir, really now?' a red-faced, broad-shouldered soldier asked Pierre, with a grin that disclosed a set of sound white teeth. "'Are you afraid, then?' said Pierre. "'What else do you expect?' answered the soldier. "'She has no mercy, you know. When she comes spluttering down, out go your innards. One can't help being afraid, he said laughing. Several of the men, with bright, kindly faces, stopped beside Pierre. They seemed not to have expected him to talk like anybody else, and the discovery that he did so delighted them. It's the business of us soldiers, but in the gentleman it's wonderful. There's a gentleman for you. To your places, cried the young officer to the men gathered round Pierre. The young officer was evidently exercising his duties for the first or second time, and therefore treated both his superiors and the men with great precision and formality. The booming cannonade and the fusillade of musketry were growing more intense over the whole field, especially to the left, where Bagration's flashes were, but where Pierre was, the smoke of the firing made it almost impossible to distinguish anything. Moreover, his whole attention was engrossed by watching the family circle— separated from all else, formed by the man in the battery. His first unconscious feeling of joyful animation, produced by the sights and sounds of the battlefield, was now replaced by another, especially since he had seen that soldier lying alone in the hayfield. Now, seated on the slope of the trench, he observed the faces of those around him. By ten o'clock some twenty men had already been carried away from the battery, Two guns were smashed, and cannonballs fell more and more frequently on the battery, and spent bullets buzzed and whistled around. But the man in the battery seemed not to notice this, and merry voices and jokes were heard on all sides. "'A live one!' shouted a man, as a whistling shell approached. "'Not this way! To the infantry!' added another, with loud laughter, seeing the shell fly past and fall into the ranks of the supports. "'Are you bowing to a friend, eh?' remarked another chafing a peasant who ducked low as a cannonball flew over several soldiers gathered by the wall of the trench looking out to see what was happening in front they've withdrawn the front line it has retired said they pointing over the earthwork mind your own business an old sergeant shouted at them if they've retired it's because there's work for them to do farther back and the sergeant taking one of the men by the shoulders gave him a shove with his knee this was followed by a burst of laughter to the fifth gun, wheel it up, came shouts from one side. Now then, all together, like bargees, rose the merry voices of those who were moving the gun. Oh, she nearly knocked our gentleman's head off, cried the red-faced humorist, showing his teeth chafing Pierre. Awkward baggage, he added reproachfully to a cannonball that struck a cannon-wheel and a man's leg. 
"'Now then, you foxes!' said another, laughing at some militiamen who, stooping low, entered the battery to carry away the wounded man. "'So this gruel isn't to your taste. Oh, you crows! You're scared!' they shouted at the militiamen, who stood hesitating before the man whose leg had been torn off. "'There, lads! Ho, oh, oh. ho!' they mimicked the peasants. "'They don't like it at all!' Pierre noticed that after every ball that hit the redoubt, and after every loss, the liveliness increased more and more. As the flames of the fire, hidden within, come more and more vividly and rapidly from an approaching thundercloud, so, as if in opposition to what was taking place, the lightning of hidden fire growing more and more intense glowed in the faces of these men. Pierre did not look out at the battlefield, and was not concerned to know what was happening there. He was entirely absorbed in watching this fire which burned ever more brightly, and which he felt was flaming up in the same way in his own soul. At ten o'clock, the infantry that had been among the bushes in front of the battery and along the Kamenka streamlet retreated. From the battery they could be seen running back past it, carrying their wounded on their muskets. A general with his suite came to the battery, and, after speaking to the colonel, gave Pierre an angry look and went away again, having ordered the infantry supports behind the battery to lie down, so as to be less exposed to fire. After this, from amid the ranks of infantry to the right of the battery, came the sound of a drum and shouts of command, and from the battery one saw how those ranks of infantry moved forward. Pierre looked over the wall of the trench, and was particularly struck by a pale young officer, who, letting his sword hang down, was walking backwards, and kept glancing uneasily around. The ranks of the infantry disappeared amid the smoke, but their long-drawn shout and rapid musketry firing could still be heard. A few minutes later, crowds of wounded men and stretcher-bearers came back from that direction. Projectiles began to fall still more frequently in the battery. Several men were lying about who had not been removed. Around the cannon the men moved still more briskly and busily. No one any longer took notice of Pierre. Once or twice he was shouted at for being in the way. The senior officer moved with big, rapid strides from one gun to another, with a frowning face. The young officer, with his face still more flushed, commanded the men more scrupulously than ever. The soldiers handed up the charges, turned, loaded, and did their business with strained smartness. They gave little jumps as they walked, as though they were on springs. The storm cloud had come upon them, and in every face the fire which Pierre had watched kindle burned up brightly. Pierre, standing beside the commanding officer. The young officer, his hand to his shako, ran up to his superior. "'I have the honour to report, sir, that only eight rounds are left. Are we to continue firing?' he asked. "'Grape-shot!' the senior shouted, without answering the question, looking over the wall of the trench. Suddenly something happened. The young officer gave a gasp, and bending double, sat down on the ground like a bird shot on the wing. Everything became strange, confused and misty in Pierre's eyes. One cannonball after another whistled by and struck the earthwork, a soldier, or a gun. Pierre, who had not noticed these sounds before, now heard nothing else. On the right of the battery, soldiers shouting, Hurrah! were running not forwards but backwards, it seemed to Pierre. A cannonball struck the very end of the earthwork by which he was standing, crumbling down the earth. A black ball flashed before his eyes, and at the same instant plumped into something. Some militiamen who were entering the battery ran back. "'All with grape-shot!' shouted the officer. The sergeant ran up to the officer, and in a frightened whisper informed him, as a butler at dinner informs his master that there is no more of some wine asked for, that there were no more charges. "'The scoundrels! What are they doing?' shouted the officer, turning to Pierre. The officer's face was red and perspiring, and his eyes glittered under his frowning brow. "'Run to the reserves, and bring up the ammunition boxes!' he yelled angrily avoiding Pierre with his eyes and speaking to his men. "'I'll go,' said Pierre. The officer, without answering him, strode across to the opposite side. "'Don't fire! Wait!' he shouted. The man, who had been ordered to go for ammunition, stumbled against Pierre. "'Hey, sir, this is no place for you,' said he, and ran down the slope. Pierre ran after him, avoiding the spot where the young officer was sitting. One cannibal, another, and a third flew over him, falling in front, beside and behind him, Pierre ran down the slope. "'Where am I going?' he suddenly asked himself, when he was already near the green ammunition wagons. He halted irresolutely, not knowing whether to return or to go on. Suddenly a terrible concussion threw him backwards to the ground. 
At the same instant he was dazzled by a great flash of flame, and immediately a deafening roar, crackling and whistling, made his ears tingle. When he came to himself, he was sitting on the ground, leaning on his hands. The ammunition wagons he had been approaching no longer existed. Only charred green boards and rags littered the scorched grass, and a horse, dangling fragments of its shaft behind it, galloped past, while another horse lay, like Pierre, on the ground, uttering prolonged and piercing cries. End of chapter 31《War and Peace》Book Ten, Chapter Thirty Two, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Beside himself with terror, Pierre jumped up and ran back to the battery as to the only refuge from the horrors that surrounded him. On entering the earthwork, he noticed that there were men doing something there, but that no shots were being fired from the battery. He had no time to realize who these men were. He saw the senior officer lying on the earth wall with his back turned as if he were examining something down below and that one of the soldiers he had noticed before was struggling forward, shouting, "'Brothers!' and trying to free himself from some men who were holding him by the arm. He also saw something else that was strange. But he had not time to realize that the colonel had been killed, that the soldier shouting "'Brothers!' was a prisoner, and that another man had been bayoneted in the back before his eyes, for hardly had he run into the redoubt before a thin, sallow-faced, perspiring man in a blue uniform rushed on him sword in hand, shouting something. Instinctively guarding against the shock, for they had been running together at full speed before they saw one another, Pierre put out his hands and seized the man, a French officer, by the shoulder with one hand and by the throat with the other. The officer, dropping his sword, seized Pierre by his collar. For some seconds they gazed with frightened eyes at one another's unfamiliar faces, and both were perplexed at what they had done and what they were to do next. "'Am I taken prisoner, or have I taken him prisoner?' each was thinking. But the French officer was evidently more inclined to think he had been taken prisoner, because Pierre's strong hand, impelled by instinctive fear, squeezed his throat ever tighter and tighter. The Frenchman was about to say something, when, just above their heads, terrible and low, a cannonball whistled, and it seemed to Pierre that the French officer's head had been torn off, so swiftly had he ducked it. Pierre, too, bent his head and let his hands fall. Without further thought as to who had taken whom prisoner, the Frenchman ran back to the battery, and Pierre ran down the slope, stumbling over the dead and wounded who, it seemed to him, caught at his feet. But before he reached the foot of the knoll, he was met by a dense crowd of Russian soldiers who, stumbling, tripping up, and shouting, ran merrily and wildly toward the battery. This was the attack for which Ermolov claimed the credit, declaring that only his courage and good luck made such a feat possible. It was the attack in which he was said to have thrown some St. George's crosses he had in his pocket into the battery for the first soldiers to take who got there. The French who had occupied the battery fled, and our troops, shouting, Hurrah! pursued them so far beyond the battery that it was difficult to call them back. The prisoners were brought down from the battery, and among them was a wounded French general, whom the officers surrounded. Crowds of wounded, some known to Pierre and some unknown, Russians and French, with faces distorted by suffering, walked, crawled, and were carried on stretchers from the battery. Pierre again went up onto the knoll, where he had spent over an hour, and of that family circle which had received him as a member he did not find a single one. There were many dead whom he did not know, but some he recognized. The young officer, still sat in the same way, bent double, in a pool of blood at the edge of the earth wall. The red-faced man was still twitching, but they did not carry him away. Pierre ran down the slope once more. "'Now they will stop it. Now they will be horrified at what they have done,' he thought, aimlessly going toward a crowd of stretcher-bearers moving from the battlefield. But behind the veil of smoke the sun was still high, and in front, and especially to the left, near Semenovsk, Something seemed to be seething in the smoke, and the roar of cannon and musketry did not diminish, but even increased to desperation, like a man who, straining himself, shrieks with all his remaining strength. End of chapter 32 
War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Thirty Three, read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama. The chief action of the Battle of Borodino was fought within the seven thousand feet between Borodino and Bagration's flèches. Beyond that space, there was on the one side a demonstration made by the russians with uvarov's cavalry at midday and on the other side beyond utitsa poniatowski's collision with duchkov but these two were detached and feeble actions in comparison with what took place in the centre of the battlefield on the field between borodino and the flèches beside the wood the chief action of the day took place on an open space visible from both sides and was fought in the simplest and most artless way the battle began on both sides with a cannonade from several hundred guns then when the whole field was covered with smoke two divisions campons and desses advanced from the french right while murat's troops advanced on borodino from the left from the chevardino redoubt where napoleon was standing the flèches were two-thirds of a mile away, and it was more than a mile, as the crow flies, to Borodino, so that Napoleon could not see what was happening there, especially as the smoke, mingling with the mist, hid the whole locality. The soldiers of Dessert's division, advancing against the flèches, could only be seen till they had entered the hollow that lay between them and the flèches, as soon as they had descended into that hollow, the smoke of the guns and musketry on the flèches grew so dense that it covered the whole approach on that side of it. Through the smoke, glimpses could be caught of something black, probably men, and at times the glint of bayonets. But whether they were moving or stationary, whether they were French or Russian, could not be discovered from the Chevardino redoubt. The sun had risen brightly, and its slanting rays struck straight into Napoleon's face as, shading his eyes with his hand, he looked at the flèches. The smoke spread out before them, and at times it looked as if the smoke were moving, at times as if the troops moved. Sometimes shouts were heard through the firing, but it was impossible to tell what was being done there. Napoleon standing on the knoll looked through a field glass and in its small circlet saw smoke and men sometimes his own and sometimes russians but when he looked again with the naked eye he could not tell where what he had seen was he descended the knoll and began walking up and down before it occasionally he stopped listened to the firing and gazed intently at the battlefield but not only was it impossible to make out what was happening from where he was standing down below or from the knoll above on which some of his generals had taken their stand but even from the flèches themselves in which by this time there were now russian and now french soldiers alternately or together dead wounded alive frightened or maddened even at those flèches themselves it was impossible to make out what was taking place there for several hours amid incessant cannon and musketry fire now russians were seen alone now frenchmen alone now infantry and now cavalry they appeared fired fell collided not knowing what to do with one another screamed and ran back again from the battlefield adjutants he had sent out and orderlies from his marshals kept galloping up to napoleon with reports of the progress of the action but all those reports were false both because it was impossible in the heat of battle to say what was happening at any given moment and because many of the adjutants did not go to the actual place of conflict but reported what they had heard from others and also because while an adjutant was riding more than a mile to napoleon circumstances changed and the news he brought was already becoming false thus an adjutant galloped up from murat 
were tidings that Borodino had been occupied, and the bridge over the Kalosha was in the hands of the French. The adjutant asked whether Napoleon wished the troops to cross it. Napoleon gave orders that the troops should form up on the farther side and wait, but before that order was given, almost as soon in fact as the adjutant had left Borodino, the bridge had been retaken by the Russians and burned, in a very skirmish at which Pierre had been present at the beginning of the battle. An adjutant galloped up from the flashes with a pale and frightened face, and reported to Napoleon that their attack had been repulsed, Campan wounded, and Davout killed. Yet, at the very time the adjutant had been told that the French had been repulsed, the flashes had in fact been recaptured by other French troops, and Davout was alive and only slightly bruised. On the basis of these necessarily untrustworthy reports, Napoleon gave his orders, which had either been executed before he gave them, or could not be and were not executed. The marshals and generals, who were nearer to the field of battle, but, like Napoleon, did not take part in the actual fighting, and only occasionally went within musket range, made their own arrangements without asking Napoleon, and issued orders where and in what direction to fire, and where cavalry should gallop, and infantry should run. But even their orders, like Napoleon's, were seldom carried out, and then but partially. For the most part, things happened contrary to their orders. Soldiers, ordered to advance, ran back on meeting grapeshot, Soldiers, ordered to remain where they were, suddenly, seeing Russians unexpectedly before them, sometimes rushed back and sometimes forward, and the cavalry dashed without orders in pursuit of the flying Russians. In this way, two cavalry regiments galloped through the Semyonovsk hollow, and as soon as they reached the top of the incline, turned round and galloped full speed back again. The infantry moved in the same way, sometimes running to quite other places than those they were ordered to go to. All orders, as to where and when to move the guns, when to send infantry to shoot or horsemen to ride down the Russian infantry, all such orders were given by the officers on the spot nearest to the units concerned, without asking either Ne, Davou or Murat, much less Napoleon. They did not fear getting into trouble for not fulfilling orders or for acting on their own initiative, for in battle what is at stake is what is dearest to man, his own life, and it sometimes seems that safety lies in running back, sometimes in running forward, and these men, who were right in the heat of the battle, acted according to the mood of the moment. In reality, however, all these movements forward and backward did not improve or alter the position of the troops. All the rushing and galloping at one another did little harm. The harm of disablement and death was caused by the balls and bullets that flew over the fields on which these men were floundering about. As soon as they left a place where the balls and bullets were flying about, their superiors, located in the background, reformed them and brought them under discipline, and under the influence of that discipline led them back to the zone of fire, where, under the influence of fear of death, they lost their discipline and rushed about according to the chance promptings of the throng. End of chapter 33 Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 34 Read for LibriVox.org by Philippa Brody Napoleon's generals, Davou, Ney and Murat, who were near that region of fire and sometimes even entered it, repeatedly led into it huge masses of well-ordered troops. 
but contrary to what had always happened in their former battles, instead of the news they expected of the enemy's flight, these orderly masses returned thence as disorganized and terrified mobs. The generals reformed them, but their numbers constantly decreased. In the middle of the day, Murat sent his adjutant to Napoleon to demand reinforcements. Napoleon sat at the foot of the knoll, drinking punch, when Murad's adjutant galloped up with an assurance that the Russians would be routed if His Majesty would let him have another division. "'Reinforcements?' said Napoleon, in a tone of stern surprise, looking at the adjutant, a handsome lad with long black curls arranged like Murat's own, as though he did not understand his words. "'Reinforcements,' thought Napoleon to himself. "'How can they need reinforcements when they already have half the army directed against a weak, unentrenched Russian wing?' "'Tell the King of Naples,' he said sternly, "'that it is not noon yet, and I don't yet see my chessboard clearly. Go!' The handsome boy adjutant with the long hair sighed deeply without removing his hand from his hat, and galloped back to where men were being slaughtered. Napoleon rose, and having summoned Colincourt and Berthier, began talking to them about matters unconnected with the battle. In the midst of this conversation, which was beginning to interest Napoleon, Berthier's eyes turned to look at a general with a suite, who was galloping towards the knoll on a lathering horse. It was Belia. Having dismounted, he went up to the emperor with rapid strides, and in a loud voice began boldly demonstrating the necessity of sending reinforcements. He swore on his honour that the Russians were lost if the emperor would give another division. Napoleon shrugged his shoulders and continued to pace up and down without replying. Belliard began talking loudly and eagerly to the generals of the suite around him. "'You are very fiery, Belliard," said Napoleon, when he came up again to the general. In the heat of a battle, it is easy to make a mistake. Go and have another look, and then come back to me. Before Belliard was out of sight, a messenger from another part of the battlefield galloped up. Now then, what do you want? asked Napoleon, in the tone of a man irritated at being continually disturbed. Sire the prince, began the adjutant. Asks for reinforcements, said Napoleon, with an angry gesture. The adjutant bent his head affirmatively and began to report. But the emperor turned from him, took a couple of steps, stopped, came back, and called Bertia. "'We must give reserves,' he said, moving his arms slightly apart. "'Who do you think should be sent there?' he asked of Bertia, whom he subsequently termed, "'That gosling of maiden eagle.' "'Send Clapore's division, sire,' replied Bertia, who knew all the divisions, regiments, and battalions by heart. Napoleon nodded assent. The adjutant galloped to Clapore's division, and a few minutes later the young guard stationed behind the knoll moved forward. Napoleon gazed silently in that direction. "'Non,' he said suddenly to Bertia. "'I can't send Clapore. Send Fouillon's division.' Though there was no advantage in sending Fouillon's division instead of Clapore's, and even an obvious inconvenience and delay in stopping Clapore and sending Fouillon now, the order was carried out exactly. Napoleon did not notice that in regard to his army he was playing the part of a doctor who hinders by his medicine, a role he so justly understood and condemned. Friant's division disappeared as the others had done into the smoke of the battlefield. From all sides adjutants continued to arrive at a gallop, and as if by agreement all said the same thing. They all asked for reinforcements, and all said that the Russians were holding their positions and maintaining a hellish fire under which the French army was melting away. Napoleon sat on a campstool, wrapped in thought. M. de Bousset, the man so fond of travel, having fasted since morning, came up to the Emperor, and ventured respectfully to suggest lunch to His Majesty. "'I hope I may now congratulate Your Majesty on a victory,' he said. Napoleon silently shook his head in negation. Assuming the negation to refer only to the victory and not to the lunch, M. de Bousset ventured with respectful jocularity to remark that there is no reason for not having lunch when one can get it. "'Go away!' explained Napoleon suddenly and morosely, and turned aside. A beatific smile of regret, repentance, and ecstasy beamed on M. de Bousset's face, and he glided away to the other generals. Napoleon was experiencing a feeling of depression like that of an ever-lucky gambler who, after recklessly flinging money about and always winning, suddenly, just when he's calculated all the chances of the game, finds that the more he considers his play, the more surely he loses. His troops were the same, his generals the same, 
The same preparations had been made, the same dispositions, and the same proclamation, courte et énergique. He himself was still the same. He knew that, and knew that he was now even more experienced and skilful than before. Even the enemy was the same as at Austerlitz and Friedland, yet the terrible stroke of his arm had supernaturally become impotent. All the old methods which that had been unfailingly crowned with success, the concentration of batteries at one point, an attack by reserves to break the enemy's line, and a cavalry attack by the men of iron. All these methods had already been employed, and yet not only was there no victory, but from all sides came the same news of generals killed and wounded, of reinforcements needed, of the impossibility of driving back the Russians, and of disorganization among his own troops. Formerly, after he had given two or three orders and uttered a few phrases, marshals and adjutants had come galloping up with the congratulations and happy faces, announcing the trophies taken, the cause of prisoners, bundles of enemy eagles and standards, cannon and stores, and Murat had only begged leave to loose the cavalry to gather in the baggage wagons. So it had been at Lodi, Marengo, Arcola, Jena, Austerlitz, Wagram, and so on. But now something strange was happening to his troops. Despite news of the capture of the fleshes, Napoleon saw that this was not the same, not at all the same, as what had happened in his former battles. He saw that what he was feeling was felt by all the men about him experienced in the art of war. All their faces looked dejected, and they all shunned one another's eyes. Only a debussy could fail to grasp the meaning of what was happening. But Napoleon, with his long experience of war, well knew the meaning of a battle not gained by the attacking side in eight hours after all efforts had been expended. He knew that it was a lost battle, and that the least accident might now, with the fight balanced on such a strained centre, destroy him and his army. When he ran his mind over the whole of this strange Russian campaign, in which not one battle had been won, and in which not one flag, or cannon, or army corps had been captured in two months, when he looked at the concealed depression on the faces around him and heard reports of the Russians still holding their ground, a terrible feeling like a nightmare took possession on him, and all the unlucky accidents that might destroy him occurred to his mind. The Russians might fall on his left wing, might break through his centre, he himself might be killed by a stray cannonball. All this was possible. In former battles he had only considered the possibilities of success, but now innumerable unlucky chances presented themselves, and he expected them all. Yes, it was like a dream in which a man fancies that a ruffian is coming to attack him, and raises his arm to strike that ruffian a terrible blow which he knows should annihilate him, but then feels that his arm drops powerless and limp like a rag, and the horror of unavoidable destruction seizes him in his helplessness. The news that the Russians were attacking the left flank of the French army aroused that horror in Napoleon. He sat silently, on a campstool below the knoll, with head bowed and elbows on his knees. Berthier approached and suggested that they should ride along the line to ascertain the position of affairs. "'Would, would you say?' asked Napoleon. "'Yes. Tell him to bring me my horse.' He mounted and rode towards Semenovsk. Amid the powder smoke slowly dispersing over the whole space through which Napoleon rode, horses and men were lying in pools of blood, singly or in heaps. Neither Napoleon nor any of his generals had ever before seen such horrors or so many slain in such a small area. The roar of guns that had not ceased for ten hours wearied the ear and gave a peculiar significance to the spectacle, as music does to tableau vivant. Napoleon rode up the high ground at Semenovsk, and through the smoke saw ranks of men in uniforms of a colour unfamiliar to him. They were Russians. The Russians stood in serried ranks behind Semenovsk's village, and its knoll, and their guns boomed incessantly along their line, and sent forth clouds of smoke. It was no longer a battle, it was a continuous slaughter, which could be of no avail either to the French or the Russians. Napoleon stopped his horse and again fell into the reverie from which Berthier had aroused him. He could not stop what was going on before him and around him, and was supposed to be directed by him and to depend on him, and from its lack of success this affair for the first time seemed to him unnecessary and horrible. One of the generals rode up to Napoleon and ventured to offer to lead the old guard into action. Ney and Berthier, standing near Napoleon, exchanged looks and smiled contemptuously at this general's senseless offer. Napoleon bowed his head and remained silent a long time. "'At eight hundred leagues from France, I will not have my guard destroyed,' he said, and turning his horse, rode back to Chevardino. 
End of chapter 34. Recording by Philippa Brody, Edinburgh, laspecula.blogspot.com.